Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Miss Nancy Kelly and Miss Kathy Lewis in Dark Journey, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Nancy Kelly and Kathy Lewis in the premiere of Lucille Fletcher's radio play for two actresses, Dark Journey. Tonight's study in... Suspense! Today I am going on a journey. I am going to see Anne Brody again after 15 years. When the news came yesterday, terrible as it was, it was as though a shadow had lifted from my life, a secret horror that I could never quite forget. I have been afraid of Anne Brody now for 15 years, but there is no need to be afraid of her anymore. Anne's secret has been locked in my heart together with all shameful, horrible things. Yet I've never gone on a journey like this one, but what it comes back. There have been times when I couldn't bear the whistle of the train flung out long and mournful over the lonely countryside. I couldn't bear the smell of a day coach, the feel of the plush seats, the rattle and bustle. Only because everything came back. Every detail of that long and terrible weekend we spent together 15 years ago. I don't think anybody saw it, do you? No. Uh-uh. Only old Mr. Hodgins, the station master, and he's no gossip. I wouldn't want anybody to know. Not that I care, but you know how the tongues wag in this town. Well, it's much better to be perfectly sure of your plans before you pass the word around. Then if you and Clyde don't settle things, well, nobody will be any the wiser. <laughs> if we don't settle things, well, there's no if about it. But Clyde and I are practically engaged. Did you get his letter yet about us coming to New York? Uh-huh. Well, for goodness sake, why didn't you tell me? What'd he say? Oh, nothing much. He's, he's no letter writer, just that he was glad and that he's been busy and he's going to call us at the hotel. Oh? He can't meet us at the train? No. Uh, it seems it's his mother's birthday and he promised to take her to lunch in town. We'll be getting in just around that time. He's terribly devoted to her, you know, has been ever since his father died. Oh, I see. You're very much in love with him, aren't you, Anne? Terribly. Yet you really see him so little. How long has it been now? Three months? Three months and six days. But it doesn't really matter. No. I know Clyde loves me and I love him. There's a bond between us. And nothing will ever break it. Well, as long as you feel that way, it's a wonderful way to feel. But I don't think you ought to let it drag on like this much longer, Anne. I really don't. (laughs) Don't worry. We'll settle it this time once and for all. You'll see... When we get on this train again, I'll be wearing his engagement ring on my finger. by now. No, oh, he's probably tied up with his mother. Come on, let's go down to the drugstore and have a sandwich. Aren't you just starving? No, no, I, I don't feel hungry. You go, though. I'll wait. Oh, come on. The clerk will take the message for No, me. no, I I want to be here myself. Well, why don't you call him? I can't if he's at a restaurant. Well, maybe he didn't go. Maybe he's home, sick, or, or at the office. No, no, it, it wouldn't look right. He's got to call me. I 
I, I don't know why he doesn't. I don't know why either. In fact, why couldn't we all have had lunch together at that restaurant? I mean, he, he's not exactly poor, is he? Uh, don't you want to take a bus ride or see the sights or anything? Later, Alice. After he's called. Hello? Yes? Oh, yes, this is Miss Ann Brody. What? He... He left a message. Oh. Thank you. What is it? He stopped by and left a message. He has a previous engagement. A previous engagement when he knew I was coming to New York this weekend only to see him. Well, maybe it was something he couldn't get out of. Maybe on account of his mother. But he already gave her today. And after all he knew I was coming, he knew I'd want to be with him every possible minute. Well, maybe that's the trouble, Anne. Maybe he doesn't want to be pinned down. Maybe you expect too much. But he was right here in the hotel, and he didn't even... Oh, he's grown away from me. He's not mine anymore. Alice. Alice, you know what Clyde has meant to me these three years, how I've lived for him and worshipped him. It's... Oh, it's just as though my, my world has been cut away. It's like... It's like having a lump of ice for a heart. Alice... Clyde is my heart. Oh, I, I've got to see him. I've got to tell him. Oh, Anne. Dear, wouldn't you like to lie down? No, no, I can't lie down. I'm free to sit here in, in this chair by the window. I wish you'd go, Alice. I want to be quiet and think and think about him. Now, Anne, I wouldn't. Something's happened to him. There's some barrier. I've got to wish it away to break it down. What are you talking about? I can do it, you know. Anne, please go. Please. Oh, oh my gosh. Don't tell me it's nine o'clock. I didn't mean to sleep so late. We better get up and get breakfast. Alice. Alice, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He hasn't called me. I haven't slept. Why don't you call him, Anne? Call him and have it out with him once and for all. No, no, I, I couldn't. Well, maybe there's something bothering him. Maybe it's some family situation. After all, his mother didn't have lunch with you yesterday. Maybe, maybe there was a reason. What reason could there be except that she didn't want to meet me? She doesn't want him to marry anybody. She wants him all to herself. Well, isn't that enough to upset any fellow? Oh, come on. We'll get to the bottom of this thing. What's his number? I'll get it for you. I, I haven't his number. I never called him at home. But his address is 3254 Sunset Drive, Riverdale, New York. 3254 Sunset Drive, Riverdale, New York. Hello. Uh, hello, operator. This is room 351. We want to put in a call to Riverdale, New York. Uh, 3254 Sunset Drive, Riverdale, New York. Uh, the name is Dexter. Mr. Clyde Dexter. Will you get it for us, please? What did she say? She's looking it up. Uh, there it is. She's ringing. Here, you better take it now. Oh, no. No, just one minute. One minute. Let me get my breath. Let me think of what I'm going to say. Hello? Is this the Dexter residence? This is Miss Ann Brody speaking. I wonder if I might speak to Mr. Clyde Dexter, please. Thank you. Clyde? Oh, Clyde, this is Anne. Oh, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Oh, Clyde, I've been waiting here at the hotel for you to call, and Alice and I have to spend the morning out, and we thought we'd better let you know we wouldn't be in just in case you wanted... Oh, yes, Clyde, I, I know you said you had a previous engagement, but I thought... Well, you see, Clyde, I'm only going to be here today, and we get to see each other so little, I was wondering... What's that, Clyde? Yes? Yes? Well, no, I, I didn't. What did you say, Clyde? I, I didn't understand. You're what? You're... Oh, Clyde. Oh, Clyde, it's not true. It, it can't be. But, Clyde, we... But, Clyde, you can't do this to me. I've, I've considered myself engaged to Anne, you. I... Anne, give me that phone. No. Oh, no, I just want to say goodbye to him, please. No. Anne, don't, don't look that way. What did he say? He, he 
told me he's engaged to marry a New York girl this September. Oh, Anne. Well, he, he just isn't worthy of you. He couldn't have been if he treats you like this now. I love him. I love him. I love him till the day I die. <laughs> Oh, Anne, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm... Oh, please, Alice, please don't talk. Don't come near me or go away, will you, just for a little while? Oh, no, I won't leave you. I can't leave you when, when you look like oh, that. Oh, go away, I said. How do you hear me? Go away. I want to be alone. I want you to go away. I, I have work to do. Work to do? I'm... I'm going to will him to come back to me. I'm going to make him come to this hotel through heaven and hell. And they're dragging him away from me. Oh, Anne. I can do it. I've done it before. I've made him write to me. I've made him call me up out of a clear sky after months and months. I willed him to speak to me the very first time I saw him when he was just a stranger. I willed him to give me his fraternity pin last year at the spring dance. And I can do it. I can do it. If only I try hard enough, and, and if you're absolutely quiet, Clyde, Clyde, oh, it's no use. He's too far away. Uh, I'll have to come closer to him. We're going out. Going out? Where to? To Riverdale. Riverdale? I want to look at his house to see where he lives. There's something there. Someone who's holding him back. Anne, let's go back to Denford. Let's take a train tonight, any train, and get out of here for good. No, I can't go home. I told you that before. I can't until I have his engagement ring on my finger. Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Nancy Kelly and Kathy Lewis in Dark Journey by Lucille Fletcher. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the Acts, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines with a little domestic drama. It's happened to you before and will happen again. You're relaxed in your easy chair, coat off, contentedly reading your evening paper. Your wife is probably tidying up after dinner. The doorbell rings. Sure enough, it's guests who just dropped in. Now, famed hostess Elsa Maxwell tells us how she handled these surprise visits. She says, I always keep Roma California Sherry on hand to welcome unexpected guests. Serving Roma Sherry is so simple... You just pour and hospitality reigns. And because Roma is America's favorite wine, you know your guests will enjoy it. Yes, there's no easier way to gain a reputation for gracious hospitality than by keeping Roma sherry ready for guests. And Roma, America's taste favorite, the wine more Americans prefer, costs no more than ordinary wines. So make a note to get mellow, gold and amber Roma Sherry tomorrow. Once you try the tempting fragrance and intriguing nut-like taste of Roma Sherry, you'll always ask for Roma. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Kathy Lewis as Alice and Nancy Kelly as Anne in Dark Journey. A play well calculated to keep you in suspense. It's getting dark. I don't think we ought to be wandering around here like this. There might be strange men. Or... Here's the street. Sunset Drive. And there's the house. I've seen pictures of it. I'd, I'd know it anywhere. Anyway. Oh, Anne, please. This is doing you no good. Oh, hush. I've dreamed about that house. Dreamed of myself and him living in it together. I've dreamed of our children playing on that lawn and the sound of music inside and our car standing outside. But it wouldn't mean a thing to you, Anne, if Clyde didn't love I've you. I've dreamed of the years we'd spend together. Well, I, I even named the children 
Clyde Jr. and Peter and Charlotte. That's his mother's name. I never liked it, but I was going to call one child that just to please him. And now, what have I got? Nothing. Nothing is gone. Come on. Come on with me, Anne. Oh, there's a light going on upstairs. He's pulled it to his room. I wonder if he's home. Clyde. Clyde. Think of me. Come back to me. Oh, love me, Clyde. Love me. Love me. Don't, Anne, don't. Somebody might hear you. Oh. Shadow at the window. Oh, it's Clyde. Oh, no. No, it's someone else. It's a woman. A gray-haired woman. Oh, it's his mother, Alice. Clyde's mother. I don't think he's home, Anne. Let's go back to the hotel. No. No, I want to see her. I've heard so much about her. She always turned her nose up at me. He never admitted it, but I knew. He was the only son, and she thought there wasn't anybody good enough. And, and he was always under her influence, just believed everything she said. I could tell the way he talked. It was always mother says this and mother says that. I bet it was she who turned him against me who picked out that, that New York girl. Oh, Anne, please, come on. You're just tearing your heart She's out. She's up in his room now. She's straightening his things. She's happy up there. She doesn't care that she's made me miserable. Oh, I can feel it now, Alice. I can feel the barrier in my heart. Shh, something's coming. Let's go. We're doing no harm. We can stare, can't we, if we wish? Come on. Come on, we'll walk past the house. We'll defy her. We'll go up and ring the bell. And, and then when she comes down to answer it, we'll ask, Is Mrs. Clyde Dexter at home? And then when she asks us who we mean, we'll laugh at her face. Oh, and you're, you're just beside yes, yourself. Yes, I am. I am beside myself because I feel it, Alice. He's lost to me as long as she's up there. Oh, I can stand here, out here under the trees, trying to reach him with every bit of soul I possess. But as long as she's there, as long as she's alive, he'll never be mine again. <laughs> This is terrible. You've got to pull yourself together and get some rest. You've been sitting in that chair now for three hours. Please, don't talk. Just let me alone. You're... You're working on that willpower thing still, aren't you, Anne? And it, it makes me awfully nervous. Be quiet. It's coming. Something's coming. Something's going to happen. I feel it all around me. I'm going to get a doctor if you don't stop. Shh. I feel it. I feel something. You're just as white as a sheet. You're shaking all over. I absolutely refuse to let this go on. Do you hear? Now, you, you get into bed. No. Let me take off no, your shoes. No, no, no. Leave me alone. It's as though there were a big lump being moved off my heart. As though the ice inside me were going. As though I, I could cry at last. Oh, it's happened. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you. All right. I'll lie down now. I'll go to sleep. If you could sleep, you'd feel better. If you just relax. I've done it, Alice. You'll see. He'll be here in the morning. You lie down now. There he is. Didn't I tell you? There's Clyde now. Hello? Yes. Yes, this is room 351. Yes, this is Ann Brody speaking. Yes. It's Riverdale calling. Riverdale. Clyde? She didn't say. Oh. Hello? Yes. Yes, I'm Ann Brody. Why, yes, I'm a friend of Mr. Clyde Dexter. Who did you say this is, please? The, the police. The police? Oh, something hasn't happened to Mr. Dexter, has it? Oh. What? Yes. Yes, my friend and I were out to the house late this afternoon, around six o'clock. Well, yes, I, I did wear a white hat and a green dress, and, and she... W oh, but we took the subway, the White Plains Express, on the Interborough Line from our hotel. We came back around seven. We, well, we just walked past the house two or three times, but... Well, what's the matter? 
Why are you asking me these questions? No, I haven't seen them. I... What? Give me the phone, Anne. Let me speak to them. You're in no condition Keep to... Away. Just... You know what they're saying? Do you? That Clyde's mother has been murdered. What? Oh, no. No, I haven't. Yes? No. No, we didn't. We just came right home. We didn't even ring the bell. Is Mr. Destica there with you? I see. Well, I'd like to speak to him, please, when he gets through. Will you ask him to call me? Yes. We'll stay here in the room. Oh, Anne. It was a hammer. At 8 o'clock tonight. She was struck from behind by an unknown assailant. Oh, how awful. Well, why did the police call us? What have we got to do with it? Clyde was home when we walked by the house. He saw us standing there. I'm going to tell him, Alice. I'm going to tell him the truth. Truth? What truth? There's always been that power inside me. I've known I had it, and sometimes it frightened me. Things have happened. I've been afraid sometimes to use it, afraid it would turn against me. And tonight it did turn against me. And what do you mean? By an unknown assailant. Murdered by an unknown assailant. You know who that assailant was? It was me. Anne, are you crazy? You, you were up here in, in the room every minute. I was up here in the room, but I was wishing she were dead. I was willing him to come to me. I was trying to destroy the barrier. Surely you can't believe that, Anne. It was, it was only a coincidence, a terrible coincidence. I was trying to bring him back, to touch his heart, but the power didn't touch his heart. His heart's like steel against me. It struck his heart and glanced off and struck her dead. Anne, please, you're talking like a oh, little... But you don't understand. People like you can understand. People like you... But there's violence to will. To store it up takes years. To send it out of yourself is like, like sending a powerful hand with fingers. Will can't kill somebody, Anne. Not pure will. The body is one thing, the mind's another. Mrs. Dexter is physically dead. Her heart stopped beating. There was a blow. Somebody real, somebody human did that. She was struck from behind. She was alone in the house. They said the doors were locked. She had no enemies. It came out of nothing and it went away again. Oh, I, I never dreamed. I didn't want it to happen that way, but... But it's getting beyond me. It's assuming forms and accomplishing ends I don't plan. It's, it's turning against me, Alice. Turning against me! Do you think a police court will believe you? You'll only confuse the testimony. You'll only hurt Clyde. Will. Will, you talk about the power of your will. Will. Did you have any real power these last two days? Did it bring Clyde to this hotel? Did it make him love you or even call you up? Yes. 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 Don't you touch him. I won't let you speak to him. Get away from that phone, Alice. Do you want to get us in trouble? Do you want us to go to jail and spend weeks in court? He'd put you there. He wouldn't care. Get away from that phone, Alice. I don't believe you, do you hear? I think you're mad. You're mad as a hatter. Get away from that phone. Oh, no! Anne, you'll ruin your life. You'll fall into suspicion, and people will always think you had something really to do with it. You'll, you'll end up in an asylum. The whole world will know he jilted you. What, what are you going to say to him? He must be half beside himself as it is. He'll, he'll never believe you. What? All right. Thank you, Alice. You see? It is there, isn't it? I made you do what I wanted. And I can make anyone. Hello? Hello, Clyde. Oh, Clyde, darling, I just heard the terrible news. How terrible for you. I'm so sorry. Yes, Alice and I were out there this afternoon. We came by to say hello, but we got cold feet and came home. Oh, no, Clyde, no, we did not a soul. Oh, yes, my darling, I I understand how terribly broken up and, and my heart goes out to you. Oh, I will, Clyde, dearest, I will. I'll be right over. I'll help you in any way I know. Goodbye, Clyde. Anne, you didn't tell him. 
You're not going to tell him at all. No. Why should I? He's mine now. And so Anne Brody walked out of my life. Walked from me wrapped in her new and terrible strangeness. Somehow I didn't want to play any part in her life again. I didn't go to her wedding when she and Clyde were married one year later. To me, there would have been something evil in hearing her voice repeat the sacred words. I am. Take thee, Clyde. There has been for me a nameless horror in the slow, steady way Anne Brody fulfilled her plans. The house in Riverdale, the car, the three children, Peter, Clyde Jr., and Charlotte. Her happiness. Her triumphant motherhood has somehow been hideous to me. I've never heard a train whistle crying through the dawn but what I've thought of her and shuddered. I have been afraid of Anne Brody now for 15 years. Today, I know I've been a fool. Today I know that it was a real murderer who murdered Mrs. Dexter with a hammer from the service porch. Today I'm going on a journey to Riverdale. I am going to see Anne Brody again, lying willless and struck down in her coffin. Lying innocent and pathetic. Lying murdered. Not will, nor nameless monsters of the mind could save her from the truth at last. Yesterday afternoon, the weak, long, brooding creature who could not brook domination from mother or wife flung pent-up death against the mistress of his will. Yesterday afternoon, Clyde Dexter struck again. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines with a tip on how to win praise and increase dining pleasure. Today, millions of clever homemakers are enjoying dinner table compliments by giving everyday dishes tempting new meal appeal. Here's the secret. A glass of red Roma California Burgundy at each place. Try it yourself. Serve robust Roma Burgundy with tomorrow night's piping hot savory pot roast, tender juicy steak, or baked fish. Roma Burgundy brings out tasty new flavorfulness from every morsel, wins grateful compliments for your cooking, and notice how the warm glowing redness of Roma Burgundy adds richness and beauty to your table. Yet the gracious custom of serving Roma... America's favorite wine is as inexpensive as it is delightful. Enjoy exciting new dining pleasure tomorrow with delicious Roma Burgundy. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Nancy Kelly. I'm sure you want to hear next Thursday suspense when Joseph Cotton will star as a famous New York criminal lawyer in one of the best-known suspense stories of our time, Ben Hecht's Crime Without Passion. Thank you. Nancy Kelly will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, Follow That Woman. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Joseph Cotton as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear. For the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Next week, part of the country goes on daylight saving time. If your area remains on standard time, tune in suspense one hour earlier. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Who knows what evil 
<laughs> the thrilling adventures of the shadow are on the air. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, one of the shadow's most thrilling adventures, Murder from the Grave. That's him there, walking towards the corner. Yeah. Pulling closer to the curb. Okay, okay. Wait, we're right beside him, see? Yeah, I know. All right. Let him have it. Right over here, Doc. All right. Well, here he is, what there is left of him. Yeah. They did a pretty complete job, officer. Yeah, he must have stopped every slug they threw at him. He's still breathing, though, and I don't know why. Well, we better get him to the hospital at once. Here, give me a hand with him, will you? Okay, but it looks to me like a waste of time. Well, what's the story, Doc? DOA, officer. Dead on arrival. Yeah, I figured that. Well, better make out of the part. You want to send him to the city morgue or hold him here at the hospital? I'll check headquarters and find out. Yes. Gangster, isn't he? Might say so. Do you recognize him at all? Now, how can I answer that? The guy ain't got hardly no face left, has he? Hey, good evening, Dr. Henry. Oh, hello, Dr. Metzger. What brings you down here to the receiving room? Uh, just keeping in touch with the activities of the hospital. Well, what have you there? A uh, gang shooting, Doctor. He seems to be well perforated. Yes. Especially the face. He's been just about shot away. Yes. So I see. He darted on the way to the hospital. So... Uh, mind if I have a look at him? No, Doctor. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to use your phone, Doc. I'll be right back. All right, officer. Dr. Henry. Yes? Did I understand you to say that you have pronounced this man dead? Why, why yes, Doctor. I'm afraid you were mistaken. What? This man is still alive. Why, well, Dr. Metzger, I couldn't feel any pulse. Yes, no heart you he is alive. Ring for the elevator. Why, but, Doctor, I tell you what... This man is to be brought to my laboratory. Hurry, Doctor. There's no time to lose. Dr. Henry speaking. Hello, this is Dr. Metzger. Oh, yes, Doctor. That patient, man who was brought to my laboratory, is alive and can be saved. Why, why that's unbelievable, Doctor. Nevertheless, it is true. But what about his face? His face has been shot away. I intend to give him a new face. Now, listen to me, Dr. Henry. I want a general order given to all in the hospital. that I am not to be disturbed for the next six weeks. Uh, yes, sir. All of my meals and any surgical instruments or supplies that I might need... Are to be left outside of my door for that period, you understand? Uh, yes, Dr. Metzger, I... If these orders are carried out, I can tell you now, Henry, that in six weeks' time, I will bring forth a man who is whole again. Doggone it, Jack. I just can't help it. Old man, curiosity is getting the better of me. And you've got to find out what goes on in Metzger's laboratory, is that it? Yes. <laughs> He's been in there almost six weeks now, Jack. Imagine almost six weeks without telling anyone how his experiment is progressing. Say, does anyone even know if the patient is still alive? Yes, we do know that much. Metzger sent word to that effect to Doc Hawkins yesterday. Look, Sherlock, how do you plan to get into the laboratory? Well, when Metzger opens the door for this tray of food, uh -huh. I'll just walk in with him, that's all. Good luck. Yes, I'll need it. Uh, knock on the door for me, will you? Sure. Who is there? Your food tray, Dr. Metzger. Oh, thank you. Uh, where do you want me to put... Uh, uh, one moment. You believe the tray with me, Dr. Henry? Well, I was just going you to... You put... were just going to try to gain entrance to my laboratory. <laughs> I'm aware of your intense curiosity, Henry. A curiosity that is shared by everyone else in this hospital. Ah, well, you can tell them all for me that my experiment is nearing completion. Very well, Doctor. If they wish, if they wish, they may come here to my laboratory tomorrow at noon. And I shall reveal to them my finished product. I don't know what we're waiting for. Uh, Dr. Metzger asked us all to be here at noon today. It's now quarter after. 
I, for one, see no reason for waiting around any longer. You're right, Henry. Well, what do we do? Well, we'll let them know we're here. Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger. Why doesn't he answer? Well, there's only one way to find that out. Not by trying to get in. The door isn't locked. I'll go look for him. Uh, Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger. He must be in there. He's not out here. Look, come here, all of you. What, oh, what is it? Look, look, there on the floor. Oh, hold. It's Metzger. He's dead. Yes. And it looks like murder. His face has been slashed. Look, here on the floor. A broken mirror. Where's the patient? The man he was working on. There was no one else in this room when I came in. Well, then he's gone. Yes. But not before he murdered Dr. Metzger. Uh... And since that time, Lamont, the police have learned nothing. Well, that's understandable, Dr. Hawkins. They really have nothing to work on. You have no idea what this Mr. X looks like, have you, Dr. Hawkins? No, we haven't, Margot. Dr. Metzger did a plastic job on his face, changed it completely. That's all we know. Well, it's been 24 hours since the killing. The man has had ample time to get away and cover up his tracks. Yes. I don't see how Lamont can do any more than the police have done, Doctor. Uh, I didn't ask Lamont to come here for that purpose, Margot. Oh, no? No, I... Well, I discovered something in Dr. Metzger's laboratory that I haven't even told the police about. Well, why not? Because it's something too fantastic for them to believe. Well, what is it, Doctor? Metzger's personal notebook, in which he recorded the progress of his experiment. I have it right here. Well, what does this notebook contain? Well, the first entry was written the night the patient arrived in the hospital. Dr. Metzger wrote in the notebook at that time... Tonight, I have at last been given the opportunity... That I have been so patiently waiting for. The perfect subject for my experiment is at this very moment lying on a table before me. I have given him the first injection of the solution. The reaction was most successful. Now, the real work begins. What does all that mean, Dr. Hawkins? You learn later, Lamont. Just as I learned as I read further into the notes. The next entry of any importance came a week later. At that time, the doctor wrote, Everything is progressing satisfactorily. Today, the patient has sufficient strength for me to begin the plastic work. I have found that best results can be obtained by giving injections of the solution every 24 hours. This is most important. Any period of time beyond this is dangerous. Well, what is the solution that he keeps talking about? I'm coming to that, Margot. I'll skip over the entries that follow. They deal mainly with a growing conflict between the patient and Metzger. A note of regret creeps into his writing. He senses that he's almost sorry for the work that he's done. Eventually, this conflict claims to open hatred. And in the last entry, written the night before he died, Dr. Metzger wrote, May heaven have mercy on me for ever conceiving this work that I have done. The patient has now reverted to the vicious being that he has always been. Instead of having gratitude for what I have done, he shows only resentment. Tomorrow morning, I shall remove the bandages that cover his face. He has threatened me that if he is not pleased with my work, dire consequences will result. This, then, is the fruit of my labor. This is the price I pay for my great discovery. My discovery of a solution that literally brought a dead man back to life again. A solution. So that's it. That was the secret solution. Yes. But that's unbelievable, Dr. Hawkins. A solution that brings the dead back to life? Metzger was a great scientist. Nothing was impossible to him. Well, where is the solution now? I couldn't find it. I've searched everywhere in the laboratory. Then it's evident that the patient knowing about it took it with him. I'm afraid so. Well, then I'd say you had good cause for alarm, Doctor. This killer who is now at large is a man returned from the dead. A man without a soul. Yes, it's true. But uh, tell me, Lamont, have you gotten any clues from what you've just learned? Only one. The broken mirror that was found near the doctor's body. Obviously, this mirror must have been shattered by the missing man. Why do you say that? He must have broken it in rage when he first saw his new face. Metzger must have made him sufficiently horrible to bring on this rage. So we have only one clue to work on. A man with an incredibly ugly face. Dr. Hawkins! Dr. Hawkins! What is it? What is it? Come in. Dr. Hawkins, something terrible has happened. There are wrong? In the morgue. The hospital morgue, just a few minutes ago. Yes, what happened? A man with a gun came in. 
forced me to take one of the bodies, a dead body, out to a car. What? I... I had to obey. Why didn't you call out for help? I... I was about to until I saw his face. His face, Dr. Hawkins. It was the most frightening thing I've ever seen. It wasn't human. Doctor, I'd say our killer has made his first move. And I fear that it won't be his last. While we're waiting for the curtain to rise in Act Two of Murder from the Grave, I want to ask you something. When the summer months come, what are you going to do for a supply of hot water? Would you be able to have all the hot water you want, when you want it? And will it be available at a cost within your budget? This is an important problem in many homes. That's why today, the Blue Coal Dealers of America are offering the latest in low-cost hot water heating equipment. They've given you the Blue Coal Automatic Heat Regulator. They've given you the John Barclay Home Heating Service. And now, in 1941, the same Blue Coal Dealers bring you the equipment that provides all the low-cost hot water you want. Yes, the new Blue Coal Deluxe Water Heater that works automatically gives you more clean hot water than you can use. Think of it. Now, at last, you can have an abundant supply of clean, hot water heated at just the right temperature and whenever you want it, all summer long. Phone your neighborhood dealer tomorrow and ask him about this new Blue Coal Deluxe Water Heater. Remember, it will pay for itself in savings over the usual cost of summer hot water. And remember, too, when it comes to keeping your home warm and comfortable, there's no other fuel like Blue Coal. Give your dealer a call in the morning. His name is listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the words Blue Coal. All right. Put the slip in the car. Yes, sir. We're getting to be regular customers, ain't we? Uh, why do you do this? Why do you want these bodies? You'll find out. Everybody will find out very soon. This ain't our last visit to you, Mr. Morekeeper. Uh, You'll be seeing us again. No, no, you'll get me into trouble. Shut isn't up. You? All right, Eddie, step on the gas. Let's get out of here. Entry, entry, another gangster's body kidnapped from the morgue. Uh, that particular pendant will cost you $2,000. Oh, I see. There we are. Well, here. This is a stick-up. Oh, uh, what do you want with that? Oh. You can't get away with this. Oh, just watch us. Grab them rings, Eddie. All right. Phil, take that for your bracelets. Okay. Ah, that's all we need here. Wait a minute, boys. Before we blow, we ought to let the folks have a look at us. For purposes of identification. Take off your mask, boys. Oh, no. They're not you. Oh, how horrible. We ain't very pretty, are we? Well, nobody is. Once they've been dead. Look. Only three guards for a payroll over a hundred grand. Come on, Eddie. Squeeze him into the curb. Right. Good work. Come on, boys. What do you guys think you're trying to do? You'll find out soon enough, Buster. You men stay where you are. We've got a Tommy gun here. Go ahead and use it, brother. Go ahead. All right. You ask, Mark. <laughs> Don't you know better than to shoot at a mob that's already been dead? <laughs> Let them have it, boys. Margot, the entire city has been terrorized by this mob of, well, ghouls. That's all you can call them. Mom, do you honestly believe that this gang consists of the dead men who were kidnapped from the different morgues? Yes, Margot. There's no doubt of it. They've been sustained by Dr. Metzger's life-giving solution. Oh, how horrible. And so far, no one has been able to learn just where this gang is hiding out. Well, what can be done, Lamont? Well, one of the mob was captured by the police this afternoon. They've got him in a city jail. Did he reveal anything? No, he refused to talk. That is, to the police. But I have an idea that I might be able to get something from him. I think I know what you mean, Lamont. I think you do. I'm paying a little visit to his cell. As the shadow. Why don't they come for me? They know the cops have got me. Why don't they come? <laughs> what was that? So, your friends have deserted you, eh? Who's talking to me? I must be getting stir-crazy. I don't see nobody. You're not stir-crazy. I've merely made myself invisible to you. You? Made yourself invisible? Oh. I get it. 
The shadows, plenty of it. That's quite correct. What are you doing here? I've come to talk to you, to learn something about you and your companions. Save your talk. I ain't saying nothing. I know the horrible secret that you and your gang possess. The power that you have to bring life to the bodies of those already dead. How'd you learn? <laughs> Where'd you ever dream up an idea like that? I followed the activities of your leader from the day he killed Dr. Metzger and stole the life-giving solution. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. You're being foolish enough to remain loyal to your mob after they've deserted you. That ain't true. Then why haven't they tried to get you out of this jail? Certainly they must know that you'll soon need another injection of the serum. What? What are you talking about? I learned from Dr. Metzger's own journal that the life-giving solution must be injected every 24 hours. To go beyond this period without it means a return to the dead. No. No, you're just trying to scare me. How long has it been since you received your last treatment? Yesterday. Just about this time. Then its effect should be wearing off right now. We must act quickly. Tell me where the hideout is. And after dealing with your friends, I promise to bring back enough of the serum to keep you alive. Uh, are you sure you ain't handing me no line? I swear it. Now, tell me the secret hiding place and just how many men there are. Okay. Okay. About the men... The boss has only two henchmen left now. Phil and Marty. It's been getting harder to make snatches from the morgue. Besides, the boss don't want to waste the serum on us dead ones anyway. Only two days ago, he let one of the boys go back to the grave without a shot from the hypo. Believe me, Shadow, his face wasn't pretty to see. Quickly now. Where's the hideout? <laughs> Hide out. Well, it's... Hey, what's happening to me? I got a funny feeling in my head. Quickly, man, quickly. My buzzing. Tell me where the hideout is. It, it's... I, I... How much better for them to have left you untouched after death had claimed you the first time? Margot, we're certain of one thing. What's that, Lamont? That our Mr. X, having built up his mob from the remains of notorious gangsters, is now finding it difficult to get bodies of gangsters who, before they died, knew their trade. Correct. Also, he's obviously running low on Dr. Metzger's solution. He's letting his lesser helpers die without giving them injections. Correct again. Well, then, here's my plan. I'm going to ask Commissioner Weston to plant a story in all the newspapers that our notorious out-of-town gang leader, Dutch Carson has just been killed by the police. Who's Dutch Carson, Lamont? A Middle Western mobster who dropped out of sight about a year ago. Well, why are you doing all this? To attract the attention of Mr. X. Then I shall arrange with the commissioner to be taken to the city morgue and be placed on a slab as the body of the dead Dutch Carson. And unless I'm badly mistaken, Margot, within 24 hours, the three missing ghouls will be back in their graves, and this time for good. Ready to stretch out on the slab, Mr. Cranston? All right, Tom. <laughs> you know, you're the first live stiff I ever had in here. <laughs> well, I hope I remain that way. Yeah. Now, will you cover me over with a sheet, please? Uh, sure. Hey, what's going to happen when these fellas find out you ain't a dead one, much less the missing Dutch Carson? <laughs> well, not Tom. Uh, it's something I'd rather worry about when it happens, if you don't mind. Well, I'm here to tell you I wouldn't touch your That's job. Quiet. Huh? I hear footsteps outside the door. Yeah, yeah, somebody's there. Who are you? Take a look at me, Pop. That ought to answer your question. You, uh, you come again. Uh, yeah, I told you I'd be paying you another visit. Uh, what do you want? I want the body of Dutch Carson. I got a little job he's going to do for me. Phil. Huh? Makes up a shot of the solution. Hey, it ain't time yet, boss. We don't need none for another hour. It ain't for us, stupid. It's for a new guy I just snatched out of the morgue. I got him in the next room. Yeah, but we're running low on his stuff. Mix it up, I said. We can use this guy. He's valuable. Huh? Who is he? Dutch Carson. That's... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know him, but I heard of him. He's, uh... Well, I don't know him either. But he was supposed to be one of the smarter boys in the Middle West. 
Until he disappeared about a year ago. What happened? I don't know, but what's important now is that we've got his body in the next room. Hey, what's that? What's going on out there? Come on, get inside, you. Hey, why'd you bring that dame in here, Marty? Well, I caught her snooping around outside trying to look in a window. <laughs> Maybe she was trying to cop a quick look at a couple of dead men, eh, boss? Interesting. What's the idea, girlie? Well, it was just a... Oh, your face. Find something wrong with it? You're the one. You're the one that killed Dr. Metzger. Oh, so interesting. Where'd you get your weapon? Let me out of here. Now, the chance to sit down like a lady like this. You can't push me around like that. Oh, well, I'm giving you a pretty good imitation, ain't I? Now, what were you doing outside? Who sent you here? Oh, you're so clever. Why don't you find out? Who sent you here? Answer me. Oh, oh stop it, Jerry. Oh, Lamont. Oh, Lamont. And I won't do you no goodness, sister. Lamont. Where is he? What have you done with him? I ask you a question. Wait a minute. Done with who? Who are you talking about? You brought him here. What have you done with him? Hey, she must mean the stiff inside. Now, what is this? Who'd you bring here, boss? The body of Dutch Carson. Why? Dutch Carson? Yeah, I snatched him from the morgue. You heard of him, Marty? Heard of him? Are you kidding? A year ago, I buried Dutch Carson a load of concrete at the bottom of a river. I see. Hey, then who did you bring here, boss? I don't know. Hold on to this day. Yeah. I'm soon going to find out. He's gone. The body's gone. It's a trap. The cops are behind this. One thing is sure. The guy is still in the house. Marty, go out and look around the grounds. Okay, boy. And now, if you don't mind. But I do mind. You're staying right here. No, keep away from Give me. Give me that knife, Phil. No, no. Sadly, boss, here you are. What are you going to do? I'm going to carve that pretty face of yours to rip it. No, don't. No, don't. Keep away. Get ready, sister. <laughs> Who left? Not quite so fast, Mr. Aiken. Hey, hey, what's happening? What? You're not touching that girl. Hey, who done that? Who knocked that knife out of my hand? I did, Mr. X. Oh, speak, and where's that voice coming from? It's coming from the shadow. The shadow, eh? Well, now, shadow, this is one time you've stubbed your toe. Because even you can't do anything to dead men. You're wrong, Mr. X, because I know that you need an injection of Dr. Metzger's solution every 24 hours in order to continue living. Yeah, and we aim to continue getting it. I wouldn't be too sure of that. What do you mean by that, boss? I mean that I now possess the solution. You see? Look... Look, the bottle hanging there in midair. He's got the solution. Give me that bottle, Shadow. Oh, no. This is my hold on you, gentlemen. And I shall keep it until your allotted time expires. I shall watch you return to the dead again. Get it away from him, boss. Quick. I'll get it all right. We may not be able to see you, Shadow. But we can see the bottle. Boss, put that gun away. That ain't the way to do it. Oh! oh. <laughs> now you've done it. You hit the wrong target, Mr. X. Oh, you broke it, boss. You broke the bottle. It spilled all over the floor. I didn't mean to hit the bottle. I wanted to plug him. You had better give up, Mr. X. No, no, we ain't giving up. We still got another hour to live, Shadow. A lot can be done in that time. We're going to rip this town wide open just for luck. Wait. You're staying here. Yeah, try and stop us. Marco, they've got an hour to spread the greatest terror this city has ever seen. I've got to stop them. Ain't got much time, boss. Look in the back, Marty's gone already. Yeah, I know, Phil. Will we look as bad as that when we return to the dead? We never know. Besides, right now, we got a little fun ahead of us. Now, when we get to town, shoot and keep shooting at anybody who gets in our way. They're going to remember us when we get done, Phil. Okay, boss. Hey, hey, watch your driving. This is a narrow bridge. You know, it's something's pulling the wheel. I, what? I can't straighten it out. I... <laughs> You'll never straighten it out, Mr. Ray. How did he get here? I've been with you since you left your hideout, gentlemen. He let go of the wheel. Shut up. So that you can carry on your campaign of ruthless killing. Oh, no. Hey, he's trying to steer us into the river. Where is he? He must be on the running board. Hey, let go, Shadow. Don't be a fool, Shadow. If we drown, you'll drown, too. That's not as important as the lives of the innocent people you're planning to kill. Hey, Phil. Phil, I can't hold the wheel much longer. Stop the car. Stop the car. Too late. Too late. might have been drowned, along with your ghostly friend. I certainly might have been, Margot. But fortunately, I threw myself clean into the car before I went over the bridge. You know, Lamont, I've become very attached to you. Oh, don't think for a minute that all our mad exploits together haven't been fun. But I wish that for a while, at least, we could have a calm, peaceful existence. And we shall have, Margot. We shall have. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, nonetheless, I'm sure you'll forgive me if I hang on to my hat when we start out again next week. (laughs) 
Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. Characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Mystery House. Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. Well, Barbie, I don't know that I understand the title of the story we're trying out for a Mystery House novel this week. You mean the composite killer, Dad? Yeah. Does it refer to several different people who combine forces to commit a murder? No. Haven't you ever seen a composite picture? Well, to be honest with you, I don't know. Oh, of course you have. In the movie magazine. Well, I'm not a movie magazine reader. Detective stories are more in my line. Well, an artist takes maybe Dorothy Lamour's eyes and Alexis Smith's nose and Anne Sheridan's hair and Hedy Lamar's ears and Betty Davis's mouth Put them all together to make a composite picture of someone who never existed. Oh, I see what you mean, Mrs. Glenn. The picture's a fake. Well, not exactly. Every part of it is true to life, but... But uh, put together, it doesn't spell truth. Well, I'm a solid fact man myself. I like authentic information. For example, listen to this. Okay, places, everybody. And uh, set the scene for tonight's story, will you, Tom? The Composite Killer. Tonight's story opens in the office of Captain Hedges, police detective. A slender, aesthetic, if cynical young man sits across the desk from the captain, sizing him up. I suppose you wonder why I asked the Chronicle to send an artist over to headquarters, Maney. Why not to reason why, mon capitaine? Where the Chronicle points its finger, there go I. I have your papers yelling at us about not solving the Dorothy Latterman murder. Don't tell me you're sensitive, mon capitaine. I always thought only artists were sensitive. Artists who aren't quite good enough to make the grade and end up by hacking away on a newspaper. They said you were the best man in their art department. They damn with faint praise. They said you have imagination, Maney. A severe criticism. I try to hide it. We're pretty close to solving that murder. Now, I know. The police are working on secret clues and feel that the murderer will be apprehended within the next 24 hours. The Chronicle carried that one day before yesterday. There's nothing secret about our clues. This killer ought to be a cinch to catch. He left so many clues, he might just as well left his calling card. And you're just holding off to make it look like a hard catch? Maney, we've got everything except our man. Now, the Latterman girl was a beauty. She had so many boyfriends, we know we're never going to get to all of them. From what we've learned, she was a gold digger. Hmm. Sounds like a sweet kid. Had a beautiful apartment, fine clothes, good jewelry. She had a string of jobs you could write pages about. None of them requiring any real work. (laughs) I've been looking for that kind of a job for years, Captain Hedges. She was as cold and heartless as any human being could be. She was playing for big game. She finally found it. You mean the letters you uncovered that showed she was going to marry Wilton Morris III? Yeah. Has it ever occurred to you that she might have been in love with the boy in spite of all his money, mon capitaine? Sure. We found a couple of her girlfriends who said that she told them that Wilton Morris was strictly a dope, but in the right money bracket. I love mystery stories, Captain Hedges, but how does all this concern me? Well, we've narrowed things down, Maney. The logical assumption is that Dorothy Latterman was killed by a disappointed or disgruntled suitor, somebody who couldn't stand to see her marry Wilton Morris III. Well? We start with the assumption that the murderer was, uh, well, an attractive-looking person. If he didn't have as much money as Wilton Morris, he had to be attractive to be in the running. Captain, you amaze me. A detective who's a student of human nature. The murderer got into the girl's room from the fire escape through a very narrow window. He had to be thin to make it. 
Hmm. Attractive, thin. Now, we've tested the street-level part of the fire escape, and you'd have to be at least 6'2 to reach it and pull it down. I think I see what you're driving at. Several people saw a man loitering near that fire escape at 1 o'clock the morning of the murder. Couldn't they give you a description? Altogether too much description. We've talked to three people, and they disagree on most points. But their descriptions checked in a couple of respects. The man had a long, thin face. They were all three positive of that. Yes, I know the type. His hair was dark. Well, we can't be sure what color, but dark. Go on. And all three people who saw him were a little frightened at one thing. The way this man stared at them. One o'clock in the morning? <laughs> I don't blame him. Now, I get the idea that he had small, deep-set, sharp eyes. Eyes with a brazen look. Two of the people said that they... <clears throat> pardon me. Said that they might have known more of what he looked like, but his stare got their goats. They looked the other way. He looked them in the eye, and he made them turn their heads the other way. Yeah, the eyes are important. Always. Now, the marks on the girl's throat indicate that he had a stubby hand as hard as iron. She fought like the devil and never had a chance. Well, the fingers don't tell me much. No. Well, to me, hands like that on a tall, slender man indicate a tough, muscular neck, too. Smart boy, mon capitaine. I'd have missed that. While he was strangling her, she clutched at his face. At least, that's the only reason I've been able to figure for the bite on her forearm. Here, here's a print of the marks. Hmm. Small mouth, but big teeth. Right. Now you're catching the spirit. Here are photographs of three suspects. Three men that we've connected with the girl. Any one of them who could answer what little description that we have. Hey, my apologies, mon capitaine. I'd always thought the gendarmerie were rather stupid. You know what I want, then. You want a composite sketch of these three guys, a blend of all three. Right, with enough of each one in it so that when he sees the picture in the paper, he thinks it's close to being him. Mm -hmm. Could be done, I guess. But it'll be quite a trick. I've talked to your managing editor. They'll start a build-up on the picture in tomorrow's paper. It'll run in three days, if you can have it finished by then. Every day until it runs, the paper will carry a front-page box saying, Coming, an artist's conception of the Dorothy Latterman killer, created in cooperation with the police department. See what the Latterman murderer looks like. Don't miss it. You think this'll do any good, aside from publicity? This was an emotional murder. And I'm going to grate the killer's nerves to the breaking point. With your help, Meany. It's a deal, mon capitaine. Oh. Oh, it's you, honey. I thought Oh, that... Jed, you don't need to be so fussy about your old picture. Covering it up like that when I came in. I don't care about seeing it anyway. Oh, it's not that, honey. It's... Well, I've had orders from headquarters. Nobody's to see it till it's ready. Going to eat midnight lunch with me tonight, Jen? You haven't asked me. Why, uh, matter of fact, honey, I'm not going out to lunch tonight. I'm working right through on the picture. But it isn't supposed to run till day after tomorrow. Sorry, honey, that's the way it is. This thing's important and, well, kind of dangerous. Oh, oh, you. Drawing a portrait dangerous. The daring young artist, Jed Maney. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh, but I'm working under orders, and I'm going to follow them. Uh, but, Jed, you're really serious about this stunt, aren't you? You're always poking fun at everything we do around the Chronicle. I've got to hurry, honey. If I expect to get this thing done by closing time, oh, I... All right. I won't bother you. I never thought I'd have a picture for a rival. Oh, it's not that, honey. It's just... Oh, nuts. Can't you give a guy a break when he's busy? Well, if that's the way you feel about it... Oh, don't it... be sore. Tomorrow night, I'll give you loads of attention. I'll scrape and bow You'll do and... nothing of the kind. Not after the way you've acted the last couple of days. As far as I'm concerned, you'll still be busy. Good night. Oh, just a minute. Uh... Well, why didn't you go ahead and kiss her, Manny? I wouldn't have minded. I never did like an audience, mon capitaine. <laughs> Isn't it pretty stuffy in that clothes closet? Yeah, stifling. I'm dying for a smoke. Why not go ahead and have one, then? No, I'm going to go back into hiding. Sooner or later, the murderer is going to call on you. And I'm going to be here when he does. So, back to my hole. Well, I think I'll use suspect number three's ears. They're the largest. <clears throat> Who the devil are you? Wilson Morris III. I read about this composite picture thing, and I thought I'd drop in and see how you're getting along. Maybe I could help you. Well, well, well. 
Wilton Morris III. <laughs> I've always wanted to meet a real live millionaire. And you're so young and tender, too. Isn't it a little late for you? No need of being nasty. I thought maybe I could help you. Dorothy was going to marry me, you know. So they tell me. You mind if I take a quick glance at how you're coming along? Get away from that drawing board, third. What? Really? Don't give me that high hat either. I've had orders. Nobody's to see this thing till it's finished. But I'm not a suspect man. Great Scott, I was going to marry the girl. If there's anybody in Kingdom Come wants her murderer caught, it's I. Sorry, mister. The publisher of the Chronicles, a good friend of Dad's. I could get permission to look, I imagine. Guess again, Buster. The publisher doesn't have a doggone thing to say about this. Oh, but hang on. I'm just trying to help. I'm from the lower classes, third. Having a millionaire help me would knock my nerves all to pieces. Very well. Have it your way. But if you don't want my advice, what was the idea of calling me? I left a rather charming party to come down here. Calling you? I didn't call you. Your secretary did, though. She said you wanted to see me if it was convenient. I don't have any secretary, Mr. Third. That's a pretty bum stall. Stall? But I'm quite serious, Mamie. Oh, I get it. You got me down here to get a good look at me. You're going to try to work some of my characteristics into your picture. Well, there are libel laws to cover huh? some... Say, uh, you aren't nervous, are you, Mr. Third? Nervous? <laughs> Why should I be? I simply dislike the idea of notoriety. And if that picture bears the slightest resemblance You're to... You're scaring me... me half to death. But if you're all through, I wish you'd toddle back to your party. I'm busy. Very well. But I'd be careful if I were you. Huh. Well, now, what do you think of that, Mon Capitan? Yeah, pipe down. You might hear you. Oh, he's practically out of the building by now. I'll close the door so he can come out and stretch. Oh. Oh, you again. You don't need to act so disappointed. Wasn't that Wilton Morris who just left? The third. Well, that's odd. My phone rang a few minutes ago, and a girl asked if he was here. I thought it was some crank, but she must have known. A girl? Look, honey, would you recognize her voice if you heard it again? Well, maybe. Why? The guy claimed somebody called and asked him to come in here. My secretary. But you don't have any secretary. Hey, hey, just a minute. Who... Hello. Looking for someone? Why, yes. Is Wilton Morris here? Uh, come on in. Thank you. Oh, but I thought... Why, well, he isn't here. Why didn't you tell me that... I didn't say he was here, darling. I just asked you to come in. See here, what is this? The idea of closing that door. I don't intend... I don't to... know what you intend, but you're going to answer a few questions. What? Oh, really, this is... Why, I never heard of such a thing. Excuse me. Just a minute. You're not leaving here till you've answered a few questions. Who are you, anyway? Well, I don't see that it's any business of yours. But my name is Harriet Cardley. Just now... a second. I haven't been a society reporter around here for two years for nothing. Oh, you're Honey Hawes. You covered my debut for the Chronicle. Yeah. And I also remember that you had yourself a man-sized crush on Wilton Morris III about that time. Really, Miss Hawes, if you'll excuse You don't me... deny it, do you? I won't dignify it with a denial. I don't suppose you'll bother denying that you called my desk a few minutes ago to see if the boyfriend was here? I called. I like that. I got a telephone call to meet him here. There's something awfully funny about the telephone service around here tonight. If you're insinuating that I'm lying... I know. Papa will talk to the publisher, who's a friend of his, and get us canned. You know, I have a hunch the police may be wrong on this business. What? They're assuming it was a man who killed Dorothy Latterman, a jealous suitor. But a jealous suitor would have lost every chance he had by killing the girl. Wouldn't he have killed Wilton Morris instead? What are you trying what to... What I'm getting at, sister, is that maybe somebody else has a yen for Wilton III. It kind of makes sense. What? You're insinuating that I did... Oh, that's ridiculous. I didn't even know the girl. If I were the police, I think I'd want a lot of answers from you. I say, if I were the police... Jed, what are you shouting about? Captain Hedges! Captain Hedges! Oh, look! Who is he? It's Captain Hedges. Oh, is he dead? Just a minute. For the love of heaven, stand back. Open the door in the window, quick. Oh, what's the matter? Let what? me get this thing out of here. Oh, what is it? A time bomb in the closet, loaded with poison gas. Call the police, quick. Oh, but hadn't we better... I'm staying right here with this picture. Evidently, someone wants it pretty badly.
poison gas time bomb. Neat idea. Mm Mm-hmm. Quiet, unobtrusive, efficient. The question is, who put it in the clothes closet of Jed Maney's office? Well, we'll find out in the second act of tonight's story. And now, Act Two of The Composite Killer. The time is four o'clock in the morning, and the Chronicle office is pretty much deserted. A light still burns in Jed Maney's little office. The policeman who stayed here, Jed, did he do much? Mm, asked a lot of questions, took the measurements of the clothes closet. Wanted to know who could have seen Captain Hedges come into my office. But how did he get in? I didn't know he was here. His being here was the reason I didn't want to kiss you, remember? I was embarrassed. What? <laughs> you crazy goon. Bashful at this late stage? <laughs> All right, you're forgiven. When you and the charming Harriet left the police station, how was Hedges getting along, did they say? No, but they didn't seem to hold out much hope. They said it was just luck he wasn't dead when we opened the clothes closet. Neither Harriet nor Wilton III went near that clothes closet while they were here. I can't figure out... Almost anybody could have left that time bomb, Jed. You're never here during the day. You never locked your office. But it still doesn't make sense. Well, the police put out a lot of publicity about this picture you're doing. The murderer could have walked in and planted that bomb any time up to six o'clock last night. Yes, but nobody knew Hedges was there. The murderer was probably watching this place like a hawk. Put yourself in his place. All this swoop to do about the killer's picture, Captain Hedges in charge of the investigation. Well, that's easy to figure. I won't rest easy till I get that picture finished and into the hands of the engravers. What, Jed? You don't mean you're going ahead after, after what's happened? Of course I'm going ahead. It's more important now than ever. What does the picture look like, Jed? Sorry. But it wouldn't hurt to let me see it. I know how to keep a secret. Have I ever let you down? You'll see it in the Chronicle. But I'll just take a quick look. Get away from that drawing board. You heard me. I'm not fooling, honey. Jed, you... You ex... You almost frightened me. After what's happened, you should be frightened. I'm not trusting anybody up to and including you. Well, you surely don't think... Somebody's committed a couple of murders, honey. I'm not anxious to be added to the list. I'm sorry to be so rough about it. I'll probably apologize tomorrow night, but for now, that's how it stands. Well, I... All right, Jed. That's the way you feel. Going home? No. I'm going to finish the picture. What the devil's the idea of getting me out of bed to come down here at 4.30 in the morning, Maney? I didn't think you'd be in bed yet, Mr. Third. And you seem so terribly, terribly anxious to see my latest work of art. You see, the picture's finished. But you know, I don't think you're going to like it. Here. Why? Why, uh, Wait a minute. What, What? Recognize yourself, Mr. Third? Well, I... It, uh... It isn't a picture of me, and and yet it is. That's right, Mr. Third. It takes a clever artist to make a picture like that. You, and yet not you. But close enough so anybody would recognize it. You. You think I killed Dorothy Latterman? I know you did, Mr. Third. Indirectly. Oh, no, no, you're on the wrong track, Manny. I didn't kill her. I don't know who did, I... You don't, Mr. Third? Not even now? What? I killed her, Mr. Third. Captain Hedges knew it. He knew it all along. Oh, you're, you're joking. You, you couldn't When possibly... Hedges told me that Dorothy Letterman had held a lot of different jobs and they had pages of dope on all of them, I knew. I wasn't picked to do this picture for my artistic genius. He was playing with me, waiting for me to get excited and make a slip. Oh, he was a smart cookie, even if he did underestimate me. What do you mean about the jobs? Dorothy was an art model at one stage of her career. She quit because a certain poor artist got too serious, bothered her too much. And you killed her. The only thing in the world that ever interested her was money. She was responsible for my taking this stinking job to try to get enough money to rent a little apartment and get married. (laughs) You must have been extremely fond of her, to kill her in such a brutal fashion. The funny part of it is, Mr. Third, I didn't intend to kill her. 
I couldn't believe her story about her engagement to you, and I went up to talk to her. She laughed at me, made fun of me. I went crazy, crazy mad. I wanted to hurt her as much as she was hurting me. I'd say you hurt her more, at least more permanently. Oh, no. But there was real satisfaction in grinding my fingers into that lovely throat. I even bit her arm when she tried to stop me. Yes, but but your name was never mentioned as a suspect. <laughs> I, I took every present she'd ever had from me. Every letter. I erased myself from her apartment. I planted the fire escape business. Oh, I gave the police plenty wrong clues. But some way, Hedges caught on. He didn't have proof, but he knew. Why do you tell me all this? Because I want you to understand what it's all about. Why you're being framed. I? Framed? Oh, you, you think you can convict me of a murder you committed just by drawing a fantastic picture of me? Hardly. You really are mad. The picture's going to take care of you, all right. You are going to be convicted. I'm not much worried. You've been here before tonight. It's established that you came here to look at the picture, and I wouldn't show it to you. Yes, but what does that have to do with it? What, what are you up to? Those telephone calls to you and your Harriet will be checked, of course. Who? A public stenographer made the calls, Mr. Third. She got her instructions over the phone and was told to send the bill to me. I don't know a thing about it. At least that'll be my story, and it'll stick. You think those calls will convict me of a murder I didn't commit? You are batty. Batty like a fox. Being an artist is useful in more ways than one. I know my anatomy pretty well. What? Try to talk sense. I'm talking sense. I put this drawing board over in the corner, see? Very interesting. It'll get more interesting as it goes along. Now, I lay this knife on the board. Just so. The handle presses against the wall, see? What do you think you're going to do? You... Incidentally, that knife is from your cabin up at the lake, and it's loaded with your fingerprints. Now I scooch down. Have to be sure to hit exactly the right spot. You, you... Look out! Oh, it's a good trick, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it takes nerve, plenty of nerve. But when you're fighting for your life, you have nerve to spare. Let's see. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. Now I back into the blade of the knife, firmly, steadily. Oh, you fool, you'll kill yourself. I can't let you commit suicide. I won't kill myself, Third. But it'll be close. Close to the heart and close to the spine. It worked, Third. Just like I planned you're through. You're licked. Where's the telephone? Who you, who you call you, sir? Doctor? Doctor or police? Both. Won't do you, won't do you any good. Don't you see? Me. Me stabbed in back. Your knife. Your picture on the drawing board. Your picture. The killer. I say you came in, saw a picture and stabbed me. You're through. But why should you try to do this to me? Why? <laughs> you with nothing but money to offer. You stepped in with your money and tore down all my hope. I hate you. But I thought you were in love with a pretty little society reporter, Honey Hawes. She was... She was just around. I had to cover up some way. That was an act. Honey. Honey. He, he got me. I'm gonna die. Hospital, quick. He saw a picture. He stabbed me. Save it, Jet. You'll need your strength. Hospital, quick. Get police. Police to arrest him. You don't seem to realize, Jed. I've heard your entire scene with Mr. Morris. Uh, what? Oh, thank heavens, Miss Hall. After what had happened, Jed, when you insisted on staying and finishing that picture, I, I was frightened to death. Frightened for you. For you, understand that? I was afraid the murderer would come in and try to kill you. You've been here all the time. Yes, because I thought I loved you. I was standing by with a revolver. I wanted to help you. You. Great help. Go. Oh. Uh, Captain Hedges. Yeah. I'm getting a little stuffy in that clothes closet. There's nothing more to hear anyway. But you, poison gas, hospital. Hey, teach you how to look out for yourself on the force, Maney. I looked that closet over pretty thoroughly. I found the gas time bomb. Oh, no, no, it went off. I, I watched it. When the spring was ready to release, I held a match up to the jet, a lighted match. You knew all the time. Yeah, but I couldn't prove anything. There's a lot of difference between knowing and proving. I didn't figure you were strong enough or cool enough to stand up under pressure, so I turned it on. Hadn't we better get him to the hospital, Captain? Yeah, I suppose so. Not that we're doing him any favor. Quite right, Mon Capita. I knew right from the start you were a sharp guy.
I'm E.G. Marshall. Today, an account of an unusual method of solving crime, the psychic method. What it is and what it isn't, you'll soon find out. Crime has been in our history since the beginning of recorded time. Adam and Eve broke the law of the Garden of Eden. And not many pages later, Cain slew Abel. One might say the first psychic manifestation of a murder is in the Bible, where it is written, And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. I need a magician who knows how to make his own disappearing act. Not interested. Fifty thousand dollars interest you? No. A hundred thousand? Mm, perhaps. What's the scam? The carnival necklace. I need one of your magic tricks to make it disappear. Why, you cheap chiseler, those diamonds are worth two million. <laughs> mystery drama, The Devil's Bargain, adapted from a story by Guy Boothy, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Sign Off, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Solve them all. The disappearance of the Mona Lisa from the Louvre, the Fort Knox hijacking, a million in gold bars that never reached their destination, the theft of the historic crown jewels in the Tower of London. In each case, Otto Glazer undertook the task of finding the stolen valuables. And in each case, through much heralded psychic means, he eventually led the police to their reward. His fees were astronomically high. But since what he regained was priceless, no individual, insurance company, or nation felt defrauded. But let Otto Glazer speak for himself. So much had been said and written about my supernormal powers, some of it exaggerated, some true, that perhaps I'd become complacent, careless. And as a result, the way this case ended was quite a shock to me. It began at Heathrow Airport, London, on a Monday morning, when a distinguished son of the British nobility came to meet a no less distinguished son of the Arab nobility. Sheikh Maraki, welcome to England. Oh, Lord Carnovan, to what do I owe the pleasure of your company? I'm merely returning your hospitality when I came to Tehran last spring for the OPEC conference. To mingle friendships far is mingling bloods. <laughs> As your immortal Englishman William Shakespeare has said. Now I remember, you're still at it, quoting the bard. Practically every time we talked in Tehran. Well, even in my country, we recognize his poetic supremacy, Lord Carnival. I uh, suppose you find our new airport quite a change from what it used to be. Oh, yes, yes. So many billboards advertising products I am unfamiliar with. And here, for instance, along this wall, uh, what is... Otto Glazer, no problem too small. <laughs> That's quite a story. <laughs> Is he a doctor, lawyer, or mind reader? You come very close, Sheikh Maraki. This Glazer chap is rather a combination of all three. Well, shall we go? He certainly believes in advertising. Oh, please, do lead the way. My car is just outside these doors. Uh, allow me to escort you to your new home. five minutes and we'll be there. I meant to ask you, Sheikh Maraki, how did you happen to find a house to rent in such an excellent neighborhood? I had an agent here. I understand the house had been vacant for some time. I have wanted to live in London since I was at school at Oxford. Oh, we are turning into your street. I shouldn't look out of your window. Why not? Oh, dear me, no. A whole line of those dreadful posters advertising this glazer person. Oh, you were going to tell me who he was? Otto Glazer is probably the most prominent psychic detective in the world. 
He can find almost any stolen object that baffles the police. He's had amazing success. Better than your Scotland Yard? I've never known Glazer to fail. He says he's an authentic psychic. You come to his house, he listens to you behind a screen, and he'll tell you how to go about finding what's stolen. Why behind the screen? Oh, very few have ever seen him or know what he looks like. He's a master at changing his voice and disguising his entire appearance. Ah, this is it, Sheikh Maraki. Oh, Allah be praised. There is one of those posters on the front door next to mine. I regret it, but this Otto Glazer just happens to be your next door neighbor. Welcome home, Otto. Oh, I love you in the shake's outfit. You look marvelous. I've got a splitting headache. It's this darn headdress the Arabs wear. Oh, what a trip. Let me hear how you sound as an Arab. All right, like this. I am Sheikh Maraki. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Oh, wonderful, Arthur. Uh, you sound just like you look. I think I prefer you as an Arab Sheikh. Oh, so the trip was horrible. Unbelievable. The flight was late. Then I had to hide in the lavatory at the airport and change into this Sheikh's outfit. Then flying back to London with this tight headpiece. It better be worth it. But you wore an Arab headdress during the OPEC conference last spring. I detested that costume then also. But when one pretends to be a potentate to lay a trap for an Englishman, one can't be choosy about the bait. <laughs> Ancient Arab proverb. Now, Marisa, help me get out of this tent. It's 20 to 12, and if I don't hurry, my clients will become impatient. <laughs> Sheikh Maraki and I, Otto Glazer, are one and the same. Now, Marissa, you should know, was no ordinary assistant, but the daughter of the great Marvello, that extraordinary magician and escape artist who had little run-in with the law from which I rescued him. When Marvello retired comfortably, out of gratitude, Marissa became my assistant. Uh, quite a clever and dedicated young lady. In three minutes and thirty seconds, I had changed to my tweeds, a distinguished false moustache and matching grey wig. Come along there, Marissa. Open the wardrobe door. Well, go on, go on. The key keeps turning, but doesn't catch. Well, are you sure you have the right key? Of course I'm sure. This is the key for the wardrobe that we always use. It just doesn't this whole operation breaks apart because I can't get through this secret door to the adjoining house. I can't believe it. Well, I am trying. I have your father build me this wardrobe right up against the wall and a matching wardrobe in the adjoining house on the same floor against the same wall. It's supposed to be foolproof so I can get from one house to the other with nobody knowing. No need to get nasty, Otto. Here. Do you want to try the key? Now, look, I have clients waiting on the other side of this wall. Wait. Wait, wait, wait I've got it. Oh, there oh. you see. All you need is a little patience. I've opened it. Well, you'd better get your father on the phone and find out why I can't rely on his lock. In two hours, I'll have seen all my 15-minute cheapy clients, and I'll want to get back here through this hidden door. What if I can't open it from the other side? Well, then why not walk out of Otto Glazer's front door, make a short flight, and go into the front door of this house? They're both yours. Well, I know that, and you know that, but I don't want anyone else in London to know that. Oh, please, Marissa, don't be so dense. You tell your dad the lock sticks or doesn't catch or whatever, and I want it fixed. <laughs> What an exquisite dining room, Lady Carnarvon. Authentic Georgian of the period, as a matter of fact. But I simply can't begin to tell you how pleased we are you joined us for dinner on your first night in London, Sheikh Maraki. Ah, I was equally pleased to find your husband at the airport this morning. Oh, he's done nothing but talk about you since he came home from Tehran in April. I'm going to ring for the soup, and then I want you to tell me quite 
confidentially. Do you think the price of oil is going to go up again this year? You may as well, Eustace. Uh, will oil go up in price? Oh, Lady Carnovan, surely it does not affect people of your station? Well, not really. Uh, Hubert tells me that you went to Oxford. All my family have been educated abroad. Oxford is where I developed my taste in Indian art. You too? Oh, then you simply must go to the Victoria and Albert Museum to see the Rosport paintings. I know them quite well. I must show the Sheik our jewel box. I suppose you have heard of the Carnival necklace. Ah, who has not, Lady Carnival? Even where I come from, a necklace worth two million is quite a conversation piece. I gave it to Hermione on our 25th anniversary. Uh, the box in which I keep the diamond necklace is pure second century Indian. I'm sure you will appreciate it, Sheik. I should not mind seeing the necklace either. Uh, I don't know whether I mentioned it, but uh, one of the reasons I'm here is to gather material on Indian art. Uh, perhaps I might borrow your antique jewel case one day and have it photographed for my book. Absolutely. Beauty is to be shared. Uh, this box is covered in ancient carvings, almost an exact replica of the Nativity of Buddha done in limestone at the British Museum. Oh, yes, that one. Is it still on exhibit? You know it. I own it. Also on loan, of course. Splendid. Oh, we shall arrange for you to have a good look at our old wooden jewel box. It's, uh, it's uh, unique. Marisa, this is not going to be a simple swindle. I've got to be very careful, cover my tracks like a cat and make no waves. In and out of his lordship's front door and that clumsy Arab get up. But how to grab the necklace, that's what bugs me. You see, it's kept in the bank, except when Lady Carnarvon's wearing it. After whatever party, she takes it off and keeps it in her... Oh, of course. Keeps her necklace in what? Marissa, that's the answer. The carved box she puts it in. Listen, get your father over here first thing in the morning. He's got the answer. Now you see it, now you don't. That's what I use, your father's great act. The great Marvello's disappearing act. Of course. At least we know who is who and what is what. That Sheik Maraki is one of Otto Glazer's disguises. That this so-called psychic actually engineers thefts. And then by pretending paranormal abilities, hands back what he's already stolen. What? Trickery, duplicity, hanky-panky. I could go on, but sticks and stones won't break this artful dodger's bones. What will? What does? Join me in here when I return shortly with Act Two. I think all of us are fascinated by the machinations of the unscrupulous... We like to be let in on the doings of those for whom the straight and narrow is a tool with which to pick a lock. For now, the world believes Otto Glazer has extraordinary see-through eyes, unusual mental powers, and divining insight. It may turn out, unknown to himself, he may actually have those gifts. But in the meantime, give him credit. He's latched onto a good thing. Good morning, Marvello, chap. Yes, what are you doing with that crossword puzzle? I uh, know. What's a seven-letter word for how a person feels having to arise early in the morning and hustle out of his dwelling when he had planned to sleep late? Uh, look, Marvello, I didn't get you out of bed to help you with a crossword puzzle. That seven-letter word is unhappy. I'll have you know. I am unhappy that my morning rest disturbed by a psychic chiseler. Now come off it, you old fraud. Would you be unhappy to make 50,000? Yes. 75,000? Definitely not interested. 
Supposing your cut was a hundred thousand. Not so definitely not interested. One hundred and fifty thousand. Cash on the barrel head. Let's say one week after you deliver. Daddy, we don't want you to be unhappy. One hundred and seventy-five thousand, that's my final offer. No, it isn't. You need me. Make it two. And my unhappiness will vanish. Done. What's the scam? The Carnivan necklace. Why, you conniving con, that's worth two million, maybe more. The insurance company won't cough up at 50% of the value. And all you're giving me is 200,000. Take it or leave it, Marvello. I'll take it. All right. We have three options to lift the diamonds. One, when Lady Carnivan is wearing the necklace at some ball or dinner party, snatch them. But the hue and cry, you'd never get away. No, no that's not good. I agree. Option two, when the old gal takes it off at night. However, it goes immediately into a carved box, which is put into his lordship's wall safe to spend the night. The Doberman pinchers are let loose, and in the morning the bank's armored car picks up the box and takes it to the vault. Uh, which leaves us with the third and last option. Which is? Marvello, do you remember your now you see it, now you don't routine? You mean the disappearing donkey trick when I used to put a donkey into a box stall and presto, change your row and behold, no donkey? Yes. Tell you what I have in mind. Carnival. As soon as I got your call, I rushed right over. I have told my publishers they will be having quite a surprise in the chapters dealing with ancient carved Indian art. Oh, I am thrilled, Sheikh Maraki. I lie awake at night wondering whether your jewel casket has on it the dream of the Maya and the miraculous birth in the Lumbini Garden. You will see. I've got it here. No. Yes. One of the clasps is loose, so I had it sent over from the bank. The jeweler is upstairs this very minute, mending it. I shall have him put it into the box and have it brought down so that you can have a look. I shan't bore you by repeating the size of the necklace, the size of the blue-white diamonds, how many. You've heard it often. The box was of some dark wood, harder than teak. I'd say about 16 inches long, 12 wide, and 8 deep. Lady Carnivan unlocked the lid, and there, inside, on a quilted bed of Russian leather, lay the necklace. It was all I could do to keep from grabbing it and running. That would have been a stupid thing to do. Oh, well, I was hypnotized, Marissa. I wasn't myself. You haven't been yourself for 25 years. Oh, stop it. My most important role is myself. Otto Glazer, psychic spy and detective. Once we have made the carnival necklace disappear, Otto Glazer will step forward and with trance-induced vision and for a slight fee, he will locate and return the missing anniversary present. Marvella, you will take up residence here until the job is done. To start you off, Lady Carnivan permitted me to make some measurements of the jewel box inside and out. And here also is a sketch I've made for you. Very helpful. Now all I want you to do is to come up with an adaptation of your illusion of the disappearing donkey. For $200,000, I could make a dinosaur disappear. Why did you send for me, Lady Carnival? Uh, Sheikh, uh, do you remember a few days ago you were admiring the workmanship of my jewel box? And I told you the day I'd be wearing the necklace, you might borrow the box to have photographed for your book. Oh, I've never forgotten your words. Well, that day is today. Look at this. A note from the Queen's Epery requesting the pleasure of the company of Lord and Lady Carnarvon for dinner at Buckingham Palace. Oh, congratulations. When is the night? Tonight. Oh. 
So I've had the necklace sent over from the vault. Here is the box. I am overcome. Go on. Go on, take it. It won't bite you. I've only one request, and that is... May I please have it back before the day is over? Oh, absolutely. Yes, you see, when I return from the palace tonight, I place my necklace inside. The box goes right into Hubert's wall safe. We let the dogs loose to patrol the grounds, and in the morning, the armored bank car fetches it. You shall have the box back today without fail. Marvello. Marvello, here's the box. There. Can you do it? Push it across the table. How does it open, Otto? Here's the key. Uh, tell you what I'm going to do. I'll refit the inside, placing springs between the side panels and the lining. Those will be geared to the lock so that when the key is turned, the springs relax. It's exactly the same principle I used making the donkey disappear in a four-by-six-foot stall. Only here... Save it, Marvello. Don't tell me how. Just tell me if and when. We have nine hours. What ifs? What ifs? No ifs. I've already made the mechanism from the measurements you gave me. Nine hours. I can do it in three. Otto, do you think Daddy's a genius? If he can make a necklace disappear as easily as a donkey before sunset, I'd certainly agree with you. It's five o'clock now. He said three hours. I knew he couldn't do it in that time. What do you mean? Daddy's been taking a nap since lunch. The box is finished. He's done it. Well, didn't you know? How can I be expected to rest with all this racket going on? My dear fellow, I think this retirement has gone to your head. Don't you have something to show me? What? Show me how it works. Otto, don't scold Daddy. I am about to open this box. Will someone from the audience be good enough to step forward? Ah, I see a gentleman in a tweed suit and a gray wig, gray mustache and gray sideburns standing over there. Will you kindly step forward, sir? Ah, that's right. Now, will you be good enough to examine this box? An extraordinary bit of workmanship, I agree. Elaborately carved outside, tastefully leather-lined inside. Now, sir, if you would be so good as to hand it back to me, and also your wristwatch, uh, don't worry, you'll get it back. The great Marbello only steals diamond watches. <laughs> ah, thank you, sir, thank you, thank you. Now, please observe closely. I place your watch into this box. Close the lid. Will you be good enough to turn the little key, sir? Good. Now, I hand to you the box. Please, turn the key and unlock it. Fine, you're doing so splendidly, sir. Now, please, open the lid. What do you see inside? Your wristwatch? Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. The watch has disappeared. What? It's gone. It's gone, Marvello, you old magician. You've done it. Daddy, I knew you were a genius. <laughs> Look at me. I'm shaking the box. You can't hear the thing and nothing rattles. Nobody would know. When the key is turned, Otto, the inside quilting parts and the object drops to a padded bottom. When the lid is opened, the sides are sprung neatly together and the box appears empty. But... It can only be done once. Well, you don't mean it's in there forever, do you? I'll show you how to take the works apart, Otto. Take out the levers and the springs, and no one will know it's been tampered with. You can do it in 30 seconds. You can do it in 30 seconds. It may take me a little longer. Now, uh, may I have my watch back? brings you here at this hour. It's six o'clock. Oh, Hubert, um, your wife loaned me this jewel box to have photographed for my book, and I promised she would have it back today. Isn't that just like Hermione? Never told me a thing. The whole house is agog because the queen said come from me. Thank you. I'll see she gets it. What time is it, Marisa? Otto, will you drink your breakfast tea and stop? Checking your watch? It's eight o'clock. Ah, won't be long now. 
My educated psychic guess is that in about ten seconds we shall have a visitor. On the button, there's our visitor. Marissa, is my putty nose on straight, the darn hake on my head, huh? You look fine. The most beautiful Arab since Valentino. It's Lord Carnarvon. They've discovered the empty jewel box. Now, listen. In 15 minutes, I shall come knocking at Otto Glazer's front door. You will open it and say that Mr. Glazer is out of town, but expected back at 12 for his daily clients. Yes, of course. Now, up to the dressing room with you and through the wardrobe into my house next door. I hope your father fixed that lock so it works. Why, Hubert, Lord Carnarvon, what are you doing here so early in the morning? Oh, or did you ask me that question yesterday? Oh, Sheik, terrible, terrible. Oh, dear me, you look as if you'd seen a ghost. Now, please, come along here, Hubert, to the library. Uh, can I get you something, a brandy? No, 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 Sheik, thank you. I've got to keep a cool head. Oh, you alarm me, Hubert, I've never seen you like this. Did something happen at the Queen's dinner party? Uh, no, 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 no. That went perfectly normally. Uh, 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 no, it's nothing to do with the Queen, thank heaven. Bless her. It's the necklace. What? The necklace? It's gone. Missing. Oh. Disappeared. It was Hermione. It was her idea. I come straight here and speak to you. Yes, but what have I got? Oh, dear me. I did not somehow... Damage this gorgeous box, did I? No, 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 the box is all right. I'll begin at the beginning. We come back from the palace last night. Hermione takes off the necklace, gives it to me. I put it in the box, lock the box, place it in the safe, loose the dogs. Anyway, this morning at seven, the bank guards arrive. Hermione opens the box for a last look. No necklace. Ah, oh, that seems dreadful. Uh, what did your wife believe I could do? Obviously, our first thought called Scotland Yard. Then I had a better idea, old man. A much better idea. Your neighbor, Otto Glazer. Oh, yes. Glazer. Uh, would you, Shake, as his next door neighbor, ask him to take on this case, but in utter secrecy? Frankly, I think this is the kind of crime that cries for supernatural or at least supernormal detective work. Well, if you think I can really help... Oh, we do. Both Hermione and I, we beg you. In that case, Hubert, I'm certainly at your service. Let us go next door and see Otto Glazer at once. <laughs> What Lord Hubert Carnivore does not know is that the famous diamond necklace is still in his house. Still inside the antique Indian jewel case. We're about to see the great Otto Glazer in action. What will he do now? He must remove two things from his lordship. The necklace and a ransom. Of course, Glazer calls it a finder's fee, but whatever you call it, it must be of sufficient size to make all the play acting and disguises worth the effort. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. It is Act Three, the one in which we learn who wins, who loses, who's caught, who escapes. One caution. This is radio theater, not fact. So we can all take the events with a grain of salt and a smile. If you remember that, friends, you won't feel indignant if the imposter succeeds. The flim-flam man makes it. It is moments later at the front door of Otto Glazer's residence. Disguised as Sheikh Meraki, Otto Glazer presses the button of his own doorbell. I beg your pardon? What do you gentlemen want? Is uh, Mr. Otto Glazer at home? And uh, if he is, would you tell him Lord Carnovan and Sheikh Maraki would like to see him? He isn't. Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, when do you expect him? At noon. Uh, come back at 12 o'clock. No problem is too small for Mr. Glazer. Oh, whatever shall I do now? May I suggest you allow me to deal with Mr. Glazer? Oh, my dear Sheikh, would you? I will tell him what I know and persuade him to visit you this afternoon. 
but I had better make sure you know it is Otto Glazer and not some charlatan who may have heard of the necklace's disappearance. Ah, I tell you what, I will give him a password. Uh, what shall it be? Something from Shakespeare? Oh, good idea. Uh, a phrase, uh, 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 what comes to your mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A diamond gone cost me 2,000 ducats. Merchant of Venice. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I'll know he's the man if he says that. Oh, this is also upsetting. I'm sure the necklace will be recovered. I am told the mind of this Otto Glazer is so penetrating, he can actually locate a real needle in a real haystack. Uh, you are Otto Glazer, sir. I am. You are Lord Carnarvon. You wish to see me. Do you have a message for me? Yes. A diamond gone cost me 2,000 ducats. Mr. Glazer, I'm delighted to meet you. Unfortunately, Lady Carnarvon cannot be here. She was quite beside herself with worry, so I have sent her off to the country with a doctor friend of mine. But I can tell you everything. You don't suspect anyone in your household, I suppose? Not a soul. This theft is such a mystery that we don't know what to think. The servants? Oh, they're as innocent as I am, I'm positive. Can you remember what happened this morning when you discovered the necklace missing? The telephone rang at seven. It was the bank. The armored car would be here at ten past. I unlocked my safe, removed the box, put it on the table of my study and went upstairs to say good morning to my wife. I couldn't have been out of the room more than ten minutes. My wife came down with me. The guards from the bank arrived, and then Hermione, that's my wife, she said to me, I suppose you've looked to see if the necklace is all right. I said, how could I? You have the key. And then? She took the key, opened the box, and the necklace was gone. I don't know if you're familiar with the way I work, Lord Carnarvon. I have a vague idea. It's called psychometry, picking up psychic vibrations from the surroundings at the scene of the crime. I shall wish to see the box first, then your safe. Uh, they are both together, the empty box and the empty safe. I'll show you. I also make it a policy to accept payment for my services in advance. The amount is 50% of the value of the item to be recovered. 50%? That's rather steep. Is the necklace insured? I'm afraid not. Even Lloyd's felt such an extravagant piece of jewelry in private hands was not insurable. Well, it's up to you to decide, Lord Carnarvon. If you feel the yard can find it before it's broken up in separate stones and sent out of the country, then, of course, you'll have it back at no cost. The police make no charge. However... It I... hadn't occurred to me that possibility, the necklace being broken up and each stone sold separately. What would you say the necklace is worth? Oh, a million. You sure? Is that all? Well, perhaps closer to two. Then you're aware of my fee. Suppose you don't find it. Well, that's possible. Then you've only lost a million. It's your gamble, Lord Carnarvon. You wouldn't let me out of the house. I barely reached the front door when Lord Carnarvon called me back. Made out a bank draft for a million. Called his bank to verify and led me to his open safe and the carved jewel box. I asked to be left alone. In less than a minute, I, re I removed the necklace from the false bottom, took out the springs and levers, and put the necklace in my pocket. Half an hour later, I bid Lord Carnarvon adieu and told him he would be hearing from me. Otto, I have never seen anything like this necklace. Oh, look at it sparkle. It could light up a city. Ah, oh, what next? Well, now it so happens the house next door to Lord Carnarvon's is up for sale. It's exactly as the block we live on with the identical houses side by side and an entire row of them. I shall disguise myself as a retired elderly army officer and you shall be my nurse. And you and I shall go there to make some inquiries about the house for sale. Driver, this is the place. Well, come along, nurse. Hand me my cane and help me out. Uh, uh, mind my injured leg, nurse. Uh. You see, Marissa, that's 
Lord Convent's house next door. Yes, but what am I supposed to do? Follow instructions and follow my lead. Yes? Oh, Colonel Riley presents his compliments. This is my nurse. I understand this house is for sale. Yes, it is. Uh, I'd be happy to show you about. Uh, there's a gentleman for you. Uh, uh, when I see you, you've got a napkin about your neck. Are we interrupting your dinner? Well, I was just sitting down for a bite, but I can have that later. It's only seven o'clock. No, 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 I wouldn't hear of it. Interfere with a man at trial time. Uh, why don't you just let us wander about the house and, uh... Oh, caretaker, uh, do take these few coins as a token of my appreciation. Oh, thank you, Colonel. Thank you, sir. And uh, do come in. Come in. Just switch on the lights in whichever room you wish to see. Now, this room, I believe, is on the same floor as Lord Carnarvon's bedroom. This, uh, this is what I'm going to do. Begin by opening this window. Now, if you look out, there's quite a wide coping that runs below this window and attaches itself to an identical coping on Lord Carnarvon's house, which is smack dab against this one, right? But it's pretty dark out there. Ah, just what I need not to be noticed. What I'm about to do, Marissa, is engineer a series of false clues, which later the police will believe is how the necklace was stolen. Now, I take my trusty old walking stick, and I pull, and pull. See? It becomes three times as long. Now, I remove my right shoe, into which I've had a metal screw hole attached, and into it, I screw the very end of the extended, collapsible walking stick. I want you to stand guard by the door while I'm balancing myself like a human fly. Yes, but you haven't explained what you're going to do with your shoe attached to the end of that long pole. I'd better tell you when I get back. Marissa. Marissa, give me a hand over the window ledge. I made it. I did it. Ah, now quick. Pull down the window while I put my shoe back on. Ooh, I'm glad that's over. I tried watching you out of the window, but it was so dark I simply couldn't see anything. I made my way along the coping and then made certain there was no one in the bedroom in which Carnarvon's butler sleeps. Then, with this telescopic walking stick and the shoe attached, I made footprints in the dust along the ledge back to where I was kneeling. That's all. That's it. How long was I gone? Oh, uh, five minutes. Good. Downstairs we go. Bye-bye to the caretaker. We'll be in touch. And back to our house. Well, he's a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa Marvello. I do believe I have this time pulled off a really big one. Oh, you do, do you? Keep it all alone, eh? Daddy. He's such a big shot, this psychic faker. Where would you be if I hadn't made my disappearing donkey box? Marvello, chap, you got paid, didn't you? I still have to do my psychic act and find the necklace and bring it over to Hubert, a Lord Carnival. You know what? I haven't even seen the darn necklace. That's right, you haven't. I'm sorry, chum. I got it right here in my pocket. I... Uh, my other pocket? My... my inside pocket? Oh, no, also, you didn't lose it. No, 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 let me think. Let me retrace my steps. Ah, uh, what did I do... When I left Carnarvon... Ladies and gentlemen, from the final feat of Monsieur de Mans of the evening... Will you shut up, you has-been? I'm trying to think. Has-been, eh? From the final act of the evening, a drink to your else with diamonds. Daddy, stop. Stop him. Marissa, why'd you knock my glass out of my hand? Look on the floor. Daddy had the necklace in his glass of champagne. Has-been, eh? I tell you, old chap, I'm sorry to see you go. If it hadn't been for you, Sheikh Maraki, I owe everything to you. Oh, no. Your friendship has paid for everything. The necklace is back in your house, and uh, 
In time, as your great Shakespeare has said, all doers of evil will be punished. The thieves will be caught. You should have been there, Shake, to see how this extraordinary Otto Glazer went straight to my window. His psychic super senses led him to it. There on the ledge were footprints leading to the house next door. Amazing. Then Glazer alerted the police. They interrogated the caretaker, and sure enough, a man disguised as an army officer had gone into that house, perhaps even to pick up the necklace from a hiding place. How he did it, I don't know, but that great man returned to me the necklace this morning. Lady Carnival must have been overjoyed. What an extraordinary man to have such psychic power. I would not like to pit my wits against his. <laughs> I did, Shake. And I came out pretty well, if I do say so myself. Uh, how do you mean? I gave him a million for his fee, which he thought was half the value of the necklace. Actually, it's worth four million. <laughs> so you see, psychic or not, to quote our old friend, I think I rather got the best of the devil's bargain. I told you at the start, perhaps I'd become too complacent, too careless. I had to face it. Oh, Lord Carnarvon had cheated me. Not only that, he'd insulted my profession. So I shall just have to steal the diamond necklace again. Perhaps I should feel guilty telling you a tale of an innocent victim losing and the guilty party gaining. But I look at it this way. Otto Glazer was a kind of Robin Hood who robbed the wealthy to be charitable to the poor. Only he believed true charity begins at home. I'm not saying every time you meet up with someone with psychic powers to beware, but to be careful, never hurt anyone. I'll be back shortly. of course, true psychics. Their powers have been documented and centuries ago have even been foretold. Back to the Bard, his very last play, The Tempest, and his thoughts on the supernormal. He said, Do not infest your mind with beating on the strangeness of this business. At pick leisure, which shall be shortly, I'll resolve to you some answers which to you shall seem probable. Did Bill Shakespeare know something we don't? Our cast included Robert Dryden, Joan Shea, Gordon Heath, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant Money could buy. 
The rich, they would live. And the poor, they would toy. I was thinking of going inside. It's, uh... It must have been a fine house. It was a grand house in its day, sir. Dollar and house in the Sarsfield. Sir Dominic Sarsfield was the last of the owner stock. <laughs> he lost his life not six foot away from where you're sitting. Biotechs, the new soap and pre-wash powder present Beyond Midnight by Michael McKay. Yeah. Hey, do you mind that mortar? Seven or eight feet off the ground, sir. Yes. Yeah. That seven foot off the ground, sir. Maybe eight. Did you not mind what it is? Well, I, I... I dare say not. Unless it's a stain from the weather. Oh, it is nothing so lucky, sir. Nothing so lucky. That's a splash of brains and blood. It's there a hundred years and it'll never leave while the war is turned. He was murdered then? Worse than that, sir. Killed himself, perhaps? Oh, worse than that, it's just his crack that's been out in harm. Are you older than I look, sir? <laughs> you wouldn't guess me years. Well, I... Oh, don't be put out by the hump on me back. It's been there since my birth, and I no longer mind it. <laughs> he knew it might throw a man into a quandary if he's asked to tell me yes, hmm? Well, I would say you were five and fifty. Huh? <laughs> I was seventy-nine last castle, Matt. And five and fifty, all right. And something at the back of it, too. <laughs> well, I... I can hardly believe it. But... You don't remember Sir Dominic Sarsfield's death, do you? No, sir. That was a long while before I was born. But my grandfather was butler here long ago. And many a time I heard tell how Sir Dominic came by his death. It must have been one of the most beautiful houses in the whole of Ireland in its day. The wind wrecked the roof and the rain rocked the timber. And little by little, in 80 years' time, it came to what you see. But I have a liking for it still, for the sake of old time. I never come this way, but I take a look in. I, I don't wonder you like it, though. Beautiful spot. I've never seen such noble trees. Yeah, I wish you'd seen the glen where the knots are ripe. They're the sweetest knots in all Ireland, I think. You'd fill your pockets while you'll be looking about you. Oh. I know woods. <laughs> Your Honor, the woods about here is not into what they were. All the mountains along here was woods when my father was a bassoon, and Marola Wood was the grandest of them all. All oak mostly, and all cut down as bad as the road. Not one left here that's fit to compare with them. <laughs> In which way did Your Honor come hither? From Limerick? No. No, Kalala. Well, then you passed the crown where Marola Wood was in the former times. He came on your list before, the steep knob of the hill above the village here. It was near that, Maroa Wood was. It was there, Sir Dominic Sarsfield, first met the Tevler, and she said, Lord, between us and harm. And a bad meeting it was, him and his. The devil? Aye. The devil. What? What happened, Sir Dominic and. Sit ye down, Your Honor. And maybe I'll tell a tale that'll make your hair stand up on end. Yes. Yes, I'd... I'd like to... <laughs> it was a fine state when Sir Dominic came to it. Ah, feasting and fiddling, three quarters for all the fiddlers from many miles around. There was wine by the hog shake for the quality, and beer and cider enough to float the navy for the boys and girls and the likes of me. Oh, there was money, me fire. There was money. And when Sir Dominic came to power, he set about getting rid of it. Been educated in England, you know. Spoke with a large dark tongue. He showed off his dogs and horses, and he travelled in France, and he had a great time of it. But once he was caught merry making for so long, that a folk heard tell of him for three years or more. Though the police was kept off course, waiting on his return. 
Uh, my grandfather ran the house attender on Sir Dominic's coming back, you see. And one night, one wild night was apparently, Sir Dominic did come back. There came a rock on the window. An old corner hand on the bottom of that father was sitting by the fire, warming his head. Who knocks there? Who calls? Oh, will you have ale? And you must need food. Oh, never mind all that, Connor. Sit down. Sit here. Sit opposite me. I want to talk with you. And don't be afraid to say what you think. And why should I be afraid, Master Dominic? Self was always a good master to me, and so was your father, as he saw before you. And I'll say the truth, and dad a dimmer, and more than that, for any sass field of the northern, much less yourself, and good right I have. It's all over with me, John. I just passed praying for The last guinea's gone. The old place will find it. And be sold. And I'm come here. I don't know why. I just have a last look around me. Like a lost ghost. Before I go off into the dark again. It was the gambling and the drinking and the womanizing. But enough of that. Listen to me. If you should hear of my death. Be sure to give the yes. oak box. Yes. The oak box. box in the closet, Con. To my cousin Pat Sarsfield in Dublin. And a sword and a pistol with my grandfather carried at Ochrim and, and two or three more trifling things of the kind. Con. Con, they say if the devil gives you money overnight, you find nothing but a bag full of pebbles, chips, and nuts in the morning. If I thought he played fair, I'm in the humor to make a bargain with him tonight. Lord forbid. They say the country is full of men enlisting soldiers for the King of France. If I light on one of them, I'll not refuse his offer. How contrary things go. How long is it since Captain Waller and me fought the duel at Newcastle? Six years, Master. And you broke his thigh with the bullet the first shot. I did, Con. I did. And I wish instead it shot me. Have you any whiskey? Oh, oh, sure, sure, sure. Able to see into your horse for you, Mister. I'm not going to the stable. I may as well tell you, for you find it out anyway. I'm going across the deer park. If I come back, you'll see me in an hour's time. But anyway, you'd better not follow me, for if you do, I'll shoot you. It'll be a poor ending to our friendship. With that, he walks out into all the weather, leaving me grandfather with a heavy heart. He went down towards Moreau Wood, and I guess he made up his mind that if no better came to himself between that and there, he'd hang himself from one of the oak branches with his cravat. Now the weather cleared itself away anyhow. The night got finer, though it was still cold. The whiskey had cleared his head, no doubt, and he was thinking of enlisting to be sure in the French King's army... When he walked into the wood and sat down, he knew full well that a man might take his own life any time. What if it puzzled him to take it back again? In spite of the cold, 
He was almost falling asleep when he spied a fine gentleman coming to meet him. I guess he was a handsome man like himself and wore a cocked hat with gold lace around it, such as officers wear on a coat. And he had on a dress such as French officers wore in them times. He came and stopped in front of Sir Dominic. Then the two gentlemen took off their hats to one another. I am recruiting, sir, for my sovereign. And you'll find my money won't turn into pebbles, chips, and nutshells by tomorrow. And I'm thinking, sir, that that gentleman pulls out a pig pack of money and cord. And the minute he sets eyes upon him, Sir Dominic must have felt the very hair stand up straight on his head. And if it prospers with you, I'm willing to make a bargain. This is the last day of February. I'll serve you seven years. And at the end of that time, you'll serve me. And I'll come for you when the seven years are over. When the clock turns the minute between February and March, and the first of March, you'll come away with me, or never. You'll not find me a bad master. I love my own. And I command all the pleasures and glory of the world. And if you'd rather wait for eight months and 28 days before you sign the writing, you may, if you meet me here. But I can't do a great deal for you in the meantime. If you don't sign then, all you get from me up to that time will vanish away. You'll be just as you are tonight, and ready to hang yourself on the first tree you meet. I, I don't know, John, what did it? It's the heaviest load I ever carried. Open it, John. Open it. Sir Tommany counted every guinea in the bag. And it took him until daylight. And he made Connor, my grandfather, swear to tell no living soul about it all. And Sir Dominic went about spending the gold in the bag. And the eight months went rapidly away. And the appointed day drew close. And his debts began to pile up all around him. And by the time the night of the 28th came round... He was almost ready to lose his senses with all the demands that was rising up against him and nothing to meet him. But the help of one dreadful, he had to depend on at night in the awkward down there below. found the money good, but it was not enough. No matter. You shall have enough and to spare. I'll see after your luck and I'll give you a hint whenever it can serve you. Any time you want to see me, you only have to come down here and call my face to mind and wish me present. You shan't a shilling by the end of the year. And you shall never miss the right card, the best throw. Or the winning horse. Are you willing? Uh, willing. Take this needle. I require three drops of blood from your arm. I shall catch each drop in this acorn cup. Break your arm. Now. 
take this pen. Write again what is written there upon this parchment. The bargain is sealed and can never be broken. Henry Dominic was soon out of debt, and he took off his old ways again, and everything was fine. But there was not a poor man on the estate that was not happier than Sir Dominic. And the years passed, sir. Tan Aaron was alive again, music, happy one singing. All were happy except the master. The morning never ran out, just as the queer one Sir Dominic met by the oak swore it would not. The years passed and the seventh approach passed. And Sir Dominic grew more and more out of humor. Took to go on for solitary rides, sometimes at night. Finally, he lost heart altogether and sent for the priest. No more to tell, Father. That's how it is with me. That's how it's been for six and more years. I've only ten months to run now. What can I do, Father? Is there aught? No, no idea. No idea. But what, Father? My soul must. No. No, I... I'll tell you what you do. I'll tell you. Ten months, you say. Ten months to run. You must give over doicing. And you must give over swearing and drinking. And all bad company. You must live a virtuous life, a steady, blameless life, until the seven years' bargain is out. You must live as if in retreat. Oh, Dominic, Dominic, for money, for good luck and trust, your soul, man. I wish I'd never be born. Never say that. The months went quickly, and Sir Dominic lived a blameless life. Not a curse passed his lips, not a dice did he throw, not a wild dance did he lead. Never looked at a loose woman. As you may guess, he felt queer enough when the morning of the 28th of February came. The priest came again by appointment, and for hours they prayed together, till the clock struck twelve. Sir Dominic and his reverence were together in the room, you see, and kept up their prayers till the clock struck twelve and an end of February for that year. Dominic thought he may as well have a pleasant evening. After all, he's fasted and praying. He sent round a half a dozen of his neighboring gentlemen to come and join with him. And there was no end to the wine. And soon the cards came out and the guineas began to change hands. And his reverence, who stayed, crept away. When he saw the way the night was going. <laughs> and the party became drunk and sure enough and lasted into the next morning. Whereupon the gentleman took breakfast and slept out a day. Only to begin again the next year. All right, now let's have again, now let's have again. We never had it. Gentlemen! 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 A ghost! A ghost, gentlemen! Please, please, quiet! Gentlemen! A toast <laughs> to the best first of March 
I ever sat down upon with my friend. <laughs> it ain't the first of March. What? It ain't the first of March. What is it then? It is the 29th of February. Leap year. Master, there's a queer gentleman if ever I see one. Huh? Tell your master to see him as awful a voice as I ever did hear. Tell your master that I'm here by appointment. Huh? And expect him downstairs huh? by appointment. Uh, no! Then I can't come down yet! Gentlemen! Well, any of you jump from the window, bring the priest here! <laughs> I'm serious! I haven't seen gentlemen! Master, he says unless you come down right away, he'll come up to you. I... Understand this. I'll see what it means. And the young noble went with a fish as if he was to meet the hangman. Downstairs to meet what? And when he reaches the bottom, his gentleman is there to meet him. And directly that one sees him, he catches Sir Dominic up in his arms. And carries him out the great door. Oh, and the queer one carries her Dominic outside and whirls him round high with the strength of a beast and crashes his head upon the wall. Dominic was a corpse. There was not a gasp left in him. Pat Donovan was coming up to the house early the next morning. And after he passed the little brook, his dog that was by his side makes a sudden wheel and runs howling by that wall there. And that minute, two men passed Donovan in complete silence. One of them looked like Sir Dominic. And the other... Chavis was like nothing on her. They made no sound with their feet, and only the dog howled fit to wake the dead. And later, Donovan found the master's body lying there, by the wall, on that spot. The head smashed, and the body cold and stiff. It's late. I'm, I must get back to the village now. And I will be leaving too. Good night, you old man. And God bless you. Friday night at half past nine by Biotex, the new soak and pre-wash powder. The program is adapted for broadcasting and produced by Michael McCabe. The Avenger. The road to crime ends in a trap that justice sets. Crime does not pay.
Avenger, sworn enemy of evil, is actually Jim Brandon, a famous biochemist. Through his numerous scientific experiments, Brandon has perfected several inventions to aid him in his crusade against crime as the Avenger. Most remarkable of these inventions is the highly secret diffusion capsule, which cloaks him in the black light of invisibility. Brandon's assistant, the beautiful Fern Collier, is the only one who shares his secrets and knows that he is the man the underworld fears as the Avenger. And now... The Avenger and the Diploma of Death. Well, Jim, Founders Day here at Rockland College certainly has brought out the distinguished alumni in full force. Yes, Fern can point out all the celebrities to you, Inspector. She was graduated from Rockland a year ago. Oh, no, almost two years ago, Jim. Oh, I beg your pardon, Fern. Two years ago, Inspector. Uh, Well, I hope that lady who just sat down in front of us isn't anyone too important. Because as soon as the track meet begins, I'm going to ask her to remove her hat. Oh, that's Amy Nottingham, the authoress, Inspector. And you'd better be polite to her, or she'll make you the villain in her next book. Oh, look, that gray-haired man in the front row is a famous brain surgeon. And the two men with him are politicians. You see, I know a few famous people, too. (laughs) I guess everybody enjoys a good track meet. Jim, I thought Professor Craig was supposed to join us. Well, he said he would, but he's probably become involved in some fascinating experiment in the chemistry lab. Hey, isn't it time for this thing to start? Yes, but I think they're waiting for Dean Clapper. He hasn't arrived yet. Oh, Fern, what's the first event on the program? Well, let me see. Oh, yes, here it is. Mm -hmm. It's the 60-yard high hurdle race. Harold Harkness should be a cinch to win then. Harkness? It seems to me I read something about him in the papers recently. Oh, that's right, Inspector. Harkness won the National Chemistry Prize a few weeks ago. And, uh, by the way, his picture appeared right next to yours when you solved the Austin case. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 that's where I saw it, all right. Oh, look, Jim, I don't think they're going to wait for the dean. They're lining up the fellows for the hurdle race. Oh, good. Uh, Harkness is number five, Inspector. All right. Keep your eye on him. There they go. Hey, Jim, hey, what's the matter with Harkness? I don't know. Why didn't he even clear that first hurdle? Harkness has collapsed, Jim. Come on, Inspector. There's something wrong down there. This way. All right. Come on. Down these side stairs. They lead to the field. All right. Excuse us. Stand back, please. Hey, come here. All right. Hey, they're bringing the stretcher on the field. Yeah. Tell them to hold it a minute, Inspector. Hey, wait a minute. Don't touch him. Police. All right. Step aside. Please let us through here. Uh, see what you think, Jim. Uh, looks to me like his neck may be broken. No. It's even worse than that, Inspector. He's been shot on the back of the head. Harkness is dead. Jim, what in the world are you looking for here into the grandstand? Do you think the murderer may be hiding in here? It's possible, Fern. But I think it's more likely that he changed his clothes in here. He's already made his getaway. Jim, it was the start who shot Harkness, wasn't it? Yes, only one shot was fired. The one that started the race. But in that case, well, why didn't Harkness fall right on the starting line? Because he was a trained runner, primed for the race. When the shot hit him, he was off to an automatic start. And he ran forward with a kind of reflex motion. No one even noticed that anything was wrong until he tripped over that first hurdle. Well, old Jake Norton is a starter, Jim. Why, he's been working here at the college for ten years. Oh, I just can't believe he killed Harkness. Listen. What was that? Why, there's a groan. Come on. It seemed to come from behind those benches in the corner. Jim. Jim, it's a man. What? He's all tied up and gagged. He's badly hurt, Fern. What? Why, Jim? That's old Jake Norton, the starter. He was slugged from behind. Here, help me on time, Fern. All right. Jim, Jake always wore a jockey cap and a yellow sweater when he was on the job. Yes. Someone must have stolen those clothes and impersonated Norton out there on the field. Uh, his gun's not here either. Shall I get the inspector, Jim? Yes, but call an ambulance first. Norton's in bad shape. 
I doubt if we'll pull through this. Well, I just got word from the hospital, Jim. Jake Norton is dead. Oh. Or did he regain consciousness at all, Inspector? No. Whoever hit him meant to kill him, Jim. Well, that means we'll have to start from scratch on these murders, Inspector. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, uh, it looks like we're up against it. Two well-planned, premeditated killings, Jim. Where do you think we should start? Well, we'll have to question every single person who wasn't present at the track meet. Absent students, teachers, and guests will have to explain their whereabouts between 2 o'clock and 2.45 this afternoon. Huh? That's a big job. Let's go to work on it. two men were called back here for further questioning in this murder case because we have not been able to substantiate the alibis you offered earlier this afternoon. I'll expect you to answer all questions carefully and truthfully. I'm warning you that any discrepancies in your stories will have serious consequences. Who's first, Jim? Robert Atwood, student. Uh, According to earlier questioning, Atwood claimed he was in the library from 12 o'clock to 3 Doing chemistry research. Hmm. Now, this has not been substantiated by the librarian on duty. Okay, Atwood, how do you explain that? Well, you see, sir, I was up in the cupola of the library. I was consulting some rare old manuscripts and books that are kept up there. How does it happen that the librarian didn't see you? The cupola is reached by a back staircase. A few senior honor students are given a key, and we're permitted to go and come as we please. Were you alone there? From 1.30 on, I was. Who was there until 1.30? Lawrence Treat. Who was he? Mr. Treat is an alumnus of Rockland who lives here in town. He's writing the memoirs of Matthew Forrester, the man who financed the new library just before he died a few years ago. Ah, I see. Treat also has a key to the cupola. Oh, yes. He does a great deal of research there, too. May I ask a question, Inspector? Go ahead, Jim. Atwood, isn't it a fact that you and Harkness were the only two students who rated a key to the cupola this year? That's right, Mr. Brandon. And is it also a fact that such rivalry had developed between you... That you were no longer even on speaking terms? Well, yes. Exactly what was the reason for that rivalry? Uh, Well, since Harkness is dead, I'd prefer not to discuss that. Inspector, since Atwood does not wish to discuss this subject, I think you'd better ask Professor Craig what he knows about it. All right. Well, Professor Craig, suppose you answer the question. To be perfectly frank, Inspector... Both Harkness and Atwood hope to be chosen to succeed me as associate professor of chemistry next term. Oh, you mean they were gunning for your job, Professor? You might put it that way, Inspector. What makes you so certain of that, Professor Craig? Well, uh, the regular associate professor died at the beginning of the semester. I was elected as a temporary substitute. Harkness and Atwood were brilliant students, and both of them did all sorts of research in an attempt to outrun me and show me up. Ah. They frequently embarrassed me before the class by posing obscure questions and problems which their wide research had uncovered, problems which which I admit I, I was not able to solve. Ah, well, that gives Atwood a reason for wanting to get rid of Harkness, all right, but also gives you a motive for wanting to get him out of the way. But, Inspector, my job is no safer now than it was before. I told you Atwood was also a rival. Well, that may be true enough, but your alibi doesn't stand up either, Professor. I was in my room alone, studying, between one thirty and 3 o'clock. Just a minute, then, Professor. When Miss Collier and I met you on the campus just before lunch, you said you'd try to join us at the track meet. Yes, that's right, Brandon, but why well, was merely being polite. Naturally, I, I didn't want the whole world to know I was literally chained to the grindstone. All right. I'll be off for now. Hold yourselves available for questioning at any time. Well, thank you, Mr. Treed. Your story checks with what Atwood told us. Just for the records, however, would you mind telling me what you did after leaving the library at 1.30? I... uh... I came straight home, Mr. Bradman. I went to my study to 
revise the notes I'd taken to the library. I'm afraid you'll have to take my word for that. I live alone here. I see. Hmm. Pardon me, Mr. Treat, but is that your college ring you're wearing on your little finger? Oh, yes, why? Oh, I was admiring it, that's all. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Treat. <laughs> suppose Dean Clapper wants with us, Inspector? I don't know, Jim. Here, this is his office. Come in. Inspector White, Mr. Brandon. Come in, please. Inspector White, Mr. Dunn. Thank you. Why did you want to see us about Dean Clapper? I've just been informed that you have subjected Robert Atwood and Professor Craig to a second questioning, and I wish to protest it. Protest it? Yes. You will not find the murder of Harkness in Norton here at Rockland College, gentlemen. There are no murderers here. Rockland is almost a hundred years old. The breath of scandal has never touched it. I refuse to allow you to drag my students and faculty through the mud in an attempt to locate some fanatical criminal. Just a moment, Dean Clapper. This is a police matter, and it's not within the realm of your authority to dictate who shall be questioned. Two men were murdered here in cold blood this afternoon. And we intend to find out who murdered them. Surely a respectable, honest student and an esteemed faculty member should be above suspicion in a violent criminal case of this kind. No one here at Rockland or anywhere else is above suspicion, Dean Clapper. Uh, in fact, I have a few questions for you to answer. What did you say? The inspector would like to know where you were between 2 o'clock and 2.45 this afternoon, Dean Clapper. Well, of all the impertinent... I'm afraid you'll have to answer. Yes, you weren't at the track me to know that. I was at home in my study, preparing an address I'm to deliver tomorrow. Who knows you were in the study at that time? No one except myself. My wife and daughter had gone to the athletic field. When did you first hear about the death of Harkness? My daughter came running home to inform me. What time was that? Oh, I don't know. And I refuse to subject myself to this foolish inquisition another moment. Then you'd better get yourself a lawyer, Dean Clapper. Because we intend to get to the bottom of these murders. Avenger and the Diploma of Death. Well, there's nothing here in the chemistry lab to give us any leads, Inspector. Now, wait a minute, Fern. Look at this piece of paper I found in the back of Atwood's notebook. What do you suppose those letters stand for, Inspector? Yeah, hanged if I know. Capitals O, E, L, and right underneath them, capitals W, X, B. Huh, probably two sets of initials. Oh, and look, on the other side of the paper, Inspector, Roaring Gorge is printed out. Roaring Gorge? Where's that? Why, that's where the fraternity initiations take place. We'd better show this to Jim. Okay. Well, we're supposed to meet him in front of Science Hall at 7.15. We'll just have time to make it. Capitals O-E-L over W-X-V. Written simply without any curlicues. What do you suppose those initials stand for, Jim? They're not initials, Kern. They're not? What are they, then? Look, if you turn this paper upside down, there, what do those letters become? What, Jim, the WXB becomes the Greek letters for Lambda Chi Mu, and the OEL becomes 730. That's right, Kern. I don't get it. Lambda Chi Mu is an honorary club for Rockland graduates, isn't it? Yes. And I heard today that both Harkness and Atwood were pledged to it. Where's Roaring Gorge, friend? Well, it's about a 20-minute drive from here. 
Although we could make it through the woods on foot in about ten minutes. Let's take the car, Jim. All right. But we'll have to hurry. What time is it now, Jim? It's, uh, 7.30, Inspector. Roaring gorgeous, just beyond that next hill. Give the car everything it's got, Inspector. All right, Jim. That was a shot. It came from the gorge. Turn to that lane at the right, Inspector. Okay. There's the gorge. Pull up, Inspector, quick. Come on. Okay. All right. Doesn't seem to be anybody here. Inspector, over this way. Huh? What is it, Jim? What? Hey, who is that? It's Hapwood. He's been shot through the head. Professor Craig must be guilty, Jim. Why, he was the only one who had a motive for killing both Harkness and Atwood. Whoever sent that note to Atwood killed him, Fern. But I'm not quite ready to believe it was Craig. Oh, Jim. Why, it must have been. Well, everyone at the club disclaims all knowledge of the note. Really, Jim, I can't understand you. A motive is always the first thing you look for in a murder case. And, well, here you have a perfect motive. And you're not willing to accept it. Well, Jim, we can all go home now. The Rockland murders are solved. Oh, that's wonderful, Inspector. Who did it? Professor Craig. The evidence against Craig is purely circumstantial, Inspector. Not quite, Jim. I have a witness who saw him leave his house at 7 o'clock last night and head toward the shortcut to Roaring Gorge. You check the distance, I suppose? Sure, I have. A man could cover the distance between Craig's house and the gorge in 23 minutes by walking fast. Mm Mm-hmm. Who's the witness you spoke about? Lawrence Treat. Does Craig admit he left his house at 7 o'clock? No, no. He claims he left at 7.15, but he admits he walked toward the woods behind the library. Well, Jim, I'm driving Craig into headquarters. You coming along? No, Inspector. I'll join you later. You're not convinced about Craig? Well, I'd like to check a few more things here before I close my books on this case. Now, let me get these facts straight, Mr. Treat. You say you were walking past Professor Craig's house at 7 o'clock and saw him come out and head for the shortcut to Roaring Gorge? That's right, Mr. Brandon. Then you strolled up Maple Walk leisurely, noticed Miss Collier, the inspector, and me in front of Science Hall at 7.15? Yes. None of us remember seeing you on Maple Walk. All of you seem to be interested in the piece of paper you were holding. That's right. Where did you go after seeing us, Mr. Treat? I turned back and headed for home. Craig claims he left his house at 7.15. But since you were opposite Science Hall at that time, you must have passed Craig's house 10 or 15 minutes before that. You see, the whole question of Craig's innocence or guilt hinges on that time element. I understand. If uh, Craig didn't leave his house until 7.15, he couldn't possibly have arrived at Roaring Gorge at 7.30 when you heard the shot. That's right. But the time schedule of your walk is conclusive evidence that you saw Craig leave his house at 7. Well, you say Craig admits to that little incident about sending his dog back into the house as he was leaving. Well, that proves I saw him, doesn't it? Yes. Otherwise, I'd be inclined to believe you saw someone else come out of his house at 7 o'clock. I'm sure it was, Professor Craig, Mr. Brandon. Well, the inspector said the case was solved. And after this little talk with you, Mr. Treat, I'm inclined to agree with him. What in the world do you expect to find up here in the tower at Founders Hall? I want to get a bird's eye view of the entire campus, Fern. What for? There's a strange angle to this case that... Fern, I've got it. The library cupola is the focal point, And it's within ten minutes walking distance of the gorge. The library cupola? 
Well, what does that have to do with it? Come on, Fern. I have Atwood's key. We're going to take a look at that cupola. Well, Jim, the first part of your theory was right. A man could stand right here in this cupola and, with the aid of binoculars, command a view of both Craig's house and the front of Science Hall. And he'd be within ten minutes' walking distance of Roaring Gorge. That's right. Oh, Jim. Yes? Look, Mr. Treat and Dean Clapper are in a huddle down there at the side door. Do you suppose they're coming up here? Fern, we've got one minute to muff this case or solve it. Here, uh, take these old chemistry books Harkness and Atwood used. Yeah, open them up and pretend you're taking notes. All right, Jim. Tell anyone who comes into this room that Jim Brandon has found the motive for the Rockland murders and that you know what that motive is. Jim, where are you going? It's time for the Avenger to enter this case, Fern. Listen. Someone's coming. Get to work. Collier, what are you doing here? I'm doing some research work for Jim Brandon, Mr. Treat. Research work? In those books, my dear? Why, yes. You see, Mr. Brandon has found the real motive for the murderers. Brandon just wouldn't give up until he found my secret, would he? Your secret? Don't pretend you don't know what I'm talking about, Miss Collier. I've caught you red-handed. Mr. Treat... Put that gun away. No. I intend to silence you and Brandon with this same gun that silenced Harkness and Atwood. Where is Brandon? Uh, I don't know. Well, I'll find him. But I'll take care of you first. So you know the secret to you. Well, Harkness and Atwood almost worked out the puzzle of the Forrester formula in that book, too. But they didn't live to profit by it. And neither will you, Lawrence Treat. The Avenger is here to take care of that. The Avenger? Where is he? My hand! Oh! I have the gun, Mr. Treat. Good work, young lady. Your aim was perfect. That heavy book hit him right on the wrist. Put your hands up and keep them up, Mr. Treat. No. I chose to play a dangerous game. And I'll play it to the end. Lawrence Treat was not afraid to kill, and he is not afraid to die. No, Treat, don't you? Ah! Oh, Jim. Gather up those books, Fern, and take them to the car. I'll meet you there. Jim, now that you've figured out the formula, what does it mean? It's the famous Forrester formula for dyes, Fern. Everyone thought that old Forrester had taken it with him to the grave. How did Treat get it? Treat stumbled on references to it in Forrester's journals when he was writing his memoirs. He discovered that the key to the formula could be found in one of those old chemistry books Forrester had donated to the library. What was the key, Jim? Certain words and chemical formulas throughout the book were underlined in indelible pencil. But that information had to be arranged in a certain order to make sense. Treat went to work on it, but discovered that both Harkness and Atwood were working on those underlined passages, too. Those two boys were exceptionally brilliant, and Treat must have been afraid they beat him to the solution. So he killed them. But all the evidence pointed to Professor Craig, Jim. What made you keep faith with him in spite of that? Because I knew that the person who sent that note to Atwood wore a heavy ring on the little finger of his right hand. The ring had made deep marks on the paper. Oh, and Professor Craig didn't wear such a ring. No, but Treat did. I noticed it the first time I met him, so I decided to concentrate on him. And it's a lucky thing for Professor Craig you did. Well, I guess this is one founder's day that Rockland College would rather forget. (laughs) Well, don't invite me out to your alma mater for the track meet next year, Fern. I can find enough murders to solve right here in the city.
characters' names, places, and plots used in the Avenger program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a thought. A thought. A thought. Remember, listen for another adventure of... The Avenger. Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable. If you can, as you hear the story I call The Man Who Died Twice. Tonight, we're going to delve into a murder most strange, one that confused many of the greatest legal minds of our day. My story begins in the mansion of Judge Marshall, situated high on a hill overlooking a large New England city. It is early evening, and Judge Marshall, one of the state's foremost jurists, is sitting in his library reading a legal brief. As he intently reads, the French door leading to the court slowly and silently swings open, revealing a huge white-haired man standing in the doorway. His tremendous bent frame shows the remains of a man who'd been a giant in his youth. Suddenly, the judge becomes aware that he isn't alone. He quickly turns and sees his visitor. Who? Who are you? What are you doing here? Don't you remember me, Judge? No, I can't say that I do. Think back. Think back 16 years when you were judge at a murder trial. 16 years? My good man, I presided over a great many murder trials, as you call them, and I I still don't know who you are. Just keep looking at me, Judge, and think back. Think back. You, uh, you do look familiar. Uh, I'll help you remember. My name is Adams. Luke Adams. Luke Adams? Yes, yes, now I remember... I sentenced you to prison for 25 years for killing a man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for killing a man. You, you've aged, so that's why I didn't recognize you. Yes. It's hard to believe I'm only 45, isn't it? I presume you've been paroled? Yes. What do you want? I want to tell you my story, Judge. I want to tell you all the things I never got a chance to tell you at my trial. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Adams, the case is closed. Now, if you don't mind, I... Then I'd... we'll reopen it. I've come to tell you my story, and you're going to listen. Very well, Mr. Adams. Sit down. Thank you. I don't know if you recall, Judge, but my wife, Millie, was a beautiful woman. Yes, I remember. She had the kind of beauty a man can't forget. Yes. Yes, and I suppose that's what caused it all. Millie and I grew up together, and I guess I loved her from the moment we met. The only reason she married me was because of the money I'd inherited. And when I lost it in 29, things were never the same again between us. She hated living in a small village, trying to stretch one dollar into two. Sometimes I think her smiling at other men was her way of getting revenge on me for the way we had to live. The angrier I got, the more she flirted, until she almost drove me out of my mind. Things went on like that, day after day, month after month. Here comes Luke. Hello, Luke. Getting home from work a bit early today, huh? Yeah. 
You know, Mrs. and I were just talking about how hot it is. Yeah. You must have found it fierce, breaking stone in the quarry in this heat. Uh-huh. Well, uh, I've got to be going. See you again. What was he hanging around for? He just happened to be going, Pat. Stop to say hello. Is there anything wrong in that? It's funny. Every time I see you talking to someone, it's always a man. How come I never see you talking to women? Because all the women in this village are a bunch of cats. They hate me because I'm beautiful and they're not. All right. But I'm warning you, I don't want to see Chuck Riker or any other men hanging around here. If I do, there's going to be trouble. The days went by. Millie hardly spoke to me. Nothing I said or did seemed to please her. And yet, just knowing she'd be there when I got home was enough for me. And one day I come home from work. She wasn't alone. Oh, hello, Luke. Home early, aren't you? What's he doing here? Chuck was going past, dropped in to say hello. Just like that, huh? I thought I told you not to let this happen again. If Chuck wants to call on me, why shouldn't he? Right, Chuck? Sure. After all, Luke, there's no use being old-fashioned. We've all known each other since we were kids. What harm is there an old friend dropping in and... Why are you looking at me like that? There's lipstick on your cheek. You'd better let me wipe it off for you. Now, wait a minute, Luke. I can explain. There's no use fighting over... Get up. Uh, Now, wait a minute, Luke. Can't we... Get up. Talking won't help. You'll have to fight your way out. That's it. Pick up that poker. Come on, come on. What are you waiting for? Okay, you asked for it. You're going to get it. No. No, Luke, no. This will learn you... No. Not to hang around other men's wives. Oh. Before I'm through with you, no woman will want to look at you. Luke, Luke stop it. He's out on his feet. Stop it. How does he look to you now, Millie? I'll throw him out, then you and I will settle a few things. Come on, you. Out you go. There's a push to start you on your way. There. Now we come to you. You think I'm afraid of you. Go ahead, hit me. Ruin my looks so no man will ever want to look at me. Go ahead. Millie, don't talk like that. You know how much I love you. Why are you doing this to me? I know I haven't been able to give you all the things you want, but that's no reason to treat me this way. I won't stand for it, Millie. All right, then let's separate. You go your way, and I'll go mine. No. No, I... I couldn't live without you. You know that. I'll never let you go. Your mind, do you hear? Oh, stop it. Millie, don't turn away from me. You make me sick. All right. But I'll never give you up. Never. Millie just stood there looking at me. Contempt in her eyes. I knew we were through, and yet I couldn't give her up. I clung to the small hope that something would happen that would change her. Make her feel toward me as I felt about her. Long, lonely weeks went by... I knew that Millie and I had been the scandal of the village ever since the day I'd beaten Chuck Riker. At the quarry, the men whispered to each other when they thought I wasn't looking. And I could only give vent to my rage by smashing rocks into a thousand small pieces. Then, one day in the autumn, an opportunity came. An opportunity to escape the villagers and their gossip. Millie! Millie, where are you? Here. What is it? Millie. You've always wanted to get away from the village. Now we have a chance. How? Well, I met Mr. Anderson this morning. You remember him. He's an old friend of my father's. What about it? Well, he owns a small farm which he's willing to sell for only $300 down. You mean you want to buy it? Yeah. Just think of it, Millie. A place of our own, 20 miles out in the country, away from the village and the gossip. Do you really think I'd move to a farm? Cut myself off from everything? Well, it's what you need, Millie. A home of your own, a place to work and build. You'd love it, Millie. I know you would. You mean you would. Don't think I don't know what's going on in that head of yours. You want to cut me off from everybody, take me someplace where you can keep an eye on me day and night. Well, I'm not having any part of it. But, Millie, you said yourself you're not happy here. Yes, but I don't want a farm. I want to live in a city. I want to have everything that other women have. But we can't go to the city. There's no work to be had. We're living in a depression. Are we? Well, if you can't give me what I want, there are plenty of other men who can. They'd better not try. 
I'm warning you, Millie, I'll kill any man who tries to take you away from me. Weeks went by. Weeks in which Millie scarcely spoke to me. We lived as strangers in an uneasy truce. I worked from dawn to twilight at the quarry, and as I worked, I, I could sense the men gossiping about Millie and myself. I would think of Millie and wonder what she was doing at that very moment. Steve. Yeah, baby? I can't stand it anymore. I can't go on living with Luke. The way he stares at me with those big cow-like eyes as he is watching every move I make. Well, you'll just have to go on putting up with it for the time being. It's all right for you to say that. You don't have to live with him. Sometimes I wonder if you really love me. Oh, don't talk like that, baby. You know I love you. Would I be putting my neck out like this if I didn't? Nobody knows we're meeting secretly. Maybe not, but sooner or later, someone will see us together, and then there'll really be trouble. Afraid? I've never run away from a fight yet. I don't mind telling you, I wouldn't like to mix with that gorilla husband of yours. I know, I know, Steve. You've got to be careful. Don't worry. I intend to be. Just let me raise some dough, baby. Figure out one or two angles... Then you and I'll be off for the big city. What about Luke? He'd be sure to follow. You don't know what he's like, Steve. He'd never rest till he found us. And when he did... Yeah, you don't have to draw me any pictures. I know that type. If we run off, we'd never have a minute's peace. We'd always be wondering when he was going to catch up with us. Yes. Oh, Steve, what are we going to do? Oh, I don't know, baby. I don't know. We'll just have to sit tight for the time being and be careful not to be seen together. All right, Steve. Oh, cheer up, baby. We'll make the big city yet, and until then, we've got this. Oh, yes, dear. Yeah. Lou? That you? Yeah, Millie. You want me? Yes. I've moved all your things up to the attic. I want you to sleep there from now on. Why? Because you keep me awake half the night with your tossing and turning, and you talk in your sleep. I talk in my sleep? What do I say? You keep yelling my name as if I was murdering you or something. Oh, Millie. You'll be all right in the attic. Yes, Millie. Millie, can I talk to you for a minute? What is it? I saw Mr. Anderson again today. Millie, he says he's willing to let us live free for a year on his farm so we can see how we like it. And if we do, we can buy it. I told you before, I'm not going to live on any farm. But, Millie, why can't we just try it? It won't cost us anything. If we don't like it, we can give it up. No, I tell you, I won't let myself be trapped like that. You're perfectly willing to take a chance on farming, but you won't consider going to the city. But there are 15 million men out of work. What chance would I have of getting a job in the city? If you had an ounce of courage, you'd try. You don't hear men like Steve Hopkins whining about the Depression and trying to make excuses for staying in this miserable hole... Steve Hopkins, huh? I... So that's it. You've been seeing Steve Hopkins? No. No, I... I haven't been seeing You're wrong. You're lying. It's written all over your face. I... You're afraid, aren't you? You're afraid of what I'm going to do to Steve Hopkins? Now, Luke, Luke listen to me. I, I tell you, there's, there's nothing between Steve and myself. When I'm finished with him, you'll never want to look at him again. Where are you going? To the village tavern. He's always there on Saturday nights. Luke, come back! Luke, come back! Hopkins, I want to talk to you. Well, go ahead, Luke. No one's stopping you. You've been making a play for my wife, and I don't like it. You're either drunk or looking for a fight. I haven't spoken to your wife in a year. You're lying. I know you've been seeing her these past weeks while I've been working. You better take it easy, Luke. You're getting to the point where you're suspicious of every man in the village. Don't try to smooth talk me. I know you've been seeing her, and if you try seeing her again, I'll kill you. Ah, <laughs> You don't frighten me, Luke. And if I wanted to see your wife, not you or anyone else could stop me. Oh, no? I'll show you. Ready, boys. Grab it. That's it. Let go of me. Let go hey, of me. Show him. Hold on to him, boys. Wait. Now, Luke, as sheriff of this village, I'd advise you to take it easy. I'll kill him. I'll uh, kill him. I don't like that kind of talk. Now, mind your manners. You'll spend a night in the lockup. No man's going to make a fool out of me and live. Now, get hold of yourself. If Steve was seeing your wife, it'd be common gossip in no time. You know that. He may have fooled you folks, sheriff, but I know better. 
You can protect him here, but just wait until I catch him alone. Just wait. When I got home that night from the tavern, Millie was in her room, her door locked. I went up to the attic and tried to sleep, but I couldn't. I kept seeing Steve Hopkins' face, the way he had smiled at me in the tavern. He might have fooled the others, but but I knew. And he knew that I did. Hours later, I managed to fall asleep. I dreamt that I was alone with Steve and we were fighting. He kept hitting me, but I couldn't feel his punches. All I could feel was my fist smashing again and again into his laughing face. I woke to hear church bells ringing. It was Sunday morning. All that day, except for meals, Millie avoided me. After supper, she went to her room, and I went down to my workshop in the cellar. The next morning when I arrived at the quarry, the men were standing around in small groups, talking to each other. They stopped when they saw me. Then from one of the groups, I saw Sheriff Roden coming towards me. Luke, I want to talk to you. What about? A number of things. Is your sledgehammer... Why, well, sure. That's my initials on the handle. Why is it all wrapped up in paper? I'll ask the questions, Luke. Where were you last night around 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock? In my workshop in the basement. Why? Anybody with you? Well, no, I was alone. Luke, you're under arrest. Under arrest? What for? For the murder of Steve Hopkins. For the murder of Steve Hopkins? Yes. His body was found in his cabin an hour ago. He'd been brutally beaten to death last night around 11. With this sledgehammer, it was found at the scene of the crime. You mean, you think I did it? It sure looks that way. Let's go, Luke. No. No, I won't. I didn't kill Steve Hopkins. You'll get your chance to prove you didn't. Now, let's go. No. I didn't do it. I tell you, I'm innocent. Grab him, man. Let go of me. That's it. Hold him while I get these caps on him. I didn't do it. I tell you, I didn't do it. Silence in the courtroom. Proceed, Mr. King. Sheriff, will you tell the jury in your own words the time and circumstances under which you were notified of the death of Stephen Hopkins? On October 12th, the last year, I received a phone call at 7 o'clock a.m. from Sam Morris. Said that he'd just stopped by at Steve Hopkins' cabin to pick him up for work and had found him murdered. I told Sam not to touch anything. I got to the cabin 15 minutes later. Will you tell the jury what you found? Well, sir, that cabin looked like a slaughterhouse. I uh, don't want to upset anyone with the details, so all I'll say is that Steve Hopkins had been beaten so badly the body was uh, beyond recognition. You say the body was beaten beyond recognition. That's right. Then how were you able to identify it as being Steve Hopkins? Well, first by the ring and wristwatch that was on the body. But most important of all, by the tattooing. By the tattooing? Yes, sir. Steve was quite a tattoo artist, and on his left arm he tattooed a heart with his initials and some girls on it. I reckon just about everyone in this courtroom saw that tattoo on his arm at one time or another. And although the body was beyond recognition... The tattoo was clearly identifiable. Yes, sir. No question about that. Sheriff, when had you last seen the deceased? Uh, Saturday night, October 10th, at the village tavern. Did anything unusual take place at the tavern that night? Yes. Book Adams came into the tavern around 9 o'clock. He accused Steve Hopkins of hanging around Mrs. Adams. Threatened to kill him. Sheriff, can you remember Luke Adams' exact words when he made that threat? Well, his last words before he left the tavern were, just wait till I catch him alone. Just wait. I see. Now, Sheriff, when you arrived at the scene of the crime, did you find the death weapon? Yes, sir. Steve Hopkins had been beaten to death with a sledgehammer. I found it in the cabin, covered with blood. Was there any identification on the sledgehammer? Yes, sir. On the handle were carved the initials. L.A.
Now, Mrs. Adams, you say there was no justification whatsoever for your husband's suspicions. No, none at all. In other words, he was mistaken when he accused Steve Hopkins of forcing his attentions on you. Yes, he was. I see. Now, your husband has testified that on the night of the murder, he was working in the cellar of your home. Where were you that night, Mrs. Adams? Upstairs in my room. Did you see your husband at all that night? No, I didn't. Would it have been possible for him to have left the cellar that night without your knowing about it? Yes, it certainly would. Silence in the courtroom. <coughs> the prisoner will rise. Luke Adams, you have been found guilty of murder in the first degree with a recommendation for mercy. The court hereby sentences you to 25 years imprisonment in the state penitentiary. Twenty-five years imprisonment. Yes, Judge, that was your sentence. The towering iron gates of the penitentiary closed behind me. And I no longer had a name. Only a number. A year after I was in prison, I was informed that Millie had divorced me and disappeared. With that, my last tie with the outside world was gone. Years passed. World-shaking events took place and scarce reached the prison workshop, where I spent long days repairing shoes. Then one day I was notified by the warden that I'd been paroled. I was free. The gates of the penitentiary opened, and once again I joined the living. I came to the city, a stranger, and found employment in a shoe repair store. Day after day I stood by the store window repairing shoes, watching the hurrying crowds. Then late one afternoon, I saw a woman pass. A woman who was a stranger, and yet wasn't. With a sudden shock, I realized that Millie had just passed. Throwing down my tools, I rushed out of the shop and down the street after her. I found her in the crowd and followed. She had hardly changed at all in the 16 years that had gone by. There were streaks of gray in her hair, but... She was as beautiful as ever. I followed her block after block, and soon we were in a residential section. She turned up the path to a large cottage, unlocked the front door, and went in. A moment later, I was ringing the doorbell. Yes, what is it? Don't, don't you recognize me? No, I'm afraid not. It's me, Millie, it's me. How dare you force your way in here like... <gasps> Yeah, Millie. Luke, after all these years. But you, you... You're in prison. I was paroled six months ago. Well, I... Uh, I'm glad to hear that, Luke. I, uh, uh, you you must leave now. I, I'm busy huh? right now. I can't Millie, talk. who is that? I... Millie, who are you talking to? Who's he? Steve. Steve Hopkins. Oh, you're, uh, you're mistaken. The name is Reed, Robert Reed. Steve, it's Luke. Luke? You're not dead. You're not dead. The body in the cabinet wasn't yours. No, no. I went to prison for your murder, but you're alive. They said I killed you, but you're alive. Yes. You let them put me in prison. You framed me. Luke, you must listen to me. You framed me. No, Luke, don't. I didn't... You framed Luke, me. Luke, let go of him. Let Go of it! Don't, Luke! Don't! <clears throat> Whose body was that they found in your cabin? Uh, uh, a young hobo I picked up by the railroad tracks. But the tattooing on the arm. After after I killed him with your sledgehammer, I, I tattooed his left arm to look exactly like mine. I, I put my wristwatch and ring on the body and then beat him beyond recognition. And then you ran away, leaving me to stand trial for murder. Luke, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? You remember Judge Marshall, don't you, Millie? Yes, I, I remember him. Well, I read in the papers a few weeks ago that the judge lives here in a fine mansion overlooking the city. What are you getting at? 
Steve and I are going to visit Judge Marshall. Oh, look, no, you you know what that would mean. Look, look, we have some money. If you'll just forget what's happened, we'll give you money, plenty of it. Yes, well, we'll give you ten thousand dollars. Twenty thousand. I'm not interested in money. Come on, Steve. Luke, you, you can't do this to me. You can't. Luke, you once loved me for my sake. Come don't. along, Steve. No, I, I won't go. If if they find out about that hobo, they'll they'll hang me. I wouldn't have a chance. They let they... You'll come, Steve, one way or another, understand? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> He didn't want to come here, but in the end, he came. In the end, he came. Incredible. Simply incredible. The the man is a monster to have done what he did. Where is this man, Steve Hopkins, now? He's out on the porch, Judge. Bring him in, Mr. Adams. I want to see that man. All right, Judge. Why are you carrying him? He can't walk. Can't walk? What's wrong with him? He's dead. Here, Judge. Dead? Yes, Judge. But but I, I understood he was alive. He was. Up until a half hour ago. You mean you... Yeah, Judge. I put my hands around his throat and squeezed squeezed until he was dead. I killed him. And there's nothing you can do to me, Judge. Nothing. Remember, you sent me to prison for killing Steve Hopkins? For 16 years, I rotted in prison. I've paid my debt to society for Steve Hopkins' death. I've paid it. (laughs) There's nothing you can do to me now. Nothing. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? What happened to Luke Adams? Well, his case became one of the most celebrated controversies of the day. Some legal minds claimed he couldn't be sent to prison again. He'd already been punished. Other legal experts insisted he should be tried again. But in the midst of this raging controversy, poor Luke Adams died and his case was never decided. What do you think? Should Luke Adams have been tried for murder again? Or having already served 16 years for Steve Hopkins' murder, should he have gone free? I should like to know what your verdict is. Send your letters to the mysterious traveler, care of Mutual Broadcasting System, New York 18, New York. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. All characters in today's story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Art Carney, Elspeth Eric, Frank Behrens, and Jackson Beck. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. diabolically complex machine designed for murder. 
The lust to kill off times lies closer to the surface, unrecognized, than is ever dreamed of. That lust is called paranoia, a word meaningless until a simple hairspring motivation turns the sane to insane, cunning, crafty, calculating, held in the vice-like grip of an overwhelming obsession. In a moment, you'll find a deeper meaning in that word paranoia in the story starring Vincent Price. of a train ride. A train ride from Willett Falls to the prison city of Banning. We're to be concerned with only three passengers aboard this train. Two of them, in compartment B, car 92, their wrists locked together in close companionship by gleaming steel handcuffs. The third passenger... One that is always present when two such men ride the train from Willett Falls to Banning City. This third passenger watches keenly the building of the slow, hot fires of a terrible obsession. Davis. Yes? Care to play a game of casino? Oh, no, thanks. I think I'll read. Okay. This is a very interesting article. You should read it yourself. What's it about? The various types of insanity. <laughs> That's quite a thing to be reading. That's quite academic, not the usual tripe at all. Academic or not, I don't go for that stuff. Screwballs and loons. But those are people, too. After all, every one of us is supposed to have some kind of an insane streak. The majority subdue their manias. These weaker ones are the people who fill our asylums. Who told you that? It says so here in the article. Well, I don't believe it. Oh, that's what makes insanity such an interesting subject. The element of uncertainty which surrounds it. Would you believe that there are people who are insane that the finest psychiatrists are unable to detect? Yeah? Yes. A certain type are called paranoiacs. Well... You see, many paranoiacs are fully aware of their deranged state of mind, and they go to great lengths to conceal it. <laughs> that's what makes them so dangerous. That's all very interesting, but I don't care. <laughs> you can keep your, uh, your, uh... Paranoia? Yeah. And I'll take Dick Tracy. Well, everyone to their own taste. But Inspector, mm? if you intend to read the comics, would you be so good as to keep your right hand a bit closer to mine? I find it quite difficult to hold my magazine and turn the page with these handcuffs on. <laughs> Want an apple, Davis? No, thank you, Inspector. Well, I'll slice it in half in case you change your mind later on. It's an attractive knife you have there, Inspector. The handle's mother of pearl, isn't it? Hmm? Uh, oh, yeah. What are you thinking about, Inspector? I was thinking of you, Davis. Me? You're a funny duck. I can't help but wonder about you. Wonder how? Why'd you do it, Davis? Well, now, wasn't it you who suggested we didn't think about it? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, you needn't be, because I don't mind. Not really. Matter of fact, I rather enjoy talking to you. Inspector, have you ever been in love? Well, yes, certainly. But that's a funny question. How was yours? Yeah. See, I didn't tell the others. That rooming house. I lived there myself. I took the room under an assumed name. Dorothy lived right above me. We were engaged once, Dorothy and I, two years ago. We were going to be married. We were very much in love. Then suddenly she started to change toward me. I thought it was my imagination at first. Then all at once I knew it was true. She had changed. Someone else? No, there was no one. That's why I couldn't understand it. We had a date one night. She told me it was all over. And she moved. I searched for her everywhere, and finally I found she had taken a room in a boarding house. I called her many times, but she had left word that she wasn't at home to me. 
That's when I moved there myself. Oh, to get her back? No, no. I, I knew it was impossible as she told me. I, I just wanted to be near her. To see her. I'd watch her go down the stairs to work in the morning. Then I'd hurry home in the evening so I'd be there first to see her come back to her room after work. And she never knew you lived there? No, never. That is until the night before it happened. I met her on the stairs outside the house accidentally. She told me she was going to be married. <laughs> I congratulated her. I remember that. Then I went up to my room, but I couldn't sleep that night. Because I could hear her laughing and talking upstairs with some man. The following night, I heard the same man's voice up in her room. It was the thought of him being there. I didn't like it. Then there was a butcher knife laying on the kitchen table. She took it and I walked up the stairs. I knocked on the door. Dorothy answered and I, I found her alone. It was him that I wanted and so I started to go. Then I looked at her face. She was laughing at me. At me. I couldn't stand it. I took the knife and, and I killed her. Just like that, Inspector. I killed her. Cigarette, Davis? No, thank you. But, Inspector, I, I believe I'll change my mind about that half of the apple. I, can I have it now? Sure. Here. Yeah. Well, would you be good enough to peel it for me, you know? Hmm? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Wait. Wait till I get my knife. Here you are. Oh, I dropped the apple, would you? <laughs> and you dropped your knife, Inspector. Davis! Davis, don't move. You're exceedingly unobserving, Inspector. I didn't dream it would be quite so simple to knock the knife out of your hand. And that over, Davis. Really, Inspector, with this blade in your ribs, aren't you overlooking the fact that I'm giving the orders now? What do you expect to get out of this? First, your key to these handcuffs. All right, give them to me. Be quick about it, please. Thank you. Now your revolver, please. Listen, Davis. You'll never get away with this. Your description will be wired to every police station or sheriff's office in the country. Ah, but you're mistaken. Who is going to wire my description? Why, I... You? Uh... Oh, no, Inspector. I trust that at some time or other you will have the foresight to take out a life insurance policy payable on your death to your wife and children. It would be a shame to see your family left uncared for. <laughs> you mean... I mean that at a propitious moment I intend to kill you, Inspector. Now give me all your credentials and identifications, please, Inspector. What do you want my papers for? You are dull, Inspector. But I suppose no more so than your law enforcement compatriots... You see, I plan on taking your credentials and representing you. <laughs> Rather fortunate that we're quite alike in stature, isn't it? You must be insane to try something like this. That's one of your first profound observations. Do you recall my mentioning paranoiacs a while ago? Yeah. I wouldn't confide this to anyone but you, Inspector. But inasmuch as you're unlikely to repeat anything you hear, I might as well tell you that... For some time now, I've been rather worried that I myself might possibly be mentally afflicted. You're not serious. Oh, but I am quite serious. You see, I've only recently become aware of a certain Machiavellian cleverness in my actions and plots. A cleverness that I must admit was not previously endowed in me. Further, although I like you exceptionally well, Inspector, I'll confess that strangely enough, I'm going to rather enjoy killing you. You are crazy. As I've said, possibly. Say nothing. Yes, who's there? Conductor. What do you want? Open up, please. What do you want? I have to have your tickets. Oh, one moment. Conductor doesn't know you by sight, does he? If answer me, does he know you? No. I'll unlock the door. Give me your wrist. Here, put one of these handcuffs on. Quick. There. You stay beside me. Don't make a move. Understand, not one move. Oh, I'm sorry I was so long in answering. One has yes, to be very... Yes, Inspector Harwell, we were told that you'd have a prisoner with you. Oh? Oh, yes, you were told, of course. I hear the ticket. Ah, uh, if there's anything you should want, Inspector, just press that button for the porter. I have him standing by. Oh, thank you. Well, I hope your trip comes off all right. I'm sure it will, thank you. Well, then I'll be um, getting along. Conductor. Yes? Uh... How long before we reach Banning City? Oh, about an hour and a half, Inspector. Oh, well, thank you again. Sure thing. All right, Inspector. I 
I think we'd better get these handcuffs off now. What do you intend to do now, Davis? Well, Inspector, you heard what the conductor said. One hour and a half until we reach Banning City. That doesn't leave us very much time, does it? What are you getting at? Well, if I'm going to make good my escape, I'll have to start making arrangements now, won't I? Davis. Davis, put that knife away. Forgive me, Inspector, but I'm very afraid that propitious moment has arrived. Davis. Wait. I'm wait, sorry, uh, Inspector. Wait, I'm wait, very... Wait. <laughs> of steam from the locomotive's whistle drowns out the last gurgling cry of Harwell, the inspector, the man with a pearl-handled pocket knife, who realized too late that the affability of his train companion was but a camouflage to hide a razor-edged obsession. <laughs> and three passengers bound from Willett Falls to the prison city of Ben. In our story, starring Vincent Price. As the speeding train hurtles down the threads of steel that leads to the death house at Banning City, Davis stares thoughtfully into the glazed eyes of the man he's just murdered. His cunning, insane mind, carefully, analytically planning his next move, with the same shrewd detachment of a chess player moving a pawn. His eyes flicker down to his wrist, still locked in a steel embrace with that of his victim. And again, his mind floods with the exhilaration of his master craftsmanship, the overpowering strength of his one obsession. Glad you couldn't have stayed long enough to witness the last act of my little drama. For you see, now that I've killed you, the rest becomes quite simple. I have sent for the conductor, Inspector, and do you know why? I'm going to ask him to stop the train so that I might make an important call to headquarters. Thereupon, I will disappear, and by the time your body is discovered, I will undoubtedly be in another county, thanks to your credentials. Oh, but come now, you'd better straighten up a bit. There, there, that's better. Oh, sure, now, I hadn't noticed that you bleed quite profusely. Perhaps we'd better place my handkerchief inside your coat. So you won't appear to be wounded. There you are. I'm sure you'll look... Yes? Yes, who's there? It's the conductor, Inspector Harwell. Oh, wait a minute, please. Well, Inspector, I must be handcuffed to you again, unfortunately. Come in. The uh, porter said you wanted to see me, Inspector. Yes, indeed. It appears that I left some very important papers regarding my prisoner in Willett Falls. This, I'm afraid, will necessitate an immediate phone call. Mm, well, I could have the train stop for you, Inspector. Oh, fine. Only I don't know where you could make a call. This is desert we're passing through. The last stop where you could have got a phone was Cartwright when we picked up our last passenger. Are you sure? <laughs> sure as taxes, Inspector. I'm sorry. However, we're on time, being banning in an hour, if that'll do any good. Of course it won't do me any good. I just finished telling you that. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Inspector. Oh, yes, well, thank you. Say, uh, what's wrong with your, with your friend there? What? Your pal. Is he snoozing? Oh, yes, yes, he is. He's, he's taking a little nap. Oh, how do you like that? A guy that can sleep on his way to the death house. <laughs> Boy, some of these killers are sure cold-blooded, aren't they? Yes. Yes, aren't they, though? Uh, well, Inspector, if that's all, oh, I... Uh... Yes, yes, thank you anyway. So long. Yes, so long. Oh. Well, now what do you think of that, Inspector? It seems that fate has interceded momentarily, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I've never jumped from a moving train before, but, well, the sand should be of help. Oh, wish me luck, Inspector. Now, let's get these handcuffs off, hmm? There. Well, it's clumsy of me to drop your keys, eh? Should be under the seat here. Yes, there. I can't reach them. A 
I'll try it with my foot. I, I can't reach the keys. I can't reach them. And the handcuffs won't come off without those keys. The handcuffs won't come off. <laughs> If you were alive, Inspector, you'd think me a coward, wouldn't you, to become frightened when I found myself unable to reach those handcuff keys. <laughs> but you would admire me for realizing in time that frenzy must be exchanged for resourcefulness, wouldn't you? <laughs> yes, who's that? I'm sorry to bother you, Inspector. Yes, Conductor, what is it? Uh, this lady here got on a cart right, and we can't find a place for her to sit in the chair car. Oh? She's only going as far as Banning, and I suggested she might share your compartment, if you don't mind. Well, it so happens I do mind. This compartment is reserved by the police department of Willett Falls, and not for the convenience of wayward travelers. Now, uh, just a minute. Oh, now, look. Conductor, I didn't know. Uh, it's all right, miss. Uh, listen, Inspector, this compartment is not reserved. It's a courtesy that the line shows to the police department whenever possible. You'll find that your ticket actually calls for a chair car in Coach 3. Now, if you don't intend to cooperate with us, I'll have to ask you to move to Coach 3. That is, if you can get in at all. Well, under the circumstances, I don't seem to have much choice, do I? Show the lady in. All right, here you are, miss. Forty minutes before we reach Banning, I'll call you. Oh, thank you, Conductor. Yes, Conductor. By all means, call us when we reach Banning City. We'll be waiting. Inspector, I... I'm really terribly sorry that my company was more or less forced upon you. I'd like to apologize. It's all right. Trains are crowded these days. I suppose we just have to make the best of it. I can understand that you would have some hesitancy about having a woman in the same compartment with a murderer. Murderer? Yes, your conductor told me all about your prisoner. But it really doesn't frighten me at all. It doesn't? No. You don't mind being here with a murderer? Oh, not as long as you're here. I'll just trust you to take care of the situation. You... you trust me? Of course. But you don't know who I am. <laughs> what difference does that make? In any way, I do know who you are. You're Inspector Harwell of the Willett Falls Police Department. The conductor told me that, too. What's your name? Dorothy. Dorothy Jones. I hate the name of Jones, don't you? No. No, I like it. And I like Dorothy, too. I used to know a Dorothy once. Did you? Yes, she looked something like you. She was blonde and tall and young and pretty like you. Thank you. Whatever happened to her? What? Where is she now? Oh, she went away. She took a long trip. On a boat, I think. Oh, I've always wanted to go on a long trip. I never get the chance, though. Maybe you will. Say, your prisoner, he's certainly a sound sleeper, isn't he? Uh, yes. Yes, he is that. He doesn't even look like he's breathing. No, no. Some people sleep that way, I guess. He could be dead and you wouldn't even know it, would you? Don't talk like that. What? What's wrong, Inspector? You seem worried. I'm not worried. Why should I be worried? It's just that this job gets on my nerves. I'm not made of steel. You know, you're not much like a detective. What makes you say that? I thought all detectives had nerves of steel. I, I didn't think any of you ever got bothered, but... Inspector, your coat. What? Your coat. It's got blood on it. Oh, oh well, I was I was peeling an apple. I cut my hand. I, I cut my hand, you understand? Oh, what are you staring at? It's the other man who's bleeding. It's the other man. I... Quiet. I... Quiet. You hear me? Don't raise your voice. You... You've got a gun. Yes, his gun. And you may be assured that I'll use it unless you do exactly as I say. Now, listen closely, Miss Jones. On the floor beneath this seat, you'll find the keys to these handcuffs. Be good enough to get them for me, please. Quickly, please. Here. Thank you. There. That's better. Now, why, Miss Jones, you appear to be shocked. Is something troubling you? You're not the inspector. You... You're a murderer. You killed Inspector Harwell, didn't you? I'm afraid so. Oh, but come now. Let's not be morbid about it. They'll catch you. They will. I hardly think so. You see, Miss Jones, since you've been kind enough to help me dispense with these bracelets, the problem of escape really becomes quite simple once again. What are you going to do? You're frightened of me, aren't you? You're thinking that I might kill you? That's an understandable emotion. Don't. Don't come any closer. Keep away from... I'll relieve you of your coat, please. What? What do you want with my coat? 
Oh, you're tearing it. Of course. I shall need these strips of cloth to bind and gag you. Now, hold out your wrists, and we'll slip these bracelets on. There, now, we'll bind your feet. No. No, let me go. I'll have to ask you not to struggle, Miss Jones. I realize how unpleasant this must be for you. However, it would be considerably more unpleasant if I should be forced to pull this trigger. You must be out of your mind. Oh, now, that's strange. Inspector Harwell said the same thing just before he died. Now, open your mouth, please. No, I... No. Yeah. No. That's fine. I do. Well, now, I... Oh. I believe it's time for me to take my leave. I'll say goodbye and... Oh. Wait. Wait a minute. The train's slowing down. Something's wrong. They... Oh. oh, of course, the train's taking a siding. I'll wait until we slow down a bit more, and then I shall... I shall leap from this window. In approximately 30 minutes, this train will be pulling into Banning City. But without me, because Miss Jones, I'll be on my way to freedom. It's done, and I've planned it all myself. Nothing could go wrong now. Nothing. Well, goodbye, Miss Jones. Dorothy. Goodbye. Charlie, catch this wire from Cartwright. Holy smoke, so that's the delay. Let me have that phone, Mac. Hello? Hello. This is the station agent in Banning City. You better send an ambulance to Centerville Junction. Some guy jumped in front of an eastbound special just as it was passing the local. Huh? No, he's dead. Goodbye. <laughs> You have been listening to Obsession. has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. The Signal Oil Program... The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, lie or consequences. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently, I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Before the whisper tells you his story, I think you'd enjoy hearing about a signal gasoline station in San Francisco, California that's been run by the same owner, Frank Miley, for 20 years. When I tell you that many customers have been dealing with Frank Miley the full 20 years he's been serving San Francisco, you'll know he really has something to offer. And that something is longer car life. You see, Frank Miley, like all signal gasoline dealers, has made his customers' cars his life's business. He knows cars thoroughly, and the little tricks that keep them running smooth and long. When customers leave their cars with Frank Miley's signal station, they know every part, including the important unseen parts, is going to receive the thorough, conscientious service it needs. Because Frank Miley, like your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer, is in his own business and will be there year after year to back up his work. 
Well, that in a nutshell is why cars serviced by independent signal dealers with signal quality products actually do go farther. And it's why now, when your car has to last out the duration, is a mighty good time for you to get acquainted with your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, the Whistler. To the men who live by matching wits with the hardened criminals who deal in narcotics, the threat of violence is always present. But sometimes that violence has unexpected consequences. Witness the experience of Mark Hoskins, veteran detective of the narcotics detail. It was late one fall evening that Mark, with his fellow officer, Red Andrews, was making his way down a blackened alley toward the hideout of two criminals prominent in the dope trade. The door right at the top. Open up. But if we should need it, I spotted it this afternoon when I cased the setup. Anybody see you? No, nobody but the druggist. I just bought a package of cigarettes. Okay. Well, come on. Let's go get your promotion. What do you mean by that? We've been on this assignment a long time. If we crack it, you know the old man will give you a promotion. Why just me? Are you kidding? You're the fair-haired boy. I'm a dog around this department. The chief's had a knife in my back a long time. He likes an excuse to twist it. You'll get the promotion. You sound jealous, Mark. Maybe I am. Come on, let's go. Better stay in close to the wall. Right. Red, look out. Somebody under the stairs. You bet there's somebody under the stairs. Hey, behind you, Mark. Huh? There's another with a blackjack. Huh? Oh, I see you. What? Let's go, Joe. I knew I'd catch up with you, Finley. Uh, no, you haven't. Come on. Oh! Oh! oh, nuts. They got away, Mark. Mark! Hey, Mark. Mark, you all right? Hey, Mark. Oh, they really let you have one that time, didn't they? Hey, what's going on up there? I heard shooting. Come here. It's all right. We're police. Well, what's wrong? Look, did you see a couple of guys duck out of the alley? Yes, yes, just after the shooting. They jumped into a car and drove off. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Hey, what's wrong with this guy? They blackjacked him. Look. Yeah? Go into that drugstore on the corner. You can go through the back door. Call an ambulance while I take care of him. Police ambulance? Yeah. Well, who shall I tell him wants it? Red Andrews. Okay. <laughs> come from? The alley. I came in the back door. Look, there's a cop out there hurt. Looks like it may be fatal. And the other one asked me to call an ambulance. What were they doing? Oh, after some crooks, I guess. Can I use your phone? Sure. Sure, go ahead. Thanks. Huh, let's see. Yeah, there's the police department number. I yeah, wonder how bad that guy's hurt. Say, there's been an accident. Location, please. Behind Small's Drugstore, 18th and Hunter. Two of your men tangled with some crooks. Yeah? Well, one of your men is out cold, and the other asked me to call an ambulance. Uh, my name is Peters. What about the crooks? Oh, they got away, both of them. Our man badly hurt? Yes. The other one, said his name was Red Andrews, asked me to hurry in here and phone. He was working over the one that was out. Okay, we'll get a car right over. Thanks. Goodbye. Say... Did I hear another shot while I was in there? Sounded like it. Well, I'd better go see, I guess. I'd go with you, only I'm on, alone here. Can't leave my store unattended, you know. I got the police all right. They said they'd send an ambulance right away. Hey! Who, who are you? You, you're the one that was knocked out. Those crooks. I gotta get... And him! Crooks. Look, he's hurt now. I gotta get... The... Who's crooks? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, look, just, just take it easy. An ambulance is coming. I'll be... i got to take a look at this. this. Hey. Hey, this man isn't just hurt. He's dead. Sorry to have to bring you down to the station, Peters, but you understand. You're the nearest thing we have to a witness. I understand. I, I think I've told you everything I know. Well, there's just one thing I don't get. Red Andrews was shot. He must have been dead when you called for an ambulance. No. No, I don't think so. 
He's the one who asked me to call. Oh. It was the other guy who was out. Mm-hmm. Andrews was kneeling down over him. But, well, when I got back, Andrews was dead and the other guy was up. He was walking around kind of like he was in a daze. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Well, we're not going to hold you, of course, but we'd like to be sure you stay in town. Oh, of course. Well, all right. That's all for now. I want to get over to the hospital and see Hopkins. <laughs> You managed to butch another one, didn't you? Take the knife out of my back, Chief. We got a tough break, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Red Andrews got such a tough break that it killed him. Couldn't you guys have been on your toes? They must have been tipped off. They were laying for us under the stairs. Yeah? Well, regardless of how it happened, I'm holding you responsible for catching the guys that did it. I don't like to have my men bumped off, especially men like Andrews. Do you think I'd have let it happen if I could have helped it? Uh, I don't know. Well, that's not the point, anyway. The point is, is after you were knocked out, somebody killed Red Andrews. Well, Beretti and Finley must have come back. Probably, but it's up to you to prove it and bring them in. Well, Mark, some rather startling developments took place while you were unconscious. You and Red Andrews exchanged positions in a most peculiar manner. And the chief putting you on the spot to explain it. Well, now that you're out of the hospital, you better do some checking up. First thing will be to locate Beretti and Finley again. Better check your gun first, though. They're desperate characters, you know. Oh, how do you explain that, Mark? You don't remember firing your gun last night, do you? They knocked you out before you even drew your gun, and yet your gun has been fired. At least there's one round missing. And now, back at the scene of the crime, you've found another clue. An empty shell from your gun. Some shells from Andrew's gun, too, but they were fired after you were knocked out. So your gun had been fired, and now you know where. At the spot where Red was shot. Does that suggest anything to you, Mark? No. No, it couldn't be. I didn't like him, but I wouldn't have... I couldn't have been that much out of my head. Could I? I've got to find out more about this. Good morning. Good morning. Can I get something for you? Were you the druggist on duty here last night? Yes, it's hard to get help these days. I have to work night and day. Yeah, uh, I understand a guy called an ambulance from here last night. Yes, that's right. Did he say anything to you? Just that there were a couple of officers in the alley and that one of them had been hurt. I see. How long was he in here? Oh, about four minutes, I guess. Did you see anyone else while he was phoning? Mm, no. No, I didn't. But see here. Who are you? I'm the guy that was knocked out. Oh. Well, you you seem to have recovered. Yeah, outside of a lump on the back of my head. Well, the fellow didn't tell me anything other than the report he made to the police. Okay. Thanks. Yes? Uh, is your name Peters? Yes. Uh, you're the guy who called the ambulance about that affair behind Small's drugstore last night, aren't you? That's right. Come in. Oh, thanks. They told me at the department you'd probably be willing to answer some questions. And, uh, who are you? Take a good look. Don't you recognize me? Uh, oh, yes. Yes, you're the one the that... The one that was knocked out. Yes. Yeah. I believe you reported to the chief that Red Andrews was kneeling down working over me when you left to call the ambulance, is that right? Yes, yes, that's what I told you. And the report also states that as you entered the alley after hearing the shots, you saw two men run out of the alley, jump into a car, and drive off. Yes, that's what I saw. Good. Now listen carefully. Were you in the drugstore long enough for those men to drive around the block, enter the alley from the other end, kill Red Andrews, and make a getaway before you got back? Oh, let me see... I imagine it took less than five minutes, but, well, yes, I believe there would have been time for that. Thanks a lot, mister. I guess that just about answers my question. I've got a hunch that's exactly what happened. I beg your pardon, but I don't think so. Huh? Why not? Because when I left to call the ambulance, you were lying flat on your face across the alley. If they'd have driven back, they'd have run over you. Or if you'd been up and around... I think they'd have shot you, too. He 
You are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company, marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Your theory of Finley and Beretti having come back and killed Red has been blasted. This is beginning to simmer down to far too few suspects, isn't it? From the way the evidence is pointing, you're going to be incapable of weighing it in an unbiased manner. It's placing too much suspicion on you. Of course, you're not ready to face an admission yet, not even to yourself. But if you won't admit killing Red, you'd better find out who did. You know that Red fired several shots after you were knocked out. But that doesn't mean that Finley and Beretti couldn't have fired some, too. Maybe they shot Red during the fight and it didn't kill him instantly. Maybe he had the bullet in him all the time he was working over you. If worth investigating, Mark, the uh, coroner could help you there. Hello, Doc. Oh, hello, Hoskins. Glad to see you. Doc, can I speak to you for a minute? Certainly. Sit down. Thanks. Look, you did the autopsy on Red Andrews this morning, didn't you? Yes, yes. Terrible thing. You determined the cause of death? And that's right. He died of injuries sustained from a gunshot. Doc, were you able to tell from the nature of the wound how long Red lived after the shot was fired? Oh, yes. Definitely? Definitely. Well, what would you say, Doc? Could he have lived ten minutes, five minutes? Well, if Red Andrews lived ten seconds after that shot was fired, it would have been a miracle. What? Yeah, he was shot through the heart. Close range. Died instantly. <laughs> Well, there goes another theory. Red couldn't have been shot by the crooks at the start of the fight. And they couldn't have driven back in the alley without running over you. But who else could have done it? Who else had the opportunity? Silly, isn't it, to suspect yourself? But the fact remains that Red Andrews was the fair-haired boy of the department. Everybody knows that. And the chief knows that you were jealous of his position because Red stood between you and promotion. Do you suppose it could have been possible that your subconscious resentment of Red could have been translated into irresponsible action while you were knocked out? Possibility or not, you better crack this thing before the chief gets such an idea or before he puts someone else on the case to start prying around. Oh, hello, Hoskin. Hi. Say, uh, did the lab stuff on Andrews come through you? Uh, yes, yes, I did the analysis. You handled the ballistics report, huh? Yes, a bullet was fired at close range from a thirty-eight service pistol. Oh, was, huh? Yes, probably by a gun that had been stolen from some officer. Probably. Did... Did you retrieve the bullet? Mm, yes. Mind if I have a look at it? Oh, sure. I have it right here. Ah. Here you are. Well, would it be all right if I borrowed it? Well, if the chief's assigned me to the case, I want to make a comparison, okay? Oh. Well, <clears throat> well I guess it's all right. Uh, if you'll be personally responsible for it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But uh, you'll be sure to take good care of it, all right. <laughs> It'll be best to know for sure, won't it, Mark? Jumping to conclusion isn't good detection. You'll be perfectly safe down there in your basement. With that pillow muffling the gun, no one will hear the shot. Then you can dig the bullet out of that sawdust barrel and compare the rifling with the one that killed Andrews. Then you'll know, won't you, Mark? be no doubt. The riflings are the same. The bullet that killed Red Andrews was fired from your gun, Mark. Looks as though you'd solved the murder beyond a reasonable doubt. All the circumstances have pointed towards you all along. And now you've found the clinching clue. Maybe it would be best if you try to cover up what you know. Or is it too late? Does the chief know something, too? Could that be why he's sent for you? Hoskins, I don't understand it. Here we got a clear-cut case of first-degree murder. Motive, opportunity, corpus electi, everything. 
And yet you stammer around about the proof. Well? Well, it seems obvious who killed Red. Does it? Certainly. The crooks you were after. So bring him in. This is becoming a pretty mess, isn't it, Mark? You don't dare bring in Beretti and Finley. As long as they're suspected, suspicion will be removed from you. But if you bring them in, they'll prove that they didn't do it. And then there'll be only one suspect left. You, Mark, you. But the chief's going to put another man on the case soon if you don't turn up something. That bullet. You'd better do something about that before another detective starts snooping around. How about a switch? A bullet from a different gun instead of the one they dug out of Andrews. Maybe worth a try, Mark. Say, I... I brought the bullet back. Sorry I was so long. Huh? Oh, oh, yes, yes. The Andrews bullet. Yeah. Hope you haven't been worried about it. Huh? Oh, no, no. I wasn't worried about it. We made a set of microfilm pictures of the bullet when it first came in. Pictures of the right bullet. And now you've substituted another. That'll look mighty bad for you, Mark. You're getting in deeper and deeper, aren't you, Mark? First, your own deduction has stamped you as a criminal, guilty of manslaughter. Now your efforts to cover up are going to make it look like premeditated murder. You're wasting precious time now, Mark. Three days pass, and then there's something else. What does this mean, Mark? A note asking you to see Ben Tolan, one of the best detectives on the force. Uh, the sergeant gave me your message, Ben. Uh, oh, yes, Hopkins. Come in. I want to talk to you. You, uh, you know what's happened? No, I don't think I do. Well, a couple of days ago, the chief assignment of the Andrews case. Oh. I know what it'll mean to you to crack this case, and I didn't intend to get in your way. But it's a funny thing, Mark. I just did some routine checking in order to look busy. But I ran to a mighty strange thing. Oh? Yeah. I went to the lab, and they told me that you'd borrowed the bullet. Yes, I... I wanted to check it. I... Yeah, I know. And the trouble is, you got mixed up. The bullet you returned isn't the right one, Mark. I... Do... What do you mean? They made a microfilm of the right one, and the one you brought back doesn't fit. Doesn't it? No. Why did you switch it, Mark? What makes you think I switched it? Maybe I brought back the wrong bullet, but there's no... I know you too well to think that you'd return the wrong bullet by mistake, Mark. You're too good a detective for that. What are you driving at? Just this. The bullet gave me some other ideas, and I checked up on them, too. So? I know who killed Red Andrews. You know? I think you know, too. Only I decided that I'd let you crack the case if you could. Well, Mark, you still have a chance to do it. So Ben Tolan knows. He's found out about you, hasn't he, Mark? But it would seem that he's still trying to give you a chance to confess. He thinks it might be easier on you that way, doesn't he, Mark? But he's wrong. It won't be simply a matter of a few years for manslaughter. They'll hang you, Mark. And that's what you're thinking while pacing back and forth in your room. That's like you're trapped. The only way out doesn't make sense. Or does it? If Tolan is found dead, he can't tell. <laughs> yes. Then again, only you would know. Uh, that's a well-isolated house where Tolan lives, isn't it? Well, there he sits, Mark, completely unaware of the danger. Why don't you pull the trigger, Mark? You think it might be better to let Tolan know why he's going to die? You, you could take him by surprise. He hasn't a gun in sight. Tolan? Uh, what? Oh, you, Hoskins. Yeah. Surprised? Mark, what are you doing here? I've been trying to get a hold of you. Uh, what's the idea of the gun? I came to settle something with you, Tolan. What's the matter with you? You're acting screwy. You've been acting funny for days. Funny, have I? Well, maybe it's funny to you. You're not in my spot. Well, you wouldn't be in such a spot if you'd keep your head. Although I suppose the blow you received... Sure, sure. But I'm not taking a chance. I'm trying to prove that. What are you talking about? You're not turning in that evidence you collected, Mr. Tolan. I'm sorry, Mark, but I waited as long as I could. 
What do you mean? I left a complete report after work tonight. It'll be on the chief's desk tomorrow morning. So he beat you to it, Mark. No use to kill Tolan now. Then you'd be facing two rats. But wait. Yes. You're going to hang anyway. A man can only pay the supreme penalty once, Mark. You're thinking you might as well take Tolan with you. Pay him for his dirty snooping. You might have covered up if it hadn't have been for him, Mark. But he's exposed you. It's his fault. Mark, Mark, put down that gun. Don't be a fool. I'm not a fool. You don't know what you're doing. Oh, yes, I do. For the first time in days, I'm thinking straight. Now, for the first time, I see exactly what I have to do. You're crazy. Maybe, but my last chance is to try a getaway. I might make it, only you aren't going to be around to know. You had to turn in the dope on me, didn't you? All right, you're going to pay for it. What are you talking about? Just this. Maybe I did kill Red. But I didn't do it on purpose, and I'm not going to lay down and take the rap for it. You were hurt badly, weren't you? What do you mean? I don't know where you got the idea, but you're wrong. You didn't kill Red Andrews. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, here are two tips for making your gas ration coupons go farther. One, accelerate gradually. Never force your motor by stepping down hard on the gas pedal. You're sure to save precious gasoline in this way. And here's the second tip. Use the gasoline that's scientifically engineered to give you maximum miles per gallon. Signal's famous go-farther gasoline. For years, more and more Western drivers, who keep careful record of mileage, have been switching to Signal gasoline. Even today, although certain gasoline ingredients have gone to war, and no gasoline can give you the brilliant performance of pre-war Signal gasoline, the Signal Oil Company is still producing the finest gasoline that can be made today. And Signal still places the emphasis on miles. So the next time you trade one of your ration coupons for gasoline, remember, your best buy today is Signal Go Farther Gasoline. And the place to get it is your neighborhood Signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Mark, you are about to kill the one man who knows you didn't kill Red Andrews. But how can this be? You're a good detective, and all the evidence pointed unquestionably towards you. How could Tolan have discovered something you overlooked? And yet he's told you that you didn't do it. What? I, I didn't kill Red? No. No, no, look, I'll tell you. There was a very obvious clue. You would have caught it if you hadn't been so busy covering up for yourself. I saw it immediately. Go on, keep talking. You cornered these crooks in an alley behind the drugstore. And they were trafficking an illegal sale of drugs. Get it? Drugs, drugstore. Well, all I did was to go on from there. Well, where did that take you? To the druggist. He was the brains of a dope ring. Now, when you and Red traced the peddlers that close to his store, he figured that you had to dope on him, too. So when Peters went into the phone booth, the druggist slipped out the back door and into the alley. Red was bending down, facing him. And the druggist went to help him. He bent down, jerked his gun from the holster, and he shot Red. He was back in the store by the time Peters came out of the phone booth. Yeah, he had my gun. Why didn't he kill me, too? Peters had told him that your injury looked fatal, that he didn't have time to check closely, but he figured that he'd taken care of both the cops who had anything on him, but he didn't. And if you haven't been fool enough to obliterate his fingerprints on your gun... Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that'll cinch it. Yeah, tomorrow morning, you'll be in jail for the murder of Red Andrews. <laughs> Not you, Mark. Not you. Well, Mark, you almost convicted yourself of murder, didn't you? From now on, you'd better be careful whom you decide to kill. You almost shot Tolan. And Tolan is the one who saved your hide. From yourself, Mark.
Next Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil program will bring you another strange tale by The Whistler. The Signal Oil program is broadcast for your entertainment by The Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil program, produced by George W. Allen, with story by Dwight Hauser, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the Night Beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began when I bumped into a little old man who claimed he was dead and proved it. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. My job is to prowl Chicago at night looking for that ever-loving story that's always out there in the darkness waiting for me. But, like most working stiffs, one day a week, I'm a free man. And this was that day. It was one of those hot spring days that come at you out of nowhere. Hot like only Chicago and one other place can get. I woke up late in the afternoon and went outside for a breath of humidity. I opened my collar and rolled up my sleeves. Man, it was sizzling. There was a little park ahead. I was just going to stretch out on the grass when I saw him. My first thought was, pass the salt tablets quick. The sun's got me and I'm seeing things. But no... He was real, all right. Sitting on a park bench on this boiling day, a fat old guy in a heavy overcoat with muffler, galoshes, and gloves. I went over to him. He looked up and smiled. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Sit down. Sit down. You look tired. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Nothing is worth getting tired for. Man is here for such a little while. Yeah, Ah, uh, look, uh, forgive me for bringing this up, but I, uh, I think it's only fair to tell you, at this moment, the temperature in this city is pretty close to 100 degrees. Oh, is that so? Uh, yeah. <laughs> for two cents, I trade everything I'm wearing for one heart shafter in Mark's fig leaf. You are lucky, young man. To feel the good sun, yes, that is something fine. As for me, I am chilled to the bone. In that overcoat and that muffler? Yes. <laughs> How could any living thing be cold on a day like this? Mm. I suppose that is just it. What? I'm not a living thing. No, I'm afraid I'm quite dead. I think I'll walk around a bit. Goodbye. Uh, say, say. Hmm? I, uh, I suppose I'm just inquisitive, but uh, you see, that's my business. I'm a newspaper man. Oh, yes. An honorable profession. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, just, uh, why do you think you're dead? Think? So you don't believe me, either. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's silly, isn't it? Uh, when did you die? I, the funeral was last week. A very nice funeral. I regret only that there were no plumed horses. Plumed horses? Uh -huh. In the old country, that was a requirement for the head of a family. But in America, of course, such customs seem foolish. Uh, yeah, yeah, foolish. Mm -hmm. uh, you still don't believe me? Well, let's say that I'm just an old skeptic. All right, young man. To doubt everything in this life is to miss so much of life's true magnificence. You need a lesson. Uh, come with me. So I went with him, this strange man so comfortable in an overcoat on this oppressive day. We stopped at the first large office building and went into the lobby. 
The old man took me to the directory on the wall. Can you find the name of a doctor? A doctor? Why do you want a doctor? Ah, uh, you will see. Uh-huh. Ah, uh, yes, yes, there's a Dr. E.M. Herrick, suite 706. Is he good? I don't know. He's the only one listed. Uh, he doesn't have to be too good. Come on. The receptionist in the doctor's suite eyed us quite distastefully, but in a reasonable time, we were ushered into Dr. Herrick's presence. He was a nice little fella, but the sight of the old man seemed to confuse him. Now, uh, just what seems to be the trouble, Mr. Uh, uh... Henry Kazarian. Yes. Well? I want you to examine me and tell the newspaper man what you find. Newspaper man? Well, I'm afraid I don't understand. And I'm afraid I can't help you, Doc. Why not uh, examine him and let it go, then? Yes. Please do. But uh, what seems to be the trouble with you? Uh, what are your symptoms? Uh, my symptoms were discovering the world no longer needed me. That can be very painful. Oh, but this isn't anything to... Oh, wor- come on, Doc. Will you? It's my day off. Let's get it over with. Hmm? All right. Now, Mr. Kazarian, uh, take off your overcoat and shirt. <laughs> The old guy undressed to the waist. His skin looked yellow and faded, but I figured that could happen to anyone his age. The doctor smiled, fastened his stethoscope to his ears, and began his examination. I put a cigarette in my mouth, but... I never lit that cigarette. I was watching the doctor. I was watching the color drain from his face. I was watching his fingers start shaking like he was trying to make nine the hard way. The doctor touched the stethoscope to a dozen parts of the old man's chest. Now he looked up, and it seemed to me, in those few seconds, he'd aged ten years. Mr. Kazarian, I I want you to wait in the next room. Uh Now, what did you find, doctor? I'm sure the newspaper man would be most interested. I I told you to wait in the next room. Take your coat and shirt. I'll be right with you. Yes, all right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I can't believe it. It's impossible. It's a trick, a hypnotic trick. No, 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 that's not true. Oh, you're not going to tell me that that old man is really... Not the slightest heartbeat. What? No cardiovascular reaction whatsoever. That man is... He... Oh, no, this is crazy. Maybe it's your stethoscope. Maybe it's on the bum or something. No, no, that's not the answer. Then what is the answer? Are you trying to tell me that that guy is really dead? Let's get him back in here. Let's talk to him. Yes, yes, by all means. He's gone. But how? This door leads into the hall. He's not in the hall. You're not going to print this in the paper, are you? Print it? How could I? The city editor would fire me so fast my head would spin. He'd say I was dead drunk. But if you were to confirm... No. What? Never. If you or your editor or anyone else ever calls me about this, I'll swear I never saw you or the old man before in all my life. I have to protect my reputation. Uh, You can understand that, can't you? Understand? At this point, I understand very little, Herr Doctor. After I left the doctor's office, I looked around the building for the old man. He was gone, all right, but his memory lingered on. Who was fooling who? I went into a phone booth and called the medical association to ask about the professional standing of Dr. Herrick. A nasal-voiced young woman informed me that Dr. Herrick was one of the most able physicians in the city. And her manner indicated that I should have had my mouth washed out with soap for even asking. After that, I looked up the name Kazarian in the phone book. It was there, Henry Kazarian, 612 Post Street. I telephoned, but the line was busy, so I hopped into a cab and took a ride out. It was a neat little white bungalow, but all the shades were down. I rang the bell for a long time before the door opened. Yes? What is it? I'd like to talk to Henry Kazarian. Who? Henry Kazarian. Henry. Oh, what's wrong? You have... You have not heard about my Henry. Hmm? He is dead. But, lady... We buried him. Two days ago. But that can't be. I can't believe it myself. It seemed like I suddenly wake up and there would be Henry saying, All right, Mama, get up. Get up, you're lazy enough for three wives. Uh, 
Uh, he was buried two days ago. Yeah, from Carell's Temple of Rest. A very wonderful service. All that was lacking was the plumed horses. The plumed horses. Oh, yes. mm, Papa, he would have been so mad if he knew there was no plumed horses. Uh, yes, he certainly was. Yeah. I mean that... Uh, Mrs. Kazarian, I'd like to talk to you. May we go inside? No, and... but... We are in mourning. If you want to know about the funeral, talk to Mr. Carell. Yes, I buried Mr. Kazarian. Why do you ask? Why, uh, for the very trivial reason, Mr. Carell, that I spent the afternoon with him. Uh, 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 I'm a very busy man, Mr. Stone, very busy. You think I'm crazy, huh? Well, I never saw Kazarian in my life, but here's how he looked to me this afternoon. A short, fat guy, about 65. Looks like he ate too much good food all his life. A mustache that just about drooped down to his chin. You look a little pale, Mr. Carell. You uh, saw his picture somewhere? No! I tell you, he's alive. I even went with him to a doctor. Oh, really? Well, my goodness, and what did the doctor say? He, uh... Yes, Mr. Stone. All right, where is he buried? At a cemetery at the edge of the city. Uh, I've got to go there on, uh, well, another matter, if you care to come along. Yes, indeed I would, Mr. Carell. Indeed I would. Uh, right here, Mr. Stone, this mound. You see, the earth is very fresh and the flowers have hardly wilted. But listen, Mr. Carell, it can't be him. Mr. Stone, the only reason I'm doing this is to avoid any stupid sensational publicity. Carell's Temple of Rest is one of the most highly respected... Yes, yes, and Dr. Herrick is one of the most highly respected doctors, and Mrs. Kazarian is a grieving widow. There's got to be a logical answer to this. There's just got to be. You are listening to Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. When the undertaker brought me back to town, I called an insurance clearinghouse to find out if anyone had cashed in a policy on Mr. Kazarian. No, Mr. Kazarian didn't carry any insurance, so that wasn't the answer. I was beginning to get a little panicky. It was after six o'clock and I wasn't a bit hungry. I started walking home to see if I could figure out one thing in all that happened that made even a little sense. <laughs> Best I could come up with was that everybody was right, that Kazarian really was dead. I was too, and I didn't know it yet. I, uh, as I laughed a great deal at that. But just the same, I weighed myself on the first penny scale I passed, and I looked at my tongue in the little mirror. I was just a couple of blocks away from home, and I felt somebody tugging at my sleeve. Mister, mm -hmm. what's the matter? You hot or something? What are you talking about? Somebody's following you. Following me? An old guy wearing an overcoat? No, a young fella. What? Don't look back yet, but he's wearing a blue sport jacket and he's built like an aircraft carrier. How long has he been following me? For the last few blocks. All right. Here. Uh, take this and then get lost. Sure. Thanks, mister. Okay. I figured you yeah. ought to know. I kept walking along. And after a while, I spotted his reflection. If only one quarter of those shoulders in that blue sport jacket were really his, I was in trouble. I stopped to light a cigarette. He stopped to tie his shoelace. I wiped the perspiration off my face. He smiled. No, he wasn't following me. It's just my imagination. I turned down a quiet street a few blocks from my rooming house. I looked back. Nobody. I found it was much easier to breathe. And then up ahead of me, somebody was waiting at the corner. Yup, shoulders. He'd circle around the other side of the block. Oh, great. I started walking past him like he wasn't even there. Mister. Ah. Um, Let me say it just once. Uh, sure. Lay off. Fine. Goodbye now. I mean it. Lay off. Ah, uh -uh. now you've said it twice. Leave it alone. It's none of your business. I presume we're both talking about the same thing. The little man who wasn't there, Kazarian. What's the story on this guy? What's the gimmick? How can he be dead and buried? Mister, I ask you real nice and polite. Yeah, I know. Emily Post couldn't have done it better. But still, I'm going to find You're out. You're not going to find anything. <clears throat> You're not going to find a thing. 
After a while, I started climbing out of the fog. And the way I felt, I wanted to climb right back in. All I had to worry about was history's most promising headache. It was after nine o'clock when I got to my room. I took a couple of aspirins, flopped across the bed, and tried to relax. Only the street lamp kept shining in my eyes. I got up to pull down the shade. Then I saw the gray sedan parked across the street. Three guys piled out, and they started toward the rooming house. And leading the way was my old pal Shoulders, back for an encore. I headed for the back stairs. I went across a couple of backyards, came out on a side street, and now I was starting to get sore. I found a taxi and headed back for Kazarian's house. Taxi let me out about half a block down the street. Kazarian's house was all dark, except for a tiny window in back. I went around to the window and looked in. And there was the old man. He was sitting in a leather chair, smoking a pipe. I tapped on the window. He turned, recognized me, and smiled. And someone out in front of the house spotted me. There he is! Where? Where? I started running toward the backyard. They were right on my tail. I came to a fence. I found the gate. It was locked. Shoulders, who was heading the pack, was the first to reach me. You just won't stop, will you, Mr. Snoop? No, I just not. I tore away from him. Ran down the length of the backyard fence, tried to find an opening. The others were coming up fast. I told myself I could never jump over that fence, but with those guys closing in, I was a hard man to convince. And the next thing I knew, I was crouching behind a couple of garbage cans in the alley. And I thought, what a fine way to die, behind a garbage can, my lifeblood draining out on some old melon rinds. He couldn't have gotten away. He must have. I told you to stop him. And then the footsteps passed me. My heart decided it was okay to start beating again. And then I went back to the house, and I found the old man's window. It was dark now, like the rest of the house, but the window was open a few inches. I started pushing it up some more. Who is that? It's me, Randy Stone. I'm coming in. I would not advise that young man. Really, it is quite foolish. Yeah, nobody knows that better than I. I'd appreciate it if you didn't call for help. Why should I? Hmm. Where's the light switch? Oh, yeah. I see you're not wearing your overcoat now, nor your gloves. You're not so cold now, huh? No. Isn't that strange here in the house? I, I do not feel it nearly so much. Yeah, that is funny. Why, why, why are you coming toward me like that? I want to shake your hand, Mr. Kazarian, just a gesture of friendliness. Uh, but somehow you do not look at all friendly. Your hand. Surely. I thought so. It's as warm as mine. Very nice pulse, too. What's the story, Mr. Kazarian? Oh, you are mistaken, young man. I am dead. How were you able to fool that doctor? Why did the undertaker swear he buried you? Why is your wife in mourning? Why was I slugged? But these are questions I cannot answer. I am an old man, and I am very tired. Would you say I was impolite if I asked you to leave? Oh, sure, I'll leave. Would you say I was impolite if I asked you where I could find the nearest police station? Because that's where I'm going. You're not going anywhere, Stone. Pop, I told you to holler for us if he bothered you. I knew there would be trouble. I just knew it. Dr. Herrick. <laughs> Life is full of trouble. Death is endless peace. If this gets in the paper, it'll be the end of everything. Oh, and Mr. Carell of the Temple of Rest. What a spot for a chorus of all Lang Syne. You keep real quiet, Stone. Oh, that's a deal, Shoulders. Well, I wish you would all leave. In my lifetime, I saw none of you. Now that I am dead, you crowd around me like vultures. Yes, Papa, we leave. Just so you shouldn't get excited, come, boys. Well, come leave boys. me in peace. Huh? Leave me in peace. Oh. Papa likes to sit by himself sometime. George, you stop looking so tough. Nobody's afraid of you. Peter, why you just stand here and all? Go to the kitchen, put up hot water for tea. Yes, Mama. Mama? Carell, you call her mama? Of course, sir. Uh... Go to the kitchen, Pedro. I love you. Go. I I will explain to the young man. Perhaps I should do it, mama. Mama again, you too, Dr. Herrick? Yes. No, I... no, I I explain, Armand. You only use big doctor words. Nobody understands. I love you. Go. I said go to the kitchen. And uh, George, the bread box is some baklava you serve with the tea. Yes, Mama. Mama, Mama, Mama. And you, young man, you come in here, in the parlor. Yes, Mama. And we will close the door. Now I... I will tell you everything. So they're your sons? Yeah, yeah. 
Well, fine, boys. The papa and I, we would have liked at least one girl. The doctor and the undertaker. Now it begins to make sense, but, but their names. But their work. They said they need American names. The whole country to name Caseria. Uh, young man, young man, that was a name. Meant something. But here it's got to be Corell and Herrick, hmm? Tell me about Papa. Uh, yeah, excuse me. 1910, Papa and me and the kids, we come to America. Even though an old country, Papa's head of whole Kasserian clan, we come. So kids go to school. Become more than gold herders, rug merchants. And they do. Uh, my boys do. But they marry, they drift away. Soon, Papa and I are alone. And if the kids come over once every two months to see Papa, we think we are lucky. Imagine that, Papa Kasserian head of whole family. <sighs> and then last week, I start with Papa. I heard alarm clock go off and... I got up like I always do, sleepy, thinking all country exists for so many thousand years without alarm clocks. Why we need, huh? Why I shut alarm clock all? Papa? 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 Where are you? I hurried to the house. And I found him in the kitchen, sitting at table in overcoat. Papa, so here you are. You feel all right. Mm -hmm. For a dead man, I feel all right. For a dead man, you should not talk like that, Papa. You got many years mm -hmm. ahead of you. I got eternity ahead of me. I call my sons. You tell them Papa is dead. You feel sick. Huh? I call Armani's fine doctor. No, oh, woman, listen to me. I am not sick. No, I am dead. Do not call Armand the fine doctor. Call my son Peter the fine undertaker. Do as I say. Tell them Papa is dead. Papa, this is nonsense. I've given you a complete examination. You're not dead. You're in perfect health. You, I do not need any more. Peter, you give me a good funeral. I want... Plumed horses. Papa, don't talk like that. You don't need any funeral. What am I to do? Just sit here? Hit that man? Oh, you see, boys, you see how it is. Eh? Sometimes happens in a man of his age. Might be only temporary. I think we should put him in a sanitarium. No! Huh? Are you forgetting who Papa is the head of whole family? Mama in his present condition. Oh, should the old country here in America, everywhere, the Cassarians, he's the head. Oh, just think what happened if they heard Papa had... Uh, it's gone crazy. Well, we could keep it quiet, Mama. No, no, no. News get out somewhere. It would be the end of everything. But, Mama... No, wait, I, I'm on, uh, Mama's right. I've been thinking of something else. Yes? What about us, you and me? We've got our careers to think of. But I told you, these things are only temporary. All the more reason for not putting Papa away. If it's only temporary, then why can't we care from here? Well, I... I suppose we could. Papa... Where are you going? Where can the dead man go? To walk the streets? Uh, don't let him out. Uh, humor him. Do, do something, Armand. Papa, I, I don't think you'd better go out. After all, maybe... Maybe you really are dead, like you say. And in that case... Uh, Papa, I, I, I'll give you a wonderful funeral. Uh, you'll see the best in town. With plumed horses? Yes, Papa, plumed horses. If you'll only do what we tell you. And stay in the house. Mama Kazarian didn't have to tell me anymore. They humored Papa so that he'd stay in the house, hoping his madness would pass, and his family and the rest of the clan would not be disgraced. But one morning he escaped, and that's when I met him. When he took me to his son, Dr. Herrick, and told him I was a newspaper man, the doc thought everything was about to fall apart, so he went along with Papa's madness. And so did Carell and the others. That's why I was followed. That's why shoulders slugged me. That's why they all came to my room later to try to talk to me. I promised to keep their confidence, ate some of Mama's cookies, shook hands all around, and left. But as I was walking through the yard toward the street, a window opened. 
Young man. Hmm? Come over here, over to the window. Oh, Mr. Kazarian. Okay, sure. If you keep your voice down, I don't want them to hear. Mm -hmm. But you are a nice young man. I feel in you uh, an understanding. That is why I talk to you in the park. That is why I talk to you now. What do you mean? They tell you now, huh? How is say I am uh, cracked in the head. Hmm? Insane. Because I say I am dead. Uh, maybe so, but let me tell you this. For 22 years, while I was not dead, and while I was sane, I worked 12, 14 hours a day. I never saw the sun. I never had time to think to remember the old days. Only working, work, work. Then my boys left me. And even my name they don't want. The name Kazarian. And then Mama and me was, was left alone. Yeah, that that was the way it was when I was sane and alive. So, so, one morning I wake up and I say, Okay, if that is how it is when I'm alive, I no longer wish to be alive. I am dead. Now my sons come fast, I tell you. They say, no, no, he is not dead. He is insane. All right, I am too old to argue. Hmm? But now that I am insane, and no longer lift even this little finger. No work. No worry. And my boys stay with us constantly, like, like the old days. <laughs> I, I, I snap my fingers and they shiver. Now, today, I think maybe Armand is getting too smart again, so I bring you to his office. Did you see what happens? <laughs> Did you see what happened? Well, you old faker. <laughs> so, uh, what do you say I should do? Should I call the bin and say, Okay, I am not dead. I am alive. And give up everything I got now? So they can say I am sane again? Well, should I, young man? Eh? Should I? <laughs> oh, Papa, if you did that, that... Would only prove one thing. Mm. And what is that? Well, if you called them in and told them the truth, you'd be the craziest man alive. All this and a moral, too, huh? All right, I'll give you a moral. All Papa Kazarian wanted was not to be left out in the cold. I guess maybe that's just about what all of us want. To be needed by somebody, to be loved by somebody. And why not? Is that such a big deal? In all this cockeyed, crazy world, what else do any of us ever really have? Except each other. Copy boy... Oh, no, what am I saying? Copy boy. This was my day off, remember? <laughs> Night Beat, a new dramatic series stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is written and edited by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music is by Frank Worth. Papa was played by Ben Wright. Betty Lou Gerson played Mama. Others in tonight's cast were Jeff Corey, Lou Krugman, and Paul Duboff. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. The last will and testament of the late Louisa Catherine. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. She's left us nothing. She had all that and we get nothing. There is this letter, ma'am. It's addressed to you and Mark Private. A letter for me? Quick, quick, 
Where is it? Here it is. My instructions were to give it to you after the reading of the will. My dear Alice, I can imagine, imagine how annoyed, how annoyed you, are you, are you are at this moment. I haven't left you and that parasite of a son of yours a penny. It all goes to Catherine, whom you have often referred to as that colorless, unattractive girl. Well, she gets everything. Not because I care for her. I, too, find her colorless and unattractive. But I have to leave the estate to someone. Anyone but you, dear sister. You've had quite enough. You've always loathed me, yet were hypocrite enough to pretend love and devotion because of the money. Now it's gone. You and your son are on your own. Happy hunting. With fondest love, Louisa. Well, ma'am, and what are your sister's instructions? Uh, Mrs. Mason, what are your sister's instructions? Oh, she explains everything. Satisfactorily? Of course, of course. Most satisfactorily. Well, now the will's been read. You'll excuse me. Come, David. I followed Mother, as I always followed Mother. She was small and elegant. I was tall and gangling and laughably shy because of her. She did it to me because she answered for me always. She lived my life for me. I had prayed for money from Aunt Louise's estate, but there was none for me. There was no way I could escape this stifling love and devotion and possession, no way at all. I followed her to the car and noticed the letter gripped firmly in her immaculately gloved hand. I didn't realize it then, but that letter was to be the key to my freedom. It was to open my cage door and let me fly. But before that happened... I had to stare at the bottomless pit of horror. I had to witness the biter bit. Time. The silent herald of life and death. Success or failure. The unseen force that measures man's destiny reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the eleventh hour. talk when I parked the car and we walked into the house, but I could read the signs. A tight mouth and hard brown eyes. She was in a devil of a temper. Then suddenly she seemed to explode, and the words poured from her. Louisa was amused when she wrote that letter, amused, and I could imagine the smile on her face. I'm getting even with Alice. I suppose she sat there and thought this is going to be great fun. Oh, what a wonderful opportunity to strike back. What did she write in the letter? Read it. Read it. Go on. It affects your future as well. She calls you a parasite, David. When I think of what you did for her, fetching and carrying without a word of complaint, what other man would have shown her such kindness and consideration? And she thanks you by calling you a parasite, ridiculing you, and leaving everything to that wretched girl, Catherine. Well... What do you think of that letter from your dear aunt? Did you loathe her, mother? Of course, and you blame me. Do you? That letter proves the kind of woman she was. But if you felt like that, why did you live here with her? Where else could I live, silly boy? Your father decamped and left me no money at all. I had to make my home somewhere. Louisa lived in this tremendous house. She was alone. Of course, this should have been mine originally. Oh? She married a man I loved, and who truth loved me. She stole him with false promises. Your father came and 
I accepted him on the rebound. I see. But I didn't love him. How could I after the way he treated us? You do understand that, don't you, David? It wasn't my fault, the rift in my marriage. It was his. And I brought you here because I felt this was your life. I did it all for you, David. Of course. You did it all for me. When I think of how I waited on Louisa, how I nursed her those last months, morning, noon, and night, I never left her. Then what thanks do I get? This slap in the face. We'll have to leave this house, of course. I suppose Catherine will take over. The lady of the manor. What will that immature, callow girl do with all this house? How can she entertain? Uh, I suppose she'll get married. Some waster who will squander all Louisa's money. Anyway, I'm not giving up all that easy. What do you mean? There's nothing you can do, Mother. Aunt Louisa made that will, and you can't contest it. Perhaps not. Mother didn't say anything else after that, but she sat a long time looking down over the rolling green lawns. She was thinking. I knew the signs. It was no good talking to her, so I left her there. And it was an hour later that she came into my room. Darling, I've been thinking about Catherine. We should help her. Help her? But, but Mother, you said that... I know what I said, darling, but I was angry. I allowed everything to, to get beyond me. I've been reflecting back over everything. And after all, it was Louisa's money, wasn't it? She was entitled to leave it as she wished. Oh, darling, don't you look so surprised. Well, this is a change of attitude. I was shocked when I heard the reading of that will. Shocked and disappointed. Now I've had time to see everything in perspective. We must ask Catherine to come down. We must extend the hand of friendship, darling. You must be very nice to her. But, but I'll Mother... phone her now. After all, she has no one. She's completely alone, and oh, I dare say this, this news has astonished and even frightened her a little. Frightened her? Well, the responsibility and all that. It's tremendous for one so young. Eighty thousand pounds. A great deal of wealth. Eighty thousand. And all this. We mustn't envy her, darling. We must... Well, we must pity her. Now, where's her number? Ah, yes. All written here in dear Louisa's own handwriting. After I've spoken, you take over, darling, and tell her you'd be delighted to call and collect her. But, Mother, I can't stand Catherine. You do as you're told, David. Yes, Mother. And if we play our hands right, we may show a nice little profit on this deal. Catherine Mason speaking. Darling, it's your Aunt Alice. Oh, hello. We would so love you to come down and stay, and then you can settle in permanently later on. Well, Now, I... don't say no, darling, and spoil everything for David. He's looking forward to your company, and he says, bring your tennis things as the weather is beautiful at the moment. Wait a minute, darling, let him talk to you. Here you are, David. But, Mother... Talk to her. Uh, uh, hello, Catherine. Hello, David. What about, what about coming down, as Mother suggested? Well, you're very kind. Tennis, tennis. Mention tennis. Uh, it, it, it's good weather for tennis. You collect her and sound enthusiastic. I, I'll come up and collect you if you like. Well, I was thinking of buying a car so I could drive down. Oh, you'll come then? Yes. Yes, thank you, I will. I'll phone back later and confirm the day if you don't mind. There are a few things I have to do. Oh, very well then. Uh, goodbye. Well, I must say you didn't sound enthusiastic, David. It was a deplorable performance. It was enough to put her off completely. Oh, she's coming down, Mother, and that's what you wanted, isn't it? She's buying a new car. So, a new car. She's spending the money even before she gets it. A new car. Our little Catherine is launching out. And it's our money, too. That's the wretched part of it. It's our money, David. It belongs by right to you and me. And that little chick is spending it. I suppose it'll be one of those flashy, expensive cars. Mother, if you feel this way about her, why ask her down? Why? Because it's the way I plan it. That's why. You plan it? Mother, what are your plans? What are you going to do? Get what is mine by right. The money? But, but you can't. Darling, you leave all this to me. What are you going to do? 
You must tell me. Don't worry yourself with this, David. Now, there's a good boy. I must slip along and arrange the spare room for Catherine. We must make her very welcome. She bustled away, busy with her plans and her thoughts. She was my mother, but there were times when I feared her, and this was one of them. I hardly saw her until Catherine finally arrived, driving a sleek new sports car. My mother looked at it, and her eyes reflected disapproval. But her voice was as smooth as silk. Darling, how beautiful. A lovely new car. Yes. Isn't it nice? And red, so pretty. David, do help Catherine with her luggage. Uh, of course, uh, yes. I suppose I should really say, welcome home. Because that is what the manor is now, isn't it? Your home. Oh, Aunt Alice, about everything. I don't want the manor. It's, well, it's too large for me, and, and I wouldn't be happy living here, knowing that this was really your home. But darling Louisa left it to you. I believe she didn't. There must have been some mistake. These things do happen in people's wills. Well, oh, please don't move out of the manor. Take it. That's very sweet of you. But a great home like this takes a fortune to keep up. Oh, no. You take it over. David and I have made plans. Now, let me take you to your room. I've decided to put you in Louisa's bedroom. You don't mind? The spare room is being painted. Come along, darling. This way. Once again, I followed my mother obediently. But this time, my mind seethed with thoughts. Why Louisa's bedroom? The spare one wasn't being painted. Was this something to do with my mother's plans? I caught her eye a moment. She was enjoying herself hugely, playing a magnificent part. Then I asked myself a question. I wonder what she's up to. I couldn't guess but I felt the icy prickle of fear. The first inkling Mother gave me of her plans was that night, shortly before dinner. David, stop pacing up and down and listen to me. I need your help. My help? I have never asked you for it before, but I do so now. I need your help. You've always considered yourself an actor, haven't you? Well, I... This is your opportunity to prove it. At dinner, I'm turning the conversation towards the return of departed souls. The return of de... I do wish you wouldn't repeat everything I say. We shall talk of Louisa. We shall talk of her, her presence, still here at the manor. We shall talk of the return of the dead to the places they love. Oh, but, but, Mother... I shall expect some help from you, David. Help from me? Oh, you've done it again. Repeat it after me. I do wish you wouldn't do it. But I know nothing about such things. No, do I. But we shall both weave a convincing story. A prelude, as it were, to the actual drama which will take place later in the evening. What are you talking about? Louisa is going to return this evening. What? She won't materialize, of course. Nothing like that. But she'll speak to Catherine. Oh, but, Mother... She'll I... speak to her inarticulately at first. Then gradually her voice will clear, and she'll talk of another will. Uh, another will? Made a short while before her death. A new will, in which, as a gesture of gratitude, she leaves me the sum of 20,000 pounds. Oh, but, but, but this will doesn't exist. On the contrary, darling, it does exist. Here. You see? Her signature. A perfect forgery. And witnesses. Everything above board. You did this? Yes. But old Ratcliffe won't believe. Even if he doesn't, she will. You saw how she was? Embarrassed about everything. I thought she was rather decent offering you the house. I'm getting the house and 20,000 pounds. That leaves her quite enough for her simple needs. Mother, you're never going to get away with this. You can't. That is the negative kind of attitude your father would have adopted. Of course I'm getting away with it. Louisa will speak of the will. She will indicate where it is hidden. She will find it and show it to Ratcliffe. He may not believe. He may well have his suspicions and his doubts. But there is no evidence that this is a forgery. Don't forget, I never disclosed the contents of her letter to him. I kept that to myself. And I intend to burn it now. There. 
That belongs to the past. Oh, you mustn't do this. Please, you mustn't. That from you? And I'm doing this for you. I don't want the money. It means nothing to me. Neither does this house. But you've no career, no profession. You must be protected from life. And money only can do it. I know you aren't a fighter, darling. You're sensitive and you don't like trouble. But leave this to me. First, a tape recorder. You see? I've been practicing Louise's voice. Listen. Look, look, look. Desk. Hidden drawer. Hidden drawer. How's that? For pity's sake, don't do this. It can only lead to trouble. What if she dies of shock? What then? That is extremely unlikely. Women of that description are horribly helpful. Well, well, she might get hysterical or anything. All the better. Now, all I ask of you, David, is to assist me. I won't do it. Of course you will, silly boy. May you run along and dress for dinner. At 7.30, knock on her door and take her downstairs. I'll slip into Louise's room and make the final arrangements. But, but Mother... There I... isn't much time, David. Now, do as I say, quickly. From then on, it became a nightmare. And I was powerless to resist the strength of my mother. You can condemn and criticize if you will. You can say what you like. I was weak and spineless. Oh, yes, I've said all that to myself many times. It was at dinner that Mother twisted the conversation with almost diabolical cunning. I do hope you'll be comfortable, Catherine. The room looks beautiful, Aunt Alice. I feel most distressed having to put you there. After all, that was Louise's room. Oh, but that doesn't make me afraid. She was such a sweet person. I'm sure her influence could be only for the very kindest. Well, I'm glad you're adopting that attitude, darling. Especially as... As what, Aunt Alice? Well, I, I'd rather not talk about it. Oh, no, please, tell me. Well, this is really David's story. Uh, Do you mind if I tell Catherine? Well, of course you don't. You see, the day after Louise's death, David saw her. You saw her? Only a pinpoint of light, wasn't it, darling? But her voice was unmistakable. She spoke softly and with the greatest effort. But she was distressed about something, wasn't she, David? She seemed to be sobbing. Uh, but, but... I know you didn't want me to tell Catherine, darling. But she's very level-headed, and she should know. After all, if you love someone, it's comforting to know that they're around, isn't it? Well, yes, but... Now, let's not talk any more about it. We mustn't make you worried. By the end of the meal, Catherine had unbent completely, and I found myself liking her more and more as the evening wore on. Then, finally, the clock struck eleven, and Mother rose to her feet. Darlings, it's so late. Just look at the time. But it's been a most enjoyable evening. Oh, I've enjoyed myself tremendously. Thank you, Aunt Alice. Tomorrow it's tennis for you. Anything to exercise this lazy boy here. I haven't played tennis for ages, but it should be fun. I thought you were very keen on it. Well, I, I had to give it up some time ago. Oh? I had heart trouble. Heart trouble? Oh, but it's all right now. I'd no idea, Catherine. But then, of course, we haven't seen much of each other, have we? Anyway, we'll remedy that in the future, won't we? Well, here's your room, dear. Oh, good. Peters has remembered to light the fire. There's a bell if you need anything. And I do hope you sleep wonderfully. Thank you, Aunt Alice. You've really been very kind. Good night, darling. Be seeing you in the morning. Good night, David. Good night. Well, that went magnificently. But no thanks to you, David. You were no help at all. You contributed nothing. I had to create the whole atmosphere. Because I felt thoroughly ashamed of myself, that's why. David. You told that unfortunate girl a pack of ghastly lies. Keep your voice down or she'll hear. I hope she does. Mother, you aren't going through with this. If you intend to work yourself into hysterics, kindly leave me and go to bed immediately. We'll wait until twelve o'clock. That is the witching hour. Mother, she's a decent girl. Don't frighten her out of her wits. And remember what she said about her heart. What will happen if she dies? What then? There'll be the police. There'll be questions, and I couldn't stand it. The trouble with you, David, is that you're a coward. I'm not a criminal, and that's what you are. I'm only claiming what is mine by right. Ask her for it, then. She'll understand, and don't stoop to this deception. She'll give you the wretched money. That is extremely unlikely. 
Now, let's not stand out here in the passage arguing. We'll go downstairs and wait until 12 o'clock. Come along, David. Once again, I followed her obediently. But this time, my whole being rebelled against her. For the first time, I found myself disliking her. Then, in some peculiar way, she seemed to sense what I felt, because she looked up at me with her hooded brown eyes and said, It's no good hating me, David. I'm doing this for you. I don't want you to do it for me. I can manage. Darling, let's be realistic. You've never done a day's work in all your young life. You've sat back and given me the privilege of waiting on you. That's the way you wanted it, because of your domination. Darling, how ridiculous you are. And do stop shouting. Oh, good. It's twelve o'clock. Now we put part two into operation. The recorder has been hidden behind her wardrobe. But the switch is in the passage. It was really very clever of me. Then we'll wait and see what happens. It should be most interesting. The passage was pitch black, and there seemed a clamminess permeating the whole atmosphere. It almost seemed that one of the dead was with us. I stood back and watched her, with hate in my heart, for her and my weakness. She had it all organized perfectly. She bent to switch on the machine, and as she did so, I knew we weren't alone. There was someone else. I backed away, seeking to escape the malignancy of the presence. I gasped, but Mother was preoccupied with her plans. I remember she turned. David, for goodness sake, what's the matter? Don't, don't you feel it, don't you? Feel it? Feel what? The, there's someone. What are you talking about? There's no one. Now, don't try and distract me, David. Let's leave. There is someone. Something. There is. Of course there isn't it. <gasps> she turned sharply from me, and her eyes widened with horror as she gazed with frightened intensity towards the end of the passage. I could see nothing. Then she gasped. Louisa! Louisa, you! I could hear nothing. I could see nothing. But I was aware of the rising tide of animosity and hate. Then, suddenly, my mother covered her eyes with her hands. She stumbled backwards. No, Louisa! No, no! She turned. She tried to run, but she crashed to the floor with a scream of sheer terror that made my blood run cold. She lay quietly, but I knew even before I touched her, she was dead. The doctor came and the police came. There were many questions, and there'll be many more. They find the tape recorder and the switch. I remember our old lawyer, Ratcliffe. Things are going to be difficult for you, David. There are so many explanations needed. But I've told you everything, Mr. Ratcliffe. She stumbled and she was dead before I got to her. It is just seen an unfortunate affair. We can only wait for the doctor's report to be phoned through. It's unsatisfactory and you can't blame the police feeling as they do. Your mother planned to frighten Catherine into handing over the money by imitating Miss Louise's voice. And then suddenly... The deceased rarely arrives. Well, that's what did happen. I didn't see her, but my mother did. I swear it to you. But it's so unlikely. And... Excuse me. That might be the doctor. Yes? Yes? Oh, most extraordinary. Yes. Well, yes. Very well. Thank you. Well, and what was the cause of death? Well... It was extraordinary. It seems that your mother died of fright. Time. The silent herald of life and death. Success or failure. The unseen force that measures man's destiny reaching its most fateful moment as it slowly strikes the 11th hour. And 
now, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. In a moment, act one of With Murder in Mind, written especially for suspense by Erwin Lewis, starring Jack Crucian, currently featured in the Broadway hit, I Can Get It For You Wholesale. Anton? Uh, yes, my please. darling. Oh, good. And Anton, don't go too far. Lately, oh, you please, please. Now, oh, this time, ladies and gentlemen, the High Hope Club takes singular pride in presenting Tesla, this renowned expert in the mysteries of mentalism, is at all times blindfolded. Tesla. Keeper of the keys to dark secrets locked in the innermost recesses of the human mind. Will astound and astonish. Yes. Tonight, Helena, I am tempted to amaze them truly. Suppose Anton, I just... no. You promise. Anton, please. It is too dangerous. Promise me. Yeah, yeah. I will be careful. And now, without further ado, it is my great honor to bring you feats of mentalism applauded in every capital of Europe. For the first time in these United States with his beautiful wife, Helena... She's the one without the blindfold. Tesla the Great! Ladies and gentlemen, as I pass among you, hold up any object you wish and concentrate on them. <laughs> Tesla, blindfolded on the stage, will attempt to learn what those objects are. Are you ready, Tesla? I am ready. This gentleman is holding up something that belongs to his wife. Can you tell me what it is, Tesla? Uh, it is something she wears, is it not? That is right. And what is it? It is a, a fur piece, a stole, mink, I believe. That is right. <laughs> That's pretty good. And now, a lady over here... Well, I, I see more. The gentleman has not yet paid for the store. Ah, how the blazes does he know? That will be enough, Tesla. And now, Tesla will attempt to tell me what object I have in my hand, which this lady has just given me. Tesla, do you know what it is? Uh, it is a gold charm. That is right. <laughs> now, Tesla, see if you can tell us what is inscribed on the back of this charm? Something only this lady and I know. What does it say, Tesla? It says, To Ruth, with all my love. Is that right, madame? Oh, yes. Yes, that's exactly what it says. <laughs> and now, now I see a gentleman holding a wallet. Sir. Ray. Wait, I have not yet done with the woman. I see more. No, Tesla. Ah, but yes. That is not just a charm. A little golden trinket. It means much more to Ruth. And it was given to her by a man who is not her husband. Why, that's a lie. Please, madame, please don't upset yourself. It is only Tesla's sense of humor. I see nothing funny in it. Please, please forgive him. Now, sir, if you will hand me your wallet. Yes, thank you. Now, How could he know? Will you How could anyone know? And tell me it happened years ago, and he's dead. It's impossible for anybody to know about the charm except me. And I haven't told a living soul. How could he know? Yes. the initials... R-L-S. Hey. Thank you and good night, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Hughes, please come in. <laughs> hey, Tesla, old man, I just had to come to your dressing room and congratulate you and the little woman. Oh, <laughs> then you liked our act, Mr. Hughes. Liked it. La say, that was the greatest opening act my club has ever had. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Say, listen, I'm having a little party at my place later just to celebrate, and I want you and Mrs. Tesla as, as guests of ours. Oh, well, we, we no, will no, be very happy. No, no, thank you, Mr. Hughes. 
Now, if you will excuse me, I must change. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I got to get myself another drink. I got to get lots of drinks. I got a lot of celebrating to do. Yeah. <laughs> so long. Uh, bye. Oh, Elena, you were very rude to Mr. Hughes. I have never known you to be rude before. I can't worry about Mr. Hughes. It is you I am worried about. Well, I do not understand. I've warned you so many times. You must be careful. Careful. Oh. They must never become suspicious. A wrong word here, too much said there, and tonight you should not have said what you did about that woman. Oh, those foolish little thoughts rumbling around in her foolish little mind. I, I could not resist the temptation to have some sport over her guilty little secret. Did you see the look in her eyes? Yes. Yes, I saw it. Fear. Cold, oh. naked fear. And questioning. I could almost hear her ask herself, how could he know? And someday someone will realize the truth. Well, what of it? It is degrading enough that I must use my gift merely to earn enough money for us to live. At least, permit me the pleasure of disturbing the little minds once in a while. Oh, Anton. This gift of yours. Is it really a gift? Or a curse. Oh, Helena, please. Yes, who is it? Lieutenant Clark. May I come in? Oh, <laughs> Lieutenant. <laughs> well, it is so nice to see you again. Did you enjoy our act? And how? But after seeing you two perform tonight, well, I just had to tell you how, how great you, you both really are. Well, thank you. Uh, Helena, you remember Lieutenant Clark of the police department, don't you? Yes, of course. Nice to meet you again, ma'am. You see, Mr. Tesla, I've made quite a study of mind-reading acts, oh? codes, and systems and things, and, <laughs> well, frankly, you've got me stumped. I don't know how you do it. Well, it is very simple, Lieutenant. I read mine. <laughs> well, I can almost believe it. Lieutenant, I believe you are thinking that I am putting on an act even now off stage. <laughs> Please, be assured of one thing. It is not an act. Uh, I beg your pardon. Anton, if you will excuse me, I, I have a terrible headache. Oh? Anton, I am going back to the hotel. Well, my car's outside, Mrs. Tesla. I'd be happy to drive you there. That won't be necessary, thank you. We're staying in the hotel across the street. Well, you better take an umbrella. It's, it's raining pretty heavily. I don't mind the rain. Don't be long, Anton. No, no, I will join you in a few moments, Elena, as soon as I change. Please, be careful. Don't... Don't let your gift be a curse, Anton. Good night, Mrs. Tesla. I hope to see you again. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Your wife's a beautiful woman, Mr. Tesla. Yeah. You've been married long? Five years. Five years. I am I am ready to leave now. Would you care to join me for a drink before you return to your hotel? Well, that is an excellent idea, Lieutenant. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, something? Uh, you wouldn't consider, uh... No, no, I guess you wouldn't. <laughs> no, Lieutenant, you should have known better than to ask. You cannot expect me to reveal my secrets to you. Oh, good evening. You're fond of, aren't you? Good evening, ma'am. And you're part of the new mental act here at the club. <laughs> That's right. 28 years I've been doing the doors in nightclubs, Mrs. Telser. <laughs> and Tesla, I, uh, Mr. Saunders. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> well, I heard him saying how great you and your husband are. Oh. <laughs> I was going to see your first performance. Uh, here, here, let, let, let me open the door for you. It's pretty heavy. Oh, that's very kind of you. Oh, not at all, ma'am. Mind your step crossing that rain... <laughs> See? It's really pouring. If you wait a minute, I'll get you an umbrella, Mrs. Tesla. Don't bother. I don't mind a little rain. Oh, but you'll get soaked clear through. Please, I, I have the umbrella right over here. I'll get it for you. No, no. Honestly, Saunders, I don't want it. I like to walk in the rain. I like the feeling. And besides, it's not far to the hotel. Well, if you say so, Mrs. Tesla. But be careful crossing the street now. Some of those cars come shooting around the corner like crazy. I'll be careful. Good night, Sondra. Good night, ma'am. If you don't mind, Mr. Tesla, we can have the drink at your hotel. There's a nice bar there. All right, Lieutenant. You may as well cut across through the stage door. It's shorter. Besides, in this rain, we're not likely. Tesla, wait. Where are you running? What happened? Oh, it's terrible, Lieutenant, terrible. I opened the stage door for her, and, 
and she went out into the rain. I asked her if she wanted my umbrella, but she said, no, thanks. I turned to go back into the club when I heard brakes squealing and she screamed. I ran across the street and, and she was lying on the ground with the rain pouring down. Next thing I knew, he came running out and pushed me away. He, he's like a madman. Who? Uh, what's his name? The mind reader, Tesla. Was it his wife? Yes, yes. She's such a beautiful thing, Lieutenant Clark, and lying there all crumbled and smashed in the rain. Where's the car that hit her? I just saw the taillights disappearing around the corner. He, he didn't even stop. You call an ambulance. Saunders, come with me. <laughs> there you are. He, he's holding her in his arms. Elena. Elena, my darling. Tesla, let me carry her inside. No, go, go away, Lieutenant. Please, leave us alone. I've sent for an ambulance. Please, let, let me take her inside. No, it's too late, too late. Wait. Yes, Elena. What is it? He's got an awful peculiar look on his face. As if he's listening to something... It's eerie. Yeah, yeah I, I understand. I, I will remember, Helena. I will remember. Yes, what is it, Sam? Man here to see you, Lieutenant. Name's Anton Tesla. Have him come in. Mr. Tesla, it's, it's good to see you, sir. Please, please sit down. Thank you, Lieutenant. I was wondering what happened to you. I haven't seen you since... Well, it's, it's a week now, isn't it? Is that how long it is? Sometimes it seems like a year. Sometimes only a day. Most of the time it seems as if... I am the one who died. Terrible tragedy. I, I don't know how to tell you how sorry I am. Yes. You, uh, you look tired. Uh, thank you. I mean, thank you for being diplomatic. I have seen myself in the mirror. I was never a handsome man, but <laughs> now I, I would almost frighten myself. Oh, nonsense. Uh, shave and some fresh clothes and you'll be a new man. If there is anything I can you do... You can find the man who murdered my wife. Murdered? You're not saying it was deliberate, are you? He left her lying in the street and fled like a murderer. He killed her in cold blood, whether it was deliberate or not. Well, we're, we're doing all we can. But you must realize we have nothing to go on. Oh. No one saw your wife hit by the car. When the stage doorman Saunders came running up, all he could see was the taillights of the car. It was dark and raining heavily. He couldn't tell what kind of a car it was or, or its color or model. Lieutenant, it was a white convertible. How can you possibly know that? You do not believe me? What would you say if I told you I know every thought you have at this very moment? How would you feel if I proved I could delve into your mind and dredge up every good and foul thing you have ever been thinking back to the very beginning of your existence? Uh, Mr. Tesla, please. I know you're under a strain. Don't, don't excite yourself. Do not worry, Lieutenant. I will not try to prove it to you. And do you know why... Because then you would fear me as all must fear and hate someone who knows their most innermost thoughts. Now, I have told you the model and color of the car. How can I act on information? Then the fender. It was damaged, I believe. The right fender. Investigate. And if you will not do anything, then I must. I'm obliged to advise you against acting on your own. No. Mr. Tesla, listen to reason. In the state... <sighs> Strange man. He really thinks he can read minds. It's ridiculous. And yet that, that, that business about the fender. And what was it his wife said? Don't let your gift be a curse. Now, why should she have said a thing like that? Saunders. Hmm? Saunders, wake up. I, 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 I was just up. dozing. Oh, Mr. Tesla, I, I didn't recognize oh, you. Oh, you remember me, huh? Oh, yes, yes, of course, sir. Uh, may I say how sorry I am about the accident last week? It no, was you? you? Oh, you're hurting my arm. What I you must know. 
when you heard the crash that night and ran outside, what did you see? I, I told the police everything. Tell me. I, just, uh, I saw your wife lying in the street. And the car. Did you see the car? Only the taillights as you turned the corner. You were lying. You saw more. No, I... I know you did, but I cannot make it out. Now, what? else did you see? Nothing. I swear it. I saw nothing there else. There is something else you saw. Think now. What else did you uh, see? Please, Mr. Tesla, my arm. Think. Think. Why are you looking at me so funny? I must not find out about Joe. Joe? I, I don't know what you... Parking lot attendant. Thank you, Saunders. Cause. Come on, get away before I call the cops. Hey, ain't I seen you here before? Yes, my friend, you have. Wait a minute, you're, uh... Yeah, you're, you're that mind reader, the guy whose wife was killed last week. And you're Joe, the parking lot attendant. Yeah, that's right. Well, what do you want? I'm looking for a white convertible with a dented fender. Because I have been given to understand that such a car was here the night my wife died. Perhaps it is back now with the fender repaired, of course. I don't know what you're talking about. Look, you better get off this lot. You're asking for trouble. You seem to be worried, Joe. Why are you so worried? I, you're not. What do you want? A week ago, a car sped out of this parking lot and whirled around the corner just as my wife was crossing the street. It hit her and killed her. You know whose car that was and you will tell me. That's a dirty lie. Hey, get away from that car. This is the car. Here. Feel the metal on the fender. It is rough. It was a hasty job, and it was not well done. Okay, for the last time, get off this lot. First, you will tell me who owns this car. I'm telling you, mister, you better get off. What? What, what? What's the matter with you? Why are you looking at me that way? I ask you again. Whose car is this? Try and find out. I already have. Thank you. Mr. Tesla, I'm glad to see you. I was worried about you. I tell you what, I was just uh, checking my books. I'll put them away. We can go out to the bar, have a drink. Uh, hey. Hey, why are you locking the door? Sit down, Mr. Hughes. I want to talk with you. Well, what Sit about... Sit down! I have been looking for the man who murdered my wife. Murdered? Oh, it was a... It was a horrible thing. A frightful accident. Not an accident. Murder. Oh, no. No, it was, uh, was an accident. Everybody it knows that. It was murder. And the weapon was a white convertible. You have a white convertible, don't you? Now, wait a minute. You're trying to say that I hit your wife? And I'll put that gun away. Are you crazy? Perhaps. But tonight, justice will be done. You murdered my wife. Oh, no, you don't. Get, get that. After that, Lieutenant, I, I could see he'd made up his mind to shoot me. I, I jumped him, trying to defend myself. We struggled, the gun went off, and, and I called you. That's the whole story. All right, Mr. Hughes, better sit down. You look like you're ready to collapse. Uh, thank you. Well, oh, what an experience. He must have been crazy. How does it look, Doctor? Uh, not very good, Lieutenant. I'm going to call an ambulance, but I don't think he'll make it to the hospital. Tesla, can you hear me? Lieutenant uh, Clark. Why did you try to kill Hughes? Uh, he, he murdered my wife. No, he didn't. What, what are you saying? The driver of the car that hit your wife was taken into custody an hour ago and confessed. Oh. We got him through that fender. It took leg work, but we found his repairman, and then him. He admitted everything. It took us a week, but it's pretty hard to hide evidence he, like that. He admits it. He is lying. He was telling the truth. But the white convertible? He was driving a white convertible, too. Although a different model than Hughes' car. A different year, too. At the fender, there was fender damage on this car? It was one of those once-in-a-lifetime coincidences, Tesla. 
As near as we can make out, what probably happened was that Hughes pulled out of the parking lot and turned the corner at the same time that this other fellow came from the opposite direction. He hit your wife and went tearing down the road. Hughes, trying to avoid a head-on collision, skidded into that lamppost opposite the club, bounced off and drove away. Both cars had damaged fenders. Tesla, did you hear what I said? Yeah, I heard. But it is impossible. Hughes killed my wife. I know it. I know it. Tesla. Is he... Is he dead? Yes. Oh. Oh, That poor tortured man. I feel so... So sorry for him. What I can't understand is why he was so sure you were guilty. There is an explanation. But I refuse to believe it. What's that? I... I was very drunk the night of the accident. I only had the vaguest recollection of the events. Until you told Tesla just now what had actually happened, I thought I was guilty. Suspense. You've been listening to With Murder in Mind, written especially for Suspense by Irwin Lewis, and starring Jack Crucian, currently featured in the Broadway hit, I Can Get It For You Wholesale. Suspense is produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in tonight's story were Bryna Rayburn, Billy Redfield, Jim Bowles, Gilbert Mack, Jack Grimes, Rennie Santoni, and Jane Ward. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. This is Stuart Metz speaking. Next week, another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Now, Ellery Queen in The Adventure of the Message in Red. Because it relieves headache pain so fast... Take an anacin. Because it gives prolonged relief. Take an anacin. Because it's made like a doctor's prescription. Take an anacin. Anacin presents The Adventures of Ellery Queen. Tonight, the makers of Anison bring you another thrilling adventure of Ellery Queen, the celebrated gentleman detective. Ellery Queen invites you to match wits with him as he relates another story of a crime he alone unraveled. Before revealing the solution, he gives you a chance to solve the mystery. Tonight, Anison's guest, who will represent you home armchair detectives, is the famous actor, Victor Jory. And now, here's Ellery Queen, master detective, and your Anison host for the next half hour. Thank you, Don Hancock, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, tonight's mystery really had my father going. Your father, huh? Oh, Nicky. I suppose all those murders were duck soup for you, huh? Oh, no, 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 Nicky. This case was no harder than many I've had. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I call it The Adventure of the Message in Red. Hotel Arbutus, public stenographer. Yes, I'm Miss Kirby. At this hour, but... <sighs> All right. If you drop into my office right away, I'll... I'll try to get it out tonight. Oh, why can't they just take their old business letters during the day? Oh, gee, I'm tired. I'd better douse my eyes with cold water. I'm so sleepy I could... So soon... Coming. Gee, they must have used a house phone from the lobby. Come in, won't you? Hooray! Hooray! In Dixie Land. Now, who's that? Nobody 
way out here. Oh. Now, who'd be using that talky thing from the vestibule? Nobody does. Yes? Yes, Miss Miss Hazel? So, at this time of night? I was just going to bed. Been washing my supper dishes. All right. If they've just got to have a reader's report on it by tomorrow morning, just open the vestibule door, and my apartment's the first door on your right. Would be my luck if it's one of those half a million word jobs. Just a second. Oh, I wish I were in the land of cotton. Old times there are not... That's all you've got to tell me, Pickett. Go on back when you make sense. Sorry, I need to keep you and Nicky waiting. Uh, those two killings last night, Dad, huh? Yes. Lasted. What two killings, Inspector? I haven't seen today's paper. Who cares, Nicky? First one, a public standard with the Hotel Arbutus in Lexington Avenue. Shot to death at 9.15 p.m. Name of Kirby. Second one, a part-time manuscript reader for Mason and Morris and the publishers of Miss Hazel. Shot to death around 10.30 p.m. in her Greenwich Village apartment. Both as they opened their doors. No evidence of robbery. Both unmarried, unattractive, no untangling alliances. Lived alone. No witnesses, no clues, no motive. And the girls never knew each other. Never knew any of the same people. Cute? Then the murders aren't connected, Inspector. But they are, Nicky. Ballistics reports the same gun killed both of them. I don't wonder you're puzzled. I think it's an upkill myself, Harry. Yes, Billy? Afternoon, Sergeant. Hi, Mr. Porter. You mind, sir? Oh, Sergeant. Inspector, you know what? No. What? Another one. No. Huh? Yeah, a girl shot to death. She answered her door around 1 a.m. last night. Body wasn't found till this morning. Ooh, number three last night. Who's this one, Bailey? Ladies' maid, Lucille du, du Bois. Uh, du Bois, Sergeant French. Yeah, yeah, French maid. Worked for the Canellas. Canella? The, uh, Vetti, Vetti Canella? The same. She was shot in the Canella house, Sergeant. Yeah, that 199-room shack on Upper Fifth Avenue. In her bedroom. A stenographer, a publisher's reader, and a ladies' maid. Mind if I sit in, Dad? You can make any sense out of it, son. Come on. Oh, my poor, poor head. My home overrun with police officers. I've had to cancel the most important appointment this afternoon with my hairdresser. And Mrs. Canella, have you never get away? My husband is simply furious. My daughter, poor child, frustrated. Now, look, Mrs. Canella. And I'm on the verge of losing what little mind I have. Mrs. Canella. You understand, Mr. Crean. I know you do. The death of your maid has upset you, naturally. Oh, yes. Where am I going to turn? How can I replace Lucille? You don't know the trouble I had getting her originally. And now she's dead. It's not fair. It isn't. Uh, the trouble is, gentlemen, you don't know the problems we girls oh. have. <laughs> uh, look, madam, how did this happen? I'm sure I don't know. People shooting off guns in my home and everything. I'm so glad I wasn't home when it happened, even though the house is completely soundproof. Your husband, I'm... will you, madam? Uh, Mr. Con... Mr. Conner? Oh, no, no, he was out somewhere. His club or something. How about your daughter? Madge. Oh, now, please, don't drag poor Madge into this. She suffered so much already. When did you first learn your maid was dead, Mrs. Canella? About 11 o'clock this morning, Mr. Creighton. When she didn't bring my breakfast in bed, I knew instantly something was wrong. Well, of course. That's the way you tell. Oh, yes. I rang and I rang and I rang. And Mrs. And I... Canella, who found the stiff? Stiff? The remains, madam. There are, oh, oh uh, why, my daughter. One of the servants told Madge that Lucille's light was still on this morning, and she didn't answer the door. So Madge went up to the servants' quarters and went in, and oh, the poor child, the poor, poor child. That's why no one answered my rings, you see. Uh, leaving you without uh, breakfast. Uh, oh, that's simply frightful, uh, yes, Miss yes. Canelli. Yes. Well, suppose you have a little snack of caviar and cold pheasant or something while we hunt up your dog. Oh, dear. Uh, must you? Must we what, madam? Uh, give Madge the, the third degree or whatever it is. You, you, you don't know how sensitive the child is. She's always been so delicate. She shrinks so from the more brutal aspects of life. Oh, Mother, stop drooling. Uh, drool oh, oh, Madge, darling, are you all right, dear? Definitely not. Are these some more policemen? 
Who's the wench, a sob sister? Um, the wench is Nikki Porter, Mr. Queen's secretary. Ellery uh, Queen. Sergeant Vailey. Inspector Queen. Now, Miss Canella. And you're in charge. Why isn't that body taken away, and who's going to clean up the mess? And you're to keep reporters out, too, do you hear? Thing like this happening now. Do you hear me? No, newspaper men. Oh, dearest, don't excite yourself. Oh, shut up, Mother. All this is your silly fault anyway. Oh. Yes, I told you long ago you should send that snoop packing, but no. You had to hang on to it till she had the bad taste to get herself murdered all over our house. Oh. What am I going to say to Evie? Evie? My fiancé. Three-star engagement was supposed to be announced this week. One of the very best Boston families. He'll never stand for a scandal. Why should you think there's going to be a scandal, Miss Canella? Oh, well, isn't a murder scandal enough? I don't think that's what your daughter meant, Mrs. Canella. Well? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. I, I didn't mean anything. Let's take a look at the corpse. <laughs> Interesting. What, Evie? Notice the facing surfaces of the tips of her index and middle fingers, Dad, on the right hand. Huh. Or calloused. Only place for calluses? Yes. If you gentlemen are through admiring Miss Dubois' calluses, would you mind covering up again so I can turn around? Hmm? Oh, uh. All right now, Nikki. But how do you know this maid's murder is connected with the other two murders? Well, he was here early and dug the bullet out of her chest, Nikki. Ballistics just reported it came the same gun that shot the Kirby and Hazel girls. Just what the connection is, I'm blessed. Oh, Vili? Hey, you throw with the carpets and spank to the morgue wagons here for the pickup. Take her away. Uh, she's all yours, boy. Uh, what did you find out about the other servants, Sergeant? Uh, names? Uh, Butler, James Smathers, Cook, Sally Fabian, Chauffeur, Waller, Boyle. Upstairs maid, Vera Andorf. Uh, Smathers and Boyle share a double room, so do the Fabian and Andorf woman. Uh, each bunkie alibis the other for last night. Period. Mother, you know you shouldn't be up here. Just your morbid curiosity. Oh, I don't know why you say such things to me, Madge, baby. Oh, look what they're doing. Stay out here in the hall, Margaret. You too, Madge. Oh, Inspector Queen. Who are you? I'm Ilfa Canella. My wife just phoned my club. Is there anything I can do? Uh, excuse me, folks. Okay, boys. Take her through. Oh, Madge, I can't look. Oh, poor Lucy. Be yourself, Mother. Oh, Mr. Canella, we were just... Pardon me. Harry, what's that you just picked up? Oh, yeah. This piece of scrap paper was hidden by Lucille Dubois' body, Dad. A message in red. Uh, red? Message. Let me see. It is red. Is it? Oh, oh it is. Written in blood. She must have lingered a few minutes after the shop. When that killer left, she tried to write something before she died. What's it say, Ellery? Mm, starts with a capital M, but there are not a spatters in the paper, and I... Can't quite make the rest out. I'll have Cranley look it over in the police lab. He'll decipher it. Give it to me, son. Right, it's quite important that you make a quick arrest, Inspector. What's that mean, Mr. Canella? I... Well, I expect very shortly to be appointed to an extremely important diplomatic post abroad. So this unfortunate little affair must be cleared up at once. And without scandal. Uh, Milford has worked so hard for the honor. Yes, it's been Father's pet dream. In fact, Inspector, unless you solve this case within 24 hours, I may have to see to it that, uh, that someone else is put in charge. Come, Margaret. Matt. And Father's just a little guy who can do it. I... Oh, I... Uh... Dad. Henry, where are you going? I'll have to confirm a theory, Dad. Theory? About what, son? About the connection between the three murders last night. I think I know now what it was. <laughs> Anybody care to come along? And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the beginning of our mystery. We'll tell you more in just a moment, but first, here's Don Hancock for Anison. Friends, if you want quick, comforting relief from pounding headache pain... Take an Anison. Yes, take an Anison, because Anison relieves headache pain so swiftly. Millions now know that easy-to-take Anison tablets act fast, give prolonged relief. And that's why we say... Take an Anison. There's a good reason why Anison relieves the agonizing pain of headaches so much more quickly. Anison is made like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients... Your own physician or dentist may have already recommended Anison to you. That's how millions first discovered Anison's incredibly fast relief. And now, at the first sign of the pains of headache, neuralgia, or neuritis, they simply... Take an Anison. Anison, spelled A-N-A-C-I-N, is sold at all druggists. 
So if you want fast, prolonged relief from headache pain... Take an anacin. And now, back to our story. It's a short time later, and the inspector's car, with Sergeant Thiele at the wheel, is threading its way through midtown Manhattan traffic. But what is the connection, Ellery? Well, how'd you know, Marshal? Well, what was the occupation of the first victim, the Kirby girl? Kirby Stanabra. And the second one, Miss Hazel? The Greenwich Village girl? Well, oh, she was a part-time manuscript reader for Mason and Morrison. A public stenographer, a publisher's reader. Now, Dad, do you recall the peculiar calluses we found on Lucille Dubois' right hand? And the facing sides of the tips of her index and middle finger. What very ordinary activity, if sufficiently prolonged, would cause calluses there? Holding a pen or a pencil. Yes, Nikki, writing. But not casual writing, like the occasional writing of letters. Lucille Dubois was writing a great deal for a long time. Weeks, months. A diary. Perhaps at least a very extensive manuscript in longhand, Sergeant. So... We have Lucille Dubois, lady's maid in a very wealthy society family, writing a long manuscript by hand. When it was finished, what would happen to such a manuscript? You take it to a public stenographer. To be typed. Surely, the unfortunate Miss Kirby. And where do people usually take typed manuscripts? To a publisher. And most publishers employ readers to weed out undesirable submissions. And that's your Miss Hazel of the village. Simple? Maestro, you're a genius. <laughs> but the men and girls are probably the only three people in the world who've read a certain unpublished manuscript. And that's why they were murdered. Man, it must be dynamite. The killer must have swiped it probably from the Hazel girl's apartment in the village after he bumped her off. And destroyed it, Danny. Yes, but there's still a possibility that something... Well, wrong. here we are, Maestro. Uh-huh. Here's Rockefeller Center. Come on. I must say, Mason and Morrison go in for book publishing in a large and handsome way, Ellery. <laughs> They're a bit on the sensational side, Nikki. Oh, uh, Miss Jenkins? Yes, Alberta Jenkins. Are you the assistant editor my son spoke to on the receptionist phone? Yes, and you must be Inspector Queen. That's right. I must say I'm all of a flutter. Am I arrested? <laughs> Not exactly, Miss Jenkins. Oh. Did you ring the list I asked you for? Here it is. All the manuscripts turned over to Miss Hazel the past few months for a reader's report. Let me see, Ellery. Say, she read a lot, doesn't she? Mm, it'll be quite recent, I think. Ah, look at this entry, Dad. Maid tells all. By Lucille Dubois. Wow. Wow. Miss Jenkins, where's this manuscript? Are you sure Miss Hazel didn't return it to Mason and Morrison? I'm pretty sure she didn't inspect it, but come into my office. <laughs> isn't here. Oh, no. But I just remembered. Where is that again? Remembered what, Miss Jenkins? There was a letter from Miss Hazel in this morning's mail. I've been so busy today, I... Here it is. Still unopened. Jimmy, give that to me, baby. Oh. Dear Miss Jenkins, enclosed is a short preliminary report on three of the last batch of manuscripts. I will personally deliver the manuscripts plus full reports later this week. The enclosed thumbnail reports cover number one. Give back my lover by Flo Gently. Flowy. Romance in our phone booth, my George had bag, wow. And the maid tells all by Lucille Dubois. No. Well, uh, Miss Jenkins, would you mind leaving us for a moment? I certainly do mind, Mr. Queen, but well. Where's that report the Hazel woman enclosed? Ah, yeah. Now we'll find out. A uh, maid tells all. Sensational true life story of high life as seen from back stairs. Style is faulty. Author obviously thinks in French, but might be worth a rewrite. Possibly high sales appeal, but must be screened carefully by legal departments against libel suits. That's all. Maid's manuscripts filled a lot of nasty, unsuspected stuff about the Canellas. It would have cost Milford Canella that high diplomatic post he's been angling for. Or Madge Canella, her blue blood Boston marriage. Yes, yeah, somehow the killer discovered what Lucille was writing, who typed her manuscript and the name of the publisher she sent it to. And through the publisher, which reader had it? So he's got a wipe out whoever run it. Steno, wham. Reader, wham. And he swipes the manuscript from her apartment. Then he goes back to the Canella dump and blasts Lucille in the secret society. Ah, uh, too safe, blasted. I thought we might find a clue here to the killer's identity. But apparently the whole Canella family has motive. Stymied. Let's go down to headquarters. Maybe the autopsy's turned up something. Don't drive 
drive so fast, Sergeant. You just passed a snail. Yeah, it was nothing but the ice for Miss Porter. You could only see some daylight. In this darkness, Inspector? Oh, um, at least I'm enjoying this ride on the East River Drive. Or I would be if the great man's <laughs> boss weren't. <laughs> of course. Of course. Well, Mr. Queen is with us again. Why they that? <laughs> the answer, Dad, it's right in your pocket. What answer? To the triple ladder, my son. My pocket. I forgot. You forgot. We all forgot, Dad. A certain message in red. Holy. That dying message Lucille wrote in her own blood. Sorry. The one we couldn't decipher. Here I put it. Ah, oh, here. What's the matter with Come me? Billy, get down to headquarters. Quick. Yeah, man. Ha. If anybody can make it out, it's that whistling lab. Men were in. Sailing, sailing over the world. Hey, you have to beat it up. Huh? What's it in your now, Sam? A car right in a trail coming up fast. Some drunk who wants to race. With a police car out. Billy, Billy, he's out the record. Oh, yeah? He's going faster. Look out, Jordan. Wait a minute. No, not with Nicky in the car. Don't mind me. He's gone. I could only spot the driver. It's too dark. Billy. One piece. Sorry. I'm okay, too. Inspector. Uh, no, no bones broken, Billy. Uh, Eddie. Uh, my miracle, we're all all right. Oh, Billy, that was quick thinking. Oh. Certainly was. Oh. Yeah, if it weren't for the way you took that crash, Sergeant, we've been through the retaining wall at the bottom of the river. Thanks, but look at the car, Inspector. Never mind the car. Why? Dad, Lucille's what? message. Huh? All three Canellas were present when I found it under Lucille's body this afternoon. One of them must have trailed us. Waiting a chance to destroy Lucille's clue before we could get it to headquarters. And the killer is one of the Canellas. And her message tells which one. Hey, the car, Billy. Let's get to that lab. <laughs> This way. Sergeant. No, good. Kind of looks like a puzzler in uh, Never mind characterizing it, Billy. What did they say the message is? Uh, it starts with a capital M, Maestro, like you said, then a period. M period, yes. Then a space, then a capital K, then a small I N, the N trailing off like she died before she could finish the work. And that's all. Capital M period, space... Capital K, small I-N. Capital K, small I-N. The start of the name Canella. No doubt about it, Nikki. But what's the capital M period space name? That's name Canella. M period must be the initial of one of the Canella's first names. Milford Canella. M for Milford. Well, the daughter's name also starts with an M, Nikki. Madge. Well, then it's either Madge or old man. Uh, let's not leave out Mrs. Canella. Don't you recall Canella dressing his wife as, uh, Margaret? Frost. Another washout. Again, it could be any of the three. Let's go back to the Canella house. I'll find out which one it is. Good evening. Oh, dear. Back Inspector Man again. And that nice Mr. Queen, etc. Well, Inspector, have you cleared up this mess? Where were you three late this afternoon and early evening? Where were you? Uh, the boy, uh, I, I needed air. I was strolling in uh, Central Park. Alone, Mrs. Canella? Uh, but, 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 yes. How about you, Mr. Canella? Well, as a matter of fact, I took a walk myself down Fifth Avenue. Very upsetting business, you know. Meet anybody you know, Mr. Canella? No. And you, Miss Canella? I took one of our cars and drove around town for a while just to uh, cool off. <laughs> I'd had a phone call from dear, dear Evie in Boston. My daughter's fiancé told her they'd better wait about announcing the engagement until this uh, this miserable affair blows over. I knew it. I just knew it. Uh, aren't we getting off the track? No alibis. Hey, Henry, anything to ask these three people before I take them downtown for a real going over? No, but uh, why do you want to take them to headquarters, Dad? Why do I? To find out which one of them bumped off the Kirby and Hazel girls and Mrs. Canella's maid. That's why. Oh, I can tell you that, Dad. Right here and now. And there, 
ladies and gentlemen, you have the mystery. Now, suppose you home armchair detectives match wits with Anison's guest for this evening. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, our guest, the famous actor of stage, screen, and radio, is Mr. Victor Jory, who is starring on Broadway in the hit play, Therese. Good evening, Mr. Jory. It's nice to have you with us. Well, Mr. Jory, I I guess tonight's show is a change for you, isn't it? It certainly is. Because generally, I'm on the other end. I'm the prisoner who's done the murdering, Hillary. <laughs> well, you always are the criminal, but uh, you're always so wonderful, too. <laughs> well, thank you, Nikki. Uh, I hope you'll like me just as well in the role of detective. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, well, Mr. Joy, who do you think murdered the three women? Well, I'm not very sure. I think it was the mother, oh, Margaret my... Canella. Why do you think that? Uh, my only reason for thinking that is because the uh, Milford Canella. Uh, suspicion is planted on him instantly by the fact that he says that he has a very important post and it's very valuable to him. The daughter banks that, backs that up. The mother has said nothing. Furthermore, the mother's alibi, uh, being in Central Park, seems to me one that could be shaken less easily than the man who walked down Fifth Avenue, which might be checked on, or the girl in the car, because the car could be checked on afterwards. Thank you, Mr. Jory. You'll find out in just a moment if your solution is correct. Now, here's Don Hancock for Anderson. Today, millions are switching to Anison. For Anison is the modern way to relieve headache suffering. There's nothing to fuss with, nothing to mix or spill. Just easy to take little tablets that you carry right in your pocket or purse. And Anison is the fast way to prolonged relief. Prove it. Next time you have a headache... Take an Anison. Anison must give you fast, prolonged relief or your money back. I'll repeat that. If you're not thoroughly satisfied that Anison does much more for your headache pain... Simply return the unused portion, and your money will be refunded. So tomorrow, ask your druggist for the small, inexpensive package containing 12 Anison tablets. Take only as directed. If pain persists or is unusually severe, see your physician. Remember, there's only one Anison. Don't be satisfied with anything less. Next time you have a headache pain... Take an Anison. All right, son. You know which of these respectable citizens killed the three girls? Sing out. Uh, Dad, what was the message Lucille Dubois left in her own blood? Start of Achilles' name. Capital M period, space, capital K-I-N for Canella. Yes. But what did the capital M period stand for? Well, it could only mean the initial of one of the Canella's first names, Ellery. Mm -hmm. How can it possibly represent one of the first names, Nicky? Milford, Madge, Margaret. All M's. If Lucille had presence of mind enough to write that message, certainly she wouldn't have left an ambiguous clue. A clue that could refer to any of the Canellas. So when she wrote that capital M period, she didn't mean the initial of one of their first names. She meant some other abbreviation. One she thought would be perfectly clear. But what, Marston? Well, Sergeant, what abbreviation, other than a first initial, usually precedes a last name? Huh? Abbreviation for Mr., Mrs., or Miss. Oh, but no, that, that would be MR, MRS. And Miss has no abbreviation. Oh, so it can't be that either, Ellery. It can't stand for Mr., Mrs., or Miss in English. But how about French? French? What? Mrs. Canella's maid was French. And that reader's report in her book actually remarked that the author obviously thinks in French. What's the French abbreviation for Mrs.? Any schoolboy knows that. Capital M, small M E for madam. Miss? Capital M, small L-L-E for mademoiselle. But for Mr., monsieur, it's simply capital M, period. Get him, Billy. Uh, I'll see you all sizzle for this. Oh, yeah. I disagree, Mr. Canella. If anyone's going to sizzle, it's you. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the solution to our mystery. We'd like to thank Mr. Jory for being our guest armchair detective this evening. And as mementos of the occasion, Anison has for Mr. Jory a beautiful Gruen, very thin wristwatch, a copy of my new mystery anthology, Rogue's Gallery, and a subscription to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Ellery will be back in a moment with a preview of next week's story. Meanwhile, remember, because it relieves headache pain so fast... 
Take an anison. Because it gives prolonged relief. Take an anison. Because it's made like a doctor's prescription. Take an anison. There's only one anison. Get anison tomorrow. And now, Ellery, uh, how about next week's case? Got another mystery with three or four murders? <laughs> no, Don, only one murder next week. But it's one of the most confusing to come our way in a long time. A tough one, huh? Yes, we had so much evidence, we didn't know what to do with it. Uh, not to mention the problem of the bending corpse. The bending corpse? <laughs> Looks like that did it, Don. Now you'll have to wait till next week when Anison presents The Adventure of the Happy Marriage. <laughs> First precinct, Sergeant Collins. You what? Smell gas? Where is this? East 70 what? Or what floor? You haven't found where it's coming from? That's right. Get the people out. See if you can locate where it's coming from. No, no. Now, that's all right. We'll take care of it. You're in the muster room at the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. You'll have assistance right away. Yes, sir, right away. No, no, just stay where you are. The officers will be there right away. 21st precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. It was Tuesday morning. I'd been on the job since 8 when I turned out the platoon for the day tour. After I read and signed reports, I went on patrol of the precinct with Patrolman Farrell as my operator. As we turned off Park Avenue into 72nd Street, a signal 32 came over the air. 618 East 75th Street. Ambulance and emergency squad responding. Sounded like a gas case. I told Farrell to make the run. When we turned into the block, I could see that sector car number one was on the job. So was the sergeant's car. There was no sign of either the ambulance or the ESD car. 618 was a five-story tenement building. A few passers-by and neighbors were beginning to gather on the sidewalk. There's the spot, Carl. Pull in. Yes, sir. All right, let's go. Right with you, Captain. That's either the ESC or the ambulance coming now. Yeah. Keep the sidewalk clear, pal. Keep off the stoop. That's all right, folks. Will you let it, let it go, yeah? You, will you please get off the stoop? Big here, pal. Yes, sir. Well, I can smell that gas out here. It's sick. Pal. Yes, sir. Keep people away from those doorbells. Yes, sir. Now, look, I told you to get off the stoop. Sergeant Collins. Captain Canelli. Second floor, Captain. All right. Sergeant? You're back, Captain. All right. You stay home in there. Open up, open up. It's the police. Where is it, Sergeant? Beat me, Captain. We haven't been able to locate it. Better locate it fast. Open up in there. And the building up. Open up in there. There's nobody's home, Captain. We've been hitting every door. I sent a man up to third and another to fifth. We're clearing everybody out. It's not on this floor. Coley! Did you locate it? He's on the fourth floor, Captain. Whole hall smells again. No telling where it's coming from. Who put in the call? Super. He's up with Coley. Tenant smell gas in the hall. How about the main feed line? I sent glass into the basement with the super glass to turn off the valve. Good. Now, uh, come on, folks. Don't stand there and talk about it. Out on the street, please. Get in the sidewalk. Did you open your windows, folks? And have your doors open? All right. Out of the building. All right, come on. Yes, sir. 
Anybody covered the third floor yet? Just quickly and away up, Captain. I told those people to clear out. Not them. Let's try that one. Smells pretty strong here. Police officers, open up in there. Police officers, open up. This could be it, Captain. Open up. Curly. Come on down here. Bring the super with you. Well, this is it, I'm sure. What do you want to do, Captain? Push the door in? Yeah. All right, let's go. Together. Again. Now. You think so? Yeah. Let me see if I can kick it. Go ahead. Try it again. Yep, this is it, all right? Keep low. Coley, hit that window. I'll get this one. Here's the... Sergeant, get the stove. I've got it. Shut off, Captain. How's the other window, Coley? Sure, Captain. <laughs> yeah, looks like the culprit, Captain. Yeah. Coffee boiled over. Put out the flame. Sure ruined a good coffee pot. Well, that looks like about it. Coley. Yes, sir. Take a look in that room. See if anybody's in there. Let's try this one, Sergeant. Only one burner was on, Captain. Looks like an accident. Nobody in here. Coley. Anybody in that room? No, sir, nobody. Well, the ambulance, the EFD just got here. You can head them off, Sergeant. We don't need them. Yes, sir. Right away. Say, Coley. Where's the super? I left him out in the hall, Captain. Well, I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Let's give this room a chance to air him <clears throat> out. Who is it down there, Phil? Yes, sir. Mr. Campisi. You want to see me? Yeah, this is Captain Kennelly, Mr. Philip Campisi, Superintendent. Glad to know you. How are you? Real mess this turned out to be. Real mess. Well, it could have been worse. I headed off the ambulance in the SG, Captain. Good. <laughs> Hey, listen, was it necessary to kick the door in? Look at that. The panel is split. The lock is busted. Ain't worth much of anything now. Well, what did you expect us to do, Mr. Champisi? There might have been somebody overcoming here, or a spark could have blown up the building. Well, that's all well and good, but I'm the one that's got to explain to the landlord. I'm the one that's got to ask him for a new door, new hardware. This could never be fixed. Never. Even a frame is shot. Look, what's the name of the tenant here? The tenant? Yeah. Oh, a tenant is a fellow named Harrods, Alfred Harrods. Listen, is any damage inside? Just to the coffee pot. Oh, well, that ain't the landlord. That's his, Harrods. None of these flats furnished. The tenants got to furnish their own furniture and furnishings. Where is he? What do you mean, where is he? Where'd he go? Well, listen, as long as he pays his rent, he can come and go as he pleases. I don't keep track of him. Can we, uh, we take a look inside? I, I just want to check for sure there's no damage. I, I got to call a landlord, give him the whole story. You got this pretty well cleared out by now, huh, Captain? Yeah, I'd imagine. Uh, landlord's going to hit the ceiling about this door. Still smells pretty bad of gas in here. Oh, uh, it's all right. You, uh, you don't have any idea where this tenant could be. Well, I told you. Did you call the police? Yeah, that was me. Mrs. Truro on the fourth floor come down and knocked on my door. She said she smelled gas in the hall. You know. I came upstairs and I checked. Checked immediately. Sure enough. Well, I couldn't tell where it was coming from, though. I had the same trouble as you, so I called. Mm -hmm. well, who knows what could happen in a situation like that? You you got to call. Uh, don't look like there was any damage to stove, huh? Listen, Mr. Champisi, this whole thing was very lucky. Yeah, very lucky. New door. Oh, the place could have been blown sky high. I want you to call the station house when this tenant gets home. I want to send an officer over here to talk to him about going out and leaving a pot of coffee on the farm. Talk to him myself. Well, you call the station house. Yeah, okay, I'll call. He's calling. Yes, sir. Go downstairs and tell Farley can let the tenants up now. It's all over. Yes, sir. He should be given a piece of somebody's mind. Where does he work? Well, I don't know. He's um a salesman, I think. He sells things. Yeah? What? Well, I don't know. I never asked him. He paid up two months' rent in advance when he moved in, so I wasn't too curious. Now, how long has he lived here? Oh, three, four weeks. You know he had a phone put in? It's the only phone in the building. Besides mine, which the landlord stands good for. If a guy can afford a phone, I don't worry too much. Did you see him this morning? No. No, I don't budge out of my place. Not unless I have to. I still smell a little gas in here, Captain. Well, check that burner again. Yes, sir. Looks off to me. It is. Well, open up the oven. Yes, sir. Well, what do you know? Hey, that's a fine thing to keep in the oven. Papers. What is it, Sergeant? Policy, Let's see that. 
No wonder the guy looks like a millionaire. Just in cash, Captain. Hey, is all that good? It's good. I never saw so much money in a lump. Looks like we've got a policy drop, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Well, listen, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what the guy did. Don't hold it against me that he lived here. Tenant is a tenant and, until he proves himself otherwise. Calling. Yes, sir. Let's see what else we can find around here, Sergeant. Yes, sir, Captain. Uh, give uh, Sergeant Collins a hand. Yes, sir. Let's start over here. You never know about some people. Numbers game in my building. You just never know. On discovery that the flat in which there had been a gas leak was occupied by a person in apparent violation of the gambling laws... I instructed Sergeant Collins to notify the desk officer at the 21st, who in turn would notify the office of the division commander so that plain clothes men responsible for the enforcement of gambling laws would be sent to the scene to investigate. As this notification was being made, a more thorough search of the premises was conducted by patrolmen Coley and Farrell under my supervision and in the presence of the civilian witness, Philip Champisi, the superintendent of the building. In a closet were found two electric calculating machines and tally sheets in addition to the policy slips and the cash. 80, 80, 120, 35, 45, 6, 7, 8, 9, 50, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Like a gold mine. $2,857, Captain. All right, Coley. Enter the amount in your memorandum book. Yes. Hey, now, here's an opportunity. Let's all go to Belmont. We could, we could still make the daily double. You want to sign my book, Captain? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what's all the production? Are you afraid this Harrods guy might say you shortchanged him? Well, we just don't want to give him anything to say. Val. Yes, sir. You got all that stuff together? Yes, sir. We'll need a bushel basket for all these policy slips, Captain. Boy, oh, this guy was running some bank. Uh, Mr. Champagne. Yeah. What, uh, what happens to all the money? Oh, it gets turned over to the property clerk until the court determines who's the rightful owner. Well, listen, uh, could you give me some consideration? You know, if I didn't put in the call, you never would have found it. When did you say this Mr. Harrods moved in here? Oh, I don't know, uh, three, four weeks ago. And he told you he was a salesman? Yeah, that's sir. He didn't tell you anything else. What do you mean? He didn't tell you what he sold? Well, listen, I, I didn't know anything about him. What can I do? Now, listen, Captain. Are the plane closemen on the way, Sergeant? Yes, sir. But one of the tenants told me he saw the girlfriend of the fellow who has this flat standing outside in the crowd. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I forgot to tell you about his girlfriend. Is she still there? She was when I came up. I told Farrell to keep an eye on her. Take charge, sir, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Champ, is he? Yeah. Man, what a day. You look to be a hundred and never see so much excitement, huh? Uh, how about, how about smoke, Captain? Give me that. Oh, oh I'm sorry, the gas. Yeah, excuse me, I, I forgot, Captain. Well, you better remember, or you'll never get anywhere near a hundred. Come on, let's get downstairs. Although the flat in which the gas leak had occurred was obviously a policy drop, there was no conclusive evidence that would lead to a conviction of either Harrods or any of his associates, despite the large amount of cash discovered, the calculating machines, the policy slips, and the tally sheets. Both the policy slips and the tally sheets were from previous day's play, and it's a good idea to have evidence showing the play was made on the day of the arrest. It was my thought to keep the girlfriend of Harrods under surveillance until the plainclothesman arrived. Then, as they thought best, they could question her, take her to the station house, or attempt to follow her in order to connect him directly with the evidence. On the way downstairs, I told the super of the building that I wanted to stand outside on the stoop and talk to him, apparently in connection with the accident. I warned him not to look in the direction of the girl, nor point to her. All right, I'll, I'll do just like you say. Count on it, Captain. I hope I can. Val. Yes, sir. Uh, don't look in her direction, but uh, which girl is it? See the gray Plymouth coupe parked at the curb there? Yeah. She's standing right next to it, Captain. The blonde, about 25 years old, 5'4". Has on a beige coat. Yeah. That's her, all right. I've seen her go up to visit him time and time again. I asked her not to look over there. I didn't look. I just glimpsed. Just talk to me. What do you want me to talk about? Uh, weather? That'll do. Well, uh, <clears throat> looks like it's going to turn into a nice day after all, huh? You know, when I woke up today, looked out the window, I had my doubts. Uh, listen, Captain, what happens to the $2,850? Does he get that back? I told you he does if he can prove it's lawfully his. Oh, well, who is it you're waiting for? Detectives? Plain clothes on. Well, what's the difference? Plain clothes and detectives? I always thought they were the same. No. Plain clothes are assigned to enforce gambling and vice laws. Oh. 
Detectives investigate all other serious crimes. You know I never knew that? No, I suppose a lot of people don't. Oh, you'd be surprised. You'd be very surprised. Have you seen her here very often, Mr. Champisi? On occasion. On several occasions. When? Daytime or at night? Both. But my wife, she knows everything that goes on around here. My wife says she's here all the time. Day, night, afternoon. She's turning the go, Captain. Yeah, I see her. Any sign of the plane clothesman? No, sir. What are you going to do? This, this is getting to be a situation. Stay here, pal. Yes, sir. You too. Excuse me, please. Yes, sir. Hey, Pardon me. Yes, miss. Miss, wait a minute. Me? Yeah. What's your name, miss? Who are you? I'm a police officer. What do you want to know my name for? I want to know. Glory. Gloria Nathan. Who's your friend in that building? What building? 618 East 75th. I don't think I have to tell you that. It's Al Harrods, isn't it? No, it isn't. Well, who is it then? Nobody. Well, why were you standing outside there? Well, I was just curious. I'm entitled to be curious when there's excitement going on. It's Al Harrods, isn't it? He's your friend. No. You came by to see him this morning. When you were walking down the street toward the place, you saw the police there. You were worried. You found out the gas leak was in his place. Listen, I don't know any Al Harris. I told you that. I was just standing there because I was curious. That's all. Look, Gloria, you don't want to get into trouble, do you? I won't get in trouble. You will if you keep telling me one lie after another. What can you do to me? You can't do anything to me. Would you mind walking back to the building with me? Of course I'd mind. Well, let's walk back anyway. I haven't done anything. I don't see why you're picking on me just because I was curious. Well, there's a few things we want to get straightened out. If you want to get something straightened out, that's no business of mine. What's it got to do with me? Uh, Mr. Champisi. Person is entitled to be curious. You call me, Jeff? Yes. Is uh, this young woman a friend of Al Harris? Yeah, he's a friend of his. I've seen her go up there. That's a lie. Plenty of times. I've never even heard of any Al Harris. The plane closed, my captain. This is getting to be ridiculous. You're telling him. Hello, Captain. Thomas, how have you been? Fine. I understand you struck gold. That's right. Look, all this is well and good, but what do you want with me? I've got a right to know. Sure, you've got a right to know. We're going to take you to the station house. One of the plane clothes men went upstairs to take charge of the premises, while the other accompanied the young woman, Gloria Navin, and I to the station house. A policewoman was sent for to make a search of the suspect. In the meantime, Patrolman Coley and Sergeant Burns returned to the station house with the money found in the flat. This was turned over to the desk officer and entered in the blotter. In about a half hour, the policewoman arrived and made a search of the clothing and purse of the suspect. Nearly 1,000 policy slips and about $400 in cash was found on her person. While the policewoman sat nearby, Gloria was questioned in my office. Well, now look, you know what's going to happen to you, don't you? No, I don't know. What? As soon as we get through talking to you, I'm going to take you out there to the desk and book you in. Then you're going to ride down to court and talk to the judge. They won't keep me. I've got the number of a bondsman. All I have to do is call him. That only lets you out until the trial. What good the bondsman going to do you after he's sentenced? You're headed straight for the house of detention. You ever been in there? No. No, I haven't. No, I didn't know. That's why I asked you. You know you can get a year out of this, Gloria? No, he wouldn't be that tough. Well, never that tough in these kind of cases. That's the captain. It'd be a suspended sentence or a fine, maybe. You know that. Well, I don't know. The judge is going to say to me, he's going to say that you cooperate, officer. And what can I say? All I can do is tell him the truth. All I can say is, judge, she wasn't a bit of help. Her boyfriend had this policy drop, but there wasn't a bit of conclusive evidence up there. She had all the incriminating evidence in her possession. She wouldn't help us at all. I've seen people stand up there. They think, who you hurt in making a little book or writing a few numbers tickets? They think the most they'll get out of it is a slap on the wrist. Then wham, they get hit right between the eyes. And it doesn't make any difference what you think or what I think about it. Gambling is a violation of the law. The way things are, pressure's on the judges, too. They let somebody off easy in a gambling case, they get criticized. They've been handing out some jolts down there. Isn't that right, Captain? Oh, so I hear. You wouldn't give me a year. You wouldn't take the chance, it's up to you. All I can tell them is that you want a bit of help. Supposing I want some help. I wouldn't want to do a year. It's not worth it. Well, like I said, all I can do is tell him the truth. But it stands to reason you'd get a lot more consideration if I could tell him, for instance, that you helped us knock over a big policy bank. He'd kill me. He'd just kill me. Who? Al. 
He beats me up for no reason at all. What would he do to me if I gave him a reason? Well, it wasn't your fault that he was stupid enough to go away and leave the fire burning under the coffee, was Oh, but he's not going to look at it that way. You don't know where I'll... I'd like to help you, but you know how it is. Well, that's too bad. I'd like to help you, too. Shame we can't do anything for each other. Let's book her in, Captain. No sense wasting any more time. Come on, Gloria. This way. You wouldn't be that tough on me, the judge. I can't tell you what's on the judge's mind. This way. No sense making any predictions. It all depends. It's nothing to do but take my chances. Stand right up to the desk, then. I want to book her in, Sergeant. What's the name? M-A-V-A-N. Gloria. How old are you, Gloria? 24. Address? 321 Lewiston Avenue. In Manhattan? In Manhattan, yeah. Listen, the only thing I'm worried about is what he'd do to me. Al, I mean. He couldn't do anything to you if you never saw him again. But if you're that crazy about him, what's the use of talking? Who said I'm crazy about him? Where were you born? In the Bronx. Listen, I'm not going to do a year for him. That'd be crazy, wouldn't it? That's what I've been trying to impress on you. Who's going to look out for you if you don't look out for yourself? Any prior arrests and convictions? One arrest. No conviction. All right. What do you want to know? Am I a friend of Al Harris? Yes. Do I work for him, too? Yes. What else? Is there any way he could have known about what happened at his place today? Only if I called him and told him, that was the only way. Where was he? You know, around. Making his collections and meeting his runners. He couldn't have known. There's no way. Where is he now? I don't know where he is now, but... I know where he'll be at 2 o'clock. Where? He'll be at a bar and grill in Yorkville. 736 East 85th. He meets a couple of his collectors there every day. They turn over their play in the collection store. In the bar? No. He parks his car. They all got keys to the trunk. He just sits in there while they drop the play and money in the trunk of his car. When he comes out, it's all ready to drive away. He just sits in there and drinks beer. Is that what you wanted to know? I told you. You going to save me that year? Like I said, I'll tell him the truth. Okay. Oh, he'll get out of bond and he'll beat me up. He'll just beat the living daylights out of me. All right, if you're worried about that, we'll see that you get protection. He won't lay a hand on you. Listen, please worry about your own job. If Al wants to beat me up, that's between me and him. We took Gloria back into my office and she supplied us with all the information she was able to furnish. It was decided that Thomas's partner remain at the flat in the event Al Harris returned there unexpectedly. At 2.45, I accompanied Thomas to the vicinity of the bar and grill on East 85th Street. Gloria could give us only a hazy description of his car, and we were unable to spot it parked on the street. A little after 3 o'clock, we walked into the bar and grill. Gloria had described Al Harris as a short and rather heavy set man. She said he would probably be wearing a plaid sports shirt, a type for which he had a passion. a plaid shirt back there in the booth. Al Harrods, did she say? That's the name he used. Al Board, Captain. I've been wondering where he was the last couple of months. You, uh, you know him, huh? Real well. Oh, hello, Al. Oh, hi. Stand up, Al. Hey, listen, I'm clean. Come on, stand up. All right. That's the way. I guess you are clean. You could have taken my word for it. You know, I was just thinking about you the other day, Al. Oh, were you? I sure was. Uh, this is Captain Kennelly. Oh, how are you? You don't mind if we uh, sit down, do you, Al? No, no, no. Help yourself. Thanks. Plenty of room. Captain, did he say uh, you're a cop, too? That's right. What have you been doing with yourself lately, Al? I haven't seen you around. Well, you know, that last 90 days in Rikers Island cured me. And I said to myself, Al, it don't pay. Hang up. That's no hotel in the mountains over there on Rikers Island, you know. Dump the racket. How are you getting along? Fine. Just fine. Live around here? No, I'm, uh, I'm over Jersey now. Oh, what are you doing here? You still working out of this division? That's right. You too, Captain? He's commander of the 21st Precinct. No kidding. Captain, this Al is an example of how a good boy can turn out to be an honest citizen. You stick him a couple of times and he learns the racket doesn't pay. 
You live in Jersey, hmm? Yeah, that's right. You working? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm breaking my back every day. Working for my wife's brother over there. He's got a poultry business. You don't say. Yeah, up the crack of dawn every day. Well, what are you doing in the big city? Oh, I just came over to see a fella, a friend of mine. You want something, Captain? I'll get the girl over. No, no thanks. So I cured you, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm walking that tightrope now. I'm on a square and I love it. Well, didn't I tell you? You wouldn't believe me. Well, I believe you now, Mr. Thomas. I'll never forget you. Won't you, Al? No, sir. You know, I've been a long time in this job, Al. There's not many guys you run into who can make you feel that you accomplished something. You make me feel that way, Al, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it, too, Mr. Thomas. Captain, this guy's made my day. You wouldn't kid me, Al. Well, would I lie to you, Mr. Thomas? No, Al, I don't believe you would. No, nah, not me, brother. I learned. That's for the birds. Well, I gotta go. It's nice to see you, Al. Yeah. Um, uh, just a second, Al. We're going to. Oh. Captain, if I know this guy, I'll bet you he's hustling policy slips across the river in Jersey. I'm telling you, I'm out of it. Since I finished that bit on Rikers Island, I'm out of it. After you, Captain. Thanks. I mean, uh, maybe uh, I fly the numbers once in a while. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not so bad. But Crookham, not me, brother. I had my stomach full of that. That's for the birds. Well, here's my car. Yeah, it sure is for the birds, Al. And you're a folk, too, with a 20-foot wingspread. Yeah. All right. Open up the trunk of your car. I don't know. What's going on? Go on. Open it up. Al, we hit your place on 75th Street. We got you $2,800 in cash and a go-kart full of policy slips. Put the key in. Well, what are you stringing me along for, a 20-foot wingspread? You were stringing yourself along, Al. Oh, you could be frank. Well, look. Another gold mine, Captain. Smeckle cruelly let me think I conned you out of it. All right, close it up. Be careful, Thomas. Watch that he doesn't fly away. He's a bird. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Collins. What is this? Thirty three sixty one. How was he shot? How many hold up now? Just one. Which way and so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, featured in tonight's cast were Mandel Kramer, Bill Quinn, Bill Lipton, Joan Loring, Bill Zuckert, John Sylvester, and Jack Orison. Written and directed by Stanley Niff, produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... poet wrote that there is nothing in words. Believe what is before your eyes. But what about the mind's eye? In it, dreams and nightmares are real enough. And wide awake, any number of persons have seen apparitions or have had premonitions through extrasensory perception. The world of the macabre, then, is not unreal at all. Sometimes, quite often, in fact, Real life is macabre. It has become so for a young Hollywood actress named Mady Rambeau. What does this note mean? Just what I wrote. You've seen the snapshot. You'll pay, Miss Rambeau. My boss thinks it's worth a hundred grand. Blackmail? Who took the picture? Now, I wonder about that, too. But there it is. You at a private gambling party with your arms around the neck of a known mobster. You. 
Miss Clean. You'll pay, Miss Rambo. <laughs> mystery drama, Blackmail, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Larry Haynes and Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. is honorable if it is earned honestly. Aristotle, for one, maintained that real happiness can be achieved only if you work up to your standard of excellence. That is a viewpoint that means nothing to those who cheat. The kind of person who cuts corners sometimes goes too far. He becomes a thief. Thieves come in many grades, and the lowest is a blackmailer. One of them the man we're about to meet is a blackmailer, Eddie Small, who owns Small's Chop House in West Hollywood. Maxie. Maxie. Huh? What are you staring at? Something wrong? Uh, I don't know. Look at that guy in the booth. The one by himself. Okay, what about him? He looks familiar. Why not? He's been in two or three times. Nice looking. Don't be stupid, Eddie. But thanks all the same. For what? Mm, Being jealous after all these years. (laughs) You're still great looking, Maxie. Yeah, and I still ought to be in pictures. Who is he? Who is who? I just keep looking at that guy. I've seen him somewhere before. Not here. It'll come to me. Go ask him. You don't look like some of the pugs and hustlers who come out and nurse a slow beer. I'll walk over. Go ahead. I'll be in the back room. Eddie. I got it. You know who that is? Tony Carpo. Hey. The tough boy from New York. Yeah, he shaved his mustache and cut his hair normal, but that's the face. That's what we saw in the newspapers. I think you're right. He's wanted by the New York police for hijacking a booze truck and killing the driver. What do we do? We don't call the cops. But I don't want him around the joint. I've got a lot of customers who don't want cops snooping around. Including us. Yeah, right. Ask for his bill and tell him this place is off limits. If he needs a hand out, I'll stake him. Eddie, listen, I'm thinking of something. Maybe you could, uh, help us. No, thank you. He's wanted for murder. I want him out of here. What about Mady Rambo? Huh? You see what I mean? Clean the guy up, buy him some good clothes, let him be our collector. What's he got to lose? You're not only beautiful, Maxie. You're smart. That's an idea. Go have a talk with him and play it close. He's a killer. Hi. How you doing? Okay. Good food. Eddie serves the best. You've been in before? Twice. No rule against it, is there? Oh, of course not. Come often and stay late. Thank you. Well, I'm finished. Oh, you can pay me. You the boss? Eddie Small owns the place that I kind of oversee it. Oh, the innkeeper's wife? Yeah, you might say that. I'm Maxine. Glad to meet you. And you? Tony. Corbett. Corbett? That's right. Okay, if you say so. Why? You stick to that? You question all the customers? I like to get to know them. I mean, we draw a strange crowd, racetrack touts, ex-fighters, guys in the numbers, rackets, all kinds. So far, none like you, Mr. Corbett. Meaning what, Maxine? I've seen you before. Oh, I see. In the newspapers, without the long hair and mustache. Yeah, thanks for the tip. I like your joint. Sorry, this has to be my last visit. I'll clear up. Oh, that was Eddie's idea. I got a different one. Eddie said if you need a handout, you're welcome. Well, that's very nice of him. 
Why, is he afraid I'll shoot up the place? Well, you've used a gun before. We don't want any of that around here. It would attract the cops. We don't care for them very much. Mr. Carpo. You said Eddie left me to clear out. You had a different idea. What is it? You know who Mady Rambo is? The young movie actress? That's the one. Miss Queen. She's going to be big if her image doesn't get spoiled. Public image, I mean. Why should it be? Well, everybody thinks she's a straight arrow, no booze, everybody's young sweetheart, you know. Mm-hmm. So perfect she don't have to be born again. Okay. What about her? She could mean uh, money to you. I don't get it. Interested. Well, sure, sure. I could use some real money, but uh, what do I have to do for it? Oh, I'll leave that to Eddie. He'll explain. Uh, not here. Why not? Someone else might recognize you as Tony Carbo and blow the whistle. You free at five? Sure. I'll give you an address on Mechanic Street. You be there and Eddie will talk to you. Yeah, what's it all about? You'll find out at five, Tony. Right on there, Maxie. Right on time. Hi. Come in, Tony. Nice place. Eddie, this is Tony Carbo. How are you, Tony? Okay, so far. You know, I like your restaurant. You must do well to live like this. Mm, the restaurant does okay, but it's no gold mine. We uh, do other things. Oh, I see. Is that where I come in? Maxine said something about Mady Rambo. Are you into movies? Mm, in a small way. And you got a proposition for me? Yeah, a pretty good one. I think you agree. Tony Carbo is one about the police. You're safe with me. You ain't safe if you show yourself around Hollywood. Why'd you come here from New York? I'm shipping out. Oh, yeah? How do you manage that? Well, this uh, small freighter will take me on. Bound for where? South America. Freighter's got a sideline too, right? Yeah, so they tell me. Who tells you that? Oh, a Jersey pal I've done a few favors for, Joe Hernandez. Runs dope. That's the guy? That's the guy. I don't know what he does except what I read in the paper. So you ship out and then what? I do a fade out. Hmm. Guy without a country? Yeah, something like that. Well, that's better than facing a murder charge, right? Yeah, I'd say so. And you ship out when? Well, the boat docks in three days. I'll be gone in five. What's the name of the freighter? I'll keep that to myself. Five days should do it, Eddie. It's been three weeks, babe, and we got nowhere. I don't know. We got nothing to lose. Could you use ten grand? Not if I have to earn it with a gun. No gun. Nothing like that. Show me the picture, Maxine. What do you think of that, Tony? Yeah. I get it. Blackmail. That picture's worth a hundred grand. You collect, you get ten percent. You know who the man in the picture is? Big Frank Fatella. Runs the town. Yeah, I know, I know. I've heard of him, the mobster. Yeah, they call him that, but he's a smooth businessman. Into everything that turns a buck. Restaurants, tracks, betting, you name it. And there's Lady Rambo with her arms around his neck. Hollywood's Miss Queen hugging Big Frank. I guess you know what would happen if the picture went public. Um, uh, who's gambling joint? Well, it's private. It's not important. The picture says gambling joint, and that's the last place the public expects to see Mady Rambo. So? So she pays, and she stays Miss Clean. She doesn't. Her career is finished. You got it. I collect the money, and I get ten grand. Is that right? Uh, that's right. And, uh... You've been trying to collect for, uh, how long did you say? Three weeks? Yeah. We sent her a copy of the picture and made our demand. I gave her a month to come up with a dough. Time's just about run out. Mm. How'd you get the picture? <laughs> She'd like to know, too. Professional secret, Tony. You have the negative? I know where it is. Well, she won't pay off without getting that. Nobody is that stupid. Well, then give it to her. We'll make a copy. Look, you can't squeeze her forever. What if they track down whoever took the picture? They can't. Take my word for it. 
How do you arrange for the money to be delivered? Uh, we got a drop arranged, a real clever one. Nah, the cops know all the tricks. Probably Big Frank does, too. I think you're lucky Mady hasn't come through with the money. Once she does, it'll lead to you. Now you know why you're here, Tony. Mm-hmm. The collector. A ten grand sitting duck. Well, what do you say, Tony? I can try. What? Well, what's wrong with tonight? Where does she hang out? You're not going to her house. No, no, no. She goes out. What restaurant? Mason. She got a boyfriend or an escort? She was more of an escort, a hairdresser from the studio. Uh-huh. I'll need some money, say, a uh, hundred. You got it. Uh, you're you're going to speak to her in the restaurant? Why not? Well, if you're spotted, you're going to be picked up. If you're not, what if she raises a fight? Before she gets the chance, I say I'm there to help her. How? You're holding a picture over her head. What if I say I know who the blackmailers are? <laughs> you wouldn't do that, would you, Pally? Now, you know better than that, Eddie. I tell her if she loses her nerve and wants to yell police, I don't carry the picture, but I describe it. She'll listen to me. Now, what about the escort, that hairdresser? Don't worry about him. What's his name? Jody Pearl. Okay, Maxine, will you telephone Mason's and ask if Lady Rambo's having dinner there tonight? You know what worries me, Tony? What's that? How you get into Mason's without a cop spotting you? You're wanted for murder. They won't spot me. I can make sure they don't. There's nothing supernatural about what's happened so far. But... Macabre? I'd say yes. One synonym for that word is grotesque. And that, for me, describes blackmail and those who practice it. In Eddie Small, Maxine, and Tony Carbo, we have a charming trio trying to extract a fortune from a young movie star. How they fare will be unfolded when I return with Act Two. destroyed when the public is turned against one of its heroes by learning that he is a human being. Everyone commits indiscretions. They're usually shrugged off. But when a statesman, a famous athlete, or a movie star makes a careless statement or is photographed out of context with his public image, the public turns on him. We are hero worshippers. Knowing this, the blackmailer makes heroes pay for their mistakes. As young Lady Rambo has found out. Don't you dare tell me what to do. Well, I only said... I won't. I won't. But maybe... No. But I'll tell you what I will do. I am going to get whoever did this to me. Swell. Good luck. Don't be sarcastic, Jody. I mean it. Okay, you mean it. How? Have the police got to leave? Frank the teller will find him. Or them. Whoever. You spoke to the teller? The head of the studio did. Mr. The teller did a slow burn... His boys are at work? He phoned and said he was sorry. When he finds the pig... That... Yeah, sure, sure, but then it'll be too late. You stalled for three weeks. You've got a week left. Pay the money now and save your career. No, I didn't do anything wrong and I'm not going to pay. Well, it's your career, it's not mine. What did I do that was wrong? You got your picture taken embracing a notorious mobster. You, every parent's darling, the girl they'd like their daughters to be. I did not embrace him. Take a look at the snapshot. I won a big pot at roulette and I was jumping with excitement. So was Mr. Botello. I didn't even know who he was. He grinned at me, opened his arms, and I jumped. Right out of the movies. <sighs> if that picture gets printed, you're finished. You've busted your public image. That is not true. I know that, but protect yourself. The police will go on looking for the blackmailer. So will Mr. Vitello. Oh, you've got some funny loyalties. How do you know Vitello didn't set you up for that snapshot? What? Well, think it over. Now get your coat, and we'll head for Mason. You think Mr. Vitello... He's Big Frank, remember? He might... He might have set me up for blackmail? It's one of his rackets, baby. What's this? A note from some admirer. What else? Jody, he's here. Who? The blackmailer. Let me see that note. Ah, uh, 
May I speak with you alone? I overheard that you are being victimized. I may be able to help you. I'm in the dark, too. Will you come over to my table? I'm alone, wearing tinted glasses. Look around, and I'll bow my head. Ah, there he is. I'll ask the captain to notify the security guard. No. Yes. You know who that man is? The collector. Not the blackmailer? No, he's from the blackmailers. Just some guy to collect the money. How do you know that? Well, it's the way it works. Let me speak to the guy, then get the police. No. No, no, it's my career. Maybe the man does want to help me. You just stay here. I'll go over to his table. Mm this note you sent to my table. Someone is trying to extort a fortune from you because of a snapshot of you and Frank Vitello. You said you might be able to help me. How? Can you raise the money? Say I could and say I won't. You won't pay? I did nothing wrong. Now, my friend's all for calling the police because he thinks you're the collector. Who's the friend? Jody Pearl, a hairdresser at the studio. It's well informed. Now, if I give him a signal, you will be escorted to the police, Mr. Corbett. That's a waste of time. I don't know much. You overheard I was being blackmailed. Where? That's a lead. A dead end. What I don't know and what seems to have been overlooked is how this racket works. It's been worked in other studios, but no one's found out how. Now, that's how I might be able to be of help, Miss Rambo. Now, who took the picture? I have no idea. The snapshot, even a negative in all the copies, they're not as important as discovering the person who had a camera and clicked it. You know, first you sound like a collector, and now you sound like a cop. Why do you care how the racket is worked? There's no protection for you, Miss Rambo, unless the person who snapped the picture is caught. Even if you paid the 100000 even if you got a negative in exchange, you'd still be unprotected. I paid the money. You'd give it to the blackmailer. I'd find him or he'd find me. How? Oh. Through Frank Fratello. He's looking for the blackmailer, isn't he? How do you know that? That's just a guess. He doesn't hurt innocent persons. Uh, an honorable monster. I think so. You, uh, you'd see your meet, Mr. Fratello? Yeah. Jody said I was crazy. You're even crazier. Mr. Vitello might break every bone in your body. And learn nothing. Because I don't know anything. If he doesn't believe me, I'm dead. If he does, then that's my gamble. I can lead him to the blackmailer. Because you can be sure he'll find out I've got the money and he'll come after me. How will the blackmailer know that? Vitello's men let it be known. So the blackmailer goes after you? That's right. I'd rely on the teller to protect me. And what's in this for you? Ten percent. Ten thousand. Mm. What about the other night? You'd get it back. How can you guarantee that? By catching the man who snapped the picture. What is it that you're saying that I give you the hundred thousand, you break the racket by finding out how it's worked, you keep ten and return the rest? Why? Blackmail's a dirty crime. It was once worked on me. What's to prevent you from taking the hundred thousand and running out? I won't. That's all I can say. Either you believe me or you don't. I'll take the chance. Tell me what to do. Well? Nothing. Who is the guy? Just a nut. Did he know anything? What's his name? Tony Corbett. He overheard my name mentioned. And what's he want? He knows I'm being blackmailed. I'm to give him the money and have Mr. Vitello's boys follow him until the blackmailer goes after him. End of blackmailer. Oh, maybe. I pay him 10000 and he returns the other night. You've lost your little mind. Can't you see through the scheme? He's the collector. I said that before. Pretty clever one, too. He can't walk in and say, give me the money, because the cops would grab him when he walked out. So he comes up with this harebrained scheme. He doesn't know the blackmailer. Maybe not. But he knows who gave him the assignment to collect the money and even where to leave it or send it. 
The blackmailer stays undercover, and the guy who gives instructions to the collector leaves town. I see. So this guy cleverly gets you to believe he wants to help you. He'll get away with the money or be caught. And if he's caught, you'll get back your money, but you won't find the blackmailer. So what should I do? Wait until you hear from the blackmailer again. He'll describe his collector. Pay only him. There's only a few days left, Jody. You'll get the word. Then pay up. I see you still want peace, Tony. Jamita. It's all set. Should pay up? Yep. Hey, I got a hand it to you, Tony. My congratulations. Yeah, uh, maybe the hundred had gone down the drain. How'd you work it, Tony? Well, there wasn't much to it after the first few moments. I sent her a note. She came over. I told her I'd overheard she was in trouble, and I wanted to help her. How? By convincing her I didn't know the blackmailer, but if she gave me the money, he'd come after me. Ah. Uh-huh. So instead? I get the money. The fellow's boys and the cops follow me, but they don't stop me. You give me an envelope, a heavy brown one. Address it where you want it to go. Put enough postage on it, and I'll see to it that it gets mailed. Nah, I don't like it, Tony. I want to see the money, all of it. You don't trust me? I wouldn't trust myself with a hundred grand. You deliver the money to me. All right. What's your suggestion? When are you seeing her again? Two nights from now. Have the hairdresser bring her here. Then what? You join him in a booth. She gives you the money. What about the guy? She's told him what you're up to. She goes along with your scheme. He does, too. All right. Now I got the money. What next? She has an envelope with the money in it. You say to me, Eddie, can I leave this in your safe until I ask for it? And I say, sure, Tony. That way I got the money and no one can hold you up for it. You go home and hang out waiting for that blackmailer to come after you. I can't hang along. That freighter... You come in the next night and I give you a ten. After that... Vamos. Simple as that. Clear? You're the boss. Don't forget it. You said the cops are tailing a girl. Would you believe I got a couple of boys tailing you? I never doubted that for a minute, Eddie. But, Jody? Yeah? Not Mason's. Um, there's a place called Eddie Small's Chop House in West Hollywood. Oh, that's no place for you, matey. It sounds like a saloon. Oh, I hear it's good. Who said so? That man. He wants me to meet him there, and I don't want to go alone. The con man you talked to a couple of nights ago? That's right. Matey, don't be crazy. I'm going to be. Oh, boy. He'll meet us there. Now, come over around 7, all right? Do I have a choice? Nope. And I'm excited. This could be the end of the trouble, Jody. More like the end of you. Two lousy days. You worried? Where's he been? Don't the boys know? Yeah, some. But he's given them a slip a couple of times. Then he walks into his rooming house, bold as bread. Don't figure. He's crazy. He's pushing his luck or the cops are asleep. They're not asleep, Eddie. They're waiting. They can arrest him any time. They're waiting to see what he does with Mady Rambo, and that's why I don't like your plan. You got a better one, babe? I just don't like having the cops take out the chop house. There's the cops and Vitello's thugs. I like that. Tony turns the envelope with the money over to you. You come to the bar and ask me to put it in the safe. I say, okay. Then Tony leaves. And the cops walk in and tell you to open the safe. Okay. Okay. They get the money. Why? Are you dumb or something, Eddie? They get the envelope and the money. We're frozen out and they arrest Tony. What's this, babe? A manila envelope. That's what the cops will find in the safe. It's fat. Yes, sure. It's stuffed with junk from Tony's room. Clippings, little money... Insurance policy is junk. When you hand me the envelope with the money in it, I do a sleight of hand behind the bar. A minute later, you come behind the bar and drop the money in the apron. Then, vamos. Go home. 
Yeah. That could work. But when Tony comes back tomorrow for his ten grand... He won't come back, babe. What remains to be revealed about our trio is how it falls out. Hopefully to the benefit of the young actress. Criminals have no conscience until they are caught. And then it is not a matter of remorse, but one of regret. They are not to be pitied. Their victims are... I will return shortly with Act Three. This is a time of the anti hero. Very few persons in public life, the professions, and business command our respect. Everyone is suspect. That makes us cynical. Such a philosophy encourages a certain kind of mentality to exploit human weakness. Lady Rambo committed an indiscretion, and for it, a blackmailer has leached onto her. It is early evening, and she has just received Jody Pearl. What's this about a chop house in West Hollywood? That's where the man wants me to bring the money. Eddie Small's chop house is a dive. That's where he heard the rumor about me. I'm seen there and word gets back about him and me. Uh Uh-huh. And the blackmailer finds out and goes after him and the police or Vitello's boys go after the blackmailer. He's caught. You'd given the man ten grand and get back ninety. You'll also get back the ten, maybe. Why? Uh, I've got a surprise for you, sweetheart. The man... You don't know his name. The man isn't that knight in armor of yours. He's Tony Carbo. I've seen that name somewhere. What? You have if you read the papers. Tony Carbo? He's a killer. And the police want him bad. How do you know he's Tony Carbo? By looking at him. Well, then why haven't the police picked him up? Well, that's been bothering me, too. I don't know. Just luck. Listen, that scares me, Jody. It should. Maybe I better call it off. No. No, go through with it. I think we'll be safe. You hand over the money. I have it here in a manila envelope. Okay. We made him have a drink. You hand over the money. He'll leave and the police will pick him up. So I get back the money and the blackmailer still sells the snapshot and goodbye Hollywood. Maybe not. Tony Carbo is horned in on the blackmailer. The blackmailer wants the money. You'll hear from him again, and he'll identify his collector and send him to you. Pay up and forget it. I won't pay up. Well, it's your funeral, baby. You're over a barrel. I would pay the money only if the whole rotten racket is exposed. That means the blackmailer and especially the pig who sneaked the picture. Maybe they're one and the same. I don't think so. Whoever took the picture was at that party. Now, everybody was respectable, and most of them were wealthy. Who could it be? How was it done? Did you see a camera, Jody? No. It's a mystery to me. What's the point of meeting the man now? This could be bad publicity. Or it could be good. Tony Carbo tries to extort money from Screen Star. She alerts police, places herself in danger, the police capture him. That's a big story. Maybe. Ready? I guess so. Ah, cheer up. We'll trap this guy and then leave. He said his name was Tony Corbett. Sure. And I'm the king of Siam. Down, pal. Hi, Eddie. Miss me? Yeah, I've been in for two days. What you been up to, Tony? Didn't your boys tell you? Oh, some. You get around. Why not? I even went out to the studio. Why? Mm. Just snooping around. I don't like that. Will you relax? Your troubles will be over in an hour. She's coming here? With Jody Pearl. Now, how do we handle it? Like I said, you hand me the envelope. No, Eddie. He hands it to me. Yeah, that's right. Maxie gives it to me and says, keep it for you in a safe. Then enjoy your dinner. Yeah. Miss Rambo won't have much appetite for food. Then let him leave. You with him. Uh, what about my money? Tomorrow. Oh, there'll be cops watching me. I can't come back. 
Ain't you the decoy for the blackmailer? Everyone follows you. The cops tail you and wait for the blackmailer to turn up. That's what you set up, right? Uh-huh. But I want to walk out with my money. No can do, baby. Why not? The dough won't be here. I see. You see a lot. For instance, what do you see out of the studio? I looked around. What were you looking for? How your racket works, Eddie. It's simple, but clever. Tell me about it. You work it through someone in the movie company, a bit player, a grip, anyone who wants to pick up a tax-free bundle. Someone who can get close to a star and catch him or her in an off moment. Uh-huh. Maybe even train the person on how to use a miniature camera. We never had a camera in our lives. You've got those spies everywhere. You wait, check pictures. A juicy one means money. For instance, Miss Mady Rambo in Frank Fratello's arms. Must be a pretty good business, Eddie. Too bad you're shipping out, Tony. Yeah, but not before I get my ten grand. Take it out of the hundred she gives you. Then get out. Then get lost. Um, what happens to the negatives of those juicy pictures, Eddie? They're kept in a very safe place. Mm-hmm. And what happens if one of your spies tries to work the blackmail con on his own? I have not taken care of. It's nice. Look at that old wooden bar. I bet the place is 50 years old. Good evening, Miss Randall. Good evening. Uh, this is Mr. Pearl. He works with me at the studio. Yeah, glad to meet you. Please, sit down. Miss Carbo... I mean, are you really... Tony Carbo? Corbett. Miss Rambo, Corbett. Did you bring the money? Look, mister, before Miss Rambo answers that question, answer one for me. You think that because you've been seen with her twice, the blackmailer is going to surface? He wants the money. I'll have it. He'll show. If you leave here with the money... But I don't leave here with the money. I don't understand. Eddie is a friend of mine. He owns this place. Now, you give me the money. I remove my tin, seal the envelope, and have Eddie place it in his safe. Now, Eddie knows that you, Miss Rambo, will return and claim it. And he'll give it to you. But you said... I mean, Mr. Carbo, I agreed to your scheme because you said you'd find the person who took that picture and he'd expose the blackmailer. Isn't that what you said? Exactly. And you've done that? Yes, Miss Rambo. I don't believe that. How would a thug like you move into Hollywood a week ago? How do you know that, Mr. Pearl? Well, by by what I read in the newspaper, I I don't know how long you've been here. Make it a month. There's no way you could break this racket. Why not? Because it's been going on for years in all the studios. Yeah, I know. Tell me, who took the picture? Was it the blackmailer? No. I'll tell you when I take you home. You take her home? Why won't you tell me now? Because I don't want to disturb the peace. All right, let's get out of here, matey. This guy's a phony. Now, the money, Miss Rambo. Trust me. You'll excuse me, matey. Sitting across from a killer turns my stomach. I hope you get home safely. I've had enough of this charade. Jody! Uh, let him go, Miss Rambo. You're not making a fool of me, are you, Mr. Carpo? No, I swear I'm not. Now, here's what happens. Take out the envelope, give me $10,000. Seal the rest of the money in the envelope, and I'll wave to Maxine. All right. This is just crazy. Yeah, it is, but do it. Don't shake. All right, there's your money. I seal the envelope. And here comes Eddie. Yeah, Tony. Eddie, uh, will you do me a favor? Yeah, sure. Need some cash? No, no, no. I wonder if you'd keep uh, this envelope in your safe for me. Sure. I'm shipping out. Uh, Yeah. And when I return from South America, I'll call for it. Sure. You'll be safe with me. You know that. Miss Rambo, just watch. Watch carefully. And don't be frightened by the sun. Eddie? Eddie, what's that all about? Police. Hey, look. 
Quick, they grabbed Jody. All right. Out the back way, machine. Uh, why, Jody? Tony found out. He's got his ten grand. How could he find out? Get out. Hurry. Well, they got nothing on us, Eddie. Let them have the money. They got Jody. Don't you know what that means? I've been double crossed. The police will make Jody talk. Tony must have found out Jody took the picture. How? Get out, Maxine. Take the envelope and get out. I'm shaking like a leaf. I don't blame you. Uh, let me have your coat. Oh, thank you, thank you. I really have to sit down. That's the wildest experience I've ever had. Hmm. Oh, come on in, Mr. Corbett. Uh, Major Tony. We've uh, been through quite a lot. Uh, yes. You'd better tell me all about it. You can't be Tony Carbo. No. There is no Tony Carbo. But the picture's in the newspaper. And the hijacking and the murder charge, all faked. We had good cooperation from the papers. Why? Well, what was it about? Blackmail in the movie studios. You know, you weren't the only victim. I still don't know what happened. Didn't... Didn't the man yell, they got Jody? That's right. The police? Mm. Why? I mean, why old Jody? He's my pal. Maybe you're in for a shock. I told you that night at Mason's that the most important aspect of this case wasn't the snapshot, but the person who took the picture. Well, I found the negative. That gave me the person. And here's that uh, deadly little piece of film. That's the original? Yeah, I think so. I don't think there are any copies, but we'll make sure. Where'd you find it? We searched the houses of everyone who was at that gambling party. Now, most of the persons owned cameras, but none owned a half-frame camera, one that is about half the size of a bar of soap. It's inconspicuous and sharp. Even the blow-up's quite sharp. I found quite a few enlarged backstage shots in one person's house. Judy. That's right. Well, that proved nothing. We had to find that negative I just gave you, and we did. Oh, how could he? He was my friend. Yeah, you thought... Why would he do such a rotten thing? Money. He didn't care about you, matey. He cared about himself. He lived in reflected fame. He was a hypocrite. No, I don't think you're the first star he's caught off guard with his camera. And that man at the chop house? Eddie. He was the blackmailer. By now, he's under arrest. And your money. And this. No, that's... That's yours, Tony. You earned it. No, 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 no. I'm not allowed to take money, matey. That's my job to track down criminals. You're a cop. Yes, well, sort of. Here. Here's my identification. Tony Corbett. FBI. For a change, no ghosts, apparitions, but all the same, a tale of the macabre. In our so-called real world, we have the underworld with its large assortment of criminals and their many strange practices. Most of us will never be victims of a blackmailer, but public figures live with the danger of making an indiscreet slip and paying for it. I'll return shortly. At one time or another, every person is a hero to someone father to son, a classmate who excels, the teacher who inspires, anyone who impresses us with exceptional ability. That's because we're daydreamers. Instinctively, we like to attain excellence. It's popular today to sneer at such an idea. We've become cynical. Let's return to hero worship. Heroes like Tony Corbett inspire ideals. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Robert Dryden, Terry Keene, and Jada Rowland. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Come
committed suicide. Yet her body is missing. The morgue attendant is murdered, and the clues point to a red-headed, left-handed undertaker. Detective O'Malley hides in the morgue, unaware that he's being stalked by the murderer. This is Peter Lorre, here again to welcome you to the Mystery Playhouse. Tonight we bring you a story by Jonathan Latimer called Lady in the Morgue. It offers Detectives Crane and O'Malley the delightful problem of solving three murders and interviewing a lovely brunette, a lady who is mysteriously related to the unsolved crimes. Come with me to the morgue for the beginning of our little story, huh? Oh, uh, don't let these thefts bother you. Their troubles are over. But for those two detectives over there, the murders are just beginning. Come down these steps. Right this way. Come. Come, come. I'm going nuts hanging around here. Oh, stop squawking, O'Malley. Three days just sitting in the morgue. I'm beginning to feel like a stiff myself. Look, I don't like it any better than you do, O'Malley, but we're hired as private detectives to sit here. And we're going to sit here until somebody identifies the dame's body. Okay. How do you know Alice Ross isn't Alice Ross? Why don't you stop being a jerk? That name's a phony. You know, Crane, the whole thing seems phony to me. What? Who is this rich New York guy, Cortland? He hires us by a telegram. We've never seen him. And why is he so interested in this little blonde who commits suicide? Look, I don't think it's going to do any good, but I'm going to tell you for the last time. He thinks it's his sister, Catherine Cortland. She ran away from home a couple of years ago, chasing after some musician. Oh, gee. Hey, that's the desk bell. Looks like the morgue's got a customer. Leave him in the attendant or answer it. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he, anyhow? Down in the vaults with the stiffs. Well, then maybe we better answer it, O'Malley. Might be somebody to claim the body. Uh, looking for someone, mister? For a couple of private detectives, Crane and O'Malley. Oh, I'm Crane. And that character over there is O'Malley. Well, my name's Cortland. I sent you that wire. Oh, come right in. Come right in. Glad to meet you. Me too. Delayed in New York. Expected to be here yesterday. What about the girl? No information yet, Mr. Cortland. And if you think she might be your sister, Catherine, why, uh, you can identify yourself. Why, yes. Uh, where? Uh, this way, Mr. Cortland. Thanks. The body's down in the vaults. Leave him in the morgue attendant. You see, he's down there. I'll wait here for you, Crane. I can't stand looking at that girl again. Come on, come on. Stick with the client. Okay. Watch your foot in the stairs are slippery. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Now, uh, what makes you think this Alice Ross girl might be your sister, Mr. Cortland? Well, just what I read in the New York papers, that's all. Blonde girl, blue eyes, suicide. Also, my sister Catherine wrote us about two months ago that she was finished with her old life. She ran away from home with a musician two years ago. And uh, the body's in here. Oh. Lieberman! Hey, Lieberman, where are you? I thought you said Lieberman was down here, O'Malley. Yeah, I saw him go down about 20 minutes ago. Come on, Mr. Cortland. The body's on tray number 27. Oh, yes. It's four, ten, fourteen. Seventeen, twenty-five... Twenty-seven. Uh, you pull out the tray. I don't like things like this. Oh, there's nothing to be afraid of. She's dead. And all you got to do is grab the handle and... Go ahead, O'Malley. You pull it out. Oh, all right. Well, that's a man's body. A man, not a woman. Yeah, she's certain. You know... What? Hey, it's leave him in the morgue attendant. Murder. Murder in the morgue? It's murder, all right. It's head smash. But where's the girl's body? Yeah, Mr. Cortland... This is a job for the police. I don't...
don't give two hoots about your private detective credentials, Crane. But, Lieutenant... Are yours either, O'Malley. Now, look, a man was murdered in the morgue today and a woman's body was stolen. And you and O'Malley and this fellow Cortland were the only ones who could have done it. Why don't you stop acting like a movie, Captain Lieutenant Grady? What? Think it through. Cortland is my client. He hired O'Malley and me to find if the girl is his sister. Right, I sent Crane a wire from New York. All right, skip the details. Ah, oh, use your head, Lieutenant Grady. You're forgetting a couple of things. Huh? You remember that Lieberman, the morgue attendant, had a handful of red hair in his hand. Have O'Malley and Cortland got red hair? Have I? Huh? You know darn well you have. And we also know that somebody held Lieberman from in front while someone else slugged him from behind. Otherwise, why would Lieberman's wrist be torn and bloody? Okay, okay, okay. Lieberman had the hair in his left hand. Now, if I were holding your wrist, I'd be holding your left wrist with my right hand, wouldn't I? Oh, no. I'd be holding your weaker hand with my strongest. All right. Now, what are you trying to prove? We're trying to prove... One at a time, O'Malley. Okay, go ahead, Crane. Thank you, Professor. We're trying to prove that whoever held Lieberman's hands was red-headed and left-handed. And none of us are left-handed all or right, red-headed. All right, Mr. Cortland, pipe down. Crane, go on from there. Lieutenant, we're going to find that missing body for you. All right. All right, Crane. But if you're getting away with something new and something right now, it's only temporary. All right, all right. Come on, O'Malley. Hey, look, don't forget, Crane. One false step and I'll pin the whole thing on you. But permanently. <laughs> you shouldn't have slammed the door, Crane. You'll make him mad. Well, what happens now? You're going back to your hotel, Mr. Cortland, and wait till you hear from me. O'Malley and I got to pay a visit to the apartment where the missing body hanged herself. <laughs> O'Malley, I thought I told you to stick out in the hall and keep your eyes peeled. Sure, Crane, but I'm getting nervous. Found anything yet? Nope. Uh, one funny thing, though. Alice Ross left a lot of brand new dresses here. In this closet. Look. Never been worn. But not a pair of shoes in the place. Hmm. You, that don't make sense, Crane. You're telling me. O'Malley, take a look at this bathroom door. According to the papers... This is where Alice Ross hanged herself. Draped the cord over it. Isn't that terrible? Yeah, let's see now. According to the papers, she came out of the bathtub and hanged herself while she was still wet. The police found a puddle of water on the floor. That's nuts, Crane. Why would anybody take a bath if they were going to commit suicide? Unless they wanted to hang themselves up to dry. Would anyone hang herself while she was still wet? Oh, I think she'd dry herself first. Don't make sense. It'd make good sense, O'Malley, if she didn't commit suicide. Yeah. It'd make better sense if she was murdered. Yeah. If, if, murdered? She was murdered first. Then the murderer hung her body up with a cord. O'Malley, get back in the hall and keep a lookout. Sometimes I wonder what you'd do without me, Crane. Sometimes I... Oh, oh. Now, now, what's the matter? It's Grady and a bunch of cops. Let's get out of here quick. Yeah, yeah, but where? It's three floors to the ground. How about this window? Great. Hey, there's a ledge. Huh? You go one way, I'll go the other. Come on, open up. We know you're in there. Open up. Now, if I can hide in this room until... My toe. Ah! You hear me? Shut up. Shut up. Now listen. Listen, I don't want to hurt you and I don't want to rob you. And I'll turn you loose if you promise not to make a sound. Now remember, if you make a sound, you're going to get hurt. Is that clear? Okay. You already hurt me. You hurt my mouth. What are you doing in my bathroom? What do you want anyway? Now listen, honey, I didn't want to duck to your bathroom window. It was just convenient, that's all. Well, get out. When I'm ready. Hey. Nice apartment you got here. Mind if I look around a bit? If you don't get out of here, I'll phone the police. You don't have to phone, sister. They're right next door. What? Yeah. Did you know the girl next door? The one who hanged herself? Alice Ross? What's that to you? And keep out of my clothes closet. Now listen, baby. You're a beautiful hunk of flesh and I'd hate to get rough with you. But I like answers to questions when I ask them. Now let's begin again. What's your name? Udoni. That's my name. It's Sam Udoni. Ah, that's better. 
Now, about the girl next door. I don't know anything about her. Don't lie to me. I'm not lying. Maybe so, but this clothes closet is very interesting. Very. Why, you know... Watch it, baby. Now, tell me this. Why have you got two different sizes of shoes there in the shoe closet? Oh, and dresses. Hmm, and two different sizes. Two complete wardrobes. It's very simple. Uh, some of them belong to my roommate. He's a blonde. Uh, she dresses different from me. Thought you just said your name was Mrs. Udoni. Mrs. Sam Udoni. My husband's a musician. He travels with bands. He's away all the time. Yeah. But what are you asking me all these questions? Your husband forgot to take his trumpet. Why, you... Now, don't get sore. I'm getting out. I just heard the cops next door go down the hall. I'm, uh, kind of sorry we met this way. <laughs> You are a beautiful doll. Don't be insulting. I always like long black hair, the kind that comes out of a bottle. Oh. And don't be surprised if Papa comes back sometime. Get out. Get out, do you hear? Get out before I kill you! Well, that's what it all adds up to, Mr. Cortland. Alice Ross was murdered. And her body, obviously, was stolen from the morgue to cover up that murder. And if this girl was murdered, and she turns out to be your sister... My sister is alive, Crane. I've just found out. What? Mr. Cortland. Oh, you heard from your sister? Yes, she's alive. So, as she's obviously not the dead Alice Ross, I'd like you both to drop the case. Oh. Mm. Well, uh... Well, I'd like to do that, Mr. Cortland. I'd, I'd like to very much, but uh, one small difficulty. Eh? You see, Lieberman, the morgue attendant, was murdered. And uh, I'm still kind of a suspect, and so is O'Malley, and so are you. Well, right. Right. And the only way we can clear ourselves is to break the case ourselves. Right. Right. Besides, uh, I think I know who helped to kill Lieberman and snatch the girl's body. You do? Who? An undertaker. A left-handed, red-headed undertaker. That's ridiculous. No, now, wait a minute, Mr. Cortland. Sometimes Crane gets brainstorms. Figure it out, Mr. Cortland. Hmm? The only way anyone could get into the morgue and carry the body away is through the delivery entrance. That means only an undertaker could get in there without a lot of questions. What did I tell you, Mr. Cortland? A brainstorm. Right. Right. Oh, this is all nonsense. Complete and utter nonsense. Maybe so, but just to prove that it isn't, O'Malley's going out right now and find that undertaker. Right. Uh, me? Why am I going to find him? You'll find him easy, O'Malley. Sure, sure. I'll find him easy? Well, if this is the only way we can clear ourselves, as you say, why, I ought to help find this undertaker. Fine, fine, Mr. Cortland. Now, let O'Malley cover one side of town and you cover the other. We'll meet here in four hours. And what about you, Crane? What are you going to be doing? Me? Didn't I tell you? I got a date with a gorgeous brunette. <laughs> Oh, uh, hello, Mrs. Udoni. <laughs> I told you I'd be back. You? What are you doing here? Oh, I came to hear the hot music and, uh, be near you. You've got a nerve after what happened today. Hey, hey, that's a solid horn your husband blows in that next room then. Yeah, what makes you think he's my husband? You said your husband was a musician and I saw a trumpet here this morning. Well, you see too much. What do you want anyway? How does a wife of a musician feel when another woman starts following him around the country? I don't know what you're talking about. Never heard of Catherine Coffin, huh? She never meant anything to Sam. She's been following him around for several years. Must have got someplace with him in that time. Look, you better get out of here. My husband's coming in here. Good. I want to see him. Tell him about you butting in here. I'll kill you. Who is this guy, baby? This is him, Sam. You're looking for trouble, mister. I like trouble. What do you want with us? I want Catherine Cortland, or I want a body. What are you talking about? Ah, oh, don't be coy, you don't. I know Catherine Cortland left New York several years ago to follow you here. What about it? Sure she followed me here. Does that make me responsible for her? I haven't seen her for months. Then who was that living in the apartment next door to you? How could I know? A girl commits suicide in the apartment next door, and right away I'm a suspect. Get out of here. Okay, you don't. Just one thing. You see this nice shiny badge? The body of the blonde that was murdered in the apartment next to yours. Apartment? Who... Murdered? What do you... Well, the paper said that... Sure, the paper said suicide, but she was murdered, you darny. Murdered. And her body will be in the city morgue in four hours, and I want you to come and take a look at it.
It's just like you said, Crane. There was a left-handed, red-headed undertaker. Only there isn't any more. What do you mean? Yeah. I went to his place, rang the bell. No answer. I went in, and there he was murdered. What? Murdered? Yep. Stuffed in one of his own coffins. A knife right through his heart. Police hadn't even been there yet. Well, this is incredible. Well, didn't you look around, O'Malley? I know, dope. No. I looked at his books, and I found out that a girl named Alice Hughes was buried today, Forest Tree Cemetery. That's our blonde, you wonderful O'Malley. I love you. Ah, oh, it was simple. Now, we got to move fast. Get out to the Forest Tree Cemetery, get that body, and return it to the morgue. How about me? You? You come along, too, Cortland. Let's go. <laughs> Lift her up. Put her on the table. Easy now. There. Now can I go? Stick around, stick around. I got a job for you. You certainly have a genius for the fantastic crane. Digging this body out of its grave, sneaking it in here in the morgue. I only do what's necessary, Cortland. Now look, are you sure this girl isn't your sister? Absolutely. Well, it's the same body that was swiped for the morgue and she was murdered. Murdered? Furthermore... Whoever killed this girl knows I've located the body and returned it here to the morgue. So what, Crane? The killer's going to try to steal the body again. And you, Mr. Corlin and O'Malley, are going to catch him. Red-handed. Me? You. But, Crane, how can you be sure? I made sure. Now, listen. Here's what we're going to do. We leave the body here, on this table, with a sheet over it. Then you two get under the sheets on these other tables. But those are tables they perform autopsies on. Right. And the murderer, when he comes in, will never suspect that you're under those sheets. All right, Crane. I'm game. I'm leaving you two here alone. I'll beat it out and get Lieutenant Grady. Oh. I ought to warn you. No one knows you're down here in the vaults. Just you two. But don't worry. The killer will be here. Oh, uh... Good luck, boys. Just us two and the killer, Mr. Cortland. I'm not afraid. Let's get under the sheets and I'll turn out the light. <laughs> Mr. Cortland, will you do me a small favor? Why, certainly, O'Malley. What is it? Every now and then, reach over and pinch me. That would be a pleasure. Why? Every time I get under a sheet, I go to sleep. You don't mean to say you could go to sleep in a morgue waiting for a murderer? Why, that's ridiculous. My mind agrees with you, but when my body feels the sheet... It goes to sleep. It's It's going out. Hey, what are you doing? You asked me to pinch you. Oh, so I did. What are you using? Pliers? What are you doing, O'Malley? Just showing you the way I want you to pinch me. Gently, affectionately. Well, if that's your idea of affection, I pity your wife. Mm. O'Malley. Mm. Mm. Did you hear that? What? I swear the door opened and closed. Shh. Listen. Footsteps. Oh, yeah. Keep the sheet over your face. Hey, let go of me. Let go. Hey, Crane. I got him. I got him. Crane. I got him. Turn on the light. All right. All right. All right, you. Come on. I got you covered. Now, come on. Get up off the floor. Well, thanks, O'Malley. I knew I could depend on you. Right, right. Hey, this guy is Courtland. Now, you tricked me, Crane. You were waiting at the end of the hall all the time. And I suppose you didn't try to trick O'Malley and murder him in a bargain. Yeah, but I don't get it. Did Courtland kill Lieberman? Did he steal the body? Not so fast, O'Malley. Go ahead. Go to the telephone and tell Lieutenant Grady to hurry over here to the city morgue. If he wants Lieberman's killer, I'll wait here. 
I'm still expecting Sam Udoni to show up and identify the girl's body. Oh, uh, O'Malley. Hmm? Another thing. Get me a bucket full of peroxide. A bucket full... Peroxide? Peroxide, I'll need it! Uh, what's this all about, Crane? And say, who are all these people? Well, O'Malley, you know, and this is Sam Udoni and Mrs. Udoni. And this is my client, Mr. Court. Uh, your client? Then why you got him handcuffed? Well, it ain't merely because he didn't pay his bill. Now, no cracks! Crane, O'Malley told me on the phone that this blonde dame, Alice Ross, didn't commit suicide but was murdered. What about that? Well, that's right. Murdered. By this man right here. But look, Crane, Cortland couldn't Who have... said anything about Cortland? I said this man right here. Meaning Sam Udoni. That's a lie. You can't prove that. You Shut can't... up! Shut up! Shut up! Oh, Crane... You mean that you don't need committed all those murders? No, my husband was with me when they were committed. And what reason would he have to kill this, this Alice Ross? Why, well, he, he didn't even know her. How about that, Crane? Well, you don't, he ought to have known Alice Ross. He killed her because she wouldn't give him a divorce. Alice Ross was actually Mrs. Udoni. Huh? How could she be? I am Mrs. Udoni. Let me out of here. Grab him, Mommy. Let me go. Let me go. Cut it out, Udoni. It won't do you any good. <laughs> It's better. Don't talk, Sam. They can't prove anything. Be quiet, you. Be quiet, you. Be quiet, you. By heavens, this is all beginning to make sense. That's why you don't. He stole the body of his wife. So that he could pass off this woman here as Mrs. Udoni. Right, Lieutenant. Sure, I get it. And now for the proof, O'Malley. O'Malley, hand me that bucket full of peroxide. Here you are, Crane. Hey, now wait a minute, Crane. Wait a minute before you start these shenanigans. If Alice Ross was actually Mrs. Udoni, who's his dame here? Well, that's simple. She's Catherine Cortland. What? You're crazy. Catherine Cortland was a blonde. Wait a minute. She's no blonde crane. Oh, no? Just watch. (laughs) Watch her hair, Lieutenant. Just watch her hair. Yeah. Say, the black is running out. The dye, you mean. You better take her someplace where she can clean up, O'Malley. Yeah, but wait a minute. Where does this guy Cortland fit in? I'm afraid he was merely an unhappy accomplice. But go easy on him. He's a good guy. Good guy. Good guy. Good guy. He tried to stab me. Yeah, yeah. But he was dragged into this whole thing to protect his sister. And she was dragged in by Sam Udoni. He's the real louse. Look, Crane, I'm not making any alibis. But I wish you'd answer me just one question. Go ahead. Shoot, Cortland. How did you know my sister had dyed her hair? Well, in your sister's apartment, I found a bottle of black hair dye and a bottle of peroxide in the bathroom. But what finally convinced me was the real Mrs. Udoni. What do you mean? You see, hair grows after death. Uh, and if you take a look at the dead girl's body, you'll see the roots of her blonde hair are all black. Crane, all I can say, you make my hair stand on end. <laughs> Lady in a Morgue by Jonathan Latimer. Oh, yes, yes, we were going to have a guest ghost on tonight's broadcast. Oh, the poor fellow. He was taken gravely ill. The doctors have given up all hope. He's going to live. By the way, if you have any pet vampires you'd like to hear about on these programs, just drop me a line. Just give the letter to your favorite witch with instructions to take her broomstick and knock on the door of the mystery playhouse. Now it's time to close the doors before all these bats fly away. This is Peter Laurie saying good night. Sleep tight. Sunflower oil, purine and press cooking fat, yum yum peanut butter, maple margarine, and niblet cheese twists present the epic taste book. (laughs) 
in which Inspector Carr investigates. Good evening. Unfortunately, one reads all too often of cases of death by drowning. Mostly accidental, but there are on record other cases of drowning which are far from accidental. Murder, in fact. The cases that readily come to mind are Thomas Joseph Davidson, George Joseph Smith, and Ronald John Chesney. Murders in the bath, all of them. But I have details of another case in my file, a most unusual affair. It was almost the perfect murder. Almost. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in a position to tell you the story tonight. A story I've called The Rapture of Death. begins one morning when I was summoned to the commissioner's office. Good morning, Inspector. Oh, good morning, sir. Come in and sit down. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Does the name Nigel Prentice ring a bell with you? Prentice. Prentice. Oh, yes, that's the skin-diving chap drowned at Plymouth last month. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Last week they held the inquest. The verdict was death by misadventure. Oh. Well, we're obviously involved, otherwise you wouldn't have sent for me, but I'm afraid I don't see how, sir. Well, I'll put you in the picture. At the time of Prentice's death, a report about it appeared in the papers, but the details were very scanty, for a very good reason. Uh -huh. Prentice was an expert skin diver. He was the director of a business which was concerned in the manufacture of aqualungs. They were angling for an admiralty contract. I see. When Prentice died, he was in the process of demonstrating some equipment. The firm had perfected uh, some of the Admiralty top brass. Mm -hmm. You can imagine their reaction when Prentice drowned in the process. Uh, he was one of the three directors. The other two are also skin divers. You've probably seen them on television. Peter and Helen Selby. Oh, yes, I know. Undersea archaeology. Adventures with sharks, that sort of thing. Yes, well, they're coming to see you this morning. Apparently, they're not satisfied with the coroner's verdict. Uh, Peter Selby spoke to me on the telephone. Feels they want a full investigation by the police. You see? Uh, but why? Well, that's what I'm hoping they'll tell me. I want you here because I want you to be fully acquainted with the facts. If I do decide to accede to their request, um, you'll be in charge of the investigation. Yes? Oh, good. Well, send them in. The service? Yes. Yes. Would you mind if I chip in from time to time, sir, and ask a few questions? Oh, no, no, not at all. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Selby, sir? Good morning. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Come in. Thank Come you. in. Uh, this is Inspector Carr. How do you do, Inspector? How do you do, Inspector? Uh, please sit down. Now, Mr. Selby. Well, I told you briefly on the phone that the purpose of our visit to you is the result of the inquest. Yes. The verdict was death by misadventure. That's just not possible. Nigel was one of the most experienced aqualungers in the world. Our company, Sub Aqua Limited, perfected a new aqualung. During the time you we were working on it, nearly two years, by the way, it was constantly used and tested by Nigel. He was a sort of test pilot. I see. When we were completely satisfied that the lung was foolproof, we arranged a demonstration for the people at Plymouth. Now, as you know, poor Nigel died. But he couldn't have died the way the verdict implies. He just couldn't have drowned. For two reasons. A that the equipment was perfect, and B, he was too experienced. And since the accident, both Peter and I have used the equipment ourselves. There was nothing wrong with it, nothing at all. The reason we're making such a fuss is because the government contract we were after involves some 25,000 sets. That's an awful lot of money to us. And I'm anxious to remove the stain that our lung has now got. A reputation it doesn't deserve one little bit. I see. And understand but why wait until after the inquest before coming to the police? Well, you can imagine how shocked we were when Nigel died. We looked such fools. And I had to test the lung before I could be certain. Uh, Mr. Selby, isn't it possible that you had all pinned too much faith in the lung? No. I know what you're thinking. That something unforeseen went wrong. But if that was the case, we could have found out what was ever wrong with it when we tested it ourselves subsequently. I really don't see that this is a case for the police. 
Unless, of course, you suspect foul play. What other explanation could there be? Well, if a man drowns, he drowns. Therefore, the verdict is correct. But they presumed that he drowned. They didn't hold a post-mortem. But he was in the water alone. How else could he have died if he didn't drown? Oh, that's a good question, Carr. I don't know much about aqualunging and such things, but I've heard tell of rupture of the spleen, and there are instances of divers going too deep and suffering nitrogen intoxication. Am I right about that? Yes. Yes, it's just like having too much alcohol. There's an overpowering urge to shout. One becomes oblivious of danger. One tears the mouthpiece from between one's teeth. Mm. Couldn't that have happened to Mr. Francis? No. He wasn't working in deep water at all. I've tested the line at greater depth than Nigel was working at. Then what else could it be? We don't know. We've racked our brains a thousand times trying to find the answer. I have such faith in the equipment. Even after what has happened. This business could be the end of Subaqua. And I know it's not the fault of the lung. Well, under what circumstances did you find Mr. Prentice's body? Well, we knew he had sufficient air for a certain length of time. The Admiralty officials set him certain tasks. I thought he was taking an awful long time to do them, and I got worried. Yes, in, in fact, we went out in a boat to look for him. His air supply couldn't have lasted that long, you see. And I knew he must be in trouble. He was floating on the surface, obviously dead. The officials were very sympathetic, but of course it was obvious how they felt about the equipment. We spent the night in Plymouth, but we had to be in London the next day. The three of us, of Peter, Frank Anderson and myself, all drove back together. Anderson? He's a friend of Peter's. In competition with us, really, he has a similar business. What was he doing in Plymouth? Well, he was very interested in our land. He had to lift down, and I promised him a lift back with us. Uh, well, Mr. Selby, I well understand your distress. You've lost a friend, and a government contract worth thousands of pounds. Well, you know, you've told me nothing that warrants an exhumation and post-mortem... But I'm very impressed by your sincerity. We can do nothing until we have the findings of the post-mortem. Thank you very much indeed, Commissioner. With that, the Selby's left and the Commissioner made the necessary arrangements. The job was over and done with within three days. In fact, it was on the afternoon of the third day that I was once more called to the Commissioner's office. Now, just listen to this car. Yes. The Home Office's report, pathology, that is, on Nigel Prentice. I won't read it all, just relevant facts. Thank uh, you, sir. Yeah, we were surprised to find no evidence at all of small internal bronchial hemorrhages. When a person drowns, these occur due to a lack of air. It can only be concluded, and we are guessing, that the subject died after being subjected to a hyper-concentration of oxygen. We understand that oxygen is not used in aqualands. For expiration, divers rely on compressed air. Well, what do you make of that? Oh, but surely they wouldn't be foolish enough to fill the lungs' tanks with oxygen? Could that have happened accidentally? Mm. Or even deliberately? Mm. So the soldiers are right. I think we'd better get them in and tell them the results. Very well, I'll arrange it for you. You know, we should have realized this before. Of course he didn't drown. If he had, they wouldn't have found him floating on the surface. Right. His lungs would have been filled with water, and the weights, I presume, he was carrying would have taken him to the bottom of Plymouth Harbour. But I don't understand. Can't you think? Even a beginner knows that you don't use oxygen. You fill the tank yourself, Peter. And you certainly didn't use oxygen. But could the tanks that you prepared for the dive have been replaced by other tanks? They could have, but I Supposing don't... somebody wanted to do away with Nigel Prentice, all they had to do was substitute a couple of tanks. Would you be able to tell the difference just by looking at them? No, no, they're all the same color and size. Yellow. Would Nigel Prentice have known the difference once he started breathing? No. Both compressed air and oxygen are odorless and tasteless. You say that you have just one type of tank, standard size and color. That's right. For both compressed air and oxygen. We never use oxygen in aqualung tanks. See. Tell me, do you know of anyone with a grudge against this apprentice? No, I don't. Did he get on with your employees? Yes, he did. One or two resented his funny manner. And Mr. Andrews, for one. Mr. Andrews? He's our manager in the workshop. Did they have words? Sometimes. Were they bitter quarrels? Oh, they were nothing. You know how tempers get frayed when things won't go right or when you're trying to meet a deadline. Yes, yes. 
You filled the tanks that Princess was to use, Mr. Selby? I did. I supervised everything. I didn't want to leave anything to chance. And you used compressed air? Yes. Did anybody see you filling those tanks? Hmm. Well, no. No, I was alone at the time. I see. Good heavens. You're not implying that... At this stage, I'm not implying anything. Just asking questions. When you were filled... What did you do to them? And how many were there? There were four. I filled them to the correct pressures and then put them in the boot of the car for the next day, the journey down to Plymouth. When did you fill them? Early in the morning. Was it generally known how you had stowed the equipment? Yes, of course. I had no reason to keep the fact a secret. And was your car left unattended after you had put the cylinders in the boot? Well, yes. For most of the day and all of that night. Hmm. Was the boot locked? No. Then someone, as yet some person unknown, could have removed the cylinders of air and replaced them with cylinders of oxygen. Yes. Yes, they could. It couldn't have happened accidentally, could it? How? I could see that it wasn't going to be easy. Such a long time had elapsed between the death of Nigel Prentice and the start of our investigation. If it was murder, and it looked very much like it, then the murderer had had plenty of time to cover his tracks, supply himself with an alibi, and cast suspicion elsewhere. It was a tough one, all right. But I like them. They constitute a challenge. I decided to visit the factory there and then. I took a car and followed the Selby's to the factory in Camden Town. the cylinders from this compressor here and then put them straight into the car. I see. I should think they took up most of the room in the boot. Everything just fits in. The car's a bit small, but we've got no family, just Helen and me. We don't need more than two seats. Besides, we've got a thing about sports cars. But when you put the tanks in the boot, what did you do with the car? Left it here until about... Oh, it turned five o'clock. And sometime during the day, you went back and loaded the rest of the equipment. Yes. I don't suppose you noticed whether the cylinders have been moved or not. No, I'm afraid not. I never thought about it. And if your cylinders of air had been replaced, you wouldn't have known. As all of them are yellow. That's right. Look, uh, can we move into your office, Mr. Selby, where it's quieter? Were you at the factory all day? Yes, I was. And you, Mrs. Selby? Yes, Inspector, I was. It was quite an occasion getting ready for the demonstration. It meant a lot to us, and, well, we were very excited. As a matter of fact, we went out to celebrate that Who's night. we? Peter, Nigel, and myself. Uh, did you go in your car? No, no. We have a flat above the shop in Knightsbridge. We went to the Magambo. It's just around the corner from us. And you left the car where? At the back of the shop. Hmm. Do you keep oxygen on the premises here? Yes. What's it used for? Well, different processes of manufacture. Is there any at the shop in Knightsbridge? No. Yes, there is, darling. It's been there ever since we opened. Oh, yes, of course. That's right. I've been meaning to have them pick it up. It's only in the way. Is it a full cylinder? Well, it was, yes. You see, it's been here a long time, and some of these industrial cylinders leak. And we've had no occasion to test the pressure. And your car was parked at the back of the shop all night? Yes. Where did Mr. Prentice live? Well, he had a flat in South Kensington. We picked him up in the morning and drove down together. So whoever wanted to tamper with the cylinders had plenty of opportunity to do so. I suppose so, yes. I'm just beginning to realize that you're conducting an investigation of murder. That's right, Mrs. Selby. Horrible. Which means that Nigel Prentice's killer is somewhere around, on the loose for the moment. Tell me... Have any of your employees left since Mr. Prentice's death? No, we've still got the same stuff. Well, I think it's safe to say that whoever tampered with those cylinders had a very good knowledge of skin diving or aqua lunging. That narrows the field down a bit, doesn't it? Yes, I suppose it does. If it helps, I could find a motive. Is your business a profitable one? Yes, indeed. It's coming into its own in a big way. The sport is getting more and more popular all the time. And, of course, that means a growing demand for equipment. I see. So the company pays handsomely to the shareholders. Well, with Nigel gone, that just leaves Helen and myself. 
Does it indeed? So you are better off than ever. Unless, of course, his shares have gone to some relative. Nigel had no relative. Lady friend, perhaps? Well, as far as we know, Nigel was unattached. Isn't that so, Helen? Yes, he was far too wrapped up in his work. Then what's the position? Oh, I don't know. It's a little awkward. If Helen and I bought the shares, the proceeds of the sale would go into his estate. But he didn't leave a will. I don't know the law in that regard, but it's... It's going to make a nice legal tangle. Yeah, so summing it up, or putting it bluntly, it looks as though you and your wife benefit a great deal from his death. Yes. I suppose you could look at it like that. I wonder if I could use this office here to speak to Mr. Andrews, your manager. By all means. Sergeant Jackson. Yes, sir. Fine, Mr. Andrews, the workshop manager. Bring him here. Why, up. Come in, Mr. Andrews. I understand you won't see me, Inspector. Yes, that's right. Sit down. Oh. I'm investigating the death of Nigel Princess. Oh. Did you like him, Mr. Andrews? He was all right. That's not what I asked you. I suppose you've been told about the little tiffs we have from time to time. That's right, I have. But I'd like you to tell me about them. Well, frankly, Inspector, I, I didn't have much time for Nigel Prentice. He wasn't my sort. We seem to rub each other up the wrong way. Why? I suppose you've heard about the fact that I've been with Mr. and Mrs. Selby since the early days. As a matter of fact, he and I were in the Navy together. That's how we started in this business. Go on. And I suppose you heard how disappointed I was when the company was floated and a third of the shares was given to a complete stranger. Nigel Prentice. Who else? But you know all this. You policemen are very clever. Thank you, Mr. Andrews, but I hate to disillusion you. I knew nothing of what you've just told me. Oh. But you were clever enough to let me go on. Of course. So you felt aggrieved that Mr. Prentice had taken your place in the business? Hmm? Well, I felt justified. I've worked harder for this business than he had. What was your reaction when you heard he was dead? Oh, shocked. It was so sudden and unexpected. Was it, Mr. Andrews? Yes. We tested the gear for hour after hour. It was the last thing we could have expected, that he would drown. Oh, he drowned, did he? Uh, that's right. Death by misadventure. You seem very well acquainted with the circumstances surrounding Mr. Prentice's death. You seem to have taken an extraordinary interest. Not really, Inspector. I was extremely interested in the development of the new lung. I was appalled that it didn't work. Did you hate Mr. Prentice? Well, Mr. Andrews? There was... No love lost of him. Because you felt he had what should have been yours. I've never been able to hide my true feelings, so let's start now. I was very hurt when Mr. Selby and his wife took him, Mr. Prentice. I resented it a great deal. And did that resentment grow big enough for you to seek revenge? Revenge? What are you talking about? Did you know that oxygen, pure oxygen, can kill a man if it's in his aqualung equipment? Yes. Any fool knows that. I didn't know, but it is generally known in this line of business, isn't it? What are you getting at? Mr. Prentice did not drown. He was subjected to a hyper-concentration of oxygen. But how? Someone, Mr. Andrews, tampered with the cylinders used in that fatal demonstration. Well, I, I know nothing about that. Are you sure? Are you sure that you weren't seeking a double revenge? Revenge which you could have had by killing Nigel Prentice and crippling Peter Selby's business by making him look a fool before the Admiralty officials? You can't talk to me like Sorry that. Sorry if I've hurt your delicate feelings, but I'm investigating a fiendish murder, not a game of Ring of Roses. Well, it wasn't me, and you can't prove it was. Uh, you're quite right. You can't. Well, can I go now? For the time being, yes. Thank you. Oh, there's just one other thing. Yes? How did Mr. Prentice get on with the Selbys? Frankly, that's none of my business. The Selbys have been good to me. You can still say that, in spite of your being disappointed at not being taken into the business? Yes. All right. What do you know about a man called Frank Anderson? He's our chief competitor. Opened up in opposition. Was there a competition between Sub Aqua and Mr. Anderson's business? Well, of course. Fierce competition? <laughs> no, it was on a friendly basis. There's enough work to go around. But there aren't many admiralty contracts floating around for 25,000 aqualungs, are there? You remember the day before the demonstration? Yes. Was Mr. Anderson there when they were getting the equipment ready? Well, um, yes, he was. Doing what? Oh, he was charting us, but very good-naturedly. I see. Well, Mr. Andrews, I'd like to see every member of the staff, one at a time, in here. Andrews. 
Andrews arranged for me to interview the staff. It took me the best part of the day, questions and answers, seeking that vital clue. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I know where the oxygen is. So does everybody what works here. at all. Nobody misses him, that's for sure. He was ever so sarcastic. Had a tongue like a witch. Something of a ladies' man at that tell. I never saw him with one. Right, send the next one in. And so it went on, question after question. I was getting nowhere except two facts emerged. Nigel Prentice was far from popular, and he was something of a ladies' man. I turned that over in my mind until I was dizzy. It was getting on for four o'clock by the time I finished. I decided to visit the premises of Frank Anderson, Sarf Aqua's competitor. And, Mr. Anderson, you were in Plymouth to see the demonstration yourself. I was. Did you have cause to touch any of the equipment at any time? No. Uh, why should I? Are you trying to say that I knew anything about the oxygen in those tanks? <clears throat> Would you be so kind as to tell me how you came across that piece of information? I know what you're thinking, Inspector, but you're wrong. It is common knowledge that you've been a sub aqua all day questioning the staff. It's amazing how people talk, isn't it, Inspector? Yes. Yes, it is indeed. So you were there all day, you stayed the night in Plymouth, and you travelled back to London with the Selbys. Hmm? Yes, sitting cramped up in the back of that wretched sports car. Huh? Anything wrong, Inspector? What a fool I've been, what a blind fool. So, do you mind if I use your telephone? No, help yourself. Scotland Yard, car speaking. I want to take out a warrant for the arrest of Helen Selby for the murder of Nigel Prentice. I was right. She did it. And for a very good reason. She had been indiscreet with Prentice, and he had threatened to tell her husband. She couldn't have risked that because it would have threatened her security. All this came out in the confession she made after her arrest. Yes, she destroyed Prentice cunningly, fiendishly. Did you spot the clue that told me she had done it? I'll be back after the commercial to tell you. Well, listeners, did you spot the clue that pointed to Mrs. Selby? Do you remember when the Selbys were in the commissioner's office and they were talking about their being in Plymouth? I promised Frank Anderson a lift back to London. It was only a two-seater, a sports car with room for one passenger cramped into the dicky seat. Three people had driven down to Plymouth, Helen, Peter and Prentice. How could she have offered Anderson a lift back to town if she didn't know that the dicky seat would be vacant? A silly slip, wasn't it? But it was enough to prevent her from getting away with an almost perfect murder. And the moral of my story? Giving someone else oxygen at the wrong time may deprive you of your supply permanently. Good night. <laughs> Epic Taste Book was produced by Michael Silver for the makers of Epic Pure Sunflower Oil, Maple Margarine, Yum Yum Peanut Butter, and Niblet Cheese Twists, with Hugh Ruff as Inspector Carr. Listen again next Thursday night at 9.30 to another exciting story from our Epic Taste Book.
The Old Nurse's Story, now on Mystery Theater. On Mystery Theater tonight, Mrs. Glassbell's Story, in radio version by Gavin Douglas. From CBC Halifax, we present The Old Nurse's Story. There, there now, my love. Come closer, and I'll tell you something from long ago. Something that you've never, never heard. You know, my dear, that your mother was an orphan and an only child. There never was such a baby before or since. So you've all been fine enough in your turns. For sweet winning ways, you've none of you come up to your mother, to my dear Rosamond. My mistress, your grandmother, commanded me on her deathbed never to leave my little charge, for I was the last person left alive who loved her. If my lady had never spoken so much as a word, I'd have gone with Miss Rosamond to the end of the world. And far we were to go before our tears were dry or the grave flowers could wither. You are the woman, Hester Albert. I am, sir. There is an orphan child here named Rosamond. There is, sir. Good. Stand aside. If I may be so bold as to ask, sir. Be good enough to stand aside when you are told. I am informed that you are the child's nurse. Fetch her. They tell you right, sir. I was entrusted with Miss Rosamond by her poor mother that's now in a better place. And that's the last word I'll say until you tell me your name and your business. Mm. I suppose that allowance must be made for your grief or your breeding. My name is Carsten. I have the honor to be agent to the Lord Marquess of Fennival. Oh. Ah, oh, indeed. I should think that even a nursemaid would know it when her mistress was first cousin to a peer of the realm. Oh, I was aware, sir. That, that your mistress married a commoner of no birth or means against my lord's command, with the present result, a penniless orphan. And the child may count herself lucky that the Fennivals do not visit their wrath to the second and third generations. My lord is pleased to recognize Miss Rosamond as a blood relative, though mingled with inferior stock. As her guardian, he has ordered me to escort her post-haste tomorrow morning to Fennival Hall in Northumberland. See that she is ready. Oh, Mr. Carson, you, you'll not separate us. The choice lies with you. Miss Rosamond is accustomed to your care. If you mind your place, you may remain with her. One or two dependents, more or less, are of no concern to my lord. Good day. But, but, sir, what are we to do? You have your instructions. Good day. Esther? Yes, Mr. Carsten? We are approaching Ferneval Hall. Wake the child. Oh, must I, sir? I... She's in the deep sleep at last, and there's been such a Wake long... Wake her, thing. I see. We are entering the great park, and it's my lord's orders that the estate and rank of her ancestors be impressed at once upon her mind. Oh, very well, sir. Oh, come now, my love. Where's the dear? Oh, wake up, Rosalind. Yes, Look at your eyes. Where have we come to? Oh, where are all the farms and cottages? Far back on the road, my dear. We're driving through the great park of Furnival Hall, the oh. port of Cumberland Fells. Look around you. Oh, Hester, that's not a park. It's all wild and cold. There's nothing but rocks and old trees, all, all white and lonely. Come now, Rosamond. Look at the great hall with oh, it. With... Yes, you were about to say, with tree branches dragging against its windows and its gardens turning back into forests. Don't they have a gardener? Oh, hush, Rosamond. Miss Furnival will tolerate no gardens and no scenery. The curtains of her own apartments are drawn winter and summer, day and night. Miss Furnival? Is my lord not here, then? Lord Furnival? 
However did you get that idea? My lord has never set foot within the walls, nor has any other member of the family these 50 years. For the same length of time, my lord's great-aunt, Miss Furnival, has never set foot in the outside world. I think it was in my lord's mind that Miss Rosamond might perhaps amuse his aunt. And the air is healthy here. Only beware of the winter. The winter, sir? Uh, come, we have arrived. Step down. Step down. I may not accompany you within. I am to join my lord at once in Newcastle. But you are expected. Mr. Carter. You have a month until the winter gales. When they come, if you are a wise girl, stop your ears and keep away from the windows. Mr. Carson! Mr. Carson! When we came up the great front steps and were admitted into the entrance hall, I thought we should be lost. It was so large and vast and grand. There was a chandelier, all of bronze, hung down from the middle of the ceiling. I'd never seen one before and looked at it all in amaze. At one end of the hall, there was a great fireplace, cold and unlit. It was large as the size of houses in my country. And on the western side was a, a huge old organ built into the wall. So broad and high that it covered the best part of that area. We were led on past the organ through endless stately corridors to the west wing. And at last, we came to a suite of apartments where it always seemed to be night. Fires crackled in all the rooms and curtains of heavy velvet shut out the daylight. Miss Furnival sat in a high, narrow chair. Her face is full of fine wrinkles as if they'd been drawn all over it with a needle's point. <laughs> she looked proud and frail and trembling with a cold no fire could warm. Welcome to Furniva Hall, Rosamond. Ah, you're a surprisingly pretty and graceful child. Perhaps you are a Furnival after all. Sitting with her in working at the same great piece of tapestry with her companion, Mrs. Stark. Oh, she looks so grey and stony, as if she'd never loved or cared for anyone. Do not stand staring, child. It shows an idle mind. And you, what is your name, girl? Hester Allwood, ma'am. Very well, Hester. Your quarters and the child's nursery will be directly over the kitchen. You will share your meals with Dorothy the cook and old James, her husband. Since Miss Rosamond has uh, connections with the family, she will dine with Miss Furnival and myself. You will, of course, remain in attendance behind her chair throughout the meal. Is that clear? Perfectly, ma'am. Uh, good. We dine at seven. I think that will be sufficient until then. There is one other matter, and it is absolutely vital. You may move throughout this west wing and the center hall as you wish, Hester. But the east wing is locked and long abandoned and is never under any circumstances to be entered, no matter what may occur or seem to occur. Very well, Miss Furnival. You are very silent, Rosamond. Oh, well, she's shy, ma'am. Uh, it's all very new and strange to her. Oh, very likely, very likely. And yet she ought to be at ease here. You will see her face in a dozen portraits on the wall. Perhaps Rosamond, our ancestors, will approve. Perhaps the dead will even grow to love you. Will they speak to me? Speak to you? Hmm. Oh, no, no, no. God grant they be too proud for that. God would not allow an innocent to hear. God would not allow... Grace. I beg your pardon... I am an old woman gathering wool. You'd better go now, Hester. James and Dorothy will show you round your quarters. Oh, uh, Hester. Uh, yes, Miss Furnival? When Rosamond is ready, you may bring her down to us. Don't wait until the bell. Grace, if you are going to spoil oh, the child. And it has been so long, so long. 
Surely we may relax some ceremony for the very young. Hester, James looks down on me. Oh, <laughs> away with you. I tell you, he does. He's lived near all his life in my lord's family and thinks there's no one so grand as they. Till he married me, I'd never lived in any but a farmer's household and he lords it over me as if he was a very farnival himself. Well, yeah. I be in a way. <clears throat> Mind you, I'm very fond of you. <laughs> Hear him now. <laughs> oh, I can think of nothing I'd rather do unless to hear both. <laughs> Oh, it's so good to be amongst my own sort of people. In a house. In a house. Say it. In a house that's forbidden, strange and cold. Dorothy. Oh, all right, James. I'll say nothing against your Miss Farnival. She's a good enough mistress in her high, grand way. If she holds herself so tall, she pays for it, as the good book says. Did you see her tonight after dinner, Hester, when Miss Rosamond went yes. skipping off with James and me to the kitchen as soon as ever she could? Yes, I do believe she wanted to stay. Her eyes were begging Rosamond to stay, but uh, she wouldn't ask. Uh, she loves the little one, never doubt it. But it's too late now to make amends. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the weather's closing in these nights, Dorothy. Uh, you best pay mind to your own duties. Uh, is the snow so terrible here? Huh? The snow? Well, everyone seems to dread the weather. Tonight at dinner, Miss Furnival stared at Mrs. Stark with those sad eyes of hers and said, I'm afraid we shall have a terrible winter. It seemed a harmless enough thing to say, but Mrs. Stark pretended not to hear and talked very loud as something else. Uh, well, come along, my dear. We're all becoming gloomy, and there's no need. Lord knows there are distractions enough here. It's a wonderful, great rambling house and a famous place for a wee one like Miss Rosamond. Come tomorrow when you're free, and I'll show you the east wing. You mean the west wing, uh, Dorothy? Uh, bless us, yes. What am I saying? You great gawk, you flustered my wits with your teasing. Uh. Of course, I mean the West Wing. It's all green and gloomy, Hester, through the tree boughs and the ivy that darkens the windows. But the rooms are full of treasures. All drowned, you might say, in green water. Old china jars and carved ivory boxes and wonderful things. Of course, we'll go tomorrow. There's nothing to see in the East Wing. Nothing at all. That a Christian would want to see. I haven't run in many a year, Miss Rosamond. And I shan't now, so there. Oh, how many pictures are of room after room? Aye, they were a mighty family since the time of the border wars and long before. But this is the last chamber that was the old state drawing room in the grand days. They hung the best of the pictures here. Uh, who's the man in the plumes and gold lace? That's Sir Humphrey Furnival that fought for the martyr king and fled to France with Charles the Dissolute. Dorothy, who, who's the lovely lady over the mantelpiece? Ah, well, you may ask. That, my dear, is the mistress, Miss Furnival, as she was these fifty years gone by. Oh, oh is that Miss Furnival? A wonder to look at she was then. But such a set, proud look and the scorn in her eyes. Yes. She's laughing at us. Why should she laugh? It's she who has the funny dress on. It was all the fashion when she was young, miss. I remember something like it when I was a wee thing like you. Great ladies wore beaver hats with ostrich plumes tilted over their brows like that. And satin gowns with them quilted stomachers just as you see her. Well, to be sure, flesh is grass, they do say. But who'd have thought that Miss Furnival had been such an out-and-out beauty to see her now? Uh... Folks change, sadly. But there was another sister, and if what my master's father used to say was true, Miss Vanessa, that's dead now, was even handsomer than our mistress, Miss Grace. But if I show it to you, you must never let on, even to James, that you've seen it. Can the little one hold her tongue, do you think? Oh, I wouldn't risk it. Uh, uh, Rosamond, dear, yes? go and hide in the next chamber, in, in the red room, oh. and I'll show you how quickly I can find you. <laughs> 
you never will find me, Hester. You know you never will. Now, quickly, turn the picture around. That one yes. that's not hung up but leans against the wall. Yes, this way. Oh. Uh, uh-huh. oh, to be sure, it beats Miss Grace for beauty, and I think for scornful pride, too. Though for that matter, it's hard enough to choose. Miss Vanessa? She's dead, you say? She was buried. I turn the picture around again, Hester. Turn it round and come away. Oh, a bitter night. And bitterer yet for the shepherds on the fells. Aye. Just the time of year now, from our Lord's birth to Epiphany... That the wind and the cold here do their worst. Seems cruel of the weather to bite most keenly in the Christmas season. Ah, the wind's a Turk. It pays no mind to Saviour. There. Uh, Hester. I can hear it again. That's the second night I've heard it. Someone's playing the great organ in the entrance hall. Bah. Your fancy's got you, Hester. It's the wind, in the branches, and the old eaves. Oh, James, it's not. Trees don't play melodies in airs. I can hear them distinctly. And the more fool you, then, to take wind in the branches for honest tunes. Ugh, I've better things to do than to listen to the girl's fear of a storm. I've work to do in the pantry, and I'll thank you to keep your dreaming to yourself. Forgive him, Hester. He's not been well these last days. Dorothy, what is it? Please hush for a moment. Just hush and listen, will you? Confess it, Dorothy. You hear it as clearly as I do. You do? Oh, God help me, I do. And so does everyone else. You must learn to bear it, as we do. It will not harm you. But who is it? Who's playing it? Oh, since before I came to the hall, it's been said to be the old Lord Furnival, the grandfather of the present Lord, playing on the great organ in the hall, just as he used to do when he was alive. Oh. Oh, I've heard it many a time, but most of all on winter nights and just before storms. You said Mr. Carson, when he brought you here, told you to stop your ears in the winter time, and you did not know what he meant. I think you know now. I thought at first it might be Miss Furnival who played, unknown to Dorothy. But one day, when I was in the hall by myself, I opened the organ and peered all about it and around it, as I'd done once to the one in our village church. And I saw it was all broken and destroyed inside. Oh, it looked so brave and fine. And then, like it was noonday, my flesh began to creep a little. And I shut it up and ran away to my own bright room. I didn't like hearing the music for some time after that. Come in. Oh, you're back, Hester. It was a bitter cold night to walk to church, I should think. I must confess that I admire your piety. Oh, it's kind of you to say so, ma'am, but it's no sacrifice on a night like this. With the moon on the snow, it, it's as bright as day outside. Where is she hiding? Where is who hiding? Why, Rosamond, Mrs. Stark. Dorothy said she left the kitchen an hour ago, and she's not in any of the other rooms. Yes, Hester, Hester, you are a What fool. have you done? The little vixen is asleep among the cushions somewhere in the room, all hiding behind a screen, depend upon it. Oh, oh, Miss Farnham. Yes. Mrs. Stark. Oh, heaven bless you, Hester. You're here. It's Miss Rosamond. Oh. James is bringing oh, me. She was. No, is she doing it? Oh, what? Oh, 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 I ran as I haven't run these thirty years. And I found her halfway up the fell by the old holly bush, stiff and cold. The holly bush. Aye. Aye. Sleepy. Sleepy. Oh, she's 
the beautiful lady. If you'd heard her cry, you'd have let her in. Oh, thank God. Oh. James, uh, dearest James, you were just in time. Uh, where's the lady? Hester, where's the lady and the little girl? Oh, gently, my darling. Gently. Oh, Tell us everything from the beginning, and, and then perhaps we can answer you. Where did you go when you left Dorothy in the kitchen? I, I was on my way to see Auntie Furnival, and 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 I saw snow falling through the windows, and and, and I thought how pretty and white it must be to see it on the ground, and and so then I went to the great hall to see out through the tall windows, and, and I looked out and and the snow was bright and soft but there was a little girl and and so thinly dressed Hester in all the the snow and cold and not so old as I am but so pretty and she beat her hands against the window and and, and 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 cried to be let in but all the time she beat on the glass and all all the time she cried you couldn't hear sound oh heaven Forgive. Have mercy. So I went outside to let her in. But instead of coming in, she took my hand fast and tight in hers. It was very, very cold. <laughs> and she took me up the fell path up to the holly trees. And, and, and there I saw a lady weeping and crying. Devil. Devil. Restless alive she was and restless dead. But as soon as she saw me, she... Hushed her weeping and, and, and smiled, very proud and grand, and, 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 and she took me on her knee and lulled me away, way off to sleep. Oh, have mercy. Wilt thou never forgive? It's many a long year Grace, ago. Grace, come oh. away now, my dear. We're old, you know. We're old, and it's time to rest. Don't you think it's time? Of course. Of course. You're you're right, Anne. You always were. Rosamond? Yes, Auntie? Would you remember something, my dear? Would you remember something if I said it? Yes, Aunt Furnival. What is done in youth cannot be undone in age. Good night, my dearest. Good night. Good night. Come, Grace, come. That's it, my dear. Rosamond, you were lying just now, or imagining things, weren't you? Indeed, Hester, I'm telling you the truth. Indeed, I am. She must be telling the truth, Hester. She can have heard no stories of the child and the woman in the snow, but they existed once, and God help us, they do still. She must have seen them. Tell me once and for all, what did she see? She saw Miss Furnival's hell. That's always with her. That's with her for 50 years. Oh, James was but a boy in the days when America rebelled against King George. The old Lord Furnival, our mistress's father, ruled here. It was a fierce, dour old man that broke his wife's heart with his cruelty and his mad pride. But above all things, next to his pride, the old lord loved music. He could play on nearly every instrument you ever heard tell of. And it was a strange thing. It didn't go to soften his heart. But it didn't. He had over an Italian music master to teach him the organ... But many's and many's a time as he rolled out his fine music, his teacher was walking in the woods with his daughters, Miss Grace, our mistress, and Miss Vanessa, whose picture you saw up above. You know their pride. But pride will have a fall, they say. And they loved, the both of them, that scorned the dukes and princes of their day, they loved an Italian music and master. And was Miss Vanessa got him. Aye. And Miss Grace swore vengeance, she did. And bided her time. And the child at the window was... Miss Vanessa's and the music master's. Aye. And the next year, the Italian went off across the sea. And never came back. What did Vanessa do with the child? She tried to conceal it in her own quarters in the east wing. 
and I found it. Oh, Mrs. Stark, I didn't hear you at the door. Nor did she. The mother and child crying and freezing in the snow? It was the old Lord's right to know what went on in his house. He didn't make the weather. He didn't make the days. But he laid down all his music and died soon after. We think that, like the Italian, he loved Miss Vanessa Moore. Miss Grace and Mrs. Stark had killed their loves. And over the years, they did the same for ours. Oh. House guests died. Servants and the rest of the family fled. And never returned. Take Rosamond away, Hester. Far away. Miss Grace loves her. They will kill her. Go, Go away, Hester. Far away. We love you. They will kill you. But you're innocent. You killed no one. They can want nothing of you. We are faithful servants of the family. We are adopted carnivals. If we love you, they will kill you. Run, Hester, run! As I ran, my dears, with your mother Rosamond in my arms, I, I looked backwards at Furnival Hall. The center block and the west wing where we'd lived were shrouded in darkness as if long abandoned. The east wing, my dears, the east wing. It glowed and shone with lights as for a children's party. Mystery Theater has brought you The Old Nurse's Story by Mrs. Glass Bell in radio version by Gavin Douglas. The cast, Joan Orenstein as Hester in Youth and Age, Dan McDonald as Karsten, Faith Ward was Rosamond. Miriam Bell played Miss Furnivell. Mrs. Stark was played by Muriel White. James was Bill Fulton. Flora Montgomery played Dorothy. Sound, Lee Bailey and Harold Porter. Audio, Bud Tabor. The Old Nurse's Story was produced and directed from CBC Halifax by Peter Duncan. And now stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. famous go-farther gasoline invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. You can't trust a stranger. <laughs> As you walk down the crowded corridor from the district attorney's office, you can feel the stares and hear the whispers. There's Frank Malloy. He's getting out, but not for long. It's costing you $10,000 to walk out that front door, but it's worth it, isn't it, Frank? Because you have a plan, at least part of one. Yes. You reach the front entrance, push open the heavy door, and go out into the street. There at the curb, you recognize the long yellow convertible and the attractive blonde sitting inside. She slides over as you slip in behind the wheel. Yeah. 
In again, out again. Yeah. How was jail this time? Lay off, Vivian. From what I read in the papers, they're going to put you away for a long, long time after the small formality of a trial. Well, don't believe everything you read. I'm not going on trial. You want? No. I'm going to be around long enough to give them a chance. You're going to jump bail. That's exactly what I'm going to do. You'll lose your $10,000 bond. Doesn't matter. I've got plenty, and it's put away where I can get at it in a hurry. Where will you go? We. We're going together, baby. I'm ready, Frank. I don't know how or where we're going, but we're getting out of the States. We can beat it to Havana and then maybe South America. I'll get a divorce and we're all set. We've got enough money to last us the rest of our lives. That sounds wonderful, but how do you expect to get away? The moment they miss you, they'll be watching for you everywhere. Yeah, I know. The DA wants to see me in a couple of days. So whatever we're going to do, we're going to have to move fast. Well, we, we can't just take a plane or a train. Before we start running, Frank, we, we have to think of something, some kind of plan. Yeah, I know. What about a private plane and pilot? Let's find out about it right away. No. There's something else I've got to find out first. What do you mean? I'm going out to the ranch. I'm going to see my wife. You're going out to see Martha? That's right. Why? Vivian... Didn't you ever wonder how the district attorney got hold of all my records and books that I kept? You think I sent them to him? You think I wanted the smoothest gambling syndicate in the state to come crashing down around my neck? No, but somebody else did. It had to be somebody I trusted, somebody close to me. I want to be sure it wasn't Martha. But, Frank, don't and you... And they have enough on me to put me away for 20 years. I want to know where they got it. Oh, Frank, what difference does it make now? All that matters now is getting away. We'll get away, baby. Don't worry. But first, I want to see Martha. I just want to know. As you drive through the city and across the Bay Bridge, your thoughts dwell upon your wife, Martha, don't they, Frank? You begin to think back, wondering just how much Martha knew about you and your organization. Wondering if she knew about Vivian or any of the others. Wondering if it could have been Martha who brought everything crashing down, sending you to jail. And there are other things to be thought of. How will you manage to get out of the country before the district attorney knows you're gone? Chartered plane and a private pilot might work. And you do have friends in Florida who would help you and Vivian get out of the country. After an hour of driving and thinking, you're suddenly startled as Vivian pulls violently at your arm. Frank, look out! <laughs> I hit him? I, I don't know. He's lying by the side of the highway. I didn't see him in time. What was he doing out in the middle of the highway? Look, look, he's getting up. Come on, we better have a look at him. Come on. He is getting up. Yeah. Doesn't look like he's hurt too badly. Hey, hey, you all right? I, I don't know. I think so. What were you doing out in the middle of the highway? I was trying to catch a ride. Uh, but does a anything feel broken? No. No, I, I don't think so. I saw you coming right at me, and I dove for the side of the road. You didn't hit me. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> Looks like my trousers are finished. You, you're sure you're all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget it. It's my own fault for standing in the middle of the highway. Uh, what's your name? My name? Yeah. Chuck, why? <laughs> well, Chuck, I feel kind of bad about this. I think the least I can do is offer you a ride... Do something about those trousers, too. Forget it. Forget it. It's my fault. Well, we can't leave you standing here. We're going another ten miles. Okay. Let me get my hat out of the ditch. Frank, do you have to give him a lift? He admits it was his fault. Let's get out of here. Didn't you notice something, Vivian? Something real interesting about that fellow? Huh? What are you talking about? Look, he's just turned around. Look at him. Now look at me. Notice anything? Frank. See it? Looks a lot like me, huh? Yeah. Same size, build, even his features. Yeah, if I worked it out right, I could get away with it. Get away with what? Just think, Vivian. How much easier it would be for us to get away if everybody thought that I was dead. <laughs> If you really want to protect the money invested in your car, then the motor oil for you is Signal's amazing new heavy-duty oil that reduces engine wear 
Signal Premium, Heavy Duty Signal Premium. Now there's the oil that really protects your car. This proved and improved heavy duty signal oil does more, much more than just lubricate. In addition, Signal Premium motor oil cools, cleans, cushions, seals, and protects. Result? Tests under all types of driving conditions prove new Signal Premium motor oil reduces engine wear 50%. Your engine keeps its like new pep and power twice as long. So if you're still using lazy, old-fashioned oil that merely lubricates, it's high time to make a change for the better. Change oil next time at a signal service station. Change to new, harder-working signal premium motor oil that reduces engine wear 50%. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Almost every piece of the plan seems to fit together, doesn't it, Frank? If the police thought you were dead, you and Vivian could take your time about getting out of the country. You could go knowing they weren't watching for you. You study the man whom you almost hit on the highway, and already you're planning the last few hours of his life. I'll be real nice to him, Vivian, and get him to talk about himself. We have to find out as much about him as we can. You just leave it to me, Frank. Okay. All set, Chuck? Yeah. Let's go then, huh? Buggy. Yeah. Always promised myself I'd have one of these someday. Look at me. I don't even have bus spare. My clothes are dirty and wrinkled and I need a shave. <laughs> I look like a tramp. I don't blame people for passing me by. Where were you headed, Chuck? Los Angeles, I guess. They tell me the nights are balmy down there. It makes a difference when you sleep in parked cars. Well, don't you have any friends in Los Angeles? I don't have any friends anywhere. Well, that's a pretty broad statement, Chuck. Must have friends somewhere. Maybe uh, back home, huh? I wouldn't know. I haven't been home in a long time. Been everywhere else. Australia, Africa, Brazil. Been working on freighters. Just got back to the States last week. Just last week, huh? Right. Been gone nearly five years. Oh, where is your home? I come from a place called Hyannis. Ever hear it? It's in Massachusetts, Cape Cod. No, never heard of it. It's a fishing village. Oh. Still, it doesn't seem possible that a man doesn't have any friends. Oh, you must have a girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. Had a girl once in Hyannis. Her name was Mamie. Mamie? Mm. It's a long time ago when I was young and foolish. Whatever happened to Mamie? I wouldn't know. I wrote her for a while, but... When I didn't get any answer to my letters, I just forgot about Mamie. Say, Chuck, tell me, what kind of work do you do? I'm one of those guys who can do anything until you pin me down, and then it turns out I can't do much of anything. Well, I'm sure you'll fit in somewhere, someday. Just haven't run into it yet. Maybe. In the meantime, I like drifting around the world. I'm talking too much. I don't get the chance to talk to people very often, especially about myself. Everybody likes to talk about themselves. What are you going to do when you get back to L.A.? Look for work, I guess. I'm broke. Well, if you really want a job, Chuck, maybe I can do something for you. What, uh, what do you mean? Well, did you have a ten bar? No. Well, I own a string of bars throughout the valley. If you're willing to learn, maybe I can put you to work as a bartender. Me, a bartender? <laughs> uh, a guy's on his feet a lot in that kind of work. You can make good money. Yeah, yeah, I can believe that. But uh, tell me something. Why all the interest in me? Well, we might have run over you, maybe killed you. I think the least Frank can do is try and help you out a little. Do you, uh, do you think I could learn to tend bar? Oh, I'm sure you could, Jug. It's an interesting proposition, Mr. Uh... Malloy. Just call me Frank. I'm Vivian, Jack. Hi. <laughs> How do you like that? Yesterday I was bumming around. 
today I'm going to be a bartender. Who knows what'll happen tomorrow? You know, don't you, Frank? You know exactly what's in store for Chuck tomorrow. As a matter of fact, you wonder if he'll even be alive tomorrow. Because now you're certain that he will do fine as a part of your plan. No one knows about him. No one even knows where he is. No one would miss him if he disappeared. He assured you of that. As you turn off the main highway towards your small ranch, you already have the first stages of the plan ready. You stop the car at the gate. I have to take care of some business here, Chuck. You go with Vivian. She'll put you up for the afternoon. Whatever you say, boss. Take him to my apartment, huh? Here's his key. I'll call you. When? As soon as I've made the arrangements we were talking about. Will they take long? No. Everything will be taken care of by tonight. Tonight? Yeah. And take good care of Chuck, huh? Make him feel at home. Now, well, we'll be at your place. You call me. I'll call you. Well, I'll see you later tonight, Chuck. Sure thing, Mr. Malloy. Bye, baby. Bye. You watch them disappear down the road, Frank, and then you turn toward the house. Everything seems peaceful and undisturbed, and you realize how long it has been since you've come out to the ranch. As you reach the steps and put your hand to the door knocker, you wonder if Martha will be surprised to see you. Hello, Frank. Hello, Martha. I, uh, I've come to see you. Come in. You don't seem surprised to see me. I'm not. You were expecting me? Yes. Then you knew I was out of jail. Sit down, Frank. Would you like a cup of coffee? No, nothing, except... Martha, I think you know who turned me into the district attorney. Who was it? Why, I did. I did what I thought was right. You must have known, Frank. I always trusted you. You were the one person I thought I didn't have to worry about. That's it exactly, Frank. You never worried about me. I don't think you even thought about me. There was a time when I was the most important thing in the world to you. So you fix it, they'll send me to prison. You belong in prison. You become nothing more than a, a gangster, a hoodlum. You're not the man I married 15 years ago. Little by little, I watched you change. You began to make money, lots of money. And along with your money, you gained power. The more you got, the more you wanted. And anything you couldn't have, you destroyed... What did you expect to do? Own everything and everyone someday? But to turn me in I like that, I... had to stop you for your own sake, and I did it the only way I knew how. I cried for months because I knew the only way to stop you was to... was to call the district attorney. I did what I thought was right. <laughs> now you know, Frank. You know who betrayed you and why it was done. You begin to pace around the room, walking faster and faster, bumping into things and knocking them over. And suddenly you stop in front of the mantel. You see the clock and the feeling of rage subside. You realize that by nine o'clock tonight, things will be all right. And Martha, conscientious Martha, will have a strange punishment, won't she, Frank? She'll always believe she sent you to your death. After a long silence, Martha throws a shawl over her shoulders and walks outside. Vivian, everything all right? Yes, I've been listening to the story of Chuck's life. Seems his girlfriend, Mamie, was quite a gal. Now our bartender's in the other room practicing with your liquor. Good, now listen, Vivian. Get one of my suits out of the closet and give it to Chuck. Have him shower and shave and put the suit on. We're, uh, going to a party. I understand. Tell him you're meeting me at one of my places up at the lake. Leave my apartment by 8.30 and drive up on Skyline Drive to Mountain View Club. Now don't stop anywhere. When you get there, wait in the parking lot and back. Be there by 9 o'clock, clear? Clear and 
simple. What exactly are you planning, Frank? Like I said, a party. I see. Good. Are you sure you've got it all? We'll see you at the party at nine. At nine. What are you doing out here, Martha? Listening to the crickets. It's a nice night. Yeah. I used to go riding on nights like this. You remember that? Of course. I'm surprised, Frank. Are you? Well, here's another surprise for you, Martha. I'm not going to do anything about the fact that you turned against me. Oh? Matter of fact, when I leave here, I'm going for a little ride. One we often used to take together. A long skyline drive. Frank... What have you got on your mind? Just you, Martha. I'll be thinking of you. I'll get my coat for you. Oh, no, no, Martha. Wouldn't be right for you to go anywhere with a... with a hoodlum, a criminal. Frank. Goodbye, Martha. Remember, I'll be thinking of you. The expression on her face, in her eyes, delights you, doesn't it, Frank? Martha is still in love with you after all this time. And later, when your plan goes through, she'll have something to think about, won't she? Something that will be her punishment. Yes, Martha, conscientious as she is, will feel deeply when Chuck's body is finally found in your car, wearing your clothes at the bottom of the lake. Martha will always believe you killed yourself because... She turned you into the district attorney. And above all, she'll testify that you were heading for the Skyline Drive. That part will help eliminate the identification problem. High up on Skyline Drive, you pull into the parking lot of the darkened club, where you agreed to meet Vivian. A few minutes later, the headlights of her car come into view. Right on time. What? Oh, oh, hi, Mr. Malloy. Didn't know you were here yet. Say, thanks for the suit. How do I look? Just fine, Chuck. Are we on time for the party, Frank? Oh, right on time. Oh, say, Chuck, would you give me a hand with some stuff in my car? It's right over here. Sure, sure. Vivian said we were going to a party. Is it in that place up there? No, not there. I didn't think so. Joint looks closed down. It's sure dark out here. What are we going to... This, Chuck, this! (laughs) Yeah. Party's almost over for you, Chuck. What happened? I hit him. It'll be easier to handle this way. Hold that door open so I can put him in the car. Right. What are we going to do now? We stay here about five minutes and then drive up the highway about one mile. The road makes that sharp bend around the lake. Yeah, I know where it is. I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting there off the highway. Blink your lights as you approach and I'll come out and wave you down. Yeah, there. I thought you were going to bring Martha with you. No. I've taken care of Martha. Another way. You drive out of the parking lot, and in a few minutes you reach the sharp curve in the highway, pull over and stop where the edge drops off into the deep end of the lake. And it only takes seconds to drag Chuck's body to the front seat behind the wheel. Carefully, you go through his pockets and remove everything. Then plant your belongings in his pockets. You put your ring and watch on him. Then everything is ready. You push the clutch in, put the car in gear. As you jump back away from the car, it jerks forward and over the ledge. To disappear in the deep black water of the lake. See for yourself. By the time they pull the car out of the water, it'll look like Frank Malloy was drowned when his car skidded off the road and crashed into the lake. Let's hope so. It'll be weeks before they find the body, and the water will make positive identification pretty difficult. 
but they'll find enough there to think it's me. <laughs> and Martha will help, too. Yeah, all we have to do is hide out until he's found. We'll be free, Viv. Where do we go now? Well, first we have to stop at a couple of places down the valley. Got to pick up the money I put away. <laughs> well, that's a must. Then we'll drive on to Los Angeles where we can hide out. Then we'll see. Whatever you say, Frank. Now let's get out of here. <laughs> you know, it's funny how Martha tried to send me to jail. When she recognizes my clothes, her story, more than anything, will help to set me free. Throughout the western states, from Canada to Mexico, one gasoline is famous as the go-farther gasoline. It's Signal Gasoline. Now, naturally, we're mighty proud of Signal's good mileage, which has built that reputation. But equally important to you as a motorist is the way Signal gives you such good mileage. You see, today's Signal helps your engine run so efficiently, you save gasoline three ways. One, you save gasoline with Signal's quick starting. Two, you save gasoline with Signal's smooth, obedient pickup, free from balking and hesitation. Three, you save gasoline with Signal's lively power, that gets you into high gear fast, helps you stay there with a minimum of shifting on hills or in traffic. So you see, considering the number of times a day you start your car, accelerate, and shift gears, even a little gasoline saved each time soon adds up to a big saving. So there in a nutshell, friends, is why motorists call Signal the go-farther gasoline. Why not treat your car to a tank full tomorrow and go farther with Signal? Signal, signal, One morning, two months later, you open your eyes in a hotel just outside the city of Los Angeles, don't you, Frank? Yes, you've been here two months, waiting for someone to find the body of Chuck and identify him as you, the missing Frank Malloy. And last night's paper carried the story you've been waiting for, the story of your death. Now it'll be safe to change your name and leave the country with Vivian. Everything has gone perfectly, hasn't it, Frank? You stretch out on the bed and your hand drops down to touch the small handbag you've kept beside you. The bag containing over a hundred thousand dollars. Suddenly you sit up, realizing the bag is gone. You get up and search the room frantically, but the money isn't there. Operator. Operator! Oh. Yes, sir? Would you connect me with room 303, Miss Vivian Nevis Smith, and hurry? Uh, yes, sir. Sorry, sir, but Miss Smith checked out of the hotel about an hour ago. What? Did she leave a message? Nothing, sir. Anything else, sir? No. Nothing. Who's there? Vivian. Vivian. Vivian, the, the bag with the... That's what you're looking for. Who are you? He's from the police department, Doc. The police? Yes, he picked me up at the airport. After reading the story in the paper last night, I thought it was safe enough now to leave, only it wasn't. She was taking your money and running out on you, Malloy. And why not? It would only be a matter of time before I meant no more to him than Martha. Shut up, Vivian. It doesn't matter now, Frank. Sure doesn't. You see, the newspaper story was just to get you out in the open. Some fishermen did find a body in the lake... But after all this time, it was a little hard to identify. He was wearing your clothes, Malloy, and was in your car. Your wife thought it was you. But I don't see how that I'll could... I'll tell you something, though. At the morgue, we found out different. You see, Malloy, it wasn't hard to figure out what you'd done when we found a tattoo on the drowned man's chest. Yeah, a tattoo of a heart with the words, Chuck... And Mamie. (laughs) 
Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember, regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. When you take a chance to save a moment, you take a chance on that moment's being your last. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Gerald Moore, Betty Lou Gerson, Shepard Menken, and Charlotte Lawrence. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Gus Bays, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Renzo, new Renzo with Tholium presents Call the Police. Attention, homicide section, flying squad detail. Murder suspect in your zone. Close in according to instructions. Between you and the evil outside the law stands the policeman of your community. He gives up his safety that you may be safe. And sometimes he gives up his life to protect yours. New Rinso, the soap that contains solium, the scientific sunlight ingredient, brings you Call the Police. A new series of realistic radio dramas inspired by the courageous work of police departments all over America. This is Commissioner Bill Grant. Case number 4208 in the Ashland police files was a nightmare. A black panic we try not to think of on moonless nights as... The case of the Sun Tower Mystery Mansion. The case really began when Mrs. Potter, a devotee of occultism and wealthy mistress of Sun Tower Mansion, hired a mystic gentleman named Michel Brouillet to serve as a cross between a servant and a ghostly ringmaster. This I knew was unhealthy stuff, but it didn't become my business until a few months later, one ugly rainy night. <laughs> That was the night Mrs. Potter returned from her European junket. On hand to meet the train was, of course, our boy, the mystical Michel. And Mr. Potter? Gerald stayed over in New York. He'll be in in the morning. He, he will not be teased when he gets here. Michel, you look different. So worried. The night after you went away, I, I made a mistake. Mistake? I was lonely in that enormous house, Sybil. It was natural that I should want to talk to our friends. But I was guilty of some fatal oversight. Michel. Suddenly, there was an infernal music and laughter. And then, as I stood trembling, a throne of skulls manifested in the center of the room. <gasps> and there, there he sat. Who? I, I think the master of darkness himself. I remembered the exorcization of Balsami. Vade, vade, magister sinistrus. I, I shouted those words, and the room was suddenly empty. Oh, thank heaven. But all, all is not well. I do not think the house is a safe place for you, Sybil. 
What have we done? What have we done? We, we will talk about it inside. Come. Oh, oh, there must be some way, somehow, of undoing the harm. And... Sibyl. Yes? I'm sorry. The key to the front door. I've left it inside. You go on ahead. I will let myself into the cellar and open the door for you. You won't be long, will you? Where will this end? Where will it end? Gerald warned me. He said dealing with the beyond is dangerous. Someday you'll be you'll discover too late that What was that? Michelle. 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 Oh, thank heavens you Oh no. It isn't you. Oh, no. No. Let me out of here. Let me out. Let me out. No. No. holiday yesterday, same as you. We spent most of the day at the beach. But first, my wife said she wanted to do her regular Monday rinse wash. And what's more, she wanted my help. <laughs> well, you know, I got a big kick out of it. And I found out one thing. A woman has a lot more wash to do than I knew about. First, she did all the white things. Tablecloths, sheets, dish towels, and my shirt. And say, the wonderful way that rinse wash turned out was something to see. Whiter, actually, than brand new. The colored washables, like my wife's good cotton dresses, her ginghams, and my pajamas were even brighter than brand new. That's the astonishing thing that happens when you use new rinse with sodium, the scientific sunlight ingredient. Clothes come whiter and brighter than new. Only rinse can do that because only new rinse contains sodium. Even on rainy days, even when clothes are dried indoors, New Rinso puts sunshine in your wash. It's so safe for clothes and kind to hand. New Rinso with Solium. Mrs. Potter, the wealthy addict of occultism, was driven home from the station by her mystic soothsayer and servant, Michael Brulier. Half an hour later, she was found strangled to death in the hallway of her enormous home by a passerby who had heard her earth-rending scream. That was the beginning. But there was more to come, lots more. And all bad, as I discovered as soon as Libby and I walked into Suntower Mansion. As the body commissioner. Mm, so I see. Now, you were the gentleman who heard Mrs. Potter's cries came in to investigate? Yes, I happen to be passing by. I'm a doctor. And the name? Robert Martin. Any details, Dr. Martin? The woman was obviously strangled. Marks in her throat, face contorted. Make a note, Louise. All right. If you'd like to have me make an official report at headquarters. What's this? Commissioner. No, look. It's our lad, Brouillet. Goodness, isn't What's the matter, Mr. Brouillet? Run into a strong arm spook? This man is hurt. Whoever attacked him meant to kill. What went on here, Brouillet? I... I brought Mrs. Potter home. I, I forgot the key. I went into the cellar to let her in. Where's Mr. Potter? New York. Stayed over. Not expected back until the morning. Um, uh, you're going through the cellar to let her in. Just I, I started to run up the steps. She was calling my name, and, and then from somewhere, something hit me, and I, I lost consciousness. I, is she all right? Not exactly. What? What is the matter? Where is she? On the floor in front of you. Sibyl. Dead. Dead. Oh, no. She... Oh, oh, oh. He's fainted. I think it was genuine shock. If it was, doctor him up. Revive him. Yes, sir. Libby? Yes, Bill? Let's take a walk. 
I want to give this monkey house the once over. Libby and I had worked our way through a dozen massive hallways and up and down as many massive staircases, getting nowhere but lost. And a sound from very nearby stopped us in our tracks. What's that? I thought this joint was empty. What is that, Bill? We'll soon find out. What's the idea? What does this mean? Why, I... Oh, Commissioner Grant. Well, if it isn't Mr. G.F. Potter unpacking his expensive luggage. Come on in, Levy. What are you doing here? I'll tell you if you tell me. This is my home. Rumor had it that you were in New York. Rumor's correct. I was. I just got in. When? A few minutes ago. What time? What is What time did your train get in? At, uh, at 11.15. I, uh, just arrived from the station. Seen your wife since you got in? No, I came in quietly through the side entrance. I didn't want to disturb her. Where do you think she is? Well, she got in a couple of hours before I did. She's probably in her bedroom, sleeping peacefully. She's on the drawing room floor, G.F. And she's dead. What? Murdered. Corroborate, Libby. Your wife has been murdered, Mr. Potter. May I come in, Commissioner? Oh, sure. Mr. Potter, this is Dr. Martin. He discovered your wife's body. I just wanted to report that Michel Bouillet is coming around. Good. And one other item. I applied artificial respiration, and when I removed his coat for the purpose, this fell out. A letter? Under the circumstances, it seemed a little bizarre. Postmarked three weeks ago, foreign stamp. Interesting. Mr. Potter has just returned from Europe. Let's see it. Grant, you like Gerald. Ah. My dear Brouillet, I'm aware that there's a romantic relationship between you and my wife. You may think I will overlook this affront, but I assure you that I will avenge it if it means death for both of you. Signed, G.F. Potter. Give me that letter. Sorry if it annoys you, Gerald, but you wrote it with your own little hands, and you kept your word. Goulier is alive by the skin of his teeth. And a little over an hour ago, you murdered your wife. You're insane. Why, my train didn't get in until 11.15. Take it, Libby. Uh, hello? Yes? Yes? Oh, I see. Uh, what time was that? Sure. Sure, I'll tell him and thanks. Tell who? Mr. Potter. Yes. That the airline is holding the briefcase that he left aboard the plane. What plane was that? The one that arrived from New York at 6.30 this evening. Well, G.F., what's the answer to that one? Before I turned around, Potter was making tracks for the open door to the terrace. I gave chase. He turned and let me have both feet on the solar plexus. <laughs> Sent me crashing back over the wall of the house, but the recoil was too much for him. And he was over the railing, howling like a horrified banshee. Potter lay still where he fell. We went down to the drive below and heard Dr. Martin's diagnosis. Just a broken rib, Commissioner. You sure that's all? I'm absolutely certain. Dr. Martin accompanied his newly made patient to the city hospital where his rib would heal under the watchful eye of a guardian of the law. The sergeant and I proceeded to the International Airline Terminal to claim Potter's briefcase as material evidence. While we were driving back, Bourdier was beginning to feel a little better at Suntower House, and Libby was doing some unrequested overtime. Unofficially, Mr. Bourdier, I think you know a lot more than you've said. And on the other hand, I don't think that you're guilty. You are right. Both times. Then who are you shielding? Of course, if you don't want to talk. Miss Tyler, do you believe in the powers of evil? In this world or the next? Either one. I believe in them in this world. And how do you feel about them? I... I hate them. Are you sure... Look, Mr. Bruyere, I only took up police work because I thought it was the best way I knew of to protect the rights of decent people. Very well. I shall tell you. Tell me. This murder was actually the work of a man named Lefebvre. Lefebvre? Yes. A murderer and villain. 
from my native island of Hawaii in the Caribbean. Where is he now? Where? Where is the wind that brings pestilence? What? He is everywhere. Oh. Listen. Second word. Oh. What's that? My death. Monster. No, no, you're not to get up, Mr. Bree, and you're not strong enough. Let me go. Let me go. Stop it. Stop it, you thief. You thief. later when Maggio and I walk into headquarters. Hello? Hello? Who is it? Hello? Bill? Bill? Libby. Hello, Libby. Libby, hello. Hello, hello, Libby. I yanked Maggio along on the double. Back at Suntower House, I must have taken the marble escalator in three leaps and then... I stood on the doorway of the second floor bedroom. Bill? Bill? And there I saw Libby on her hands and knees, ah. dragging herself toward me, Bill. literally over the dead body of Michel Brouillet. with solium, but there's one particular kind of woman to whom it makes a really special appeal. That's the kind of woman who likes to keep everything she owns fresh, new-looking, and shining, as nearly perfect as she can. New Rinso with solium actually makes the clothes you wash turn out whiter than when they were brand new, and the washable colors brighter than brand new. You can't do better than that, and as a matter of fact, no other soap can do that for you because no other soap contains solium. So if you want your table linens, towels, and your house dresses, too, to have a brilliance you've never seen before, use New Rinso, the only soap that contains the scientific sunlight ingredient. The wonderful solium. You'll find that even on rainy days, even if you have to dry a wash indoors, Rinso with solium puts sunshine in your wash. Try it on wash day. Safe, soapy, rich New Rinso. When the second murder occurred and Michel Brouillet was found strangled to death at Sun Tower Mansion, we got Libby out of the joint fast. Back at headquarters, she began to talk to Maggio and me, incoherently at first, and then... Brouillet was just telling me that the murder was committed by someone named Lefebvre. Lefebvre? Mm-hmm. Hey, wait a minute. There's a thing in the paper about a guy named Lefebvre. What about him? He's a guy who's running for president in an island in the Caribbean. Got the article? Yeah, just a second. Here. Uh, oh, here it is, page three. Where? Yeah. Oh. And I, July 3rd. Edmund Lefebvre has announced his candidacy for president to replace the late Manuel de Guerra, recently assassinated by the aroused population. Uh, it couldn't be the same, Lefebvre. He's 2,000 miles from here. Mm-hmm. Uh, go ahead, Lefebvre. Brouillet mentioned Lefebvre and... Well, and suddenly there was this music. This wild, unreal music and the heavy pounding of a drum and people laughing down below. What people laughing down below? No people. The place was empty. What are you telling us, Miss Tyler? What happened? Just what happened? I can't explain it any more than you can. Who's that? Come in. I just dropped by, Commissioner, to say that our patient is conscious and under police guard in City Hospital. Potter? Yes, I just left him. He couldn't have slipped out about 45 minutes ago. No, definitely not. Then that lets Potter out. Sure. Sure does. It's obvious what we're dealing with here. 
Ghosts. Goblins. Maggio. Yeah? Go out and round up a witch doctor and hand him the case. Get a real Lollapalooza with a two-headed mask. If I might suggest... Huh? I, uh... I was going to say that since we all know that ghosts don't exist, we might make a simple assumption in this case. You mean... Somebody could be rigging up a ghost scare? Possibly. Though I can't imagine the reason. The reason? Or could there be anything valuable at Suntower House? Dr. Martin. Yes, sir? Is Potter well enough to have a little conversation? Yes, he is. Okay, let's get to the hospital. He's the boy to give us the answers. You better talk, Potter. If you didn't kill your wife, you intended to. Somebody had gotten to Sybil before you, and you gave us that phony timetable alibi because you were scared. But I... I've told you all I know, Commissioner. But there's nothing of peculiar value at Suntar House. Are you absolutely certain, Potter? Yes, yes. There's, there's nothing in any of the rooms that we know about. Rooms you know about? What does that mean? Well, there... Well, there's some lost space in Suntar House. That's all, Grant. That's all, is it? That's all! Come on, come on. Well, we rebuilt the right wing, and the architect did a sloppy job and left a foot or so of the floor space out of the new blueprint. It was really a better house the way it was when we bought it from him. From him? From who? A foreign chap named, uh, something like, uh, Lafayne, uh, Lefebvre. Lefebvre? Yes. Why, yes. That's it. Edmund Lefebvre. He was somewhere from the Caribbean, uh, the island of Hanoi, I believe. I made a beeline for the original architect of Sun Tower House and came away with the blueprints. Burning the 10 o'clock oil with compass and slide rule, I finally scared Maggio out of a year's growth. There it is. There it lays. I got it. Holy smoke. Compare, my ever-loving Watson... A fast glance betrays that there's a discrepancy yielding us four and a half feet of unaccounted floor space in the attic reaches of Sun Tower House. Come on. To where? To the mansion. Come on. Where will I get my coat? You don't need it. My gun's inside. I got a gun. <laughs> you went up to that attic armed with axe and crowbar and started tapping for hollow sound. Maggio took the front wall. I took the rear and then... Maggio. Yeah? The axe. What do you find? We'll soon know. <sighs> Look at it crumble, Sergeant. If you ask me, this is it. <clears throat> there, have a look. It's the four and a half feet between the real outer wall and this phony partition. It's very nice, Chief, only it's as empty as a beggar's hat in Edinburgh, you notice? I notice. But I also notice it's papered. So? Valuables can come in very small parcels, Maggio. Start ripping the wallpaper off wherever it looks a little loose. As you say, Commissioner. Hey. Listen. Yeah. That's what Miss Tyler said she heard. Let them have a picnic down there, Sergeant. They can't stop us now. I got an angle, Chief. Run me a gun and you keep looking. What are you going to do? Fire a shot and see if it don't break up the celebration. I kept working over the wallpaper while Maggio went out to the head of the stairs. He had fired that shot down into the darkness. I waited. The music was still. And then... Two shots came up out of the darkness, and Maggio staggered into the room, empty-handed and gripping his right arm. Chief! Chief! Maggio! It's coming. Coming. Something's coming up the stairs. Listen. What is it? I only only saw a blood. My gun! Where's my gun? I I dropped it over the staircase when I got it in the armor. What? I think this is really it. I, I'm sorry, Chief. There was a dark figure in the doorway. I reached reflectively for the gun that wasn't in my holster, found my flashlight, and turned it on the shadowy menace. You 
will be wise enough to respect the gun, I trust. You could miss with the light in your eyes. Hardly with six bullets, Commissioner. And there's a logic in what you say, Dr. Martin. By the way, I just located the valuable. It was a roll of 16-millimeter film plastered behind the wallpaper where the former tenant, Mr. Lefebvre, left it. I will take it, please. What's this thing worth, Martin? Grolier evidently considered it pretty important. He started a ghost scare here at Sun Tower House to keep people away while he searched. What Bourrier did is none of my business. Your rivals, weren't you? Both after this little roll of film for reasons of your own. You're only in agreement on one point. The ghost scare was a very useful smokescreen, a hocus-pocus worked with records and a public address system. So? But essentially, you and Brulier were mortal political enemies. You must have been. You killed him when he was about to enlist Libby and the police on his side. I have no time to talk. You also killed Mrs. Potter to keep her from intruding on this vital hunting ground. But one point I don't get. Why did you enlist the services of the police? I needed official help. I needed it badly enough to take the risks involved. I had to get those architects' prints and locate the missing room. Washington has discovered that I am here without a visa. And you wanted me to wind up your unfinished business? Just as you have done. And now, if you don't want to be the last business I finish, give me that film. Not a chance. Very well. Play it your own way. Best wishes to Grant. Well? Well, who was it? Santa Claus? Olivia Tyler. Did... Did I kill him, Bill? No. He just knocked his artillery arm out of commission. Oh, good news. I got better news, Angel. He didn't kill me. As soon as Maggio came around, Libby and I ran the 16-millimeter film through in a private projection booth. They were documentary proof of Lefebvre's intimate association with certain ruthless elements in Hanai. Enough to kill his chances for election. Brouillet was after the film to squelch Lefebvre's chances. Martin, on Lefebvre's payroll, was in this country to destroy the film. So, uh, now what happens, Bill? Michel Winslow, the mystical man of goodwill. How do you mean? We ship the film to Hanai tomorrow. And the mystery's over? Except for one thing. How did you manage to appear just in time? Oh, that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I got on to Martin. I contacted the New York Medical Association, found out there was no listing at all for a Dr. Robert Martin, and I came looking for you. Very sly, little lady. And what do we get for it in the end? A movie. <laughs> at least a free movie. Oh, it lacked a lot. Oh, such a... Uh, a finish. You know, a moment when the guy and the gal stand face to face and he murmurs something sentimental and then draws her uh, to him. Bill, Bill, please. Well, what's the matter, sweetheart? I'm only trying to show you what I mean by a lovely finish. Bill! Oh, Bill Grant. <laughs> Mr. Grant will be back in just a moment with the Call the Police Award of Valor. This week presented to a police officer who drove his motorcycle headlong into a hail of bullets to capture three vicious bank robbers. This is Bill Grant. Tonight we present the Call the Police Plaque of Valor and a cash award to motorcycle officer Robert T. Mayer of Los Angeles, California. While on traffic duty in downtown Los Angeles, Officer Mayer picked up a radio police call alerting all units to a bank holdup at 8th and Vermont. Wheeling his motorcycle, he roared in the direction of the robbery. Several blocks from the bank, Mayer spotted the hold-up car as it careened around a corner. Skidding crazily for a half block, it crashed against a wall. The three bandits leaped out and, using the overturned car as a barricade, opened fire on the radio car number 71T, which had led the chase. Mayer rode his motorcycle directly into the hail of bullets. Then he, too, opened fire. The pitch gun battle lasted for several minutes before two of the robbers went down. Severely wounded himself, Officer Mayer apprehended all three gunmen. His high courage in face of direct fire, his resolute fortitude and gallant devotion to duty, 
are in keeping with the highest tradition of the police forces of America. Congratulations to Motorcycle Officer Robert C. Mayer, Chief C.B. Horrell, and the entire police force of Los Angeles, California. George Petrie was starred in the role of Bill Grant. Music was arranged and conducted by Ben Ludlow. This is Hugh James reminding you to be with us again next week when Lever Brothers Company, makers of new Rinso with Solium, bring you another exciting police case. Listen next week to... The Case of the Mandarin's Macaw. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. There's an old school motto with a modern twist, folks. An empty barrel makes a fine casket. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Manhattan Island's my beat. From Battery Place uptown to Spite and Divo. I've got my footprints on every inch of sidewalk. A memory in every mile. Get used to a beat and it's like home to you. You're an island native and only a pretty fancy fee can drag you even across the river to Brooklyn or three other boroughs. To drag you out of town needs a major earthquake or an act of Congress. So how come I find myself 40 miles from Broadway in an incorporated village called Seneca on the trail of a claw murderer? A nice little gent with side whiskers like Abraham Lincoln coaxed me into it. Town Supervisor Samuels, he called himself. His pitch went something like this. I came straight to you from Lieutenant Trav Rogers of your Metropolitan Police, Mr. Craig. Yeah, Lieutenant Rogers phoned me. You just left his office. No dice, old man. Seneca's off my beat. But but it's a situation of desperate emergency. What's the population of your village, Samuel? 300. A killer can't lose himself in that small a crowd. But then... uh... Order every townsman to line up in the public square. Then go up and down the line. When you see a wild gleam, nab him. A wild gleam? The guy you're looking for is a lunatic, first class. The claw used in the killing shows that. One nut in a navelly crowd, your sheriff can't be that helpless. Well, he is. Berkey's only honorary sheriff. His business is farm tools and tractors. Who's your regular sheriff? We have nobody. Crime in Seneca is a rare thing. <laughs> Don't even have a jail. Pass the hat and build yourself one. Crime's here to stay, people say. Uh, the board of supervisors empowered me to supersede Berkey, to contract outside help, someone experienced in homicide. You were highly recommended. By Trav Rogers. The lieutenant's having his joke. Please, Mr. Craig. You're a nice town supervisor, and you look like a tin type of an old favorite uncle of mine. I'd like to help you, but uh, no amount of pleading, no power on earth, not 50 claw killings can entice me 40 miles from New York. In Seneca, flanked by Samuels and the sometime sheriff, I got a look at the corpse. The morgue was the back room of a taxpayer divided into a grain, oats, and seed shop and mortuary parlor. Uh, This was Dr. Tyler, Mr. Craig. A doctor, huh? A horse doctor. Oh, sad day for Dobbin. Pretty thorough job of annihilation. Uh, Shocking crime. The claw marks on the skull were made by a garden tool, looks like. Yeah, did Doc Tyler have any enemies? Uh, let the sheriff answer, Samuels. Why, no. Not to my knowledge, he didn't. Doc Tyler was a pillar in the community, a fine, respected Save man. Save the uh, eulogy for the funeral services, huh? Theft, then. Was anything stolen? No, I'll have to say no to that. All Tyler had was accounts receivable. Bills owing him for his doctoring work. You went over his property, then? I did. The robbery was my notion, too, at first. I ordered an inventory of everything Tyler owned, right down to the horse pails. And nothing was missing? Nothing of any account, no. 
Except for old Baldy, everything was right where it belonged. Except for old Baldy, you say? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh. Old Baldy's an old iron paperweight, uh, the American Eagle. Doc Tyler always had it on his desk on top of a pile of papers. And old Baldy was missing? Yes. Yes, we couldn't find hide nor hair of it. Well, either somebody borrowed it and planted to keep it now that Tyler had gone, or Tyler threw it out. Or oh, the murderer clawed Tyler to get it. Oh, now, uh, why would anybody want to commit murder for a worthless old paperweight? Can't say. But that's why I'm in this whistle stop, to find out why. And that brings us down to cases. You and me. Come again? Your being here. Samuels brought you out against me. Against you? No, no, serious. Shut up, Samuels. This is between me and Craig. Against me, I said, Craig. Oh, I get it. Your pride's hurt, huh, Sheriff? When you jackassed around a while and Samuels admits to being the finicky fool he is, I'm marching you to the railroad station. With a brass band and local school mom doubling as drum majorette. A big goodbye to a conquering hero, Sheriff, because my parting gift to Seneca is your claw murderer in person. Want to bet? I found overnight accommodations at a Miss Pringle's split seconds before a storm broke. Miss Pringle was a spinster who looked it, and a fluffy white poodle who looked as if he was eating himself into his grave to escape Miss Pringle. Uh, this is Fluff, Mr. Craig. Fluff, huh? Does he bark? Uh, seldom. Uh, Fluff has chronic laryngitis. Oh. oh. Uh, Dr. Tyler, peace to him, was treating Fluff. Sad about Dr. Tyler. Uh, you're here to find the fiend? I'm here to get a night's sleep. Very well. You you can have the attic room. Why so high a climb? But I'm I'm not accustomed to taking mail lodgers. Enough said. Blankets, towels, is everything there? Oh, yes, yes, the room is ready. And a wall outlet so I can plug in and shave? No, no, the electric wires don't extend to the attic. Oh. Uh, there's a kerosene lamp. Uh, now, if you go to your room... I... You're pushing me, Miss Pringle. But I'm not accustomed to men in my parlor. Enough said. I'll see you in my dreams. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Good night, Miss Pringle. There were things I wasn't accustomed to, like attics, like figuring out how to light kerosene lamps, or like having the roof suddenly cave in on my head. I went down from a sneak blow, a club the weapon felt like. I went down, but not out. I could see through a red haze like a film of blood, and I could hear glass breaking somewhere in the room. I rolled on the floor, not to be a sitting duck for a second blow. But no second blow came. Just quiet and the rain outside. The rain blowing in from an open window. The window my sneak opponent had used getting in and out. I went out the window after him. Outside, just at the edge of Miss Pringle's driveway, I ran into a reasonable facsimile of King Kong. A guy who looked as if he should be swinging from trees. Sitting behind the wheel of an open convertible, its top down. Working the car starter and getting nowhere. Having trouble, friend? It's slow. Don't want to go. The wires are wet. I'm driving good and then it stops. Your wires are wet. I'm driving good, and then it stops, and then it won't go. You're getting all tangled up in your IQ, friend. Doesn't the top go up? Yeah, easy. This button here, you push it. So push it. No. You've got a medium-sized lake around you. Floodwaters rising from the floorboard. I'm not pushing no button. I like it like this. How did you happen to stall here? I told you I'm driving good. And well, then it stops, and then it won't go. You making fun of me? No, 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 no. Did we meet a while ago? Huh? Where? In Miss Pringle's attic. No. I'm driving, so how could it be? How could it be? 
Parked here the last five minutes. Did you see anybody in a hurry to quit the general neighborhood of Miss Pringles? No. I see nobody. You're sure? Were you trying to mix me up? Nature got to you first. Just for future reference, uh, what name do you answer to? Harmony. Harmony? Yeah. You like it? Back in the attic with the kerosene lamp lit and Miss Pringle in a trembling spasm, I took stock of the room. Oh, what you've told me, Mr. Craig, it's unbelievable. Believe it. I wasn't born with this rhinoceros egg on my head. But what purpose could I'm checking it? to see. This picture on the floor, where was it hanging originally? The kerosene lamp's throwing so many shadows, I can't see the nail hole. Why, oh, it's it hung there over the high boy. The glass broke? Yeah, it needs a new glass. A ship's print, huh? Yes, uh, uh, the princess Ida, an old whaling vessel. The picture have any special meaning? Special meaning? A value, an heirloom or something? Why, no, no value. I only paid a dollar for... Oh, wait, yes, come to think of it, I was offered a good price for it. How good a price? One hundred dollars, if I recollect. For a dollar print? Who made the offer? The young Mr. Stanley, the one with the new antique shop out on North Rugby. Why didn't you sell the picture to him? Well, I'm not sure. For spite, I guess. Spite? Well, the young man was too persistent and, and bad-mannered. Calling me on the telephone and then tracking his muddy boots on my parlor rugs. But I don't understand why these questions... Somebody was up here to steal the picture. I got in the way and was struck down. But nobody stole the Princess Ida. It was dropped in the commotion and the getaway. I heard breaking glass while rolling on the floor. Oh, you're trying to frighten me. Just enough to make you twice the cautious miss you already are. No men in your parlor. There's one joker abroad who might not respect that rule. Oh, you, you, you're not alluding to the... The claw murderer. Bolt your door and sleep with one eye open. Oh, my... I've just found you beautiful, and I don't want to lose you. Mr. Craig. Yes, Miss Pringle. Uh, there's a fine room on the first floor right next to mine. Oh, no thanks. I'm getting to like the attic. There's electricity and, and a wall outlet you can shave. Oh, really kind of you. But I'm looking forward to roughing it. It'll toughen me up. Mr. Craig, I... I insist you move to the room downstairs next to mine. Oh, this creeping infatuation for me. Fight it, Miss Pringle, to your last drop of blood. We could get to be the talk of Seneca. But I, I don't care, Mr. Craig. I, I'm frightened. <laughs> In the morning, I took breakfast with town supervisor Samuels. Breakfast and information. I'm sorry, Sheriff Berkey made you unwelcome. Berkey's sensitive to competition. I'm sorry about your injury. My injury? You were attacked and beaten last night. How could you know? Uh, Miss Pringle had me on the telephone in the middle of the night. Oh. I want to know about a couple of your townspeople. Yeah? First, uh, a bright chap who calls himself Harmony. Harmony? Now, what reason could you... Never mind. I'm asking the questions. Tell me about him. Uh, Harmony's big Toby Keller. Hires out for odd jobs. Spring plowing, window washing, garage work. How about dirty work? No. Craig, you're wrong about Harmony. I'd take an oath. His mind isn't uh, the best. But we know him to be good-natured, honest. Mm-hmm. What about a young Mr. Stanley? Fred Stanley? Uh, he's a newcomer to Seneca. What brought him here? A lawyer got him to come in the first place. From Chicago, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, Chicago. Fred Stanley came thinking he was a missing heir. Claim his grandfather's fortune. But there was no fortune. Only an old house just this side of the Seneca line. Not worth the taxes on it. Why was there any idea of a fortune at all? And the grandfather, old Mitchell Stanley, was said to be a rich miser who put no trust in banks. And when Mitch Stanley died, there wasn't a penny. They had to auction off his furniture to pay for his funeral. But young Stanley stayed on in Seneca. Yeah, opened an antique shop in the old Stanley house. Can he make out in a one-horse town like this? He has business signs posted on the highways, hoping to get the tourist trade. What's your interest in Fred Stanley? He tried to buy a ship's print, the Princess Ida, from a girlfriend of mine, Miss Pringle. 
Stanley offered $100 for a picture worth $1. A liberal offer like that... Craig, Craig! Craig. No, don't blow your gasket. It's only a parcel delivery through your closed window. Did you order this? What is it? A claw. A garden tool like the one used on Doc Tyler. And a note with it. It's addressed to me, Barry Craig. Get out of Seneca by 10 this morning or never. Get out of Seneca by 10? Nine. Hmm, I've got an hour of grace. Or never. Craig, it's a threat against your life. Huh? Oh, I'll be planted in the country. A city fellow like uh, me. The handwriting. No handwriting. The note was put together with newsprint. Can I borrow your car? Yeah, of course. Uh, Stanley's Antique Shop is on North Rugby Road, uh, just this side of the Seneca line, you said. It's a three-mile drive, up the incline to Widder's Ridge, then left a quarter mile... Uh, Craig, be careful. Please, I, I don't want your murder on my conscience. Okay, I'll stay alive. But only for your sake, mind you. <laughs> Staying alive is a deal that sometimes needs the cooperation of unknown parties, in my racket, anyhow. Climbing the steep incline to Widow's Ridge. Climbing maybe 300 feet into morning mists as thick as pea soup. I knew I wasn't going to get that kind of cooperation. <laughs> A rifle shot that blew a tire into confetti. Crash off the incline had to come. <laughs> Funny distortions in your eye when you first come to and start taking inventory to see if you're alive. A half-frozen robin who didn't have the sense to fly south for the winter. He sat on the side of the hill ten feet from where I lay, staring solemnly at me and chirping prayers for my safety. Oh, when I started getting to my feet, the robin flew away. The inventory added up. I was all there in one piece with a few dents that couldn't hurt forever. Samuel's car was down at the foot of the incline, topsy-turvy, like it was playing dead dog. I'd been thrown clear of the wreck. Half my fee into the poor box. I took an oath on that as I started for Rugby Road on foot. Fred Stanley gave me the expected answer. Just what do you find so unusual about my interest in buying old pictures, Mr. Craig? $100 for a $1 picture doesn't make sense. And why must it make sense? It's a cold, practical world, chum. People generally don't go haywire with money. They conserve it. Now, look, Craig. I collect Americana. Whatever strikes my fancy, I buy. The cost is secondary. But you're in business to buy cheap and sell at a profit. Technically, yes, but it doesn't work out that way. I love buying and I hate selling. A profit is rare. That gets expensive. Where does the money come from? That's none of your business, Craig. Now, if you don't mind, I'll terminate this interview. I'm in no hurry. Now, look here, Craig. And I'm in no mood for the polite, formal approach, Stanley. Or the kind of weasel talk you've been giving me. Or being terminated. Are you insane? I walked away from my own murder 20 minutes ago. I came to this whistle stop against my will to do a big, good deed. And go home. I don't intend to settle here for keeps. But what has that got to you do with... You lied to me. A fancy, eccentric pose that's as phony as a ham bought with Acton Shemokin. The ship print signifies something more than just another antique. No polite, formal approach, Stanley. I'm going to pound the truth out of you. You're me. crazy. Let me go. Tell me about the Princess Ida ship print. Let go. Harmony. Harmony, help. Harmony, huh? Now we're making headway. So uh -huh. King Kong's hired out to you. Harmony, help. I want you to let Stanley uh, go. Uh, Strapping ape like you, Harmony, uh, you don't need a gun to take charge. I want you to let Stanley go. Sure, I'll let Stanley go. I was only fixing his tie. Oh, Craig, you, you had no right to manhandle me, no right. It paid off. I got to find out who was providing Harmony with his raw meat. Harmony's with me on day hire to do general cleaning and polishing, scrape down old furniture. Plus prowl and attics, plus distribute garden tools shaped like claws all over town. Plus, take rival shots at passing cars. You're out of your mind. You assaulted me and Harmony rescued me. Now get out of here. Sure. But I'll be back. I'll be back, Stanley. The minute I tumble to your motive.
Back at Miss Pringle's to wash up and change my suit for a whole one, I found her prized parlor rug a mess. Spots all over it. And the dog Fluff suddenly cured of laryngitis and barking. Warm spots with a sticky feeling to the hand. Red like blood. Blood tracked in by Fluff from somewhere. followed the tracks to Miss Pringle's bedroom. The blood was Miss Pringle's goodbye to spinsterhood. The garden tool shaped like a claw lay beside her on the floor like a third hand. Town Supervisor Samuels, aged 20 years and 20 seconds. Craig, it's, it's ghastly, ghastly. We'll skip the rhetoric. Miss Pringle was murdered by someone who made off with the Princess Ida. You know that? The picture is gone. I searched high and low. Uh, the murder then clears Stanley in harmony of any suspicion. No. But you saw the both. Miss Pringle could have been murdered earlier. While I was here, breakfasting with you. The Princess Ida and old Baldy. Two murders for two worthless relics. You're convinced these relics motivated the atrocities? It figures. The relics and somebody's lust to kill for its own sake. We're dealing with a nut to boot. Do the articles have any history? History? A story, some legend they figure in, say. No, no, nothing I know, Craig. Some background that could tell us why two hunks of junk produced two killings. I'm sorry. Is there anybody in Seneca who could know? A village librarian or a local historian? Uh, you could ask Will Briggs. Will used to be our recorder until the town board voted to abolish the job. Will Briggs? Uh, Will is crotchety, bad-tempered. I don't think he'll be disposed to help you, even if he could. Even in a town crisis like this? Uh, Will Briggs don't feel very civic about Seneca and its problems. Since we abolished his job for economy reasons, Will's been feuding. Sued in the courts for pension, making a rumpus at town hall meetings. Great cooperative little town you've got here. Great job you roped me into. <laughs> Will Briggs pulled a switch on Samuel's characterization of him. Briggs fell all over himself, cooperating. For twenty dollars, Mr. Craig. I am a man without funds. Twenty bucks, okay. You get it. Black-hearted board of supervisors. Did you dirt? Old Baldy and the Princess Ida. Scratch your memory. Old Baldy and the Princess Ida. Funny now, you should be asking about them. Why is it funny? You're the second party that's come to me asking. Who came first? Oh, Mitchell Stanley's grandson. The one who settled himself into a shop here a spell ago. Young Fred Stanley. What did you tell him? What I'll tell you. If you wait. I have the record here. Ah, yes, here it is. The sales sheet, my own writing, for that auction they held at Mitchell Stanley's once. To raise money for burying him. I was craking for the auctioneer that day. Get to it, please. In my time. See? says here we sold beds and tables and floor coverings. Down here it says Old Baldy. Fifty cents. Sold to Dr. Tyler. Princess Ida. One dollar. Sold to Miss Pringle. And the snowman. Sold for seventy-five cents. What's the snowman? A design on a patchwork quilt it's named for. Who bought it? Let me see. Sold to Adam Samuels, it says. That's the town supervisor himself. Where's your telephone, Briggs? Telephone? <laughs> Ain't never invented it. From its use to me. Keeping body and soul together as it is. Briggs, don't bend my ears. What's got your back up? Samuels, your town supervisor's number three on the claw murderer's list. If it's so, I say good riddance to the black hearted. Good riddance are bad. Someone else would have to judge Samuel's merits as a human on earth. The garden tool, shaped as a claw, lay across the room where it had been thrown. A claw with bright red fingers. Fred Stanley resisted arrest to the last gasp. Harmony's last gasp, that is. Craig, get out of here. You're under arrest, Stanley. You have no authority. I've got a gun. Harmony! That ape man comes through the door and he's dead. Harmony! You're asking your moronic stooge to commit suicide? We'll see. Harmony! 
One down, and Seneca's a better place for it. You... You killed him. He's only wounded. Where do you want it, Stanley? Uh, I'll go with you. Stanley put his confession on record after a little workout and a lot of sweating. I... I found a diary that once belonged to my grandfather, Mitchell Stanley. A diary hidden behind the oak paneling over a fireplace. In the diary, three pieces of a map were mentioned. A piece each hidden in old Baldy, the Princess Eider, and the snowman, huh? Yes. A, a treasure map. The three pieces were to fit together into a treasure map. Through them, I'd find the wealth my grandfather was reputed to have. The wealth that never turned up when he died. Insanity runs in the Stanley line, huh? My grandfather's whole genius was a genius for hiding and hoarding. Hiding from the world in that awful house at the edge of the town line. Hoarding his gold. Fantastic thing like a child's treasure map was well in character with my grandfather. The shabby trick, too, was well in character with my grandfather. What does that mean? Well, it was all a grotesque joke. My grandfather's ghoulish sense of humor. I killed three people for a load of junk. There weren't any pieces of map in Old Baldy. Or the Princess Ida. Or the Snowman. That diary, Stanley. Give it to me. Here. Go hunt yourself up some treasure, Craig. There was an anticlimax to the Stanley story. In the village beanery, with the sometime Sheriff Berkey trying to act apologetic and yet keep his dignity... Uh, I, I suppose you'll be leaving now, Craig, eh? Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to stand on Broadway and flip a cigarette into the gutter. Well, uh, I've been a jealous fool. So would I be, in your shoes. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, Will Briggs is coming over to see you. He says uh, you owe him something. Yeah, yeah, 20 bucks for valuable services rendered. Craig? Okay. Briggs. It's not out of order now. To done me for 20 bucks? <laughs> Here you are. I'll thank you and be gone. Stick around a minute, Briggs. I want to go over that feud you had with the town board. I'm over it now. Now with the town board extinct. Now that the murders of Doc Tyler, Miss Pringle, and Samuels have left Seneca without a town board. I'm not one to pillory the dead. But I'm one to pillory the living. Here's that alleged Mitchell Stanley diary that produced three murders. Is it now? And uh, this is that auction sales sheet in your own handwriting, as you told me. Do I have to tell you that the handwriting in both is the same, even down to the green ink? Greg, what are you getting at with Briggs? That Briggs here forged the diary, Sheriff, and planted it where young Stanley would be sure to find it. That Stanley killed three people Briggs hated while Briggs sat back and enjoyed the show. That young Stanley was only a dupe, a tool used for revenge. Make the arrest, Sheriff. And then flag down a train so I can scram out of this whistle stop. The sweet neighborliness around here is just killing me. Good night, folks. See you next week. been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Diary of Death, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled A Time to Kill, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I have a wow of a time in the kindergarten when a whimsical corpse insists on playing hide and go seek. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Samuels was Louis Van Ruten. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 
This is Don Pardo speaking. Welcome to Starlight Mystery Theater and another episode in the series, Matthew Slade, Private Investigator. We invite you to take your seat as Matthew Slade unfolds, Who Killed My Pen Pal? In my job, the hours are odd. So are the circumstances and the people I meet. You could even call some of them dangerous. My calling card reads, Matthew Slade, private investigator. I didn't know what time it was. I hoped that it was later than I thought. I was angry, angry enough to kill. I glanced at my watch, cursed silently. 9 a.m. An hour to go. An hour before... Train time. Mm -hmm. And the deserving Sergeant Sid Dinelli, little old me, flies off into the wild blue. Hollywood, Hawaii... But will you shut up? Huh? Buddy, pal, friend, you get me up at dawn. You drag me to the office so that I can toast your trip from my liquor cabin. Oh, yeah, I should have got a later flight, Matt. It's too early to drink. Yeah, for two hours, you've talked about this great vacation you're going to take, rubbing it in that I have to stay here and work. Well, bon voyage. I think I have an appointment. Oh? Jonesy, do I have an appointment? No. What's that? There is someone here to see you. Let's call that that friend. Paulette Van Breck. Beautiful plot. Not exactly. Now, never mind. Uh, send her in. Now, hold it, Lancelot. I'll leave by the back entrance. I don't want to be dragged into one of your cases now. Aloha and hooray for Hollywood. Well, don't let a talent scout see you. The movie industry is in enough trouble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come in, Miss Van Breck. I wish that I had met her 50 years ago. She must have been beautiful. Now, she was an aging, ageless Titania. A silvering sprite, wrapped in bright green mace. She perched on the edge of the chair, bobbed her head at me like a parakeet about to give an esoteric performance. A tall, silent man in a chauffeur's uniform was with her. Well, Miss Van Breck. It's Holly. Holly Smith. It's Paulette Van Breck is my pen name. Uh, my number two, Miss Breck. You're a writer? Uh, in a way, yes. Oh, uh, this is Francis, my chauffeur. He follows me everywhere I go. I don't think he trusts me. I'm always flying off on his left page, and, and he... Oh, 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 where was I? Oh, 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 yes. I, I'm a writer. Uh, that is, I, I write letters to ten pals. Ten pals? All over the world. Darlings, all of them. That's why I'm here. One of them didn't answer a letter. Exactly. You're very intelligent, Matthew. I may use your first name, of course. Now, what do you think of that? Oh, what do I think? Well, I think that... That Jason has been killed, naturally. Oh, are you? This is the right detective, Francis. Now, why do you think Jason was murdered, Matthew? Someone didn't like him. Amazing. Isn't he amazing, Francis? Who did it? Now, I hate to admit this, Polly, but I haven't the slightest idea. Who is Jason? No, you're not as bright as I thought you were. <sighs> Sorry. Jason is a decent actor. He's a talented young genius. A kindred soul. A poet. Uh, here, his last letter to me speaks for itself. She handed me a letter. The return address was Los Angeles. In 16 pages, the kindred soul repeated in iambic rhythm and using poetic license that the thing he had feared had happened. Now, what did he mean by that, the thing that he feared? Someone was going to kill him. Uh, that is, they hadn't yet, but he didn't say that. But that's what he meant. If you understand poetry at all, Matthew. Jason isn't exactly Stephen Vincent Bonet. Oh, but he's close. I've written six letters since I received that one. He didn't answer any of them. Oh, I just know that something horrible has happened. Now, I want you to go to Los Angeles immediately. Rescue well, poor boy I... and bring him back here. Oh, no, now, wait a minute. I that all don't... All right, it's all settled. And my lawyer, Nathan Gainsborough, will send you a check. <sighs> I told him I was hiring you. Come, Francis. Goodbye, Matthew. You're a charming boy. <sighs> and she pattered out with Francis while the charming boy detective wiped the egg off his face. Jonesy, get me Nathan Gainsborough on the phone. All right. 
You know what happens to secretaries who listen to keyholes? They write stories for confession magazines. And uh, Nathan Gainsborough was already on the phone. He called you. Line one. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Gainsborough, Slade. I presume I'm at Kevin Yeah, I think I've agreed to handle a case which I know nothing about, but I'm not sure. Well, welcome to the club. I'm not sure that I want to join. Of course you do. It's profitable. Polly has $20 million, which I try to keep track of. It isn't easy. But she likes it to spread sunshine. Now, this pen pal business is an example. Any other knew that she's Polly Smith, the eccentric millionaire, and not Paul Ed Van Freck. So we'd be up to our dividends and marriage proposals and sad stories. Well, she has a big heart, huh? You don't know anything about him? No, nothing. Now, when you get to Los Angeles, check with Maggie Moore. She runs Ten Pounds Incorporated. Holly gets all of them through Maggie. Now, is a thousand dollars all right for a retainer? Oh, fine, but I... I've sent it by messenger. How soon can you leave? Oh, right away, but I... The receiver clicked in my ear. I had a definite feeling I was being pressured. I muttered to myself on the drive to Los Angeles, swearing to bring Jonesy into line. And to not get roped in by anyone as far out as Polly again. It was almost five o'clock when I reached Los Angeles. I checked Jason Caster's address on the letter. It was in the valley. I turned onto the Hollywood freeway leading to the valley, planning to check out his address before dinner. Thousands of cars were headed toward the same destination, jammed together like sardines. The sardines all belonging to the same school of thought. Move and stop. Move and stop. What in heaven's name, Matthew? I'm getting car sick. Uh, where are we? It was Polly. She popped her head over the back of my seat. I hit the bumper of the car in front of me and set off a chain reaction of cars bumping, jolting, and drivers waking up. Uh, you are the worst driver I've ever seen, Matthew. Look, look what you How talking. did... What? Where did you... I how... said, don't bother, Matthew. Drive. I decided to come along and help. You've been in the back seat all this time. But Matthew, I didn't get $20 million by trusting people. Or oh, hey. She told me how she got her $20 million. And how I could make the same amount if I stopped talking to myself and sharpened up during the hour and a half it took to go two miles on the freeway. Polly was a compulsive talker. My ears were ringing when we pulled up in front of a three-story monstrosity, which Jason, fondly, I suppose, called home. It appeared to be deserted. Oh, but charming isolation, Matthew. It looks just like this. Vacant? You're too sarcastic to be so young, Matthew. It's the inner world which is important. I can't say much for Jason's outer world. Now, you stay here. Really, Matthew? Or I'll quit. I walked through waist-high grass, expecting Livingston to show up any minute. The house towered above me, its paint peeling and cracking. The broken panes in the windows made it appear drunk. I wouldn't have been surprised had it given a giant hiccup and tumbled into oblivion. I stumbled on a broken step, then knocked rather than on the front door. And the door fell in. So I went inside. The house was dark, dusty, empty. If I'd had the sense Polly said I should have, I would have been cautious. I wasn't. Someone hit me from behind, and I joined the door on a red velvet carpet. I was stunned, but not out. I heard someone run past me and up a staircase to the second floor. I got to my feet and ran after him. I knew that whoever it was had hurt me, but they were acquainted with the house, and I wasn't. I stopped on the open balcony... Then heard a sound. Came from behind a closed door. I went toward it. Jerked the door open and... Matthew, are you trying to frighten me to death? Don't open a door like that. Polly, what are you doing in a closet? Hiding. I came in the back way and I heard... Did you hit me on the back of the head? Thank you, Dad. I don't know. I just had to ask. Now, how did you get up here without my seeing you? There's a back stairway. Now, that's how he got away. Okay, you kids, get out of here, you trespassing. There's nothing else to do than drive me crazy. Like the window is tearing up. Oh, mister, aren't you a little old for this type of thing? You and your mother get out of here. I am not his mother. Sorry, we were looking for someone. In the closet? I was hiding in the closet. Okay, I'll... Now, just a minute, who owns this property? The city. And they're going to tear it down. When? Any minute. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry we bothered you. I thanked him and propelled the protesting Polly down the stairs and into the car. I would have to go back after dark. And after I got Polly out of my hair. Where are we going, Matt? You are going to San Francisco. I am going to stay here. She exploded and kept it up all the way to International Airport. Between explosions and persuasions, I managed to find out that she didn't have a picture of Jason. But that he was about 25, tall, blonde. 
and that Maggie Moore of Pen Pals Incorporated had recommended him. I saw Polly safely aboard a plane for San Francisco, and then in the terminal, spotted that happy tourist, Sid Dinelli. Well, hello, Sid. Welcome to Paradise. Oh, no. What are you doing here? On a case. Aren't you a little late arriving? What'd you do, Walt? I hate comics. I missed my plane, Matt. Then I got air sick and... And the stewardess didn't like you. Yeah. You want to ride into town? You're working on a case? No. Just go away. All right. Take the bus. Uh, Matt, uh, wait a minute. You know how I feel about the bus. I drove Sid into town and dropped him at the Grayson Hotel. Promised to meet him later for a drink at the Shea on the Strip. Then I looked up the address of Pen Pals Incorporated. It was about a ten-minute drive. Mr. Slade, please come in. I've been expecting you. She may have been expecting me, but I wasn't expecting her. I had visualized her as a horn rim hair in a bun type. She wasn't. Uh, Gainsborough called you about Jason Castor, huh? Yes. I have no record of him at all. I checked the file. Nothing. I don't know how I got Polly's name. Well, then you know that Paulette Van Breck is Polly Smith. Of course. But none of the pen pals do. Uh, Polly said that you recommended Jason. You didn't. No. Does anyone have access to your file? No, but there is no information about Polly Smith in them. She's listed as, uh, Paulette Zembra. Occupation, writer. Interested in reading, cooking, horseback riding. Collects modern poetry. Uh, well, around his ten pounds, but no money. Exactly. But where do we go from here? We go to meet a friend, Sid Vanilli. Shea was crowded, but not so crowded that I couldn't spot Sid. He was leaning over the bar, murmuring to the bartender. Maggie and I went toward him. Hello, Sid. Mac. You know, I may get thrown off the force, but I'm going to kill you. Oh, oh I'm uh, sorry. I really am a gentleman, uh, Miss... Uh... Uh, Miss Moore. Maggie Moore. Oh, delighted, Maggie. I may be the most interesting man you've ever met. Hmm. Yeah, bartender, uh, champagne for this lady. And what are you buying for yourself, Matt? Hemlock. On the rock. Well, what have I done now? Over there. In the corner booth. Does that belong to you? It was Polly. She waved a Mai Tai at me. I groaned. Hey, Maggie, there's a secluded booth. Oh, no, you don't sit. Come on, Maggie. Uh, well, Polly, we didn't stay on the plane to San Francisco, did we? No, no, we didn't. Uh, have a Mai Tai? Uh, no, thanks. Are you in the back of the car again? Oh, I never received my check, Matthew. I followed you in the taxi, paid the doorman to find out where you were going to meet Sid, and here I am. Since you are, this is Maggie Moore. She's never oh. heard of Jason Castor. Now, where did you get his name? Oh, uh, really, Maggie, how strange. Uh, don't you think that's strange, Sid? Hmm? Oh, I never heard of him either. Well, you have now. Oh, no. When did Jason start writing to you, Polly? How did he get your name? Oh, one question at a time, Matthew. Uh, about a year ago, I think. Oh, he's such a poor lost soul. No family and no one... Polly. Well, and Maggie recommended him. You're lying. Yes. Now, go on. With the truth? I met him at the racetrack. Uh, no, that was Alan Dulles. Oh, in an art gallery, an exhibit by an extremely talented artist. It uh, is film or something. I forget the last name. Jason was alone in San Francisco. He was coming back to Los Angeles the next day. I told him to write to me. Did you give him your real name? Certainly not. Your home address? No. I used the box number. And I didn't send him any money. You didn't? Well, all right. How do you make a living? He's poetry. Poets don't make money. They either marry it or teach English. Now, what was he doing in the art gallery? Well, he was just there. Well, I'm his hobbies, Polly. Sports, dancing, music, well, music, uh, jazz music. He liked jazz, but he couldn't afford to buy records. He afford to listen. Did he hang out in any of those record stores? Well, yes. He, he mentioned one in, in one of his poems. Now, what, what was the name? The Square Place. The Square Place? Oh, that's from Hollywood, Matt. And it is the place for jazz folks. Well, let's go. Oh, wait, not you, Sid. You huh? take care of Polly. Maggie and I will be right back. Oh, uh, Matt, uh, Matt, don't do this. Matt, Matt. I had a hunch that Jason did know who Polly was and that the character he had built in his letters was a come on. Maggie and I arrived at the square place. The place was filled with kids and sound. Someone pointed out the manager. Uh, I'd like to talk to you. You're the manager, right? The owner, man. The owner. Oh, listen to that horn, man. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Okay, man, speak. I'm looking for Jason Casper. Never heard of him. He's a fuzz? No, 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 no. He's, uh, he's tall, blonde, about 25. 25? He's got the wrong plate, Pop. Nobody over 18 in here. Kids, just kids. Wait a minute, man. You know, he's fading in. Yeah, we called him Jason the Argonaut. 
Uh, uh, where can I find him? Uh, who knows? In the Dead Sea, maybe. Oh, I chased him out of here a couple of weeks ago. Oh, listen, fan club, that one's like eerie. I mean, I turned him out like he was never part of the scene. Well, he's part of the scene now. What do you remember about him? Oh, a poet, he said, but no gift. You know, no dumby dum dum you know? He's dangerous. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. You know what? Uh, one of those who wait in the dark. One of those who wait in the dark. I did know. Flam didn't recall anything else about Jason except that he had, in Flam's words, latched on to the painter who had done the murals for the square place. The painter was a woman. Her name was Selma. Flam gave me her address, and Maggie and I drove through the Hollywood Hills to what looked like an eagle's nest. The door was open, so we went in. Who are you? I'm Matt Slade. This is Maggie Moore. You look well today. Um, would you like a drink? Do you know Jason Tapper? Oh, I just wasted two ounces of good shot. You know him. And? And he's not like anyone I've ever met. Are you police? Private investigator. Has he killed someone? No, why? Intuition. It might have been me. But the little painter didn't have enough money for Jason. Thank heaven. You held an exhibit in San Francisco last year. Did you introduce Jason to anyone there? Yes. A charming but perfectly wild woman named, uh... Paulette Van Brett? No, Polly Smith. One night I came home with friends. Jason was here. He had painted his face with fluorescent paint, a death mask. A grotesque, bleeding death mask. When he saw us, he ran. That was a week ago. I haven't seen him since. Uh, thanks for your help. Here, you lock the door after us. Double bolt, lock, chain, and chair. Maggie. Holly is in this up to her beneficiary. You think that she put Jason in her will? She's made some provision for him, or he thinks she has. He's going to kill Polly. He's going to try. Slide in. I'll take you home. This is a good night for Girl Scouts to go home and catch up on their arts and crafts. You make a great den, Mother. We started down the hill. The street was steep, narrow, winding, filled with blind curves. If you hadn't passed your driver's test in San Francisco, I'd walk. It's not as bad as it sounds. It's worse. That car behind us. Yeah, I see it. Oh, he's so close. What is he trying to do? He's trying to beat us down the hill. See that we don't get down. Stop thinking and make sure your seat belt is fastened. No. He's trying to hit us. His face. It's just mask. Yeah, I saw it. Get down. Here he comes again. Why did he pass up? He's going to wait for us or to get us to follow him. Well, follow him. Maggie, he thinks that you're Polly. Do exactly what I tell you. <laughs> Maggie promised that she would. But women promise one thing and mean another. We drove up in front of the house. There was no sign of Jason, but I knew that he was watching it from somewhere in the dark. But, Mr. Slade, I know that Jason wouldn't hurt anyone. He's a dear, dear boy. I murmured something, covering in response, as Maggie ducked down into the shadows, preparing to run back to the car. Then... Matthew. Matthew. It was Polly. I looked, but couldn't see her. I'm in the front step. I grabbed Maggie, pulled her off the porch. Polly, what in blazes are... No, 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 Matthew. Don't blame Mr. Denny for this. Sid, where is he? He's inside the house. He went here a few minutes ago. Oh, there was a terrible noise. And then you came. I'm so afraid that he might hurt Jason. Oh, that's not what I'm afraid of. All right, Maggie, stay with her. Now, can you shoot a gun? I I think so. Yeah, take this. If he comes out, if you hear him, shoot. I started up the steps, caught my heel in the broken one, cursed silently, and went inside. There was a sound. I turned quickly. <laughs> Sid, are you okay? Right, I got a broken lad, man. He hit, he hit me with something as I started upstairs and I fell. Now, where's your gun? He's got it. You don't have one? I gave it to Maggie. Where is he? Upstairs. I just, I just saw it, Sid. That paint glows. Look, if I can close that front door and get out, I can get the gun from Maggie. Oh, okay. But let me cover it. Okay. Now, Sid, go. Jason! He's up there. I can see him. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Will you get out of the light? the wall and into the floor around Sid. I started to move, but not quickly enough. A noose snaked down from the balcony and caught me about the throat. I managed to get a hold of the rope. I looked up and saw Jason. The rope was wrapped around the balcony railing, the other end tied to his waist. He jumped to the railing. I held on. He jerked at the rope, trying to break my hold. I clawed hand over hand, gained a few inches. He was ready to jump. I knew that when he did, Matt Slade would be dead. You, on the balcony, I have a gun. Don't move. He jumped. And Sid fired. I swung like a pendulum, still holding on. The rope snapped. His body hit the floor. And I fell. Now, are you all right? Yeah. Yeah, get this. You saw me. I didn't have too far to fall. What happened? Shot. What happened, Matt, you? Got to my feet. Moved to Jason. Bent over him. Oh, Matthew. You. you killed my pig pal. I hadn't killed Jason. 
I had come as close to killing him as he had to killing me. The score was even. Maggie went to call the police and ambulance for Sid as Jason tried to convince Polly that he was just a little different from most pen pals. I agreed with that. I didn't agree that he wasn't trying to kill her. Polly was very sympathetic. She would still leave Jason her collection of modern poetry, which was what she had intended to will to him, not part of her fortune, as he had thought. Jason would have to learn to read between the lines of her letters for the real meaning. Jason was going to have enough trouble reading between the bars of his cell. The police and ambulance arrived. Jason and Sid were taken away as the caretaker stormed in with the demolition crew. I tried to explain, was ordered out, and fell down the front steps, which were no longer there. The crew had removed them. The next few weeks I spent with Sid in the hospital, in traction. I had gained not only a broken ankle, but a pen pal. Polly wrote to me every day. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.